I wrote is... a thing last week when I was a kid. There was a place that for two dollars it was uh, erotic banana night. It was a strip club when I was about sixteen and fifteen, and you give the chick two dollars and she'd give you back two frozen bananas, and she'd peel the banana, stick it in her monkey, and give it back to you, and you ate the banana. This is the Meadowlands Inn in 1980. I seen the Meadowlands Inn in New, <laughs> New Jersey. What are you talking about, Joey? It was a strip club run by cops. It was on Tunley Avenue. When I was a kid, people would tell you about the Meadowlands Inn. So I was a loner, so one day I walked back there, and it was all the cops I knew, and they're like, go in. You sit there, you, you order a drink, and a chick would be in the, and it was a little thing, a little table, maybe four by four, and a stage around it. People would drink around it. And every night they had different chicks. But the highlight of the club was this girl, Tina. And she would sit on a Galliano bottle. Up and down on a Galliano bottle. And people would go fucking bananas. Really? Oh, this was crazy. They used to take Budweiser and put it in their monkey. Like splash it and put it in their right. monkey. And take all the beer out of the, out of the bottle and spit the beer at you. And you'd see it. And then you'd <laughs> tell people the next day. Like, you're like, dog, I'll pull you aside. Listen, I went to the Meadowlands Inn last night. The chick sat on a fucking Galliano bottle. I'm like, Joey. We think you're doing too much drugs. You're fucking out of your mind. So two nights later, you take the people down there. And every time you were down there, you'd always hear this. Oh, my God. <laughs> people would just say, oh, my God, and they drop their drink glass. Like, so remember, she was probably the first squirter. Yes. <laughs> no, I think the first squirter was in the Bible. Okay. If you look, she went to the Last Supper, but she was sick that night. So they had her <laughs> But she got sick, so she couldn't make it. You know what I'm saying? But this place was crazy. This place gets crazier. This is why you really got to watch. One of the kids I grew up with, his sister was Tina. I mean, I was tight with this kid, and his sister was Tina. Right. So we'd be out getting a six-pack, and guys would go, Hey, have you been to the Meadowlands eight lately? Tina sat on a Galliano bottle last Wednesday night. I mean, this was so embarrassing. And I would hang with this kid. Oh. Everybody knew who his sisters were. And he had six sisters, one hotter than the other one, and all of them became like fucking freaks. But this strip club took it to the next level. One Christmas Eve, I went in there. That's how pathetic my life was. One Christmas Eve, I went in there, and I seen a girl put her leg on the bar, and I seen the old guy take his teeth out, give them to the girl. She put them in her monkey, took them out, and gave them back to the guy. And the guy sat there at the bar drinking with his teeth and this girl's little fucking monkey. I mean, if you seen Felicia's face when I seen this, guys, this is how crazy it is. Even Felicia thinks this is fucking crazy. And they finally got shut down like two years later. But this is how bad it was that if you went to 42nd Street in New York City, the home of sex, they had a map on how to get, like star maps they have today. Uh -uh. Right. That was invented in New York for star maps on how to get to the Meadowlands Inn. I wish I was lying to you. Wednesday night was erotic banana night. Frozen banana. Chick would put in her monkey, give it back to you. You ate it. And that was your highlight. Rock Springs, Wyoming in 1995. Rock Springs, Wyoming is where all the beat up hookers from Vegas go to rehab. A lot of right. people didn't know that 60 <laughs> Minutes did an expose really? in Rock Springs, Wyoming in the early 90s. The FBI had to go in and take over Rock Springs, Wyoming because it was one of the most corrupt cities in the country. It was mob run, and it was mob run out of Vegas so they could be close to Vegas. So they would take all these chicks that their pussies were sitting on Galliano bottles, and they'd send them to Rock Springs to rehab <laughs> and go to, like, strip clubs and rehab themselves, get right. off the drugs. Then when they'd be ready, they'd pop them right back to fucking Hookerville in Vegas. It's amazing. It's wow. A, and I went there one time. We did comedy at the strip club. And for like three bucks, the girl gave me a lap dance. I mean, it was fucking amazing. Like, I sat there drooling. And I asked the people. Well, what did I, she do in the lap dance? I don't remember. I know she got my dick card, and I know I wanted to give her more money. That's a lap dance. Right, and right. You get your dick card, <laughs> and you're thinking of ways of spending the rent money to put it up her ass, and you don't even give a fuck. You know what I'm saying? She's doing her job. And I remember that. Toronto one time. The girl put her monkey in my face and I bit her pubic hairs. That's a fucking what? lap dance. Oh, really? Yeah. In Toronto, they don't give a fuck, Jack. Yeah. On Bloor Street, they'll put that monkey live in an action right in your face. You can hear it gurgling at you. It's crazy. Somebody asked me a couple weeks ago how I got into stand-up. And it was when I did time. And I, I got arrested in Colorado, of all places. Boulder. Yeah. You know, that's why I tell people I became a man in Colorado because I was raised in Jersey. But I thought I was hot shit when I came out. If I didn't get arrested in Jersey, I won't get arrested anywhere else. I came to Colorado with my bullshit, and they shut me the fuck down. And it was. Uh, Do you mind me asking what you were arrested for? Well, the charges were kidnapping one, kidnapping two, aggravated robbery. All right. The next time you ask someone <laughs> to do a motherfucking podcast, yeah, you might want to bring that up. Well, we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about it now. Uh, it was kidnapping one, two, aggravated robbery, accessory to a felony, and second degree burglary, all rolled up in one. 
I got convicted of second degree burglary and accessory to a felony. And the way I looked at it was for all the other burglaries I had done in my life. I had right. to pay my price. Right. So when I got out of prison, it was like going to Vegas. All your sins are absolved in a way, you know. But uh, I had been like a low rent type of guy, trucks, robbing trucks all my life, shit like that, so and so, whatever, in New Jersey. I went to Colorado, and the first time I went to Colorado, <clears throat> I got into burglarizing homes, drug dealer homes. You know, I would get to know them right. and then just rob their house or whatever. And, and that, was, why them? Because they're drug dealers, not gonna call the cops. Okay. A drug dealer's not gonna call the cops, you know. And even if you clean out the television or whatever, they're not gonna call the cops because the cops are gonna know. Oh, they broke in here and took this, so a drug dealer's house gets robbed, they don't say anything. I was young, I was 21, 20, you know. And I went back to college, I went back to Jersey. It was so weird when I left uh, Aspen at the time. Burglaries had gone down. I mean, I was going crazy. <laughs> I'm not even joking. It's not even joking. I shoveled snow wow. in the daytime to case the joints right. to know what their movements were. I shoveled snow for 12 bucks an hour in snow mass, and I would burglarize. And then I'd send the jewelry home, and they would send me uh, uh, cash on Western Union. You know, I had friends on the East Coast that would fence it for me. And I did all that shit. Then I went back to the East Coast. I stayed for 18 months. And by that time, the cocaine epidemic had taken over. It was 84, 85. I went back to Boulder, and I was clean and sober at the time. I was just smoking dope. I wasn't doing coke. I, I, I had put together in six years of doing coke that it was bad luck and all this shit. And after about a year of being clean, I had a nice girlfriend, I started dabbling again. Coke was 18000 an ounce in Colorado. I was getting Is it for 800 in New Jersey. So I would fly back to Jersey and fly it back, so I got into that shit. Wow. And then I built up this cash, and I fucking snorted it all, and I had to leave Aspen Owen like forty grand, and I moved to Boulder. And I get to Boulder, and I'm detailing cars, and I'm pretty good, and I'm, I start selling cars, and I always went to night classes. Believe it or not, in all my crimes, I always went to Colorado well, you were up. College. Yeah. You were up. <laughs> I love going to school. I love right. learning. So I went to Boulder, and I, and I got myself into a way of life that was phenomenal. It's like so weird. Like when people say old habits die hard, I was making like four to five grand a month. I was going to classes. I was doing a little coke. I was working out. And all of a sudden, one day, I just got into this coke thing again, and I, and I started working with this guy in Boulder. His name was Kent Vella. And uh, he said he was going to rob his roommate. His roommate had a couple kilos of coke. Well, I decided I was going to rob Kent Vella. So I got this biker to help me, and it was really weird. Our plan was to, to the biker was going to be the front man. He was the one that was going to buy the drugs, and he was going to rip, rip out a gun and rob us both. That was the plan. So it was right. like, it was uh, well, that expression, uh, what, what a tangled web we weave. And it was really weird. The day came, November 18th, and I picked Vella up, took him to Tidwell's house. Tidwell rips out a machine gun tries to rob the guy. But when I picked up Vela, I had noticed that he had hid the kilo of Coke in the ceiling, in those uh, standing ceilings. And then he had like an ounce in the drawer and he had like cash in the drawer. So we, 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 we show up at this guy. Tidwell pulls the gun out on me and Vela. We tie Vela up. We put Vela in the room, you know, and then he goes over to Vela's to rob him. He comes back and says he can't find nothing. He comes back and says, I found an eight ball and $200. Well, I knew there was cash in the drawer right. it was like an ounce of coke in the drawer so I said you're trying to rob me I didn't let him know this I said something wasn't right here so I got in my car and it was the weirdest thing I walked in this house like terminated I walked into a building with a guard just told the guard a story went up to the second floor kicked the door down went in pulled the ceiling down because I was already involved in this crime yeah. I took the kilo and I put a newspaper thing one of those vending things on the bottom where you go put a quarter in a newspaper right. old school drug dealers would always put their drugs under the vending and make drops I would call you and say, Felicia, go to the corner of Laurel and whatever. There's a newspaper thing. Put a quarter in. Your kilo is under there. And then wow. you give me the cash later so we wouldn't make the, trash, the cash transaction. So I hit it there. I went home. And I went back to Vela's. And I told Vela he was a cocksucker for trying to rob me. And it was really weird because I had a handgun in the car. I had like a 9 millimeter handgun in the car. And I went to the car and I said, you know what? I could shoot these guys and nobody will ever know. This is when you become a man. Like this is the story that you don't know about prison. And I walked to the car. And I had a full clip in there, and I go, you know, I could walk into it and shoot both of these guys, and nobody will ever know. I, I sit back now, and, and I consider it a bad fucking day. It's what happens when you get involved in something, and that's why I tell people a lot in life that before they get involved, because something will run away from you. Oh, absolutely. That was something that I had under control that ran away. Now, now it was supposed to be easy. We're Robin Vella. That's it. The, the kid I was doing the crime with, the biker, he had the pit bull, the tattoo, the leather jacket, anything to get attention he had. He was one of those guys that went to strip clubs to do business. No, I don't want to lap dance. I'm not here for the girls. But he, with that show, there's guys right. that have that yeah. show. Yeah. And the story was he was dating a girl that did new lap dancing. She was beautiful, but she was in trouble with her husband. 
and she needed <laughs> money to play college. Aww. So he put her in one of his bedrooms. They didn't fuck. They were living together, in the, and she would tell him they wouldn't fuck because she was Catholic. What? So he bought it. So she needed $10,000 to get a divorce, and that was his main motivation for this. Um, if you're Catholic, you can't fuck, but Listen, you can nude dance. are you fucking crazy? Are you fucking Is, kidding I me? I don't know about that. This kid <laughs> bought into it. This kid was in love with her. Yeah. And she goes, I'll fuck you when I get the $10,000 and get oh. the divorce. So his motivation was to get the 10000 Me, I, my motivation was to party. I was sick and tired of living in Boulder. I was ready to go back to my buddies were going to clubs and they were snorting every night and fucking and sucking. And here I am in Colorado living like a snowman, selling cars. So that was my motivation. And all of a sudden, it was just one day that turned bad. I mean, I remember being in my house. The kilo was on his way to Aspen. I had my buddy drive the kilo to Aspen. So it was out because our plan was to take Vela and put him on a bus to Arizona. That was our genius plan. This is all the drugs. This was the effects right. of the drugs. We actually thought that we were going to rob somebody, give him $200 and say, you're on a bus to Arizona, bitch. Don't ever come back. So on the way to drive the guy to the bus, this Tidwell guy had Vela in the trunk. He gets pulled over in Thornton with no headlights on. That's what, see, this... This, this was God. Yeah, this was all God. Yeah, yeah. And if you're going to kidnap, make sure you, uh, your car is good, but right? But no, make sure you have your fucking headlights on. And oh, he, have, oh, he didn't even he have He didn't have the headlights oh, on. He really? got pulled over, and the guy's like, license and registration. The guy in the trunk's like... Mm. <laughs> oh. So now they took oh, the guy goodness. out of the fucking trunk. They, they're for kidnap Because kidnap isn't really me taking Felicia and calling uh, your relative and saying, I got Felicia $400. No, kidnapping is when I take you from one room to another room to do a crime. So if me and you get into an argument and I throw you into this room, that's kidnapping. If you tell the cop he threw me into a different room, that he took me from that room into the kitchen, that's kidnapping. When you're taking somebody against their will into a different room. So let me ask you, when you, when you realize uh, that all this shit had gone that down, that the dude was in the trunk, like what were your thoughts? Were you what? What, what did you think? Were well, you one thing, I'm a street guy. These two guys had never seen in life what I had seen. This is just a tangle web. This is like one of the worst tangled webs you've ever seen in crime altogether. When he came over, he tried to threaten me. He goes, well, I'll go to the cops. Go to the cops, bitch. Get the fuck out of my house. I kept like an eight ball from the kilo. I did it, went to a bar, came home, passed out, and I woke up to some guy knocking on my door. And it was the lot man from the car lot where I worked. And he goes, bro, the place is surrounded with cops. Don't go in there on their way here. I packed my stuff. And I went to King Supers, mm -hmm. and I called my girlfriend at the time, and I forgot my weed. This is how bad the cops were in Boulder. So I went back to my house with the cop car in front of my house. I walked around the back and got my weed and my pipe and my lighter. <laughs> oh, no. I hid for two oh. days because oh, they no. wanted me for kidnapping. Right. Like it was in the paper. They were looking for an accomplice. Oh, it was in the paper? Oh, fuck yeah. I made oh, the front page of the paper was in Boulder. Was your picture? Would no, you? no, no, no. Oh, they, okay. didn't have, they didn't release any names. I went up to my in-laws and stayed for two days, and I actually thought in my head I was going to beat it. Like I was going to go tell the cops that... I was a vigilante drug guy. And I remember that that was the night that Don Johnson was marrying uh, the girl on Miami Vice. And I'll never <laughs> forget my wife dropping me off going, listen, she's dropped me off at 11. I'll be home for the wedding. Like, we'll watch Miami Vice tonight. You know what I'm saying? Right. And I remember knocking, you know, going to Boulder <laughs> County Jail, knocking on the fucking thing. You know, oh, it was great. I had a great two days because I went into Boulder and I would call the cops from Albertsons and say, this is Joey Diaz. I heard you're looking for me. And they would go, hold on. They put me on hold to try to trace the call. Fuck you. I know. And I'd hang up and i dog, don't fucking trace me again, cocksuckers. Uh, what do you want me for? We just want to talk to you. Come in. And I'll never forget hanging up one time and them going, all right, where are you? We'll come to you. And I was at a Kmart on 30th and Iris. And I remember looking across the street at Albertsons. I go, I'm at Albertsons. And I hung up the phone. I really went into town that day to call the cops and to get weed to go back up to my girlfriend's parents' house. They were out of town. I remember rolling the joint and watching. 20 cop cars surround Albertsons and seeing cops run into Albertsons with walkie talkies on. And I even remember what I rented that night. I rented Tequila Sunrise. Oh, and I no. Rented, uh, <laughs> Above the Law. It was oh. a, my buddy talked me into watching Above the Law. I went home. I watched both those movies and I turned myself in the next day. And it's funny because when I turned myself in, I went, I'm Joe Diaz. And they go, Hold on, we'll come out to get you. And they came out to the window and they brought me in. There was 10 cops with fucking weapons pulled on me. And they're like, Get on the fucking floor. And I'm like, All this. Are you fucking serious? I didn't do anything. And they sat me down. They said, you get charged with kidnapping one, kidnapping someone. I'm like, kidnapping? And they're like, your bail is 50000 cash. And I'm like, so I turned myself in. I had to sit in Boulder County for a fucking month. I got out before Christmas. And it was, uh, when you get arrested for something like that, like I had been arrested for petty shit where you go through the system and you have an attorney that knows people. Right. 
this was fucking deep. This was like, you know, I sat in there and then they, they lowered my bail to 3,000 cash because I had a, my wife's, my girlfriend's family at the time who lived in Boulder and we got a bond. They put their house up for me and shit. So we got the house and three thousand dollars. They did. Yeah, my. They in-laws. must have really. They really dug me, and I dug them. They thought it was a bad day. He came to see me in the prison. He goes, "Listen, I always knew you were a little kinky, my fucking machine guns." You know, uh, I, I dealt with death and I dealt with divorce, and I'll tell you, it's two different things. Because when somebody dies, they just die and they go away, and you know where you stand. But when you get divorced, and especially when you have children in the mix. Either you get along or you don't get along. And when you get along, it's a good thing when everybody's amicable. But when you don't get along, it's worse than fucking war. Because this person across from you is the person you shared a life for for 10 years or more. And all of a sudden, they're coming at you with things you've never even heard of that you couldn't even say to you. Like I said, my ex-wife was robbing my weed and then going to the court and saying, he smokes weed, let's give him a piss test. Yeah. She was robbing my weed. So people do things that are uncharacteristically... And the anger, it's a weird anger because my anger, I mean, after I got divorced, I had just started comedy. And there was a point in my divorce where this is how fucked up my mind was. I was ready to kill him. At the same time, I was going to turn myself in and become a joke writer for Jay Leno, get a fax machine, (laughs) have my friends send me a fax machine in the prison. And I was just going to send jokes to Jay Leno and try to get 35 bucks. I was content with doing that. I fuck like comedy. That plan. I like that plan. Yeah, fuck comedy. <laughs> fuck everything. I'm going to kill this motherfucker just to prove a point. And that was your wife's new man? That was my wife's new man. And it wasn't really him that was confusing everything. It was her that was yeah. putting the fire into him. You know, she went and got a female attorney, which really changed everything. You yeah. know, I, one minute she's like, just give me 250 a month and we'll work this out for daycare. You know, at the time, just pay for daycare. And we got separated. The next minute, She's like, I need $2,000 a month, da, 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 and whatever you didn't pay $2,000 on is retro. Yeah. I mean, it was fucking mind-boggling. It was, and the anger wasn't from the paying or anything like that. It was what they were doing with the child, how they used the child. And uh, like I said, I was getting ready to the point. Like one day, he saved himself. The Lord saved me. And I always say that because I had gone home and gotten a knife, and I went to his work. And I was already planned it out. That's what I never knew what premeditation was till right. that situation came to me. And I was in the car driving home saying, that's premeditated murder. I had already planned, like, before you leave your house, right. if you already got your suitcase ready to go to jail and you got your paperwork, right. that's premeditated. Yeah. And I remember driving down there, and until this day, that would have been my life changing because I was walking right in the building. I did walk in the building with the butcher knife. You know, I really did come in there. And then eventually, what got me really going was I ended up smacking him. And I smacked him. This is how God works. I had two felonies. And I had one more felony, and it's a career criminal thing in Colorado. Right. And I was driving there. And my little girl, I went to pick her up. She was four. And he said, my little girl asked me what the word spick meant. And I said, where did you hear that? And she goes, every time you call the house, that's what John said. Go get in the car. And I drove right to his, uh, I went to drop him off at Safeway. I don't know if you know Boulder at all. It's on 30th on the outskirts. And I got out of the car and I gave him an opportunity. I said, I don't really like you. I had spit in his face once before when I dropped the kid off because he told me not to take the kid to Jurassic Park. You're the boyfriend. Don't ever fucking tell me. Right. You know, relax. Yeah. Yeah. So this one day, I took him out like a man. I go, look, this, I left my daughter in the car. I go, here's the situation. My daughter just said, Spick. If she was an East Coast little girl, we're in. She heard it at school. Right. But they don't use that word in Colorado. Only racist fucks like you, cocksucker from Idaho, use that word. And he goes, I don't know what you're talking about. Felicia, I looked him in the face. I go, I'm going to give you an out. I'm going to give you two minutes to say you did it. If you say you did it, this is over. We'll shake hands and part friends. But if not, you're calling my little girl a liar. And he's like, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And I said, you got one opportunity to come clean. He didn't say it. Felicia, with everything I had, I didn't care if I did the 25 years. I punched him in the fucking eye. In a safe way, right outside. Some lady's like, I'm calling the police. I go, go mind your fucking business. Go suck a dick and all this shit. And I smacked him again. <laughs> he goes, I'm calling the police. And I go, you know what? Now I'm going to give you one to go. And I hit him in the same eye. Bam. And my little girl's in the car, and she's fucking holding on to it. And that's when I really realized I can't do this. Yeah. Cops came. I did an AIDS benefit under an alias. I got caught for misdemeanor. I gave an <laughs> alias. I did you an, and your aliases. I did an AIDS benefit <laughs> under an alias. And the cops came, and they're like, Jimmy. What's the problem? <laughs> Don't they know that's your <laughs> alias? And I told them what happened, and here's how God works in mysterious ways. They gave me a ticket because they knew me. Yeah. I went into court the next day. In the Boulder city limits, you're not allowed to use a racial epitaph, a racial slur. Oh, yeah. If you use a racial slur, you got one coming to you. That's the J.J. Flanagan law. So here I am, ready to go to jail for 25 years, and the judge goes, dismissed, you did good. 
Next time you call Mr. Diaz to speak, you got more coming to you. He had to leave court. His eye was gigantic. I get in the car with my daughter. She's like, you should have seen his eye this morning at breakfast. I couldn't stop laughing. And that's when it really hurt me. Yeah. But I got that anger out. And all that anger I had built up, that those two punches, yeah. was better than any fucking yeah. therapy session. Yeah. That motherfucker never even came to pick her up again. Yeah. It's tough. Is, it's, it's tough. It's, it's really tough. When I was a kid, I'd go to Miami <laughs> and I'd spend time with my aunt, and, and my aunt was fucking hot. My right, aunt was like five right. eleven. She had jet black hair, and she had like little white things in her hair from like like white marks, and she just looked gorgeous. She was a taller woman. Her name was Vivian Castrillon, and she had a hell of a body when I was a kid. And she was my aunt. I really loved her because she taught me how to do math. She taught me how to play the piano. She was very smart, but she was sexy. And my uncle wouldn't sleep in the same room with her. At Why? that age, they would sleep because my uncle was a nut. He was doing blow. He yeah. was out shooting people and going to get bales of weed off the ocean. This is in the early right, 70s. I right. would go to Miami. And since they knew how I grew he knew how I grew up, he could be open with me. He couldn't be open with his kids about his drug use and shit. So at night, we'd wait. In those days, in the early 70s, the, the TV didn't run 24 hours like it does now. It would go to like 1130. Then you'd hear, da 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 Television would end. Right, right. With this Nash. You had to get up at 12 in the morning, at 12 at night, after Mission Impossible. And he'd go, you want to go for a ride? And we'd go over to this uh, little milk thing in Miami. They have those little drive-up things. They've always had them. What, where what you do you mean? Where you buy milk. All the essentials. You don't have to get out of your car. Since the 60s, they've been doing that in Miami. Oh, like a drive through Like a drive through You know, they have these still here in California. They have them here. They yeah, call them the... La Vaquita, the cow. Oh, yeah. And you get cigarettes, beer, ice cold beer in a bag, cigarettes, beer, you know, chocolate milk, and a couple sodas. Just right. like if you're in your journey. We go there. He'd get a couple beers. We'd go down to Miami. He'd get his boat. And I remember being like eight. We'd go out and we'd pull in the bales of weed. Shut and up. I wouldn't know what the fuck they were. I knew, but I didn't know. You were like, some someone's yeah. going to make some spaghetti with this yeah, basil. With this shit. And we'd go back to his house <laughs> in the garage. And he'd give me like 20 bucks. And the next morning we'd wake up. And it was like nothing happened. We'd go to work and do construction. Are you serious? Yeah, a construction company with 20 guys. He'd build five houses on a block in like southwest Miami and 100th and 130th Avenue. Uh, and he would, it was like amazing. And every night he would make burgers or whatever. We'd go fishing in the afternoon, get fish, and then he'd cook them on the boat, bring all the kids back. We'd watch the Three Stooges. All the kids would go to bed like at nine or eight. Right. And he'd let me hang with him till about 11. He'd smoke pot. And then about 12 o'clock after, da, 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 we'd shoot down, get a beer. So how did he know where this weed was? They would call him and tell yeah. him. You know, he was part of like a, oh. a little network. And oh. he would, he would, just do, he was such a, an influence on me because I really couldn't tell my mom what I'd do in Miami. My mom would think I would go to Miami with, to hang with my cousins. I, that was my only really like blood cousins. And she would go, we'd go to baseball camp, we'd play the piano, she'd make us do two times two all morning for an right. hour. It was a great, she really worked on her kids. But at night I hung with him and he would show me guns and we'd go pick up money, you know what I'm saying? Wow. He would introduce me to his girlfriends. So he had really two lives. And, and the thing why he was so tight with me was because in 1966, him and my dad used to get high. All right? They used to do heroin together. Oh, wow. So one night, and they used to sell heroin together in the 60s when there were two young kids from Cuba. And one night, my, my dad had a party for his birthday, and it was uh, he was at home. He had something that Monday morning. And they called him at midnight, and they said, Manolo, who is my dad, <clears throat> is having a heart attack. And he really was. And he kept saying, you guys are fucking with me. What do you think, I'm three? I'm not leaving. He'd hang up the phone. Well, the next day he found out my dad died. Aww. So he always felt really guilty about it. So he was always very nice to me. He always went the extra mile. And he's the one that told me the real story. My mom and my mom always told me he died of a heart attack. He really died from doing a bump of pure heroin. And it just Oy. blew his fucking brains. Oh, wow. So he was real tight with my dad. So ever since my dad died, he felt he owed me. Right. So he was just really good to me. And then I, at the end, I fucked him. I fronted a kilo and never paid him in 19 <laughs> Of course you did. And then the Hurricane Andrew came, and I talked to him, and he was kind of upset. I didn't really front the kilo. He was mad at me because he found that I was selling coke. Right. And he goes, you know, you can't sell coke if you come down and visit me. He goes, that's the last thing your family wanted. He goes, I, I, I don't mind you doing Had he gotten pretty straight? At no, no, no. He had just gotten out of prison. Oh. I, I would go down there every summer. And in 76, they came to his door one day, and they accused him of murder from the early 60s or something. Because uh, he used to come to California and pick up weed in a trailer and bury it under the trailer and bring his kids with him. And he'd right. just have his kids and the wife, like they were cooking hot dogs, the all-American Cuban family, wow. you know? And he would have weed buried under the, the truck and he'd go to Miami and New York. When we was a kid, they'd visit us in New York every summer. That's what they were doing. Right. They were bringing weed. Like in December, they would come to New York and in July, we would go down there. 
Wow. So it was that tight of a family. I think everyone should rethink when their family comes to visit what the real reason for oh, the visit is. Oh, this is the real reason. <laughs> you know, I could tell him and my mom and my dad would stay up for a day. So I knew they were partying. Right. You know? Vivian always had the kids. But in 76, they accused him of murder or whatever. He had a long trial. And it was weird because that's why I never understood drug dealing and that stuff. Because at his peak of his life, at 50 fucking six, they come knock on your door for something you did when you were 35. And he had to give up everything. And go to a federal prison in Atlanta. And he was there. And while he did that, his family had to move into a two-bedroom fucking apartment. Right. And, like, live off nothing. And then he got out of jail. He did some more shit. He was right back in business. And I went down there to visit him in 84. But 84 was the height of cocaine. So I would lie. I would tell him that I was coming down to visit him. But what I was really doing would bring the coke back to well, New York. Well, it's full circle at that point. And he found out. And he was oh, really yeah. hurt. He was like, I can't believe you would do that. He goes, and besides, I have it here. You know, right. like he was really pissed. He's like, you're doing that. Besides, I have the coke here in my house. You're not even helping me. Like, if you were saying to me, listen, I got a connection in the East Coast. He goes, you cut me out. Like, he was really hurt. It's yeah. a really weird story. And I called him after Eric, Hurricane Andrew in 91 and told him that I named my daughter after his daughter. And he wasn't buying it. And the next thing I know, he died. So I never really had my... Uh... Right. And his wife was really upset with me. I think Vivian... Because his wife really thought I could be an attorney. She was pushing me to be like a smart guy. You right. Know? You are a smart guy, Joey. Yeah, I know. But fuck <laughs> like that. I didn't think I was book smart like that. The daughter was brilliant. She played the piano. And the kid had some problems, but I guess he's got it together now. I've I've befriended them on, on Facebook. But I think that that life was too hard. Like they, My mother was Jacqueline's godmother. And when you're Cuban and when you're Catholic, that's really big. That means right. that if anything should happen to that person, you take over, no questions asked. You, you have to pick that kid up. And like, she would come and spend summers. She was pretty hot, too. But I could see in her note that she wrote back to me that we were done. Like, yeah. they didn't want to really even... That was a hard part for them. Oh, I'm sure. You know, I'm they sure. came from this decent family. And meanwhile, their father was fucking shooting yeah. people and selling drugs. And, I'm but it sure. was really interesting, my summers down there. But it's so weird how I see my life now sometimes. Yeah. And, I, and I actually shake when I think of those times. And it's like, oh, my God. You know, one time we robbed this house and the lady had a Siamese cat. This is my first experience with cats. What's that? Oh, really? And this was, we used to go to this drug dealer's house, this Colombian lady. Right. Was, this is 82, guys. Scarface hadn't even fucking come out. Yeah. And in Union City, there's a lot of Colombians. And this chick was big. She always dressed in white. Instead, instead of having, I thought she had like a parrot. She had a parrot in the living room. But in the <laughs> bedroom, you'd have to go over, give her the drug, give her the money, and she'd go in the bedroom. We always thought that she'd weigh it up in the bedroom. Right. She'd never open up the door or leave the door open. We'd never seen what her bedroom was. Right. So she jacked this once on an eight ball. So me and like two buddies went down there, and we made my one buddy go up there. He's like, I don't like to climb. We put a gun in his back. We go, fucking climb up there. So he goes in. <laughs> The reason why, the reason why, <laughs> the, the reason why she wouldn't open the doors because she had one of those skinny Siamese cats, the skinny fucking right. Egyptian looking ones. Right. That was violent. Yeah. So we're like, Mike, Mike, what's going on up there? And all of a sudden you hear, wow, wow, wow. And he's like, I got a cat on top of me. And I'll never forget, he comes to the balcony to look over and the cat's <laughs> on his head and there's two claws pulling his eye up. Like this, and he's and he's like, I'm coming down, and he's trying to pull the cat off his head, like he's got the cat right, by the neck, right. and we're like, don't fucking come down, don't come down without the coke. <laughs> he had to go back in with the cat on his head. He punched the cat or he did whatever. He threw like a bag of coke and a bunch of jewelry, and he tried to hook his leg over again as he's coming out. You see the cat fly out of nowhere and grab him again, and we're down there. Don't fucking come down. We came down, we robbed the fucking house, whatever. But the story was till this day, Mike, my buddy, who's like my brother. He still has one of the cat claws in his fucking head because he really? didn't want to go to the hospital because he thought that they would have like fingerprints like the cat. Right. You know, like instead of getting shot, he had a claw in him. You know what I'm saying? Let's do his DNA so, match. So till this day, like if you feel over here, yeah. there's like a little lump. By now, the nail probably disintegrated, yeah. but just the, the skin puncture right, must right. have swelled. He always like, whenever we're like, let me touch you, he's like, fuck you, cocksucker. <laughs> It was your fault that cat fucking attacked me. You didn't tell me he was up there. I would have brought cat litter. You know what I'm saying? Oh, shit. That is awesome. Wow. Aren't you lucky to be listening to Joey Diaz oh, and his my. wonderful stories? And then after we robbed that house, like she was connected big time. So one night, this is 80, this is three years later, I had gone to Colorado. I forgot all about we robbed this lady. So I get, I'm leaving for Colorado. I'm going to, I had my mind made up. I was going to Colorado Springs. It was the number one growing city. It's June. 
30th in 1985. I had already lived in Aspen. Oh, I'm going back to Colorado. It was a mess by then, Colorado Springs. It was a Don't mess. get me started on Colorado Springs. It was Springs. a fucking mess. Yeah. And I get to this bar. It's my last night. I'm at the spot in Union City. I'm having a great time. I'm doing powder. I got this Asian credit card. I'm using it. I'm buying gold and shit. And all of a sudden, a body of mine from years earlier comes over. He's like, how are you doing? He goes, can I talk to you on the side? He goes, listen, man. That lady sent out like 10 guys looking for you. They know you're in town. They've been looking for you for two fucking weeks. They just haven't found you. They're going to shoot you. This is what I got the <laughs> night before I left right. town. Like, I'm like, yeah. what? And they're like, yeah, she's going to shoot you. I go, fuck that. I'm with like three, and I'm with three friends. I go, you know what? They come into Union City. Let's get the fuck out. I want my friends to get shot because of me, you know? Right. But three years later, this lady, and I didn't even know she knew it was us, but she had figured it out some way or the other. Yeah. So life wow. is a motherfucker. Wow. Yeah, you always got to be, uh, it's like uh, the <sighs> Austin Powers movies when they always have a cat or, you know what I mean, in the James Bond movies. Yeah, but we didn't cat. know she had the yeah, fucking cat. That the was the secret. She was like the guy in the end of the dragon. <laughs> that was the secret. He didn't have a hand. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Same thing. She didn't let us know fucking leopard, the, co the cat was in the room. Oh, Listen, I know, yeah. Those that criminal stories are fucking crazy. Charm. When my mother died, she had, my mom was a collector of really gaudy gold jewelry. We were Cubans, you know, and drug dealers, so my mom had all the gaudy shit. So she was a gambler. And when she lost the bar, her daily income, and the numbers, the PIX3 systems came, and my, mo my mother's primary business was numbers, which is a, a way of gambling in New York. It's the last three numbers of what the track makes, so you can't fix it, you know. Whatever the track makes that day, they take the last three numbers. And, and then the, the, the late 70s, picket came, so the numbers business shrunk down, too. So my mom was hurting. You know, my mom died. They added her pawn tickets. She had $220,000 in jewelry to pawn shop. Wow. And my father took it out. He was pissed. I remember after my mom died, like two weeks later, we were driving all around New York to the different pawn shops. She had stacks of those tickets. Wow. And he took all that jewelry, and I guess he melted it down or whatever, or whatever the fuck he did with it. Diamonds, my father's real jewelry, $225,000 <laughs> wow. in pawn. Wow. And she probably lost it all on the fucking Mets. Right. <laughs> Tom Seaver and the fucking Mets. That's a true story. My mom was a degenerate fucking wow. gambler. Degenerate. Three wow. tracks a day we would hit. Yeah. My mom could hit the number for $20,000 and the next day be broke. Well, how do you feel about it now, though? Do you have, like, a negative feeling towards that your mom uh, was was someone that did that? Or or is it... Oh, is it I have a Do you certain look at it with any mom. kind of warmth, you know what I mean? Like, no, the wall that could have been my money, you know, and I don't think of it that way. I think of it as uh, my mom lived her life a, a real w weird way. If I was a millionaire, I lived my life how my mother lived it. If my mom got a million dollars, a half a million she'd give away. Honest to God. To people who she'd make mental notes that she'd seen, mm -hmm. like doing something that Normal people shouldn't do, like, if she found out Felicia had a night job and had two kids, she'd come to you one day and go, don't say nothing to nobody. Here's 20000 Don't tell nobody. This is between me and you. I don't want it back. Get your fucking shit together. Right. That was what my mother did a lot. You know, she'd go over and just, and the other half, she'd blow in a fucking hour. An hour. When I talk to you about go to a best steakhouse, get steaks, I mean, my mom lived like a fucking Puerto Rican. Steaks, even if she didn't know, you give them a steak. Right. Give him a fucking beer. Give him a steak too. Give him a beer, and that's what my that's how my mother dropped money. Whatever you know. Sometimes your kids come up to you and break your balls, mommy. If I get an A, can I get that special thing? All my mom would have to hear that, and once she hit the number, she would call me and go, "Hey, I'm coming home. I'm gonna give you that money you want for the fucking thing. Don't bother me for another month." Right. And I would say, "But you said it was for my report card. Forget it. Just get it now. And make sure you bring me home A's." Right. My mother would spend her money in one day, and she lived. By the fucking nickel. One day she had it, and one day she didn't. If we didn't have it, we got to make a stop at the pawn shop. Right. You know, we got to make a stop at the pawn shop and pick up some cash. And it was just a way of life for her. It was just right. a way. It was just a cost of doing business. But right after the longest yard, I went to Beaumont, Texas, which is next to Houston. I would go to Houston, one of my favorite spots, and I would go to Beaumont. This was about five years ago. This is what was weird. And I went down there, and I was deep in the, in the coke thing. I was deep in it. I went on the road just to get high in a hotel room. Whether there was somebody there or not, I couldn't even care. I was with Terry. You know, Terry lived here, and I was with her here during the week. I couldn't do anything. So when I went on the road, it was to lose my fucking mind. So I go to Beaumont, 
and I'm headed to Houston the following week. And I go to Beaumont, the home of Janice Joplin. Janice Joplin. They have okay. the they have the Beaumont and in, in Beaumont they have the, the Janice Joplin Museum. It's like a pair of underwears and a syringe. It's the fucking, <laughs> it's the smallest museum you've ever seen in your life. It is. A, I went there with Tom Rhodes. Oh, you it, when you go to when you go to Beaumont, you go to this right, place, right. and they have great food. Well, anyway, this club in Beaumont, the the guy Slade, who's a good friend of mine, he has a brother who's a white rapper in Beaumont, Texas, which is right next, like the home of the Ku Klux Klan. Like, there's a town behind Beaumont. They hate everybody. They even hate white people. Right. You understand me? They hate each other. They sit at the table, fuck you, and it's just crazy. So I go to Beaumont, and I'm looking for powder, and the kid says to me, "I got no powder for you, but I got Valiums." And I go, I don't need Valiums. But I go, you know what? I know people who do. You know, just give me 30 of them. So I figure I'll, take, I'll bring them back to L.A. Right. So the first night you pop one, you go back to your room, you sleep like a baby. It was Thursday night. I had 30 of them. Friday <laughs> morning, I pop like one in the daytime. I'm like, this is great. And I smoked a joint. And I was high all day. So that night I go to the club and I pop one. I get some powder. I start pumping powder. The second show, I eat like two more, three more. After the show, I go back to the room. Some bro, huh, I did two more fucking bumps, three more of those things. I gave her two. I ate two more, whatever. I pass out Saturday. I get up and the bag still has some in the bottom, right? Right. So I get up. I have one in the afternoon. <laughs> get to calm me down. And now what people don't know when you eat Valiums, let's say you eat a 10 milligram Valium, 5% of that or 50% of that goes into fat and it gets stored. Your body doesn't need that much Valium. So that next day when you wake up and hit a joint, it kicks right in. Yeah. The Valium sits, sits in your system. It sits in your fat. That's why even if you take it at night, the next day, you're a little sluggish. It's like taking uh, Tylenol PMs. You always wake up a little fucked up right. you know, in the morning. So again, I go out, boom, and it's a big night. It's Saturday night. I'm going to get paid. I'm getting fucking an eight ball. I start popping these Valiums and drinking Jägermeister. Oh, Pop no. Popping Valiums and drinking Jägermeister. Then one of the waitresses at the end, like, I heard stories that I was laying down on stage doing the comedy and sitting <laughs> down, you know. I, I got the money. Oh, yeah, I was laying down on stage doing comedy. That's always the worst when you hear stories and, oh, you, and you're in the story, but oh, you weren't there. You weren't there. And I remember, like, I remember going back to the hotel room and this girl came back and we did a couple bumps. And then she laughed at something and I kept popping those Valiums and that three... I remember calling the Coke dealer, and he drove me to some part in Beaumont to get this Coke, and it was just fucking scary. But the Coke was off the chain. It was like these three Mexicans, and they had shotguns and cowboy hats and those cowboy boots. But the Coke was tremendous. I went back to the room, and I finished the three grams or whatever, and I did the rest of those Valiums. And I remember that I was leaving the next morning. They were to give me a wake-up call, and I'm like, it ain't happening. I hung, and I slept from Sunday at 9 in the morning. And I woke up Monday at 3 in the afternoon. And the phone was ringing. You know, people looking for me. Where are you? You're supposed to be in L.A. And I remember getting up and calling Terry. And my mouth was still crooked. Like I was Ew. still flurring from the volume. Oh, and Terry's no. like, what's the matter? I'm like, nothing. I just don't feel good. <laughs> and I had my buddy pick me up in Houston, take me to a hotel in Houston on Monday. I got there about 4. We ate something. I puked. I went back to sleep and I slept till fucking Wednesday. Aww. That's how much Valium I had in my. That's a hangover right there. Believe it or not, I was a really good student. Really? Yeah, I was really good. I had good grades because I always knew that if you paid attention and made little notes in class, it would make it easier. Then after like fourth or fifth grade, like I hated those uh, end of the quarter things. So I always knew that if you reviewed your stuff every night before you went right. to bed, it would be a lot easier. You know, for the oh, quarter. Wow. So I used to do all that type of stuff because I did enjoy the social aspect of it. I did enjoy the social life of it. So I knew that to keep continue the social life, I had to keep getting grades, good grades. You know, oh, wow. like if I didn't go to school because I was sick, I wasn't allowed to go out of the house. Oh really? I grew up in one of those homes. Like if you're too sick to fucking go to school, then you're too sick to play baseball at oh. three. Yeah, but my belly hurt at nine. It didn't hurt at three. Fuck it. Yeah. You stayed home from school, but it was so weird as I got older. And my mom got lenient. Like, I was telling you a story. that I got left back in the sixth grade. You did? And my parents never knew. Shut up. <laughs> my <laughs> mom never knew. And that's why I always knew something was going to happen. That's why when she died, I was like, whew, I got that off my fucking chest. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> because what happened was I, I had good grades, but I had failed geography. Like, right. world geography. Like, who gives a fuck where Uganda is? You know what I'm saying? Like, I just couldn't translate that in the sixth grade. So they sent me to summer school. But I had this little girlfriend named Nikki Ariza. 
and we used to dry hump every fucking day. And I knew she was just about ready to give it to me, so I was on top of it. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. I had a dry humper every day to get this thing. And I would go to summer <laughs> school. How fucking crazy is this? Even in the sixth grade. Dry humping, by the way, is awesome. It's awesome. It really right? gets you going if you point your helmet yeah. in the right way. Like, if you point your dick in the right direction going up, it makes it kind of like... I like a, a weird type of thing. I We'd, still like to dry hump. Yeah, every once in a while. Gets the party started in the right uh, the right moment. I put on <laughs> Earth, Wind, and Fire, Can't Hide Love. We put the whole album on. Uh, that's the way of the world. We put the whole album on. It, w- once it was finished, we go downstairs and drink some orange juice. Then we go back up and do some more high dr- dry humping. It was fucking nuts. Wow. And I didn't go to I, I was like I would go to her house in the mornings and try to dry hump her. And then I would go to school and then come right back. I mean, it was like I was fucking addicted to dry humping. Yeah. So I'm in summer school, and they're talking about Uganda and Israel and all this shit. And I'm like, all I'm thinking about is dry humping. Right. So finally, See, all they had to do is say, in Uganda, the percentage of males that dry hump, and you would have been like, Fuck what? Fuck yeah, I want to go what? there. <laughs> so I want to go there. So it was weird. After the sixth grade, for two years, I used to make my own report cards. So I'd have to steal a report card and then take my grades that were good and print them onto the other report card. And then give them to my mom. <laughs> it was fucking just amazing shop work. And this is before the computer. I was pretty good at oh, all these wow. forgings and shit like that. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was fucked up. Because my stepdad. So your penmanship must have been really Tremendous. Yeah, my, okay. well, except for the book I made for you. The, the, my stepdad really wasn't into it. Like, you know, they weren't into going like to school events. And neither was my mom. But I kept her at arm's distance from school. You know, I would always say, ah, you don't have to go in for PTA shit. I would never. My mother never went in. Only one time. My my uh, the teacher in the sixth grade, Mr. King, will tell me to br- bring my mom in. So I paid a guy at my mom's bar to say he was my brother and that my mother couldn't come in because she was sick. So I paid this guy <laughs> to come in. Well, at the end of the year, the guy says to me, hey, bitch, bring your mother in. This time, not your brother. So the whole meeting, I'm like, please, don't say that my brother came in. Please, don't say that my brother came oh, in. And well, no. The meeting was almost over. We didn't even talk about being left back, nothing. And just about ready to leave, Mr. Kingwell goes, oh, by the way, I met your other son. Real interesting guy, nice guy. My son's, my wife, my mom's like, other son? I don't have no other son. And I, my face turned red, and my mom gave me a backhand right fucking there. Oh. But my mom never found out I got left back. Like in the eighth grade, she kept saying to me, when is your graduation? And I kept saying, oh, they pushed it back. Because my seventh grade year was the year it snowed a lot in New York. Right. So I kept saying, they pushed it back, they pushed it back. I'm not going to go. And she was like, okay. And then my real eighth grade graduation, I couldn't really go because I had nobody coming. Right. So I ended up going to five star <laughs> basketball camp, and that was the end of that. Yeah. It was fucking amazing. I mean, she didn't know for years, but I always maintained great grades. And even in high school, you know, I quit high school for like four months. You did? In my senior year because I had a job. I had nobody at home to s- support me, so I had to support myself. Right. So I said, fuck it, I got a job loading trucks. It was like 600 a week. And, I think and for, were you a pretty buff guy at that time? Like, well, I was a, a strong kid. Yeah, you were pretty strong, strong right? And I had to uh, get a job, and I remember I went and did that for like three months, and my friend's dad talked me into going back. He was a football coach because you're not eligible to play football, but let's get you back and let's get you great. Then I, gra- I went all the way to the fucking end of high school, senior year. I was right there, and this lady didn't like me, Mrs. Farley, and she said, we did a count of all your credits, and you have 99 credits. So you're a credit short from graduating. And I was like, you're fucking sick. kidding me, aren't you? So they were going to make me go to summer school my senior year. Uh. But if I look closely, uh, if you play football for three credits or some three years, you get a credit. Oh, nice. So they gave me a credit, and boom, I graduated. I never had Good. to deal with that shit again. And then I went to college, believe it or fucking not. I went you were college. saying that. I yeah. went to fucking college. Yeah. And I remember robbing houses at night and going, bro, I got to get back and do homework. I got to go back and do a term paper. And I'd be robbing a fucking house. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'd be selling an ounce of Coke in Colorado. I'm like, hold on. I, got, I can't be there from 8 to 10. Why not, man? Because I got class tonight. So somebody emailed me and said they want to know the first time I burglarized the home. Was it out of necessity? Was it out of desperation? Was it out of addiction? The first time I burglarized the house, I was like in the eighth grade. But it wasn't a burglary. Some people were moving across the street from my house. Already smells like burglary, my friend. Okay, you be the judge. (laughs) Some people were moving across the street from my house, and they left the door open. And we used to walk through the woods through their yard. And one Uh day we said that their screen door was open. There's all this shit in the living room. So like four of us went in there, and I took the stereo, and somebody else took like a poster. But it just so happened that the kid that moved into that house was real cool. 
And I had his fucking stereo in my room <laughs> with four speakers. I had the eight track, the cassette, the fucking, you know. <laughs> So every time I'd have parties, I couldn't invite the kid over. He's like, you're having a party? Or if, well, if you come over to my house, I couldn't bring him to my room. Like I would, And people would say, why can't I go to your room? Ah, it's dirty. But it was because I had the kid's fucking stereo <laughs> in my room. How embarrassing is that? And then he moved right away. They, they didn't own the house. They rented it. But that's the first time I burglarized the home. And it was not a necessity. It was out of, of being a stupid kid. Tomorrow is 28 days from the biggest heist I ever did in my life. Like, Mike, if you go back to my hometown and go Coco Diaz, they'll say Michael's Jewelers. Tell us. When I was in high school, I used to go to this jewelry store on Bergen Line Avenue. It was called Michael's Jewelers. Uh -huh. And they had... You can't get in trouble for sharing these stories. No, it's 28 you? years later. Okay. The statute of limitations. Okay. Okay. They collected the insurance <laughs> money. <laughs> they were one of the only jewelry stores that didn't have a buzzer at the door. You just opened the door and went in. Michael's right. Jewelers. And they had three old ladies that worked there. And it was weird. When you ask them for something, like, I want to see that ring. They give you the whole tray of rings and turn their back on you. And they'd have doubles in the ring. So I would take one ring and put it in my sweat sock and give it to my little high school sweetheart. So she every week I'd go to Michael's Jewelers because we always went to Burger Line <laughs> on Saturdays. We'd go to Levy's, right. the sporting goods, and we'd get books and karate stuff. And let's go to Michael's. i got to pick up a fucking ring for Mama. And I'd go in there, get a ring, boom, clip a ring. They had cameras in there and everything. Every week I'd clip a ring, clip a ring, clip a ring. This started like in 1980. Right. Now, now it's June uh, of 82. We're eating Cuban food, me and three other gorillas. By that time, I'm hanging out with junior gangsters and all this shit. And I go, let's go to Michael's. I had a football shirt on, like a big bulky shirt. We had just graduated high school. I go, let's go to Michael's. And I go to Michael's, and the lady again leaves 30 engagement rings. Big fucking rocks engagement rings on this thing. Like, uh, And I know it was 30 because I picked the thing up and put it under my shirt and walked out of the the thing with it and then we went to my buddy's house who was a fence and I got like $600 per ring he robbed us because those were eat all those diamonds were at least fucking two three grand now in hindsight but when they give you $600 times 30 and you're, wow. and you're 18 and you got 10 buddies with you and we're gonna go do coke so that was the first time I robbed them but when I robbed them that time for the big loot I realized that they had a thing that was like three feet tall and it was a case and it was on top of the counter and it had gold chains on the top and bracelets on the bottom. And there was just a little string connected to it. And it was for the plug <laughs> and the light. So they could plug it in, the thing would right. spin around. Okay, yeah. So all summer long, that was, if we ever get in trouble, we know we got the fucking big chain jewelry from Michaels. We know it. We, uh, so sure enough, I go to college for a semester. This is my friend. <laughs> I go to Glassboro State. And after three weeks, I'm bored in Philadelphia, which Philly was crazy at that time. I come back up north, and my buddy says, hey, bro, stay till Tuesday. You know, stay till Wednesday or something. I didn't have classes till Tuesday or something. I was working on a roof or something. And uh, he goes, you know, let's put some bets in on Monday night. So we all pulled together, all these kids, six kids I hung out with. We put like $10,000 on Pittsburgh on a Monday night. And we put it in with my high school football coach. He was a bookie part-time. So we put the, <laughs> we put the we, he was the running back coach, George McGrath. He used to smoke camel cigarettes. So we used to call him Camel Breath. He had a mustache that drooped over his lips, uh, and it was orange. Uh, and he had fingers that were orange. Uh, so Oh, no. Oh, yeah. He, oh, but he was great. Camel yeah. Breath was great. George McGrath, I don't want your George McGrath. That was his name. So uh, we put the bet in with him, and we lost. I love George. It's like me going to Felicia. Felicia, I'm going to buy another $3,000 to give it to you Friday. I know you have kids. You give it to me. I got to get it back to you. This is my friend. Even at that age, I knew this guy was going to fucking get killed over this $10,000. What are we going to do? So I had the friend Stinky. His name was Glenn Conte. He's a big shot at UPS now. So me and Stinky were partners and everything. If we sold drugs, we were always partners. I go to get Coke and I give him ups and we were partners on it. So I'd sell Coke and he'd sell the ups. Anyway. We go to we planned it out. We were gonna go and pick this fucking thing up and run out of there with it. At the that, jewelry store. At the jewelry the, the store. That was our display plan. Display case. That was our plan. I went to my attorney buddy. I asked him what happened if we got caught. It was gonna be grand larceny because there was a ton. He went down there and looked at. It. He's like, Joey, there's a ton of fucking jewelry in there. You're gonna go to jail for a long fucking time. Oh, the attorney went down and looked. My at attorney. It. He was a friend of mine that was right. an attorney, a little <laughs> older. Oh yeah, I had an attorney because you gotta ask him. That's what real people do. Hey, if I'm gonna move drugs, what's the easiest way? And they'll tell yeah, you. So you're right. in the, the thing. So he goes, if you take it, it's gonna be grand larceny. It's 25 fucking years. You know, think about it. And I said, fuck it, they're not gonna catch us. There was a lot next to it that was abandoned. So our plan was, Stinky was gonna hold the door. I was gonna go in, pick up the thing, run out with it. He was gonna jump the fence. I was gonna throw it over the fence to Stinky. He was gonna run up the hill with it. 
And then I was going to meet him on top of the hill. He was going to throw it over the fence to me. We were going to get over. And we had our brother, our buddy driving, uh, Hammerhead, uh, Marblehead, Timmy Holloway, right? And Marblehead, we just because he got hit in the head of a bottle one time and nothing happened to him. So we called him <laughs> Marblehead. So it's on. We're doing it on Thursday morning at fucking 9.30 when it opens. We get down. I still remember the sun, how powerful it was. It was the fall. It was September 25th. And sure enough, it was like clockwork. There's two old ladies working. Stinky opens the door. I run in. I ask her to pick up jewelry. She says, let me go in the back and check. I pick up the gold thing, run out. Stinky jumps the fence. I throw it over, give it to Stinky. When I run to the top, I come over. There's Stinky. Jump the fence with like three gold chains. And he goes, the thing fell and it broke. I go, are you fucking serious? And I got to jump the fence. I pick everything up. I can see the ladies on the bottom going, come back. We call the police. And I could hear the sirens. Oh so I go, Stinky, God. get over the fucking fence. He jumps over the fence. I start throwing jewelry to him. Bracelets, jewelry. I mean, this is going on. Half the case, I put all the jewelry in the, the plastic case. Half of it was broken. And I climbed over the fence with it. We got in the fucking car. And I put it. And we couldn't pop the trunk open. We couldn't <laughs> pop the trunk. I'm like, oh. fucking pop the trunk open. Pop the trunk open. The trunk wouldn't pop. So sure enough, I get into the back seat, sneaking into the passenger seat. I throw all the jewelry down. You couldn't even see my feet. In the back seat. That's how much gold. It was up to my <laughs> knees. It was like one of those um, Herman Munster treasures that he finds right, with gold right, and coins right. and shit. We're back there going, holy shit. All of a sudden, we pull out of there, we make a right. And at the first light, cops are coming towards us with cop, with lights, two cop cars. And we're like, we're dead. Stay right here, Timmy. Don't move. And the cop cars went right. The cops stopped at the light because we were opposite them. Right. They to, they're trying to get around the people. And as the cops are getting around us, our trunk goes, boop. And opens up all of a sudden. And I remember that the cop made like a mental note. He looked at the fucking trunk and kept going. I go, we got to go. This guy's going to turn around. So we went back to our, we had like a little stash pad where we would meet and we divvied it up. <laughs> and then I, uh, I sold jewelry like we had these parties at people's house. Like we'd get black velvet and we'd go to people's houses and mobsters. <laughs> and we'd be there strapped with gold on like Mr. T selling braces to people's mothers. We were oh taking the gold God. to our friends' mothers' houses. And they're like, where'd you get this? Oh, we, we found it. And the braces still had the tags on them. So let's say a tag was $900. We'd sell it. We'd split it in half and take another 100 off. Wow. So by the end of the week, we had like 20 fucking large, and we still had all the jewelry left. So what happened was they did have a camera. And one day, I go to a bar, and I'm drinking, and this principal comes in, Ray Dalton, who was cool as shit, and he comes up to me. He goes, dog, can I talk to you in the back? He goes, cops came looking for you at the high school the other day. They came looking for you as Coco. They got your picture. He goes, I tried to tell him Coco Dempsey, Coco Espinosa, but no, they knew it was Coco Diaz. They're coming to arrest you, blah, blah, blah. That's all I needed to do. I took the rest of the gold, sold it, we got it melted, and I took my money and went on a lamb at Sarasota, Florida, <laughs> where boredom was invented. You know what I'm saying? That in Delaware is like the most boring spot in the fucking world. And I sat there for a month, and I missed my friends. Sarasota, I, I was down there with this kid, Gary Hartman from North Bergen. His parents worked for NASA. So I was down there hiding with him, and it was just boring. All he did was lift weights, and oh, I went to see sure. the Road Warrior 18 times in a month. And So I went back home, and I was scared they were going to arrest me. And I bumped into this kid, Mike Denny, who we used to call the devil as a kid because he looked just like the devil. He was short, and he had a big head. And he goes, can I talk to you for a second? I go, what? He goes, bro, the cops aren't going to arrest you. I go, come on. You don't have to. He goes, I don't have to because I was going to leave like a week later. And right. he goes, you don't have to leave. The cops aren't going to arrest you. He goes, my daughter dates that guy. My uh, sister dates him. Right. And this is what happened. When the cops were looking for you, if they arrest you and they press charges, then you have to repay the people. You have to pay them back. What are you going to pay them? Five dollars a week? Well, if they don't arrest you, they get insurance. Oh. So he contacted the cops and said, don't arrest him because he was a dirty guy, Michael. Yeah. He was like a half a gangster. And uh, the cops never arrested me and he got wow. the insurance money. And then that was 82. And in 85, I was at a gas station, fucked up. I walk out of this gas station. It's the holidays. Like uh, It was 84, and I'm walking out of this gas station. This guy goes, psst, and I look, and I go, excuse me? And he goes, Michael's Jewelers, good to see you, Mr. Diaz. And he kept walking, <laughs> and that was it. That's my Michael's Jewelers story. So oh tomorrow is 28 fucking years to the day. Uh, I have never, I had never had a threesome. I had never really? even thought about it. Really? And I was in Miami, summer of 98 and 99. And in Miami at the time, they would book features for two-week slots. Uh -huh. Because why fly them down there for one week? There's nothing else going on, so they just book you for two weeks. And it was fun for me. At the time, I was a fucking addict in Miami, and I knew Colombians, and I had family down there. 
But uh, the, that's like the third time he kept booking me. He would book me and then call me like a month later and I'd go down and there'd be a cancellation. I ended up staying for three weeks. Joe Chadwick really liked me, the manager at the time. And Miami was in the Coconut Grove and there was chicks and shit. And this one night, this girl comes up to me after a show with a guy and she says, you're very funny, blah, blah, blah. You made me laugh, whatever. Two nights later, she's there again with another broad. Not a guy this time, with a broad. And they're talking to me, no, we came to see you again, oh my God. And this girl was pretty hot. She was like a... a, a what they call now a MILF. She was very professional and had glasses and blonde mm -hmm. hair and she had fake gorgeous tits and the whole package. And I didn't think nothing of it. I was not in her league, you know, whatever. So I'm talking about all drugs on stage, whatever, and sure enough, she's there with her fucking brother. It's the third time in a week. Right. It's Friday night now. It was a different headliner. So I go, do you come here often? She goes, I come here all the time, but I really like you and I really come to see you. When are you here again? I go, next week. Okay, I'll come again. Uh, guys, I don't think nothing of it. I'm not that type of person. I went home and did drugs, and I was happy anyway. Right. <laughs> that Monday or Tuesday is black night down there. It's urban night. Right. And I would, they would pay you to come in. I, I do the urban night. And when I get there, the girl goes, they call. Some people call to see if you were going to be on stage tonight. I go, really? That's fucking crazy. I get on stage. I get off. It's the chick. Hotter than hell. Mini skirt. Drinking this time. Glasses. Blonde hair. Hotter than fuck. And she's got this other chick that's just as fat as I am at the time. Right. Huge, you know, uh, just chunkier, but Cuban girl, whatever. And we start talking after the show, blah, blah, blah. And they start talking about Coke, if you want to go get it. And I go, yeah. And the one hot girl drove me, and the chubby girl was in the car behind us. Right. I'm, again, I'm not thinking. Hot girl always gets the lead car. I'm not thinking nothing of it. You know, right. I'm not thinking nothing of it. We're driving, blah, blah, blah. We go pick up the blow. We go to her house. She lives in a penthouse right off the beach in North Miami. Wow. And in her fucking, where we pull up, there's like three different cars. There's like a Mercedes and something else. Right. And, and I'm not looking at this. I think she's got a boyfriend. There's always a by the way. Right, right, yeah. We go upstairs. She's got the fucking refrigerator with that Dom Perignon in there. And we're fucking out there just drinking, drinking. Next thing you know, her and Chubby check this, start swapping spit. <laughs> right in fucking front of me. Start swapping spit. I'm coked up. I'm mummified. I'm in heaven. She's got coke everywhere. This chick had little <laughs> packages everywhere. <laughs> I'm in fucking heaven, and, and, and they swap and spit, and next thing you know, they disappear for like 10 minutes, and they come out into the living room, the chubby chick is completely naked, and the other chick's got a leather top, uh -huh. and no bottoms, right. beautiful body, and she's swapping spit, and they got dildos and all this shit, and I'm sitting Holy there, shit. I'm not even looking, I'm doing blow, because I think this is going to end, you know, they're going to think I'm throwing me out any minute now, I'm just a fat guy sweating here in the corner. <laughs> And I, and I know I got dead dick. You know, it's not going to work. So they, they, they got no use for me. I'm just sitting there fucking drooling on myself, watching Conan yeah, O'Brien. At this point, you're like, I'll have to use my nose. And they're like, oh, please. And they're like, get in on this. And I'm like, no, that's okay. Next time. You know, like, so somebody's like, are you hungry? I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not hungry. They're like, come on, take your clothes off. And I'm like, no. Really? Yeah, they're like, come on, get in on this. But the hot, hot girl had a problem. She had a string coming out. She had a period. Which really made me no reason to get in there now. Right, I'm like, what am I right. gonna do? I got dead dick. What am I gonna do? Swap spit with this fucking cocaine, Budweiser breath? Right. You know? I'm like, no. And she's like, come on, you better get in here. So they come over and they take my shirt off, and I'm fucking dying inside. I'm embarrassed. I'm dying. I haven't taken a shower, you know, like since eight o'clock. So I did a right, show, and my right. balls are sweaty, and I'm all panicking. <laughs> oh, no. And next thing you know, I'm in there with both of these chicks swapping spit. They're trying to get my dick hard. And I am dying inside. I'm starting to like it. But the chick that I really want to bang yeah. has got a period. And she's like, you know, doing all this shit with her tits and stuff. The other one's like, get a condom on. The chubby one. And I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> so I go in. I'm trying to put this condom on this dead Cuban uncircumcised dick. Oh, it was no. basically like... By that point, it was just With a... holes on the top of it. Oh, yeah. By that point, no, no. By that point, the fucking turtleneck had gone in. The, the turtle head right. had gone in. The only thing that was out was the flap, the, the skin. Oh, my so I had God. to put the condom over the flap. They're trying to get it hard. I'm trying oh, to get it hard God. in my mind. I can't do it. I'm going through condoms because I'm getting like half a fucking load. And like it would get, my dick would get hard and it would just go, and a little bit of cum would come on. They'd just look at me like, what's up, chubby? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, listen, let me go take a shower. 
because I'm sweaty and I'm, I'm insecure right now. Can I go take a shower? And they're like, fine. I'm doing blow. I go in the shower. And I'm, what I'm in there doing is washing my pussy and trying to get my dick hard. I'm fucking doing everything. I'm <laughs> fantasizing. I'm thinking of fucking old scenarios. And finally, I get it halfway hard and I run out of there. And I go out to the chubby chick is waiting for me. And again, it just fucking dies. And finally, the two chicks go in the bedroom and I'm out there like a coke fiend that I am, just doing their blow, it, the, the sun's coming up. The chubby chick comes up about like six, she walks out of the room and she's like, I have to go to work, I'm a school teacher. <laughs> and I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> and she goes, it was great, we had a great time. Like two hours ago, she was hating on me because right. I couldn't get dead dick. So I knew something was going on. So now is my chance with the hot chick. Fuck it, I'm going to go eat that period pussy. I'm coked up, I'm evil. Oh, you know God. what I'm saying? You're getting all evil and shit, and your jaw's going... I go in there and I start to bang her. Like, I finally get a heart on and I put the condom on and she's hot. And Chubby Checker walks back and starts yelling at me. You motherfucker. I fucking knew you didn't want to fuck me. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so then she throws her out of the house and I, I went past out to like one of the girls drives me to the hotel or the condo where I was staying. And then she goes, I'll call you later. Sure enough, she calls later. She comes over and the whole week we had sex. Oh, she was really? very hot, very beautiful. I found out that her dad was the biggest distributor for Porsches in oh, the country, wow. in the world. Like, yeah. this guy, get, he gets Porsches for all those, those cars that they can't get, like they make 50 of. Right. He buys them, and then he sells them. Right. And this chick was just spoiled rotten. Her job was at the Audi dealership, right. one of his dealerships. So I'm there, I'm getting ready to leave Sunday night, and this night, the bitch shows up with an engagement ring on like a ring on the left hand. Right. And we go to the news cafe and we're eating. And she goes, listen, I got to tell you something. After today, it's over. In other words, you were my activity partner for the week. It's right. over. She goes, I'm getting married in two weeks. Get the fuck out of yeah, here. Yeah, she goes, I'm getting married to the right. weatherman on, in Miami. And I know, and everybody would talk about this The guy. weatherman. <laughs> she was marrying the fucking weatherman. But he, this is very interesting. Throughout this whole thing, like she was banging me that week. Guess who her booty call was? What? For years. I mean, I seen the pictures and everything. David Lee Roth. Oh, really? Was her when he went to Miami, he belonged to, like, they were like an item in Miami oh, for really? years. She showed me the magazine pictures. Pretty hot girl. And I called like a year afterwards. She was married and was pregnant. But it was amazing. She had drawers filled with those dildos. And, oh, really? And that was my one threesome story. It was the most embarrassing night of my life. Yeah. And then at the end, the girl broke my heart. I, I wasn't really in love with it. I knew what it was about. But it right. was kind of weird. Like, some people tell you something different. I don't like you. You're too fat. This, that. You don't have a job. But to say, oh, by the way. I, no, that, that's what she said. It. She goes, I wish you were here. Because we're having, like, a formal a week before. And I'd like for you to come. So wait a second. I had a threesome with you. And then fucked you all week. And now you want me to go to your formal, whatever, and meet your husband. Like, they're having, like, a, for people to meet the couple. I don't know. Oh they had a lot of money. God. So. But that's that my threesome crazy. story. Like for some people, Bruce Lee was just a movie guy. Like, oh, people went to see him. For me, he was everything at that time because I grew up with Bruce Lee. I still remember being in the fourth grade and sitting around. I was at Sacred Heart School for boys who had just taken a shower. And we would sit around and watch Happy Days. Happy Days had just come on. And we would sit around like from 8 to 10 and watch television. And I, I still remember Bruce Lee coming out for the commercial for the Chinese Connection. And him doing all these moves and me losing my mind and my parents picking me up on Thursday night and going, so this weekend we're going to the carnival and Saturday you're going to see your aunt. And I'm like, ah, we're going to start the weekend off with fucking Bruce Lee. C cancel awesome. all that. And awesome. it's just really weird that for some people, like I said, he's just an actor. For other people, he opened up a lot of doors. I was pretty fortunate in 95 to go to his grave Where is in, his Seattle. Grave? He, oh, in he's, Seattle. He was buried in the same cemetery as Jimi Hendrix. But then they moved Jimi Hendrix out because somebody had broken into his casket and they got too much traffic of Bruce Lee. Uh -huh. So it was funny. When I went to the Bruce Lee thing, when it's, I forget the name of the hill, where you're up in Seattle and you go to this hill and you pull over and people come right up to you and go, oh, you're looking for Bruce Lee's cemetery. Oh, yeah. It's pretty. <laughs> and when you get out of your car and you walk up to the cemetery, there's fucking letters everywhere on the really? floor. Like people write these letters and you pick them up and you read these letters and they're from all over the world. People had just been there that week. Or that day, wow. and they write all these letters, thank you, because of you, I got into martial arts, and, you know, I did this and this and this. But it's weird. Uh, last week, I had my, my buddy Jerry Roca, a great comedian, over for lunch. Jerry's an awesome guy. And uh, he's a, a TV comic book nerd, and he's seen that I had it, and he goes, let's watch it. So what I did was I just 
fast forwarded him and gave him a, a, a liner notes on the movie. And I showed him the scene when he goes, to, and the, this, the movie's about, he comes back from something and his teacher's dead. Blah. And yeah. he avenges his teacher. <laughs> right. Blah, that's it. But what nobody knew at the time was that Bruce Lee was very tight with Steve McQueen. And they both wanted what each other had. Bruce Lee didn't want to be a fucking, he wanted to be a, an international movie star. And Steve McQueen didn't want to act. He wanted to be a fucking tough guy. So it was two lost souls who were living through each other. And, and, and Steve McQueen would take him into the Hollywood Hills and ride, drive with him, doing 90 miles an hour up Mulholland and shit. And Bruce Lee would be scared of driving. It was just an amazing relationship. And then Bruce Lee got robbed from Kung Fu. They stole the idea from him. And uh, Raymond Chow approached him. And Raymond Chow said, do movies in China, you know, wherever they did them. They did them like in uh, the, the Philippines or Thailand, these low-rent movies that made fucking billions. And Fist of Fury was the first one, which is really a Chinese connection, but they changed the name in America. Right. Then Fist of Fury was the name of Chinese connection in China, but when it came to America, it was a Chinese connection. And like I said, in that movie, he goes and he avenges his teacher. But he, the way he does it, Felicia, he kills people and he hangs them for people to see him on display. Right. This is just crazy. He's just this ball of fucking heat in this movie. And, and there's one last scene where people always say, well, Enter the Dragons is the best fight scene. You better think twice before you say that. It's his best choreographed fight scene. But in, the, in Chinese Connection at the end, when he goes to the Japanese school and he tells him this line, he goes, this does not concern you. I'm allowing you to leave. It's like me coming to your right. house and going, listen, motherfucker, I'm allowing you to leave. And he throws a beating on, the, on this little kung fu school for a little karate school, like eight Japanese guys. Right. Then he steps out into the hallway and he fights these other two guys. Then he fights another five Chinese guys. Then he fights a Russian. Then he goes after the king Japanese guy. And the guy tries to kill him with a sword, and Bruce Lee has the new chucks. And then he goes back to the school, and he turns himself in. And at the end, this is what really gets you, that he makes the cops promise him that if he turns himself in for the lives that he took, that you won't mess with the school no more. So it's the last scene. He's walking out, and they open the doors. He's got no shirt on. He's fucking ballsy. I mean, there's one scene where the cop, the Chinese guy tells him, he promises him he won't touch him. And that's where you see his emotion. You really see this acting emotion. And when he walks out, there's all these cops with guns. And instead of going back in, Bruce Lee runs at him, and they shoot, and that's how the movie ends. So you never know if Bruce Lee's dead or alive. It just, it's, it's a mind-boggling movie. And I know that it affected me the way it affected other people because people still fucking talk about it. Right. I mean, it's just one of the best movies he did. And it's so weird that everybody always says, well, how did he die? You know, it was so mysterious. This is what happened. This is my take on it over the years. He was involved with this heroin deal in, in uh, China. The people who were doing his movies was, were heroin salesmen. What people don't know is the mafia concept isn't Italian. It's Chinese. It came from China, the triads. And that's who really enforces that type of behavior. So he was there to launder money. Then America came back to him. Warner Brothers and said, we want to do another movie. He came over to do Enter the Dragon. And all of a sudden, he mysteriously dies. He goes to some girl's house. He ate an aspirin. His brain swole up, and he died. 33 years old, right before the movie got released. Yeah. I mean, and it was just fucking amazing. I remember being a kid and seeing the casket, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and James Coburn and Steve McQueen were all his casket guys. And you're just dying inside. Like, that's one of the first deaths that really traumatized me as a child. It was fucking that real. And then yeah. the Dragon came out, and he became an international superstar. And now, you know, all this MMA and stuff, to me, it wouldn't. nothing would have came to fruition if it wasn't for him. Because yeah. that's what he did. Plus, he gave you this, he gave people a belief system. Very spiritual. What a lot of people don't know was he was Abi Ku. What's that? Abi Ku is something that it's really big in, in, a, in an African religion, the Spanish religion, is when you, ha you were going to have a child. And the child uh, is lost in childbirth or in death when he's one or two or three. And uh, people believe there's a belief system. Elvis was Abiku. He had a brother that died. Bruce Lee was Abiku. I'm an Abiku. It's when somebody is born and they die and you come afterward. And they say that your presence was so strong that you took that life. You needed that life to live. Oh. It's a very weird thing. And if you watch the beginning of The Dragon, his father was very superstitious. And his father tells him that when he was a kid, they used to dress him up as girls because the spirit wouldn't come from, it would confuse the spirit. Abiku will always come back and get you unless you do something. And some religions, some cultures know what to do 
Even when a woman has a lot of miscarriages, right. that means she's Abi cool. That's, a, that's an African word. That means that there's something not right, that you have to come to terms with something. You have to pay a debt from your previous life or something. Wow. Bruce Lee was Abi cool. Elvis was Abi cool. They all die. They, their head gets too, their, their strength is just too much. They can't, right. they can't live. Wow. And it's really weird. Uh, I didn't know that until I was about 10 about me that when I, when I was born, my father died. Right. And then they said that my mother would die. My mother died when she was 14. That I wasn't When you were 14. When my, yeah, when I was 14. It's really weird that when you're Abi cool, you have a lot of death around you because for you to live, you have to take other lives. Wow. And they said that you would never take your mother because she gave you life. So you take somebody else. So that's one thing about Bruce Lee that he knew this. He knew this. And if you read deep in his books and Enter the Dragon, it started coming back to him. He was blacking out a lot. He, he was lost. He wasn't connected. And then, doom, he died. Right. That's what a lot of people know. So it's a very wow. interesting story. I got a call from my family doctor uh, when I was growing up. Yeah. I had a family doctor. His name was Orlando Del Valle. Okay. <laughs> and when I was a kid and lived in New York City, he was friends with my real father from Cuba. So whenever I would get sick, I didn't have to go to the doctor's office. He would just make house calls. Okay. And he would come over and he would always take my temperature and all that shit and then say, we got to give you a needle. And as you know, I hate fucking needles. Right. So I'd be sitting there going, let me think about it. And he'd go around and, I, and, I, and I'd say, give me five minutes to think about it. And him, my mom, and whoever else is at the house would go out and have a few drinks and they'd do a couple lines. This would be in the afternoon, like my right. family doctor doing bump. And I never knew this at the time. <laughs> but he'd come back like five minutes later and his jaw would be going. Right. And I'd pull my mother aside. Why is his jaw going like that? And she'd say, oh, he's got a nervous condition. <laughs> by, the time, <laughs> by the time he would give me my needle, he would get fucked up because like, he would be there for an hour, but he didn't care on the house call because he was there drinking and snorting and smoking oh pot with my God. family and, and my mother's girlfriends. Like my mother always had a hot girlfriend over, so when guys would come over, they always die, you know. But I remembered him like always being so fucked up. And then as I got older, I kept going to him. I got I had this lung infection. I was thirteen. And he was my family doctor, and he come into my mother's bar. His office was on Thirty Fifth and Weehawken, and like, my mother's bar was on Twenty Ninth Street. And he'd always come in from there. And if you went to my house and opened up the refrigerator, we'd have like soda. But the top shelf was just penicillin bottles. Because he would just give me penicillin bottles to shoot me. Like Why? Because my mother would say he's sick. And he would go, I don't want to go over. Just shoot him with a needle. And I'll check it. So my mother would give me needles like well, whenever. maybe that's why you don't like needles. Oh, it was horrible. One time she gave me a needle in the restaurant. I was what? Go- One time I was going to Sacred Heart School for Boys. And we would go eat first as a family. And then she'd drop me off at the Catholic school. And I'll never forget this. And I got sick. And she kept saying, you got to take a needle before you fucking go back to school. And I'm like, are you crazy? She would carry the syringes and the penicillin <laughs> in her purse. Really? So she took me in the boys' bathroom, and I ran out of there. And I sat, I'll never forget the story. I sat down at the table, and it was a fancy restaurant we were eating. And I'm yelling at her, I'm not taking a needle. And I remember I, I wanted milk. With uh, My mother always used to make me drink milk because I was really skinny. And I hate milk. To this day, I don't drink milk. Only right. like a cereal with ice cream in it or something. And I go, I'm not fucking drinking that milk. Do you have quick? And they're like, we have no Nestle's quick. So the, the, the fucking guy put a scoop of ice cream on top of the milk instead of mixing it. Right. And I'm drinking it. And I'm not drinking this. And my mother took the fucking glass and poured it over my head at this thing. And she's like, <laughs> oh. you're fucking drinking that or you're going to wear it back to school. And she poured the milk. And I remember sitting there crying with a little top of ice oh. cream on my head with the oh. milk dripping off my face. And she oh. took me in the bathroom and she shot me in the ass with the needle. Oh, no. And I went back to fucking school and that was it. You know? Oh so, my God, this is a, a, a reveal. This You're is revealing a reveal. everything about why you don't like needles. So <laughs> I got older and I got to be 13 and 14. I'd still go to him. And I remember one time, like, I had a rash and I couldn't show my mom. And I went to him, like, it's just like a rash from VD. Like, I hadn't even even had sex, I think. Right. I think I had just swapped spit. And I'm like, is this a VD thing? And he's like, get the fuck out of my office. You got no VD. That's a little pussy rash, he would say. <laughs> that's a chocha rash, you know? Like, so as I got older, my mother died and I kept in touch with him and I would go see him. And then I would see him out in clubs. As I got older, I would see him, like, at Studio 54. Amazing! I would see him at Xenons in the city. Really? I would see him at all these big discos at the city, fucking whacked out of his mind. And he'd come up to me in Spanish and go, Que tiene para la cabeza? That means, what do you have for the head? I mean, what do you got for your head? You got a, a 
that joint. You know, he would come oh, up to me really? as I got older and go, what do you got for the head? And I'd say, aspirin. He'd go, oh, don't even tell me that. And he would walk away. Like, he thought I was holding, you know? Right. But then it was really funny because years later, his kids got older, and they stole his, you know, we were around the 80s, and they stole his prescriptions, and they were writing Valium prescriptions to all their friends, and right. he lost his medical license. Oh. But he's in Miami. He's about 81. Uh -huh. And he just called me, so it was 9 o'clock here. So he just called me. I go, what are you doing? He goes, what do you think I'm doing? I'm headed to the fucking bar. So he's wow. in Miami. He's 81 or something. He still drinks every fucking day. And it's just amazing that I just remembered that story. That's that he was, hilarious. He was my family fucking doctor, Orlando Doval. He had a daughter who was just hotter than shit, but I'm she wouldn't sure. even give me the time of fucking day when we were growing up. At all the functions, <laughs> she'd come over, and I'd be over there fucking rapping to her. I was in no danger. But that's weird. He's still alive. Yeah, I live in a little bit of a hell. Sometimes I'm standing, you know, sometimes I'm standing next to these celebrities who people know about or read about. I'm sitting there going, if this guy only knew that I used to break into houses or that I, you know, handcuff somebody or that I even lit a wig on fire or I beat Is up a nun. Is there one, uh, in, one person in, uh, that you think about that you have a lot of, that you kind of sweat over that maybe you scared the shit out of them or is there one person, person that you have? A lot of guilt over it. Something There's in particular. one particular family that it eats me alive because when I was a kid growing up in North Bergen, uh, we were in a band together. We had a lip syncing band, and I fired <laughs> him as the singer. We used to sing right. Michael Jackson songs and Beatles, and and we fired him as the, as the bass player. And he he was my friend. He, I would go to his house on Wednesdays and eat spaghetti, and I would let him ride my motorcycle. We were friends. And then one day a situation happened. My mom made me get into a fight with this kid that was older. And John was still hurt from the band, so John fought me. John was a great kid, and he came from a great family. And when my mom died, I, I, I had choices of where to live, but I went with them because they were very lenient on their kids. They were always out playing cards or, you know, bingo on the weekends. You could walk in whenever you want. Me and John had no curfew when we were kids. John could call me at 2 and go, come over. You know, so I moved in with him. And uh, the, the dad really loved me. The dad was a man's man. He was a Hoboken dude. He was Lithuanian. And he fucking loved me. I mean, I could do no wrong in his eyes, you know. But the mother fucking hated me because he was bringing a kid into their house. He felt, the mother felt that you're not even a fucking father to your kids. He was very cold and to the point with his kids. And I moved in with him, and he loved me. And she would say little things to him, like, keep your eye on him. This ain't right. And he right. would say, fuck it. He's a great kid, Coco, you know. And I, I, I got a job at Rendell Lumber, and I, and I robbed Rendell Lumber, who were friends of his. Like, I had a, a sheetrock scam that I would sell sheetrock out of there and sell plywood. And uh, he found out. You know, he found out about all these things. He was putting a roof on over my head. No rent, no Social Security from the government. He's just a guy. It's like you. One of your right. friends, one of your kid's mom's dies, friends. And you tell the kid, you're living in my house. Don't worry about money. This kid did all these things for me. And what did I do with it? Instead of working on my grades and stuff, I went out and stole and sold drugs and fucked around and took it for granted. Then in 81, I got into a problem with one of their other kids that was a cop. Me and him were kind of crazy together. And the uh, internal affairs was investigating him. And Miss Jimmy Bender had to come to me. I'll never forget. It was the day Reagan got shot, 81. And I'll never forget. He came to me. He goes, you got to leave my house. And he was crying while he told me. Uh. He was fucking crying. He goes, you got to leave my house. And he goes, I'll give you money to get set up, whatever you need, but you can't do this to my son. You know, he's a cop now. And, and it was really weird that I moved away and I kept in touch with him. And I would call him when I needed money and I would go down there. But the mother always hated me. The mother fucking hated me. So I took that hate from her and I did things to their family members that was kind of wrong growing up, you know? And when Mr. Bender's father died, I was out getting high, I was 82, and I called him, I go, I'm not gonna go to the wake, but I'm gonna go to the funeral. He goes, no problem. Well, I got fucked up that night, and then never went to the funeral, and I never spoke to him again from the shame. I just never called him again from the shame, and he died of cancer. Well, I was telling you that one time I was, a, I was in an American home, and it's in Idaho. It's part of Dave Tribble's Potato Run. Uh -huh. And it was like a Friday night. And uh, it's Friday and Saturday. It's a two-night run in Idaho. And it's this big base, you know, and it's just Army guys or whatever it is. I don't even know what Air Force. I think it's Air Force. Right. And I'm there, and I do the first show. And I think it's two shows on Friday, two on Saturday, and then there was a band. So I do the two shows the first night. I'm talking to the girl, and she tells me she's married to one of the guys that runs the fucking base. Right. But after two more drinks, she's telling me how she's sick of sucking 
guys' dicks in uniforms that she sucked like a bunch of dicks. And I'm like, does your husband know? And she's like, he knows. When you first told can. me that, Joey, I was like, I understand that. Yeah, she's like, I got suck, sick of sucking dicks that were in uniform. And I'm like, what? And I'm listening to this shit. It was my first real feature run. I didn't know, you know, I didn't want to really want to blow it. I didn't really listen to her, what she was saying. I was kind of ashamed when she was telling me how she was going to suck my dick and lick my balls and all this. And I'm sitting there going, what the fuck? And she's like, come on, let's go up on the stage. I always wanted to give that on a stage. And I'm like, come on, let's go. So we go up on the stage. And while she's sucking my dick, the band opens the curtain. So there's two curtains. Like the, every, every one of those places has one thick curtain right. and then one light curtain. Right. I was in between the thick and the light. Really? So when the fucking curtain opened, there I am in front of the band getting my dick sucked. So I turned to run. This chick held on to my dick and <laughs> ran with me, like on her knees. She, I dragged her with me on the dick run. And all I could hear is, like, stay still. And she went. This bitch took like a six-foot run with me and kept holding on to my dick like it was the last dick in the world and it was holding her. And like you're that guy from the Fantastic Four. Oh, it was what's amazing. That, what's that character called? I have no fucking idea. slime -o. And I fucking slimed on her, and that was the end of it. Stretch. She sucked my dick in between the fucking curtains. And when I ran, she took the run with me, but she kept her, my dick that in her is mouth. Awesome. And I know oh, her mouth never left your No. Oh, she I heard she it. ran while the mouth and was talking, just her hand. And speaking to the mic, going, slow down. Like I could hear her saying that <laughs> while her mouth. This chick had a gift that even fucking uh, 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 what's his name with the puppets couldn't do. Fuck ventriloquism. She was talking through her fucking ears oh, yeah. while she was sucking a dick. I had never seen nothing like this. This bitch was making her ears talk. That, that this is talent. Yeah. And she was like 39. She was already beat up, but I didn't give a fuck. A right. blowjob, an Idaho, a potato. Oh, and yeah. everybody saw? I think like the band saw it, but everybody knew that she liked to suck right, dicks right. and nobody said nothing. Right. Like the next day, people were like, did you run into Marge? Yeah. Oh. yeah. Like she had sucked every dick on the base. You know what I'm saying? Aww. It was crazy, yeah. but she was like the, and it was like to think that this, this lady was the first lady you seen when you walked into the base. Like she was like the mom of the base, right, right. but she had a dick sucking fetish and I was the victim there. Uh, the kid's name is Steve Avillo, great friend of mine. I've known him since I was 13. And he goes, Coco, where are you? He goes, I can't talk. I'm just getting out of the Meadowlands. And uh, he goes, can I call you back? And I go, yeah. And all of a sudden, one in the morning. I mean, this kid's got a kid, two kids in college. And Steven was one of my best friends growing up. And he stopped partying. You know, he drinks right. still, but he, he's in a band now. He plays a guitar. But he's a real guitar head, this kid. He had, a, he had something like what you have back here when we were growing up. And this was our party. He had a room. fancy garage. He had a fancy garage that he turned into. <laughs> we called it the shed. Right. And he turned it into a party place. There was a set of drums in there. There was a guitar. So he'd come in at any time and play. But this kid's such a great artist that the four walls, the one wall uh, north is Pink Floyd the wall. Uh -huh. He did it by hand. Beautiful. The wall with all the markings. Oh, really? The other wall was uh, the Kinks Sleepwalker. The other oh, wall really? was... Uh, Black Sabbath, Volume 4, Ozzy Osbourne, a tremendous album. He's got his hands up with the fucking ruffles. And this is Volume 4, tremendous. And the other had like a mixture of shit. I think it had like a Led Zeppelin or something like that on it. But him and I went to see The Wall 30 years ago. And it was mind-blowing. I have a YouTube clip on it where I tell the story. We got the tickets for $15.50. The album came out and the tickets went on sale. It was November of 80 and, and uh, 79. And wow. it was right after my mom died, and right. this was like the big thing. The wall was released, and we would smoke. We would buy $25 worth of weed, roll 35 joints, and we'd go in the shed and listen to the wall from beginning to end. And then one day he calls me, because we got to play hooky. The wall tickets are on sale. And we got this guy to drive us that He thought he was Satan while we were growing up. Uh -huh. His name was Joe Satan Focaraccio. And, 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 uh, <laughs> and he used to call himself Satan. And he was very Italian, like the mother would have sit you down. Right, Satan should eat be Eat and then all this stuff. And we'd yeah. go to his house, and the house was gorgeous, but his bedroom was black. Okay. And it had a noose in it because he thought he was the devil. He it had like a noose? A, a noose in it. I don't know where he got I thought about so it. So his for, bedroom was black with a noose with in a it. With a noose in it. It had Satan LaFolk. On the thing, that's what he called himself. And for Halloween, he dressed up like Satan. Oh, really? It was fucking classic, you know. So he's the driver, and I'm like, oh, Bill, Satan's the driver. Oh, do you really want to do this? You know, and we're like, yeah, don't worry, Bill. Uh, he's cool, you know. He's cool, you know. We get him high. He won't even talk about the devil or nothing. So on the way there, he hits a fuck. <laughs> we're 14, 15. Right. On the way there, he hits a barrel on the, on the interstate. I mean, we're howling because the joint fell on his shirt. It's like that typical story. Right. And he's you know going like this, and yeah. also he hits a barrel. Because Satan air. apparently burns. Right, so. <laughs> As afraid of fire. <laughs> <laughs> Look at Felicia cracking funny. <clears throat> so, uh, 
we go to this one place and they don't have the tickets, so we ended up going to St. Peter's College and we got tickets for fifteen dollars and fifty oh, really? cents to wall. So we were fired up about this. The concert was February twentieth, nineteen eighty. It's November of 79. So every day to that concert, we listen to The Wall, Animals, Dark Side of the Moon, fucking, uh, you know, sh Shine On You, Wish You Were Here. These are masterpieces in American music. Which a lot, and they put four out, at, one after the other, gentlemen. They put out, I don't know the exact discography, but they put out Animals, Dark Side right. of the Moon, which is number one selling album of all time, The Wall, and somewhere in there was Wish You Were Here. Four fucking masterpieces. Right. We're tripping on acid every day. I'm selling mescaline. I'm getting from East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania on the weekends. With Nick Biamonte, I would get 100 hits for $90 and sell them for, for the dollars. Amish were making that acid? Uh, some <laughs> East Stroudsburg State <laughs> College, a bunch of, really? they had these fucking hippies that had white beards already from taking all the acid. And every week they'd make something new for us. Four-way acid, blotter really? acid, window pane acid. We'd get ups. I'd buy 1,000 Black Beauties for $35. $35 and I would sell them to the wrestlers for a hundred for thirty-five dollars. I had a tremendous <laughs> business going. I'm telling you, I was popping ups every day. I was losing my fucking mind. I was a lost kid. Right. But I still remember that Sunday. Like it was a Sunday night, Pink Floyd, Nassau Coliseum. We met at eleven o'clock and we did it right. We drank a couple beers and we dropped a half a hit of acid. But it just so happened my friend Le 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 Lebrano, his mother was gonna drive us. <laughs> the stutterer. The stutterer, but his mother had to go to bingo or something. So again. The guy that did the heroin in his grandmother's apartment. No, that's Georgie K. Oh, okay. okay. This is this is Le 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 Lebrano, the okay. stutterer. So he's supposed to drive and his mother has to go to bingo, get her hair done. So now Joe LaFolk, Satan's gonna drive us to fucking right. Nassau Coliseum, February twentieth in the snow. So we go out there, we 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 get the tickets, they're phenomenal tickets, they're the level up. So we see the stage and all of a sudden I don't know if you ever listened to the wall. There's two albums. There's side one and two, and then there's uh -huh. a break in side three and four. In between side three and four, we're cooking on the acid. I mean, we're fucking cooking. People are getting <laughs> up and talking. We're sitting in our chairs. But Phil Caracci, it was If you a, could see how Joey just sat oh in his chair. Oh, my God. Like, we were just like, sitting there. I'm, I must contain. I must contain. I mean, I this fucking <laughs> acid was killing us. I'm seeing fucking pigs. And, you know, and if you ever know anything about the wall, it's these four guys performing. But at one point in the concert, they start building a wall in front of them. Right. And all of a sudden, while they're playing, this wall gets built, and by the end of the show, they knock the wall down. But while all this is going on, they got pigs and shit flying, and they got a video thing going on, which <laughs> your head's about to fucking oh, explode. Absolutely. I'm and sure. what a lot of people don't know about the wall was after Dark Side of the Moon, uh, they were touring, uh, and, 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 and they were in Toronto, or one of those Canadian places. And while they were on stage, Roger Waters is such an intellectual that he felt that his audience was very stupid. He, and he spit at one of the audience members, <laughs> really? and he went back, and he told the audience, David Gilmore, he told me, he goes, you know what, I wish I could perform behind the fucking wall. That's where that concept came oh, from. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. and then he did a wall about growing up in East Berlin during World War II with Hitler. That's what the wall's about. Right. It's a fucking phenomenal masterpiece that if you, if you have it, you know, people talk about psychedelics. You eat a fucking mushroom, you turn the lights off, and you put the wall on from beginning to end, your life will fucking change. Oh, wow. We go to this concert... The balloons at halftime, as I call it, they throw out a million fucking balloons. Everybody's walking and mingling with one another. Folk is sitting there with a lighter burning all the balloons as they land. <laughs> bah! Bah! That's bah! Satan. 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 <laughs> and all of a sudden there's these four little young cocksuckers that didn't even know why they were there. They just thought, Pink Floyd, let's go. And they went to the show. They, were, they had to be from Long Island. They were rich and shit. And they're behind us. And one of them finally reaches over. And she goes, excuse me. She goes, why do you keep burning the balloons? And he looks at her with a quick look and he goes, Satan does not like balloons. <laughs> and they left. Oh yeah, the girls yeah. left. They never came back. That's how much he scared them. They were like, "We got to get away from that balloon killer." So this is He's thirty crazy. years later. Gilmore leaves. You know, Pink Floyd's in disarray. Because you, we, we did watch the documentary. We at your did house. at my house. What was the name of that? Documentary? That was a biography on A and E or one of those. It was, yeah. a, it was a sports. It was a music biography. But the real thing is that all of a sudden, this I'm in Austin and I haven't thought about this story, and it's a villa. And he, I go, what's up, Avilos? And he goes, Are you, can you talk? And I'm thinking like somebody died. And he goes, bro, I just went to the Meadowlands to see Roger Waters and Pink Floyd. Oh, yeah. He goes, I got a ticket at the gate for a buck and a quarter. And he goes, I got to tell you, there was nobody there. Really? And he goes, guess who I went with? And I go, who? And he goes, I went with Joe Focaraccio <laughs> and L L Loops. He goes, I called him up and everybody went. So I was the only thing missing from this oh, night. Right. And he broke it down. I could feel the passion in his voice. He's like, Joey fucking, he calls me Cokes. He goes, Cokes, fucking uh, David Gilmore wasn't there, but they had to get three guitarists to fill his void. That's how strong wow. David Gilmore is. David Gilmore is a bad motherfucker. Everybody talks about this guy and Randy Rhodes. You put on animals and you check back with me. David Gilmore is a fucking powerhouse. 
and the, the lead and comfortably numb. Let me tell you something. When you're on that acid and you hear that guitar, you can feel his right. love. When you hear the guitar leads on animals, because uh, animals is about the world. It's about four different types of people. Sheep, dogs, uh, dogs, sheep. She, Joe, you're tearing pigs. up. Pigs. Oh, yeah, because up. people don't understand the importance of So which, of which one are you? I'm a fucking dog. Yeah. you got to be crazy. you got to have a real name. Which need. one am I? You're a dog. Okay. You're a dog. <laughs> you better not call me a pig. <laughs> there's sheep and then there's fucking pigs, right. you know, and, and the pigs are the politicians and the oh, people okay. like that. That's what they refer to. Pink Floyd never released a picture on any of their albums to make it even deeper. You didn't even know who the Pink Floyd was. You don't know if that's a guy's name. But we were talking outside, and he was saying that how amazing it was. And I was like, Jesus fucking Christ, I would give an arm to be there with you. Yeah. And I asked him, I said, did you trip? And he goes, Coax, I had a mushroom in my pocket, but I'll be honest with you. If I would have ate it, I would have ran out of there. Because <laughs> the visuals, I can't even imagine yeah. now, 30 years later. Oh, they must if, be, if, yeah. If, I if, would if, love he said to it was amazing. Yeah. So people always talk about, you know, they email me, and they send me music, and I love it. You know, this week it's Pink Floyd, bitches. Because it's 30 years later. The story yeah. is amazing, you know, and the rumor, the word on the street is that Gilmore's going to play with them in L.A. And they're really? in L.A. twice, and, oh, and I really? can't afford to go. I mean, I'm trying. Because the tickets are how much? Well, the tickets are on paper, like 450 250 oh, yeah. but the day of is something different. The oh, day of is true. something yeah. different. So what I'm thinking of doing when I leave here, I'm going to call my buddy. I'm going to tell him to put an order in for an eighth of mushrooms. It's 25 bucks, and I'm just going to have them, and we're going to see what happens on that day. I think it's like November 30th. And then there again at the Staples thing in December something. Even if, and I'm thinking of going by myself. Like that's the only really? way to experience. Yeah, I want a trip. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go take with the you. train. I'm gonna take the train. Go. I think we should go. So I yeah, got Terry on go. it. But again, they told Terry. They said since the tickets are so expensive, yeah. let's wait. We gotta wait till the day of. Okay. And if we release some tickets, let me tell you something. There's nothing in my world that I want to do more than that. I love. Uh, Pink you Floyd. should go with your wife. Yeah. No, my okay. wife don't like. My wife's not gonna understand it. You understand what I'm trying to say to you? Pink Floyd is not something that you go to as a hobbyist. You got to right. be in the fucking moment. I don't want you there. You're wasting my fucking time. You know, these people <laughs> go to concerts and they buy the album that's out now. And then, they, and then they go and then when they don't know the music, they stand around and look at me. I don't know what the fuck to tell you. Yeah. This is why you got to be prepared like that bookie in fucking Rocky. Right. Rocky told them, <laughs> you got to plan ahead, bitch. This is Pink Floyd. I want you to listen to all four albums. I want you to listen to Piper at the Gates of Dawn. I want you to understand where these motherfuckers are coming from. You know, what people don't understand is that they had a guy that, that, that snapped from doing too much acid. The guy's name was oh, Sid, Sid Barrett. Sid Barrett. Sid yeah, Barrett. I knew about that part. Yeah, and it's a very sweet story. You know, wish you were here, shine on you crazy diamond. These are four fucking guys that wrote music about their fallen friend. Shine on you crazy diamond. How fucking beautiful is that to say to somebody? Yeah. Not good morning. Hey, bitch, shine on you crazy motherfucking (laughs) diamond. That's a beautiful thing. Oh, Joe, you're. Wish you were here. You're you're tearing up. When was the last time you heard wish you were here? I know, wish you were here. That you didn't think about somebody from your life. Because it's so deep. It's like uh, playing that for somebody at their funeral. Yeah. So if you get a chance this week, go on iTunes, download Animals, download Dark Side of the Moon, download Wish You Were Here, and then download uh, The Wall and Bitches Get Back to Me. But uh, <laughs> it was weird because I woke up Monday and I really, I always think about the week ahead and I'm like, oh, what happened? When you look at the dates, you're like, November 16th, I got arrested, whatever. And I thought about November 18th and I thought about what happened that day 23 years ago. I woke up and went and kidnapped somebody. And, you know, we fuck around in here. And I tell you stories about hookers. We burned their wigs. And, you know, that was great. And I couldn't imagine telling you the story because I didn't want to see your reactions. Because only one person, two people pointed out to me what I had done. You know, I always tell people, I just kidnapped this dude. It was a drug bust. Oh, really? I had a machine gun and it's a joke and I went to prison. But it really wasn't a fucking joke. It was uh, something that I did that I'm not proud of. Because at the bottom, you know, I picked the kid up, you know. Uh, I don't know. I'll tell you the story. You tell me what you think. I okay. mean, I know you want some questions. I was working with this kid, Kent, and uh, he had gotten a DUI, and the kid was pretty fucked up. He was on his low emotional angle, you know, and he said at the time he had gotten a DUI. We were working at Subaru. We were selling cars. I was going to college at night and selling Subarus. And even though I was mugging <laughs> people and shit, like I said, Amongst I was always other going to things. school. <laughs> uh, and, and this kid comes up to me, you know, and I knew him from the car business, and he told me that he had these two kilos, blah, 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 and his roommate, this poor guy, he was sleeping on his couch, you know, and uh, weeks before the 
to the DUI, or the night of the DUI, I guess he got banged up and went to the hospital. And while he was at the hospital getting stitched up, the guy broke into the pharmacy, robbed liquid cocaine, and ran out. This guy was an ace. You know, Have this... you ever done liquid cocaine? No, no, but you get it at the dentist office, that good shit, you know. It's how like... do you do, if you're going to do it, how do you do liquid You just cocaine? shoot it. It's liquid. You shoot it? Yeah, you don't snort oh, it. Wow. It's liquid, you know, unless you're a freak like me and you put it in your nose with a fucking... With one of those things to put like apple juice spritzer, in. Like yeah, a spritzer? Like a sinus spray? Like, <laughs> like, like a turkey thing, like a turkey baster up your nose or something. And it was really weird because this kid was at a low point. Me, I wasn't doing bad, but I was fucking hooked. I was doing, you know, an eight ball a night by myself and jerking off You know, off I don't know six. much about Coke. Is that a lot? That's or? a lot. That's, That's fucking a lot. A lot. You know, and, uh, my like friend there, Georgie lived with me. Is there an, if you have an eight ball, how many people... Could, on average, could do an eight ball. Fucking five or six. Oh, really? You know? And you did that all by yourself? By myself, you know. Yeah. And Georgie was living with me at the time, who wasn't on heroin at the time, and then he got on coke, and now he's my best friend. He's clean and sober, except he smokes that white line every once in a while, some weed in Jersey that's been killing that brother. But, really? Uh, yeah, he got some good weed in Jersey. But uh, it's weird how, I, you know, this kid, the, the, the deal was I was going to pick him up, and I had this biker guy that was going to rob him, and it was like we all got robbed. Right. But in the, in the meanwhile, it was what a tangle web we weave because Kent was robbing his roommate. I was going to rob Kent, and then uh, uh, Steve Tidwell was going to rob me, you know, because he had some stripper girl that he was dating, a nude stripper in Denver and Aurora that was getting a divorce. And she, right, she couldn't right. sleep with him until she got the divorce, but she was a nude dancer. Right. You know, so he had to pay for the divorce. <laughs> makes perfect sense. Fucking makes perfect sense. <laughs> So he's all whacked up by this pussy. You know, I'm whacked up on the drugs, and Vela wants to leave. Three fucking emotionally mooks, you know? And, and all I was, really, what I was going to do is I was going to take the money from the coke. And here's how destructive our lives are. When things were going perfect, when I had a normal life, I was going to take the money from the coke, and I was going to go back to Jersey and just go to the money ended. That was my plan. That's when I was in a self-destruction course, as how a lot of people are. How old were you then? At this time, I was uh, 23, maybe 24. 23. And I was like, I first, this is the first time in my life that I really had it together. I had a job. I was making money. I was going to school. I had a beautiful girlfriend. And I'm still fucking around with this because old habits die hard. This is who we are, you know? And the next thing you know, the day came, November 18th. We had been planning it for like two weeks. Tidwell's mother had real estate Another fucking idiot. His mother had real estate all over Boulder. She had an empty house, so we were going to do the drug deal then. You know, so I went to pick him up and brought him to the house, and while we're doing the drug deal, we rip out fucking tape and handcuffs and start taping the kid, and, and, and Tidwell had a pit bull, so he put the pit bull on the fucking kid, and then Tidwell went and tried to ransack the guy's house. Was Ken uh, crying for his life? Was he, what was like, he what was, was that He was going through like? so much at the time that this was just another day for him. And I didn't realize it until years later how bad I felt about that. Here's a guy, you know, just looking for cocaine, just looking to make a deal. Next thing you know, he's tied up in an empty room with a pit bull in the fucking room. You know, this is the savage that I had become. I, yeah. And I wasn't that. I didn't want to be that. I thought I wanted to be that. That's why I always tell people, before you get into that business, fucking think about it. Think of this is what you really want to do with your life, you know. And I was telling you the other day that when Tidwell came back from ransacking and said he didn't find nothing, and he told me what he had found in the drawer, which I knew he was lying to me and the, the amount of the coke, I knew then that I had made a mistake. And I was just trying to get out of this as easy as I could. I uh, went to the car, and I knew the two kilos were still in the house, in, in Randy's house. That here's this poor kid tied up on the fucking floor. You know, I'm not even letting my emotions get into this. This, for me, was just I was going to do this and get the fuck out and start a new life, you know. I wasn't even thinking about what this poor kid was going through, you know. And uh, I, come, I, I, went to the, I, I went to the car, and I had a gun in the car. I had a gun that I was going to use that he had given me. And I said, you know what? Uh, that Kent had given you? No, the other idiot. Oh, uh, Tidwell. Steve. And I, I thought about it, and I go, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to shoot these guys. I'm going to shoot them both. Nobody will know. It's one in the after fucking noon. Everybody's working. It's a suburbia. They'll hear two shots, and they could think it's a car or something. And I'm just going to, because I really, at that time, from the anger of my youth, my mother, all the shit, I wanted to shoot somebody. I just wanted to shoot somebody. I didn't care about emotions or, or the consequences. That's how stupid we are. When you, you watch Gangland, and these kids are fighting over a neighbor, and you're like, what the fuck? That was me in my head. But I was at war with myself. I 
I grew up in a house where I was always at the attorney's office with my mother. You know, I was uh, my mother was represented by Sam DeLuca, and he's one of the best. Right now, he's representing the Manzo brothers in a corruption case in Jersey. <laughs> this guy's the best, right. and this guy does everything with money. You go to him, and you go, I got a DUI. He'll tell you right now, listen, DUI in the state of Jersey, you're going to get a year. But if you pay me $10,000, i will get it knocked down in nine months. If you pay me $50,000, i will get it knocked down in three months. If you pay me 100000 you don't do no jail. You'll be in a halfway house for 10 days. I'll get you out. It's all about money and the corruption. So I knew that. But this was Colorado. It wasn't about money. But I knew that there was a victim involved, and I knew he was emotionally fucked up. So I called, like, buddies of mine in New York that had gone through this. And they said, when there's a victim like this, you want to give the trial time. Give it time. Give it air, because he'll disappear. I always thought that if I pushed the trial back for a year, the motherfucker would disappear another coke. Because he was hooked like I was, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So uh, when I got out, I had a public defender at first. His name was Sonny Flowers, a black guy. His mom was the first black graduate for the University of Colorado. So he was like a token for them. So I got out December 1st, and then I started working on my trial, you know, and I, and I started working on money. I had to get money because that's the number one thing you have to do. So I, uh, I went to Sunny Flowers. I took a meeting at the University of Colorado with this guy, uh, Jaramillo, that was in charge of law for the state. And he broke it down for me. He's a Spanish guy. He goes, listen, dog, you got caught with a machine gun. There was violence. And I kept saying, I didn't do nothing. He's like, listen to me. Stupid, you did something. There was a potential for violence. Whenever you have a weapon involved, even if the weapon don't go off, there's a potential for violence. And he gave me a strategy. He goes, go in there, kill time with a public defendant. When they make their first offer, string them along, and then fire him. And then they have to start all over from scratch again. So that gave me some time to get some money, and I hired this guy, Philip Dupont. He told me not to hire a big, flashy attorney. This was Colorado. Mm -hmm. This is why when, uh, when mm -hmm. John Benet Ramsey had all those problems in Colorado, they didn't hire somebody big, because these are white, conservative people. So I hired the biggest corn-eating motherfucker you ever seen in your life. His name is Philip Dubois. <laughs> all right, Philip Dubois was his name. He was born and raised in bold, a ton of teeth, white as can be. The guy probably fucked with a sheet in between him and his wife. That's how white he was. I told him the truth, and what our strategy was, was I was going to go to jail no matter what. You're going to do time no matter what. What we're trying to do is get the jail time cut short. So what he did was prove that it wasn't a not, that I was nonviolent. So we had to do, we, they looked into my background, I had really no assaults or nothing, so he proved I wasn't nonviolent. So he went for nonviolent charges. The first attorney was going for kidnapping and kidnapping too. That means you're going to do your full sentence. Right. Not to mention, I called everybody I knew in Jersey to write letters. Everybody who writes a letter is a potential voter. When a judge gets a letter, a judge is not a judge because he wants to be a fucking judge because he has political aspirations. So every time somebody writes you a letter, that's a voter. So you have to appease those voters within a, a thing. I got thousands of letters sent. I, I had people send letters that I didn't even know. Congressmen, attorneys, you know, assemblymen. I had people send letters that fucking I didn't even know, Felicia. That's how strong it was. So within the letters, I did a pro... Uh, probation thing. I got a job. I went back to school. I did all the things to look the best I could in front of that fucking guy, you know, in front of that judge. And I milked it. And I even had them do a community service thing where they, they think about putting your community corrections and you do community. That's how much I had these guys going because I had never been in trouble before beside this real significant trouble, you know. So I plea bargained for six years because the, 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 the guy that did the crime with me was going to testify against me, but an attorney would pick him apart. And the victim had already robbed cocaine from the hospital, so the attorney would pick him apart. Right. So they knew they couldn't put nobody on the stand here. The only one that could go on the stand was me. So did Tidwell get uh, uh, brought up on those charges? Tidwell well? got brought up on charges, but he was on parole. So, but Tidwell read it. Tidwell gave him information on me. So they made him a trustee at the jail. He became like a trustee, and they put him in a thing. What he, is a trustee? A trustee, like a guy who sweeps and who has access. When you're a violent... From, they can't make you a trustee. And it's funny because years later, I, I, I bumped into somebody and he was like, yeah, he was telling people you were a rat. What the fuck are you talking about? I did my time just like you. You were on parole, you stupid motherfucker. You know, and it's funny because after I, I fired, I mean, it was just like just a ball of bad luck. And it was, it was bad luck brought upon by me. I don't want to think that this is society, but it was so weird. When I fired Sonny Flowers, this is what I was telling you, they made this special court hearing. And when I went to this court hearing, I went in front of this judge I forget what his name was. The judge that sentenced, sentenced me was Judge Bellapani. But I went in front of this other judge, and he said that after my court date, that some gentleman wanted to see me in the back. So I didn't know what it was about. I thought, you know, I thought it was more cops. When I went in the back, it was three federal agents. 
And they're like, we don't know if you remember this shit. And they start throwing me all these pictures from Colorado, Aspen in 85. When I was up there going crazy. Yeah. And I had teamed up with this guy in Aspen that had stolen money from uh, the, the Aspen. His wife was like an accountant for the city. Right. And they were stealing money to buy Coke. They got busted, so they wanted to turn state's evidence. I was one of the guys that was selling them Coke. So they were taking pictures of me while I was selling this guy Coke. Before they could make a bust, I boogied. I knew yeah. that they were watching me, and I boogied. And that's when the crime rate went down, And you that's said. when the crime rate went down in Colorado, <laughs> but in Aspen. But it was so funny how when I went uh, in front of these people, they showed me all these photographs of me to fold, and I wasn't going to fold. Like I was like, I don't even know these people anymore. And even if I did, I'm not going to fold with these people. That's a complete different fucking story then. Right. But it's so weird. Like uh, this week, I just thought about the person I was at that time, and it really wasn't the person I was. It was the person I was for those three days. Like, my mind had just, I don't know what had happened, you know, but it was a lesson that taught me who I am today. And, I, and like I said, I kept pushing it and pushing it. And one day I was getting into an argument with my ex-wife, and, and she said this to me before we were married. She told me, you know, think about what you did to that boy. You had him tied up, you know, you had him hog-tied with a fucking gag on his mouth, you know. That's some heavy shit yeah. I did that day, you know. And, uh, and yesterday I found out he was on Facebook. I saw that. And I just put it up. I put up first that 23 years ago today, I kidnapped somebody because I'm not hiding nothing from nobody. And then somebody said, look him up on Facebook. And they came up with his picture on Facebook, so I, I'm awaiting a friend request, you know. So I didn't want people on Facebook or anybody else who listens to us to think this was a joke. What's the closest you ever came to death while A, either doing cocaine, or B, uh, violence because of the circle of people you were running with? I've always told people that I have a fucking guardian angel on my shoulder because I have lucked out with that shit. I did something in 94 that I wake up that's even worse than that. that I kicked on a drug dealer's door with a DA badge on. And to this day, somebody just could have paid. We put people on the floor and we took drugs, you know, and I did it once and I never wanted to do it again. I knew it wasn't. And I remember when I was walking up the stairs going, I'm going to get myself in trouble again. But this was my dog, you know, and, and he needed a favor. And what the fuck, you know, at this point in my life, I still had nobody. I had nothing to lose, you know. I was in a hole. I had to pay child support at the time, you know. And, uh, man, I think of those times. But the closest ever was in Colorado. Some guy pulled a, ne a, a knife to my throat. And had me up against like pipes so I couldn't get my footing. He, he had me. This guy was slick. He had me, you know, he had me in a fucked up position. He threatened me. When and was this? Was this before uh, the this kidnapping? This is 83. Yeah, so it was right was when you got there, Yeah, right? this guy didn't like me. I didn't like him. And one day he waited for me and he got me with a with a knife and threatened me. But he didn't threaten me enough because I got him like a month later at lunch. I beat the fuck out of him. Oh, really? And then I left to New Jersey and we never fought again. You know, I yeah. smacked him a couple times. But was he a drug dealer? No, he was a, a just a redneck that worked with me on the electrician site. He didn't like Yankees or something like that. He just didn't. Oh, really? He, you know, they got a lot of those people out there. And yeah. that's why I had to be careful. When he put the knife to my throat, I seen fucking stars. Yeah. I seen stars. I really did. I, I thought it was the end. You really, what, did, what was the purpose of him putting the knife to you? You know, till this day, it was an argument or something that we had had during the week. And he went home and thought about it. And the next day, he wanted to catch me off guard, which he, that's the way to catch people. He caught me off guard. Uh -huh. You know, he didn't make a fuss about it. As I was, I turned into the knife and he pushed me against the wall. And one of those straight razors, you right. know? Right. And uh, as far as doing Coke, what's the closest that you've ever come to an overdose? Oh. <sighs> Years ago, man, I mean, from 86, uh, like from 85, I got into like those three-day binges. Like I used to get into those where they're just disgusting. Like one of the worst things I think I did was when I was married. Before I got married, the first time, like Kathy, she went home for a wedding, to her brother's wedding. And I had this pink blow that I had been saving at my friend's house. Pink? It was pink. It was beautiful. It was 1984. <laughs> no, it was 87. And it was, uh, was it 87, 86 maybe? And uh, she, her brother was getting married. And she went down to Boulder on Wednesday. I was supposed to take a flight on Friday. And on Thursday, I picked up the blow. And I was only supposed to do two bumps. And, and ended Yeah, on <laughs> story of your life. Yeah, and, then I, and I remember I had a dog, and I didn't let him out for three days oh, really? to pee. Like, he was looking at me by the door, and the pee was coming out of his ears. And I kept hiding the blow in the sink and taking it out every time I wanted to do it. But the worst thing I did that weekend was I called cops on myself. You what? Like three times. I kept seeing shadows. 
And I kept calling the cops, and they would come to my house and look around the house and say, no, there's nobody here. And finally, the last time, the two cops, there was two cops, one of them went downstairs, one of them stayed up, and he goes, I advise you to put the bag away. <laughs> <laughs> put the bag away and get some sleep. <laughs> but I remember one time, uh, it was like my birthday, and I, but you, you were allowed to bring like shit in the next day, and like, all of these mom, I didn't know. I didn't even know my mom was going to show up or not. My mom at those times, she was a single mom, and we had, I had a babysitter. And my mom basically worked all day and then worked this bar all night. I had no dad at the time. I was still, my dad was still in Sing Sing, my stepdad. And my mom was everything. She cleaned the house. She did this. She did that. And I knew that night she used to get twisted, dog. You know, I knew my mom got twisted. And I knew but didn't know she did bumps. Right. I knew for sure she smoked dope. But I knew that my mom was not, you know, like I had to trick my mom in the mornings. I told you I had to move the alarm clock up. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. I would say, oh, mom, I want to go. And she'd go, give me two hours. And I'd wait 10 minutes and move it up two hours. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd fuck with my mom to get right. her up out of bed. And I knew that. She's tough to wake up, you right. know. So I'm sitting there all day. And, like, I put it out there. Like, even then, I was kind of a very subtle kid. I put it out there but really didn't. And I'll never forget. My birthday's February 19th. I'll never forget that. It's like we get off, like in those days, you went to school half a day, nine to one. And then, but I remember like a quarter to one, my mom came in with like fucking a case of Coke and cans, which was huge. Right. You know, yeah. your mom brought fucking cans, straws, and she brought a Carvel cake, one of those chocolate three layer cakes. Let me tell you something, those little fucking kids were nuts. Like yeah. I was the coolest motherfucker ever. They hugged my mom, they hugged Aww. me. Mom sometimes make your day. But another thing she did at that time that was amazing, that I still had the pictures of growing up. I don't know what happened to them now. Again, I didn't know what condition my mom was going to be in the mornings. Right. It was always a 50-50 shot. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And one morning, I remember it snowed, one of those New York City snowstorms. Right. You know, and, and, and they, it snows in some parts of the country. Buffalo got 39,000 inches the other day. But those New York old school snowstorms, oh, where they the would best. paralyze the fucking That's city. That's the best, and people play football Yeah, down people Broadway. play football, and yeah, there's no yeah. buses, and there's no newspapers, and nothing's fresh. You got eggs. People just, you go on a band burgers, not even, you go on a shop right or whatever. Yeah. But I remember one of those locking up, it had to be 1970. And I still remember my mom waking me up and going, I went, walked 10 blocks and got you a sled. We're going to go sled riding. And she oh, got me a sled. I remember her pulling me on Broadway and Amsterdam all the way to Central Park but I remember even in my back of my mind going she must be fucking hung over as hell you know so I knew what she was going through it was right. harder for her than what and I just respected that Stories from Christmas Pass with Uncle Joey Diaz. <laughs> so, in the winter of 83, I'm living in Snowmass Village and I'm a fucking recovering klepto. I mean, I was, I was living in North Bergen and I, the last year or two I was in a klepto spree. I had an angle for everything. If you had a wrench, we could sell it. If you had a pot and pan, we could sell it. If you got a check from somebody down the corner for Social Security, I had a way to get you 10 cents on the dollar. <laughs> I was always fucking making some scam. So society, life, that Jesus puts me in a town called Basalt, Colorado. <laughs> I live in Basalt, Colorado. It's where uh, Goldie Hawn lived with the boyfriend at the time and the two kids. I used to see a little young girl when she'd be at the old Conoco station, right. old snow mass. So at the time, I'm recovering an old snow mass in Basalt. Recovering you know, from your kleptomaniac. Like for kleptomaniac, just stealing guns. It was just craziness. I got arrested for reefer in New York at the time. So I figured I'd go out to Colorado and chill out for a while. Right, but so it's, you're recovering, not hiding. No, I'm recovering and hiding. I okay. got like 1800 <laughs> I bummed off a loan shark, and I went out there, and I'm living in this condo in Old Basalt, and I'd walk around, and they had weights downstairs, and everybody was eating natural, and it was just great. It was just a different lifestyle for me. You know, I had gone from 79, from having a home, to... 83 and just being a fucking nomad, you know? So the thing happens that we're, we're going to give up the house and me and my buddy Jimmy are going to move to Snowmass Village, Colorado. Snowmass Village, Colorado is three miles into the mountains 
and it's a, a criminal's paradise. I mean, no, no security cameras, people wave, <laughs> hello. You know, I'm walking around for a month sweating fucking bullets. And finally, by September, I just break down and I break into this business, you know. And I get them for, you know, 2000 I go buy steep speakers. And then they used to have these condos for sale. I was living in this bed. We had a two-bedroom condo that was gorgeous with no furniture. We had a TV. We sat on milk crates. Our, my bed was on milk crates, and I had nothing. And all of a sudden, I'd walk by this condo every day, and there were condos for sale, and they had model condos with furniture and clothing and towels. One night, I went in there with my buddy. We stole everything. You should have seen our apartment. It was like something out of let's make a fucking deal. You know what I'm saying? We had covers and bed covers and curtains. I mean, and the town was in shock. Like, who could have done this? We had everything. Towels. I had robes. There were cigars in the robes. You should have seen it. It was fucking classic. Okay. So I'm like, this town you could rob with. So I keep, uh, I'm addicted to this, you know. Now I, I find out this is like a drug dealer's paradise where I live. All these little individual drug dealers with eight balls and shit. So I get a job. I had a thousand jobs then. I went from being an electrical helper to a, a mason this helper because it, there's a seasons of skiing, you know. So people change careers right. really quick. So I got a job shoveling snow in front of my building, in front of these buildings, in front of all these drug dealers. So basically, I got I got paid thirteen fifty an hour to case the joints, <laughs> and I had a I figured out a way a tool to bust into their doors and whatnot. So I was just stealing coke out of all these houses and all these cash out of these things. It was amazing. So what would happen was I would transform. I would try to go out as a human being like Joe Coco Diaz, you know, and be a normal white kid. And I go to a bar and I get like in those days I used to drink Southern Comfort and orange juice, and I get three or four of those motherfuckers in me and I had to rob something. Like, I would just lose my mind. It was fucking crazy. I was wondering what your drink was because I don't see you drink. That was then. Oh, okay. I go through periods. At that time, I used to go through periods. Whiskey sours, uh, Jack Daniels and Coke. I haven't had Jack Daniels in 30 years. Jack Daniels and Coke, never again. Since New Year's 1980, B-52s and a couple of quaaludes. Never <laughs> again. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I went to, uh, you know, gin and tonic was my long, that was the yeah. longest. I love gin and tonic. I could still smell it sometimes. I could still remember all the drama. But at that particular time, <laughs> December of 83, it was Christmas Eve, 1983, going into 84. And the town was kicking ass. No mass village was kicking. And at that time, I knew some business owners, and I knew what was going on in the area. And I'm at this bar having a couple fucking Southern Comfort and orange juice. And I go from being Joey Coco Diaz into being Wolfman Thief by Night. Right. <laughs> And the first place I hit is this fucking cheese shop upstairs that I had hit everything. It was like an ATM machine. Whenever I needed money, I'd just kick in the back door. They didn't even have like a, a security, nothing. And I'd go in there. They always had like three, four hundred bucks. And I went into this one night and took them for eight hundred. And then I went to like this jewelry thing next door and kicked the door down there and took a couple of watches. And then I stumbled down the court and there was this fucking pharmacy slash 7-Eleven type thing. And I just ripped the door open. This is how secure, it was nothing. It was a, a mom and pop operation. And I remember the safe was open and then they had another safe. And I remember carrying the safe home in the snow and, and being half drunk and I just left it there and walked home. And <laughs> so, <laughs> and the next day I remember waking up, hung over, feeling like shit. I would, do a, I would do Coke too. I would buy $50 worth of Coke and go home, listen to Pat Benatar and just pass out. You know, and drink at home and just pass out, try to jerk off, whatever the fuck I would do. And I'll never forget that the next day I stumbled down to City Market and right in the cover of the front page it says, Mall Burglarized Christmas Eve. <laughs> and I looked at this and, and part of me was proud. I made the paper, you right. know what I'm saying? <laughs> but the other half, I was so fucking embarrassed oh, really? that they had that documented. Yeah. So I had my buddy Mike Roebuck, who's a newspaper guy, try to get the archives a couple of years ago and he says that. They break them apart after 20 years. Oh, really? But in, I made that front cover. It said, Mall Burglarized, Christmas Eve. <laughs> Three businesses were burglarized on Christmas Eve. Right. And then I tried. I, I had just become this fucking drug little lord. I was stealing little, you know, ounces of hash. And one night, how they got me was. A Who big, got you? How the cops even suspected me. I was going on a tear. I went on a tear from September of 83, and now it was January of 84. And I probably had 10,000 cash stocked away, and I kept sending drugs and jewelry to the East Coast. And my buddies were selling it and sending me back the money. And what I was doing was, I was planning on going back for my birthday. 
but I was going to come back. I was just going to go home and spend the 10000 on Coke and then come back. And one day, I actually went out one night to burglarize this uh, drug dealer, and it was snowing. And I got there, and I uh, went through the front of his house, and there was back doors, the sliding doors. Mm -hmm. And I, the first thing I would do is always slide the doors open so I was always ready. But I heard a car pull up, and I seen the lights, and I ran, and I didn't slide the sliding, that last mosquito gate. Right. And I went through the mosquito gate and fell on the snow. And it was like two, three feet of snow. So I got up and started running. And I ran home, and that was it. About two hours later, I got a knock on my door. It's the cops. And they're like, did you go out tonight? I'm like, no, I've been home all night. And they're like, that's funny because there's a, uh, a trail of snow that, <laughs> <laughs> that leads to your door. Can we, look at, can we look at your boots? And I'm like, yeah. And all of a sudden, there they are. The snow's melting on them. And they're like, you said you haven't been on. I'm like, ah, you know, it's out the heat. And they're like, I'm fucking sweating. Right. So they knew right then and there. So I knew that trip I was taking back for my birthday was going to be like a little vacation. Because they already <laughs> knew now. Right. It was starting to put two and two together. Oh, you're the guy from New York. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you know, you've been in a couple of places where things have disappeared. Right. So I knew they had me. So that's when what happened. They didn't arrest me, mm -hmm. but now I knew that they were on to me, so I had to behave myself. <laughs> I like, you guys should see what he just said, because I had, so I had to behave myself, and like, you, you like, did your hair nice. Sure, sure, I had to behave myself, like a little captain <laughs> boy again, you know what I'm saying? And I uh, stayed all right for like three weeks, everybody had their eye on me, they suspected me now, because I had robbed a couple of different people that knew each other, like people were like, fuck, I'm missing the house from my house, so was I a couple of days ago. So people were like, what the fuck? You know, I knew everybody's schedule, you know, it would yeah. be the skis in the daytime. Or... So did you leave the next day? No, no, I waited like two weeks. I laid low, and then I went back. And then when I went back, my buddy called me. He goes, bro, a couple people asked. They know that you were doing something. Right. They just can't put their finger on it. But if you leave and don't come back and nothing gets robbed, then they're going to know it's you. So I left for like eight months, and they figured it out. Right. The crime wave was Joey Coco Diaz. This is the time of the you go to school excited, you're playing the Secret Santa. Like after my mom died, I had nothing for those two years. I yeah. remember Christmas, and I would just cover up with alcohol and speed. And I told you that one time I went to the Meadowlands Inn, that bar. And I went there the night, or two nights before Christmas. And that's the night that the chick put her, the glasses the and the Gabbiana. guy's pussy and all that shit. Yeah. Glasses. I, oh, yeah. She took the guy's false teeth and put him in a right. pussy that night. I told you about that, right, at the Meadowlands Inn. So I bought false a grandma. teeth? No, I don't I bought, a grandma, I bought a gram of speed at that bar that night. Like I was like 16, maybe 15. I bought a gram of speed, and I went. And the next day was a half a day at school. It was like one of those 7 to 11s. And we already had a plan. We're not going to go to home. We're going to get a couple cases of beer and get fucked up. So me, a couple fucking Tarzans, we go rob a case of beer from a beer truck. And we out in the wintertime. We're drinking, and we do a couple bumps of the speed. And we decide to get into a snowball fight. So we're throwing snowball fights back and forth around Kennedy Boulevard, back and forth with each other. And while the, <laughs> while the fucking thing is going on, ooh, a little oh, fart for you. Stop that. While the, the fart. That, that's a little fart. That, that was a little, I, I had some pork chops Jesus for breakfast. Jesus Christ, try your ass to the back. While, while we're driving back over there, uh, we throw a snowball. <laughs> look at Felicia's. Felicia's looking at me like I'm going to hit her because she knows the fog from my know, asshole is about like to cover her. I know, it's like about to bit my nose, and there it is. Thank you very much. <laughs> How's it smell? Good. It's like nothing. It's like a milk. It's like a malt ball fart. It's nothing. Please, please. So Continue I throw the, the snowball. Story. Richie Vanichek throws the snowball, and there's a guy dressed like Santa Claus <laughs> <laughs> driving by with his window open. I can't believe I fought it. You got to see her face. <laughs> I might as well tell the wig story again and double torture. Tell how I punched her in the face. I, know, and I don't want to laugh because I don't want to take Aaron. So, oh my God, that's a good fart. That's oh, a good fart. So then, uh, Stop it with that. So then uh, uh, I hit the guy in the face. Richie Vance hit the guy with the face in the snowball. But he's a, a Santa Claus headed to do detail at one of those places. You know, what's the places where you go to arm, whatever, the soldiers of fortune? Salvation, Salvation Army. Salvation Army, right? Yes, the soldiers of yeah, fortune. Right? So he's in front. He's driving. He's doing like 50. And a fucking snowball gets him, gets away from Richie, low and inside, and just hits him right in the fucking face. And the guy almost loses control. And we're like, fuck it. He's going to keep driving. So we're out there. We're drunk. We're drinking blackberry brandy. And with that, we look. And here's Santa Claus running at us with the Santa suit on with a big red splotch on his face and the snowball. He's fucking gunning at us. And we can't no minute to think. We're like, either we run 
or we fuck this motherfucker up. So as he gets close to us, Richie Vancic lays on this guy, and all three of us get into Santa Claus, and we're just beating the fuck out of him on Kennedy Boulevard. You we're, beat the fuck out of Santa Claus? We're 15, Claus? 16 years old. We're just hitting him with lefts and rights. Boom, boom. His fucking Santa Claus suit's That's ripping. Terrible. He's a fucking man. He's a 40-year-old man. We're kids. Right? So we're scared for... Oh, that fart is good. We're scared for... <laughs> it's from the root of the muffler, that fart. You follow what I'm saying to you? Oh, so uh, we, we, we're beating the fuck out of Santa Claus. He's yelling and screaming. Kids are driving by, beeping the horn. Beep, 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 beep. We're dragging them off the thing because there's ice and snow all over the floor. We're like people driving by with little kids and they were crying. Beeping Mommy, at us the whole fucking thing. Make them stop beating up Santa Claus. The cops come and make a stand up and put us all against the wall and frisk us. But all Richie Vance, his father was a cop. The other guy's father was a cop. So here we are against the high school fence because there was no wall. And they're frisking all of us for weapons. And Santa Claus is bleeding from his nose. His ear is ripped. His costume is ripped <laughs> and shit. And kids are beeping, crying, it's Santa Claus. Aww. And they let us go. And that's the North Bergen. That You asked me what one of my favorite Christmas stories were, and that's it. You Beating want the fuck out of Santa Fucking Claus? jack that motherfucker. Yeah. Did he have like a pillow in his tummy? No, he was just getting prepared to. We oh, fucked really? him up. That was pretty funny when we were fighting Santa I couldn't believe to this you day we were, were fighting, fighting Santa fucking Santa Claus. Was he able to get one? Yeah, yeah, he got a car. He smacked me a couple times. He, oh, he pulled yeah. our hair. Yeah, 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 he was going down. He was slippery. So you motherfuckers were definitely on the naughty list. <laughs> oh, please. We didn't get who got to that year. <laughs> I was like two with a little fucking knife. What up, bitch? <laughs> with a little pen knife. <laughs> it's hysterical. I, you know, one of my memories as a kid, I remember being in New York City and my mom put me on a mule, like on 86 in Broadway with those mules in front of that bank on the corner where you take a picture of your kid on a mule. Right. Then I wouldn't get off and she had to beat the fuck out of me on Broadway. <laughs> I remember that crying all the way with my picture on it. It was still soggy. I know. Years later, I can still see the teardrops on the picture from me fucking crying. <laughs> she made me hold it on the way home while I was crying. You know, we can't do nothing. We're betting off air. Like, you call a bookie and say, what's the line? He goes, grab a pen. This is all that's out tonight. And degenerate gamblers like myself at that time, we weren't degenerates. We were just another avenue to make money. We'd call. But we get to the fucking thing, and everybody's in a pissy mood. We can't go to the city. The Coke dealer's car is stuck in the snow. So here we are at this bar drinking Budweiser's out of a can. I'll never forget. We're sitting there. And all of a sudden, me and this kid are looking out the window because there's no cars in the street. And what do I see? A cross-country skier. <laughs> Skiing by, right? And I'm looking at this motherfucker. I'm about 19. I go, the ball's on this cocksucker. Fucking skiing like this. <laughs> and I look at my buddy, and he's thinking the same thing. He like, look at this cocksucker. He thinks he's better than us cross-country oh, skiing. No. Fuck him. Let's go get him. So we run out of the fucking bar. Oh. We got like nine gorillas and we run. I had to know this was we, coming. <laughs> we run down Bergenline Avenue, and we tackle this motherfucker with the cross-country skis. I mean, we just tackled them, ba ba boom And we're like, what the fuck are you doing? And we're not beating on them. We're just having fun with them, you know? We, Shut you know, up. We so just, <laughs> with that. I mean, we're just having fun. So we're, we're kids. We're not oh beating them up God. or not. We took them and we dragged them in the snow a little bit. Like, fucking cross-country skiing. What the fuck is wrong with you? You know, he's like, oh, I'm just trying to exercise or whatever. We need to make a video called <laughs> Cross-Country Bashing. So, so people can write us nasty emails from the industry <laughs> saying, how dare you bash and so, have violence against Cross country so, skiers, Joey. So finally, so finally, we take them. We're like, what are we gonna do with them? And I'll never forget, like the people, the plows are out, like choo -choo -choo with the chains. Again, we picked him up by his legs and we're walking with his body and the plows are going by and they're just waving at us and shit. It's fucking crazy. So we just put him in the snow drift. Like we just put him in the snow drift. That was it. And we went back to, to the bus. Stop the bleeding. No, nah, he wasn't bleeding. He wasn't. He wasn't bleeding or no, nothing. Bullies. We weren't. We weren't bullies. We just tackled you them. You weren't bullies. No, we just tackled them. That's what bullies we just, do. No, we just tackled. We were fucking fucked up. We That's just tackled no them. Excuse. We just tackled them football style, and then we just dragged football them into. Style. Yeah, we just, what is that? And then we just dragged them into a like a snow a snow drift, oh right? So we're like laughing, high fiving. We walk <laughs> back. We walk back to the bar, and finally the coke dealer gets there. Now everybody's hopping. We're on quaaludes. Call me. Uh, there's a friend. He goes, hey, I need to ask you your advice on something. He goes, my wife's girlfriend is fucking getting married, but she's getting married at the Virgin Islands. What do I do? And I said, you put two on an envelope and tell her go fuck herself. And he's like, well, what about my wife? I go, fuck your wife. They want 5000 for the trip to Virgin Islands. These people got to stop this shit. Who the fuck are you to get married? You want to get married to Virgin Islands? That's great. But you better get my plane ticket if you want me to go. 
But you know, here, I'm going to say in defense of that. Nah, I, fuck no, that shit. No, listen for fuck a minute. Fuck that but shit. I, want, I have a different point of view. Yeah, fuck that. I, you know, uh, fuck my different point of view, but here it is. I got married in Hawaii, in Kauai, and we invited 100 people. But here's the real deal. We invited 100 people because we only wanted people who just really wanted to go to Hawaii and right, really right, want right, to be right, there. Right, I understand. If you can't afford to do it, then then that was kind of a good way to like see you later. See you later. Uh, I don't send know. Send us I the two hundred dollar check. Sure, you know sure, I mean? sure. No, so but that's, it's okay if you can't go. I never. But you don't understand. This is a different level. I don't know when you married Dave how financially off you were. No, we weren't. But, uh, we weren't. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it kills me when people go out and build this fucking huge wedding to show people how much they love each other then three years later they're divorced nothing pisses me off because I see it coming it don't take no fucking genius as positive as you are to waste my fucking time and there's people and there's women who take this wedding thing a little bit too fucking serious a little bit too fucking serious you know I got an invite and I'll never forget this I got an invite from a girl to a wedding New Year's Day in Cancun, Mexico I actually picked up the phone Oh, like really? I looked at the, I, I picked up the phone. I yeah. had to, yeah. as a fucking man, as a person, a human being. Like, what gives you the right to do this? Just let me know. I just want to know what gives you the right on the most brokest day of the year that you are, New Year's Day. What gives you the right for us to go down there? Why did you decide this? Right. Well, it was my dream. Well, you know what? It's my dream to fucking go to the moon, but that's not where I got fucking married. You take a VFW in Hollywood or in North Hollywood or in Sherman Oaks, and you right. do it. And then whatever the fuck you want to do on your fucking time, you do. But right. you can't put that on people. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. So you want me to fly to fucking Virgin Islands and get you a gift? And No, dog. You got to pick your fucking battles, my friend. I love my friends. I was telling right. to him an example uh about 20 years ago, I got a call from a friend of mine. He met this white girl. You know, he's from North Burger. He's crazy. And they're not together anymore. But it was like, he met a white girl like that. You know, it was, my God, with the magazines. And I remember going over there one time, and she had 20 of those wedding magazines. Oh, no. Yeah. <coughs> so the, no, it was, it's yeah. A trap no, 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 no. It's accidental. And, and this kid and me used to do some crazy oh. shit. And all of a sudden now, he's like, uh, he's like, uh, you know, yeah, we're going to get, and I'm looking at this guy, and it was like, Thursday night in Boston because there's two families, whatever. So they were going to do a Thursday night rehearsal dinner, a Friday night rehearsal dinner in Boston. Right. And then the whole family was going to like Martha's Vineyard to do the wedding on the beach. And he came to me. He's like, yeah. And I told him right now, I go, listen, bro, here's the deal. You either get an envelope or I go and I'm not doing those wedding things. I'll go to the wedding on the beach. And then I looked him straight in the face and I go, and number two, are you inviting my gorilla buddies to this? Yeah, 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 yeah. One other thing, they can't bring cocaine. I said, you better stop it right there. You better stop it right there because this is where this party is. No, he'll listen to me. My wife doesn't like that shit. Let me tell you what happened. They went to the thing on Thursday. Yeah. These motherfuckers did all the coke and stayed up all night Thursday, embarrassed the hell out of them. I told them not to invite them. I told them don't even do it. I go, dog, don't even waste your time with that shit. Sit this bitch down and tell her you're from North Bergen. Look her in the face and go, listen, dog, I'm from North Bergen. I ain't going to Boston. I don't want to get married on the beach. Let me tell you what happened. Like the 40 people that came from his part of the family all went out Thursday night after the whatever. Did the coke, did so much coke they had to send back to New York to get three more ounces. At the Friday night rehearsal dinner, nobody touched their food. Okay. Okay? The dishes were coming. They were pushing the dishes away. Some of my friends, who I told them would happen, took the coke and actually put it on the dish at the rehearsal dinner and snorted the coke off the dish. To my instructions, I told them this was going to happen because they did it at their prom. Right. And they did it at their own weddings. Why aren't they going to do it at your wedding? (laughs) <laughs> and he's like, no, her father's a congressman. Dog, they wiped their ass with that shit, my friends. I'm giving you a fair warning. <laughs> so now they stayed up. They didn't eat Friday night. Then guess what? What? They got so fucked up on Friday, nobody went to the beach. <laughs> 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 and and I told them again. I said, what time is the wedding on the beach? Five o'clock. Ixnay, bitch. You better do that at 11 because they ain't going to make it all fucking day. Right. This is 1988. I know my friends. Right. Listen, I didn't go to the wedding. I put 500 envelopes, but the beauty of it was he called me back three days later. Oh, and they made it late. To, they didn't make the honeymoon because the limo driver, they got the limo driver fucked up. Oh, right. So those guys yeah. finally made the wedding party after the wedding, 
And then they got the limo driver, gave him a bunch of blow, and he didn't show up, so they missed their flight to their honeymoon by a day. Oh, my God. And he called me like a week later. He's like, bro, you calling on the head? I said, she, they lasted three years because she's seen him for what he was after yeah. that. And I told him, I said, you're wasting your fucking time. You got to know the yeah. animals you're dealing with, stupid. And I went to one of my buddies, and I said, I need a job. And he got me a job as a union stock clerk in a building. And it's called the Galaxy Towers in Guttenberg, New Jersey. And it's three big towers, whatever, maybe 40 floors, maybe 30. I can't remember what it is right now. And underneath, it was one of the first buildings that had, that they didn't want you to leave the building. They were going to build the building so you could have a dry cleaner, a movie theater, a bar, uh, you know, a gym equipment. Right, they have everything right. there. And that was the original thing of it. That was the original prototype. Now they have them in Marina Del Rey where you don't have to leave, you know, those big buildings there. And I guess that uh, the Galaxy was a little prototype, but to get to the fucking story, Joey, uh, <laughs> no I took shit. this job. And at first, I had to be in there at 730, and there was like a little window, and I had an office, and contractors would come in that were doing contracting in the three buildings and order pieces from me. And I, the first week, I didn't know what was going on. I was on the up and up. And then one day, somebody came to me, and they are like, you don't know how this building works. Everything we order, we get two of. Just build a fucking building, and then you get a kickback. So it was just this, like, amazing thing. Like, what are you saying? Like, people are telling me to steal. Right. So I'm like, I have to steal. And they're like, bro, we didn't call it that, but just figure it out. Everything we get from you, you get two, so you have a back supply, and then we'll buy it from you, whatever. I'm like, fine. So this goes on for a couple of months. But before that, one of the guys was into blow. And he starts tr uh, trading me blow. So I would get there at 7 in the morning, and this guy's already in a fucking grinder. I had never Ooh, seen anything like that with uh, big eyeballs. Oh, and he had so kids. Oh, and he no. would drive home, drive his kids to school, and then go there and start bumping. And by lunchtime, they were drinking. I could get weed there. We used to, we used to have board meetings every morning. Like, they'd come into the, into the thing, and we'd smoke pot back there. And then I had keys to the building, you know, because sometimes it, <laughs> you're bored. So the contractors are like, hey, bro, if you're bored, you want to make 20 bucks, stock the job. So, you know what, sometimes if I like the contract, it wasn't about money. I just walked the air conditioning unit up. or, And I started looking, looking at these apartments. I'm like, oh, my God, here I am, a fucking, I'm a savage at the time. You know, and I'm like, you know what, one thing I do, I know you don't shit where you sleep, you know. And, right. And then I started finding out that people in the building <clears throat> were coke dealers. All that whole Boulevard East is all drug dealers at that time. It was the 80s. They were Colombians. But Ken Griffey lived there from the... Uh, because it was pretty close to the city. It was pretty city. close to the city. Right. So like Dave Winfield lived there. I seen a couple of athletes there and uh, people from soap operas lived there and stuff like that. But one night I went into this... Uh, I would get coked up and go back to the building and I always thought that somebody was a drug dealer. And, like I'd see somebody and I'd think they were a drug dealer. Mm -hmm. And I'd go, I'm going to go into their apartment when they leave town or when somebody's doing work on them. And uh, this just went on and on and on, and it was just this, I was making too much money there, and I was bartending at night. So here I am, I have a great union job at night, but I had this job in the daytime, and it was just too much. And you're saying, Joey, what do you mean too much? It was 40 hours, but I was making like 800 a week paperwork-wise, and then I was making like 2,000 a week cash. And on top of that, I had all the drugs I wanted, and now I'm getting keys to apartments. Right. You know what I'm saying? Which is right. even worse. Right. And one day... <clears throat> I went into this apartment, and it wasn't Santeria. It was like this Hindu stuff. You know, it was like this just this Tibetan stuff with people right. bowing and shit. And I think they had coke in there or something, and, and I took it, and I just felt it was just fucking horrid, you know? And I remember that I said, that's it. I'm going to quit this job. And I went, and I gave my notice, and people were saying to me, you were making so much money. Even the kid I just called before, I said, remember when I worked at the Galaxy Towers? He goes, I remember it was like a fucking party. But I remember that even under all that, I just felt a bad energy in this building. Right. Like I always knew something was going to go down there, either with me or something. Right. Let me get the fuck out of here now. No, even, you have to. Even if you it, sense something like that, you If have it's too to, easy. And yeah. guys, you ever go to a bar and you meet a girl and everything falls into place and it's just about to work out. She's just about to give you the pussy. And then there's a, by the way, there's a husband. It's, it was too easy. When right. it's too easy, there's going to be a by the way at the end. So I quit this job and, you know. I took my losses, and I still stayed friends with the guys. And as, when I was growing up, when I was a kid, my mother was good friends with this guy. I mean, great friends with this guy named Tati. His name was Andre Garcia. And he kind of raised me in a way. He would pick me up and take me into the city and get me these expensive haircuts. And he would always he gave me a capsule full of Coke when I was in the sixth grade. Oh my and he God. told me to put it in a girl's pussy if you ever got older. I mean, this is where I got this shit from. <laughs> I'm a fucking, you know, 11-year-old right. kid. Right. And he always, he, he had a thing of... Uh, 
he was one of the first people to ever do drug rips. That first scene in Scarface where the drugs come and then you tell him you don't have money and you shoot him. He was one of the first people that were doing that. And as I was growing up, he did it to somebody really bad. And uh, he brought this bad luck around and my mom didn't want him around and they got into a fight. But I loved him. I loved Tati because he was like my older uncle, you know. He, he always took me to these weird places. He introduced me to his girlfriends. Well, years later, after I came out here and I was a man, Tati went into that building to do a drug rip. Right. And he kicked down the door and he ended up shooting the Colombian's daughter. Oh, really? And her boyfriend. To, like, Shot him, him dead. I like, yeah. killed him. He, yeah. he wanted to get drugs and they were on the couch making out and he just started shooting and he wow. shot them. Wow. And that, right there, that thing, I remember, like, I didn't, I never knew about it because I wasn't in touch with him. I don't want people to think I was in touch with him. You know, once my mom died, I lost contact with him. But it was, I went back to Jersey and I seen one of the guys from the old school and I said, Bro, brother, I'm the Dati. And they said, You don't know. This idiot did a drug rip, busted into the Galaxy Towers, and started shooting and shot a girl, the Colombian's daughter, and the boyfriend. And he's doing 50 years. He died in the can, you know? Yeah. But it was so weird that I always knew something bad was going to happen in that building. Just, I mean, even under my drug induced. And in those days, I think back that I would have been more comfortable there. Like you just asked me, did you ever get laid there? Right. I remember everything, and I can't remember it. That's how uncomfortable that building made me. Yeah. It didn't. And I could have gone in there with broads and said, this is my apartment. It had a great right. view of the city, balconies. There's a disco upstairs. I could have done whatever I wanted to, but there was just something about that building that I always respected. I didn't care about the job. It was a union job. My friend got it for me as a, as a handout, you know. But it's amazing how even under the drug induced, sometimes in life, something seems a little too easy. Right. And you oh, catch absolutely. it. Yeah. You catch it. You know, you <clears> always <throat> catch it. Before I left Jersey, one of the things that really got me to leave Jersey was that I was messing around with this guy that it was just too creepy. Like he would show up at two, he'd buy drugs from you, and then he'd invite you back to his house. And then when you got back to his house, he had his own Coke. But he had jewelry and he'd show it to you and take it out. It was like he wanted us to rob him. Right. You follow me? It was really weird. It was like he wanted something to happen. And one night I went up there and it was just too easy. He was giving away grams of Coke and giving bumps to you and take a gram to go. And I remember I went home and I said, I'm never going up there again. Something's just not right there. And that was in 83 when I moved to Colorado. Right. And a year later I found out the guy was an undercover cop. And he had gotten shot and had interviewed some of my buddies because they thought it had something to do with those, with us in that bar. And I don't know what happened because I was never there. But it was really weird. Even then, I knew when something was too good to be true. Oh, absolutely. And even though my, you know, and, and, and trust me, I'm the type of guy, you know, when, when the drugs have you, they have you. You'll, you'll go anywhere to do coke. And even the last 10 years of my cocaine habit, the last 15 years, I never really did coke with a lot of people. I always did coke by myself, which is always scary. My big kick was I was going to be a bartender. And I didn't watch Cocktail. Don't, I wasn't into that shit. I just always, I grew up in a bar. My mother had a bar. So I always wanted to bartend. So when I uh, came back from Colorado, the first stint, I got a job at the Sheridan Center. And then I got suspended a couple times. And and because I wouldn't show up on Tuesdays, I'd be, I was so fucked up then. And I, But I ended up working there for 18 months. And then I went back to Colorado. When I came back, I needed a job. And I went to the bartender's union. And you could... Uh, sign up for like individual little fucking gigs, you know. Right. And I was crazy, you know. I was, I was. And you didn't know how to bartend, or you I did? did. I oh, did. did. I was really good, you know. But I was, uh, it was really, really. I, I liked the Manhattan bars. I like doing rusty nails. I like doing all those old fashions, those type of drinks. I don't like doing fucking sex on the beach and shit. I'd rather have an older clientele because that's what I came up with. A lot of whiskeys, a lot of scotches with a with water backs. That's what I'm used to. I don't like all that other fancy right. shit. Right. So I you, like old people. Yeah, because like they're easy. People. Yeah, I like old <laughs> people and I like heavy shit because yeah. I know who I'm dealing with. Right. You follow me? You can tell a lot by what, what a person drinks, you know? Right. So uh, I got this. I got an assignment on a Saturday. They call This is a horrible, horrible story. I got an assignment on a Saturday. I got to be probably 21, 22, 21. Uh, let's just give it 21. And I get an assignment on a Saturday to go to a country club in northern New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> All the way up 9W. I forget the name of it. I do remember the name of it, but Jeez. this is a shitty fucking story. So. <laughs> so, so I take the fucking gig. I show up there, and it's a fucking bar mitzvah. I'm, I'm bartending for a bar mitzvah. Right. And it is just mobbed. I mean, there's... 
thousand people there for this thing, right. you know. And they told me they're like, "This is gonna be." If there was a main bar, and there was five bartending stations. So this thing was. Not <laughs> You so, must have been looking at it like, look at all these victims. <laughs> no, 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 no. I just sat there like, I didn't know what to expect until this situation arrived. So I'm behind the main bar. So there's a door with a key. Uh-huh. So the fucking Jews kept coming up to me going, hi, can you put the gifts in there? Do you want to be in charge of the key? And I'm like, whatever, <laughs> whatever. So they're bringing me gifts at first and going, right. can you put them behind there? But then as the night went on, they would bring me boxes of envelopes that were halfway open like they didn't have, and some of them were filled with cash and some of them had checks. I don't have to tell you what I did for me <laughs> to do that. How, embar <laughs> how embarrassing is that shit? But it was the weirdest thing because I would just look at a card and there'd be stacks of 20s. Mm -hmm. And I would just leave a 20 in there and take like, and it was just, my pockets were lined. <laughs> and like at five o'clock, I went for a break to smoke a joint. And I got so paranoid in my head that they were going to find out. This is no lie. So they actually called my friend George. And I said, George, you got to fucking come get me. You got, This is amazing. <laughs> and I remember going to the car and having like $1,200 on me and feeling like horrible. Like I just robbed this little kid's bar mitzvah thing. But he had a million envelopes. You know what I'm right. saying? And I didn't take all the cash. I left a 20 in all of them or something. <laughs> I made change, you know what I'm saying? Like I made sure everybody gave him a 20. It's not right. like I fucking mu mugged them. Right, yeah. No, you have a heart about it. I get it. <laughs> You're sensitive that way. <laughs> ah, you know. What are you going to do? Things are bad all over. <clears throat> so if you're the Jew kid that was bar mitzvahed, I'm sorry. If you were the kid that was bar mitzvahed. I'm sorry, yeah, because I just clipped you. But hey, sometimes things are fucking thing, and that's why they tell you don't put cash in envelopes. You follow me? Right. Because there's people out there like me that'll fucking mug you. And I forgot all about that disgusting, disgusting fucking story. Yeah. It was a terrible story. Wow. That is so my friend George was terrible. 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 And I got out of there before the shift was ended. Everything. Oh, wow. Like, and oh. you left him dry handed at the bar. I That's nah, even but it was, worse. It was like nine o'clock. George is oh, always okay. fucking two hours late. So he, you know, I don't even like those were so those days were so like those days would have been so easy if we had cell phones. Like, if I was a criminal with a cell phone, I would have made so much more progress in right. the criminal world. When I was a kid, there was a dog on my block that used to fucking chew on rocks. He had no teeth left. He would just chew on them. I mean, it was down to the... He had nothing. Right. And he would just chew on them. And every time you see him, he had a rock. And he'd spit it on you, and you had to throw the rock. And I'm like, is this it? <laughs> this is as primitive as it gets. There's no ball at your house. The O'Rourke's, they live like uh, one, two, three doors up from me. And they were pretty interesting. And they had a little kid, Timmy, who was about six or five. Cutest little boy you ever seen. And he ran with this fucking killer. And in those days, there was no leash. Right. You know, there I was know. no leash. A dog had to fend for a himself. Dog. But there was no yeah. pit bulls either attacking people. So it was a different way of life. But this dog went everywhere with this kid. And he always had a boulder in his mouth. And he'd chew this fucking rock down to the nib. I don't wow. know. With his gums and saliva, he'd break this rock down. Right. He was maybe like, he just had a boulder fetish. No, maybe he was a sculptor <laughs> in a yeah. previous life. You know what I'm saying? When I was young, the cops raided our apartment. Uh, they did? Oh, please. All the fucking time when I was really? a kid. I never told you about you that. You never told me about So this. when I was about five, I lived on, before 205 West 88th Street, I lived on 89th and Riverside Drive. The building was kind of weird. It was a high-level building with a doorman and an elevator man and shit. And here's my mom. She was the only spick in the building. And there's all these rich dentists and lawyers and basically Jewish people. I'm not going to say Jews because I don't want to Basically, a lot of Jewish people in here, we're the only spicks. And I'm saying it like this. We're the only spicks on the fucking building. And I mean, you know, to us, this was like a beautiful building and everything. Like, I remember my mom bringing goats up live goats what you know because Santa Rita you gotta kill goats and shit and I remember my mom bringing up goats in the elevator that were alive like the doorman's like here's 20 bucks we gotta bring a goat up the doorman's like no worries we're <laughs> no, bringing the shut up. oh please please are you serious yeah 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 that apartment was weird but where do you even get a goat you have to go to Marlboro New Jersey at the time uh -huh. to get like little baby goats for Santa Rita things and the uh -huh. Cubans cook them up it's a ceremony but it was so weird that I remember that building and I remember one time I went to the dentist in the building and the guy cut me. I told the story on the podcast, and I seen blood. They told me it was something else, so I robbed his, his ivory elephant, and then my mother made me bring it back. Oh, right, and right, then right. And that whole story. And then what made us move from that building was my mom had the, the, the fuck. My mom always banged everybody. My mom always banged somebody with a 50 or 20. My mom always had that because she knows if you hit somebody with a 20 or a 50, they're going to remember you. 
So she had the landlord on automatic pile. Every time she seen the landlord of 50. So one day we got shit in the apartment. I don't know what it was. This is when the women used to hang out. That's the yeah. apartment where I really remember the women hanging right. out. That was the main apartment where the women would hang out. Your, your mom's friends. Yeah, my and mom's they friends. Would party, they'd do drugs. And, and change outfits. Yeah, and change outfits. And, and that was the main yeah. apartment. And yeah. it, it was cute as shit. It had like this balcony that went into an alley with like a... a it was like four buildings connected, but you had a balcony, uh -huh. and you didn't see the view, but you seen like the alley, but oh, then yeah, you yeah, had yeah. the, it was really, yeah. because really, because everyone's, right. the back everybody's of everyone's connected. apartment right. uh, uh, looks down into like a kind of a green area, right. but everyone had apartments, and if you had the lower apartment, because we, right. we had the apartment, lower apartment, right. so we had a little tiny garden, but, there you go. but 150,000 eyes are on that right. little garden. Little, and then we had the view of Riverside Drive, but to make a long story short, we had a lady downstairs who was my mother's stash pad. And I didn't know this growing up. She was this little old lady that lived in the building, and I used to call her grandma, abuela. Uh -huh. So my mom used to always talk to this lady, always be downstairs talking to this lady. Now, I remembered this bus, but there's this kid that lives in Orange County that grew up with me, and our parents were tough. We don't talk anymore because he's fucking crazy, Al Coelho. And he was telling me and Terry the story. He goes, you don't remember you were like four or five, and the cops came, and uh, how your mom got away with the shit. She had a bag with a string on it, and she would lower it. <laughs> to the lower building with the fucking to the lady downstairs. Really? And she had the landlord came, knocked and goes, the cops are downstairs. They came up, they were looking for drugs. They didn't find any drugs, so they left us alone and stuff. So then we moved from there and I didn't really, my mom didn't have any police involvement after that for years. Mm -hmm. But in like 75, uh, you didn't know this shit that we got raided? Oh, please. And then 75 one time. Were you scared though when that happened? I was like four or five. They were kind of nice to me. You know, uh -huh. I remember them tearing up the apartment. You know, tearing up carpets. Did you understand what was going on? Uh, yes and no. You know, yeah. my mom was sitting next to my mom on the but couch. But you knew don't fucking talk about a boiler right now. No, my mom knew don't talk about nothing. Don't yeah. say nothing. She always my told you that growing up? No, the, the key to work my house was mira, oye y calla. That what means does that mean? look here and shut your fucking mouth. The three monkeys. You say that again? Mira, oye y calla. That means look, listen, and shut your fucking mouth in Spanish, right? <laughs> The three monkeys. That's how we live. That's how I lived my life in my house. Oh my mom my had God. those three monkeys everywhere. Yeah. Just as a reminder, shut your fucking mouth. Don't say a word. The cops come. Don't say a fucking word. To this day, cops are around. I don't say nothing. That was instilled in me from my mom. Don't say nothing. You don't know nothing. Nothing. You don't even. You're a mute while they're around because they use everything, and that's how they start fucking with uh -huh. you. Is if you talk, they they got you. Once you talk, they got you. So I remember them sitting us down. They didn't find them. And they left. But then. My mom, my stepdad got out of jail, and then we were raised, and my stepdad was into numbers, and he had a, a flower shop and a butcher shop up in Hudson Avenue in West New York, and my mom had the bar. Can I ask a question? What yeah. is the purpose of having doing numbers if you already got a flower shop? And a... They're the banks. They're, they're, they're the laundry. Oh. That's how you launder your money. You just so can't be a bookie. So did those businesses make money? Yes, the flower shop But that's made... what I'm saying. Why can't you just live off the money? That you make numbers because you have to have laundry. You have to launder no, that no, money. No, no. Why can't you just live off the numbers of, from the flower shop? Because these people weren't like that. These people always had an angle for everything. The flower shop, I don't even think my father worked the flower shop. Like We went and picked up roses, de-stemmed them, stocked the thing, and then he used that as a hangout. That was a social club type thing. It was a flower uh -huh. shop. They did deliveries. I still Beware remember, of the fucking flower I shop. Still remember, <laughs> I still remember the guy's uh, name that would do the decoration. His name was Ivan. Uh -huh. His name was Ivan Hoe Martinez. He was a great guy. Say that name again? Ivan Hoe Martinez. He, Ivan Hoe Martinez. And... Uh, so we had the, the flower shop and the butcher. That belonged to my dad. And then my mom had the bar. And they did the numbers out of there. But my dad, my mom was very uh, happy-go-lucky. My mom was one of these people that talked on the phone. She would put bets on the phone. My dad, till the day he died in 2006, he'd get on the phone, say, hello, como esta? Bien, everything good? Hold on, talk to her. And then he would have the conversation to a third person. My stepfather was bad to the fucking bone. What do you mean by a conversation through a third person? Bring the phone rings. I pick it up. Hey, Felicia, what's going on? Everything good? Yeah. Hold on. Terry wants to talk to you. You don't want to talk to Terry. You call for Joey. Yeah. He would put Terry on, and then he would have the conversation through Terry on the phone. So you couldn't say nothing. You couldn't say to him, hey, what happened with the Knicks? Or what happened with... No. He didn't want to know about it. Yeah. So before you even got to that con... You'd say, what the fuck just happened? I was talking to you one minute about fucking gambling, and next thing you know, I'm talking to your wife about sport. That's what he did to throw you the fuck off. Don't talk on the phone. He would always tell my mother, don't talk Never on the phone. Never leave a trail. Don't talk on the phone. Don't talk on the phone. Go over there and tell the fucking guy what you got. He, I'm telling you, my stepdad was, and he didn't do drugs, 
My stepdad. Yeah, he didn't do drugs. No, my stepdad was so paranoid. That's what our beef was about. As I got older, oh. he was anti everything. My dad would How did stab you. Handle your mom doing this drugs. was the problem. He didn't well, like there, this shit. There really? it was. He didn't like it at all. Oh, you're doing that shit again. Look at you. Your hand is moving. He'd always tell my mom, "You little move. Your hand is moving. You're doing that shit again." Because some people draw, but my mother's hand would go. You know what I'm saying? Some people's jaw goes. So he hated drugs. So he was always anti. I mean, this motherfucker didn't even like talking in a room that was hung up. That's how bad he was. This is 70s, and he wouldn't talk in a room where there was a phone hung up. He always felt that you could hear through that phone, even if it was hung up. This is how fucking bad to the bone he was. So what had happened was somebody had put a bed in at my mother's bar. Somebody They had my mother on bookmaking, but somebody had uh, bought drugs on the payphone. But in those days, they tried to, try to, they, they t- t- try to tie it to the bar. Right. But I used to go with my, my stepdad to work every day sometimes in the summers, and I would see his a- action in the morning. He would park his car, and before he'd even go into the flower shop, he'd go get coffee, and he'd talk to people. He wasn't really talking to people and getting coffee. He was watching the cars in the neighborhood. He knew every car. He would say, how come Felicia's car is there and your car is there when you got here earlier? He was one of those guys that he knew where you were going to park every day. He knew his two-block radius. Yeah. So he, if he seen something out of whack... Everything was shut down. Shut it down. You got something on, you get it out of your pocket. Get the numbers out of your pocket. Get the cash out of your pocket. Get everything out of your He was one of those guys. And that's why he stayed out so long on the numbers. In Jersey, numbers is a felony. In New York, it's a misdemeanor. They didn't want to go to New York every day. So they said, fuck New York. We'll, do it. we'll, we'll put the main bank in New York, but we'll have satellites like little, like what the, the, the lotto does today. Uh-huh. That little front. So it was a front for flowers. Uh-huh. When you went to buy the flowers, you said, Psst. 219, 15 bucks. You follow me? So right. at least you walked out of there with a flower in your hand. Yeah. They would never let you walk out of there without nothing. Here, take a flower with you, please. Yeah. So one night my father goes to the bar and he sees that there's a car out of place. And I'm coming back from karate. I'm like 10. He goes, go to the Chinese restaurant and see if there's a, a car with a white guy sitting in it on the corner. And I went up there and sure enough, he goes, come on, let's go. And we had a walk. He had to go to all his friend's house and tell him that the cops were there. We walked like 10 fucking miles. All around New Jersey, just going from bar to bar, telling people, hey, the cops are coming. Hey, clean up. The cops are coming. Hey. And we walked back to my mother's bar. We got there like at 1230. And within 30 minutes, the cops broke in the fucking door. And they threw everybody down the floor. And they searched us. They even searched me. But my mother had already cleaned the bar out. There was nothing at the bar. But it was amazing how my mom and dad were the chief hiders. They could hide. Like my dad, he knew that this was here. And how would he know? He'd take a little piece piece of paper and go like this and put it there. Right. Oh, he could yeah, even yeah. tell if you moved it. That's how that's how bad to the bone this guy was. Right. He could even tell if you moved he would he would use tape, Scotch tape, clear tape, uh-huh. and put it on the door outside. Wow. On the bottom. Wow. Because you can't replace it. He should it. have been a spy. Oh, this guy was amazing. So yeah. he was very counter to surveillance. He would put hairs. Yeah. He would take a hair out of his head and put it in the wow, door. Wow, it's a good thing he didn't do drugs, and so I'm not you, making it no, as a joke. So it's a good thing. No, yeah. this guy was anti. You he think he was, to, like, compulsive? No, he was he was anti-prison. This yeah, guy was yeah. just one <laughs> step ahead of the game. You could, Like, I told stories about him. Let's say he was taking numbers right here, right here. He was sitting here with a TV and a newspaper with a sheet of paper. If the cops came in here right now, they could not find his money and his, his numbers log, even if it was hidden here. That's how good he was. Wow. So even if he did find it, he'd say to you, so what? You found a piece of paper on the floor. You ain't camping it on me. It's over there. I'm over here. That's how he was. You know, he was so content intelligence guy. Right. So I'll never forget, they raid the bar. They got everybody down. They're searching. They can't find nothing on the way out. There's a guy. His name is Monina. He's still alive. Monina is a, is a slang name for brother. How people call themselves brothers today. Mm-hmm. There's a part of Cuba that they call you Monina. That means you're my brother. You know what I'm saying? That's my Monina. Fucking Felicia. What are you talking about? She ain't gonna do. That's how they call it. This guy was everybody's brother, so they called him Monina. Uh-huh. Like they call him like everybody's brother. And he had a toupee. And I'll never <laughs> forget that all the cops got everybody against the wall, right? Uh-huh. And also at the end, the cops are ready to walk out. They're like, all right, everybody's clean. We're getting ready to walk out. And the cop walks past and he looks at Monina and he goes, take the wig off. <laughs> <laughs> And Molina took the wig off, and in the wig was a little Scotch tape with fucking coke in it. And they took him to jail. I'll never forget that. And whenever I go home now, I see Molina at the jewelry store, and I always say, Molina, 
Remember that time you had the coke on your forehead? Don't even mention. Now he doesn't have a wig no more because yeah. of the style. You know, <laughs> in the seventies you could trick people and shit with a wig. Now you can't. Maury's that wigs do. Ridiculous. I'll never forget that they found a little loom on the way out. Everybody's like, "Whoo, that was close." And the cop, come here for a second. <laughs> Take the wig off. <laughs> and, <they took> the <laughs> and under the fucking that wig. That is why you have to get a good wig. And that's why I lit the wig on fire because I remember that night. If you got a wig, you're fucked up. You see what I'm saying? So, that's, it all goes back to your childhood, bitches. That's and we just figured it, it out goes back to. right here on Beauty and the Beast podcast. That's what this podcast is about the truth. In 1985, I was waiting to fucking take a train down to my buddy's house to drive me to the airport. A guy pulled up to me on a motorcycle and he goes, Hey, you never paid me that money. The next time I see you, you're going to get shot. And he went right away. I'm still waiting for that fucking guy to show up. I'm old school. If you're going to shoot somebody, shoot him. If you're going to tell me you're going to shoot me, you ain't really going to fucking shoot me. So if you're going to tell me you're going to visit me, I laugh. Right. Visit me. Yeah. Visit me. Come yeah. see me. And it had to be somebody from Jersey that I grew up with that heard about what happened at the bitter end or something. And, and now they're out of the woodwork because that always happens. Uh. You know, that always happens with my friends in Jersey. Some of them get mad. Uh, for years I wrote a blog. And two years ago I wrote a blog about robbing somebody. And one of the guys that robbed them, and I told the story on the blog that I robbed the guy, but the, the guy that robbed them with me ratted me out. Well, that guy emails me three days later. He wants to talk out of the fucking blue after 20 years. And he had told some people he was going to call me and straighten me out. When he called me, he didn't say nothing to me. I even called him back at his work. I was like, I don't need to talk to you. What do you want to talk to me about? He's like, well, I didn't really like that you wrote that on the blog. I didn't lie, guy. Did I lie? Did you put his whole name? Yeah, you know me. Oh. There's a blog. There's a writing exercise. What are you going to fucking oh. do, you know? And uh, But he didn't say nothing to me. A month later, I hear he's going to beat me up and all this shit. Then about 10 years ago, I went to Rascals, and I heard again that some guy was going to come get me. So my buddies came to the <laughs> show with me, Aww. thinking if this guy showed up, the guy never fucking showed up. Yeah. You know, so if you're going to come get me, come fucking get me, all right? You know, full-time electrician is where he has a business, but he also grows weed, and he got busted for weed, and he's got to go away now. And he contacted me, and he goes, you know, uh, I love the podcast. I love what you and Felicia do. He goes, I was wondering if you could be my pen pal. Weren't we talking about pen pals last oh, week? Oh, really? And it broke my heart. Yeah. You know, it just got to me because I understand when you're inside. And I was like, absolutely. You know, let me know when you're going away. Uh, I'll give you my address and let's start this thing. But he also wrote, can you prepare me mentally for it? You know, and, and it's so weird what people think of prison and what it really is. It's just another day in the life. And, and we have a lot of young kids that listen to the show. And I'll fucking tell you, you know, I'll fucking tell you. Are there black guys raping people and shit? I, I never seen none of that stuff. I know that you have to walk a fine line because you're dealing with people that have no reason but to stab you. So I want you to understand, prepare yourself for that. Like this guy, at least, this electrician, they're telling him now a year in advance that he's going away. Me, I, I had it beat till the Friday before. So I was going on, on sentencing Monday and they called me Friday and told me the bad news at four in the afternoon. Would I have stayed if I would have had six months? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I would have stayed. Would I have gone to another country and fought extradition or something? But it's really weird how you prepare yourself. And there's some people that can't handle that. It's like you're going through your surgery. It's the same kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. You're going away. You're going away for whatever, three years, which is 18 months. I'll tell you what, three days in jail is bad enough when you have a life. And everybody has a life. You have a kid somewhere or a daughter or a family or somebody who loves you. It's always rough. But I was thinking about how to answer him to prepare. It really fucked with me. You know, it took me like an hour. Like I had to smoke 10 joints and drink two cups of coffee. And I was like, what the fuck do you prepare? And how do you prepare? The only thing you could tell somebody about prison that, and I tell people, like I went in there and, I, and my chuck and jive continued. You know, I'm not going to lie to you and tell you. My chuck and jive continue. Yeah, you got into a couple fights because, like I said, there's people in there that have nothing to lose. They got 22 years, guy. They're looking for fucking shit, you know. And I just told them to do your own time and do it in your head and have a preparation when you go in there that what you want to come out like. Like, even though I was fucked up at the time on blow, on the bus ride in, I thought about what I wanted to get out of this place. I had never been in a situation like that before. I had been in county jail, you know, a night there, a bail here. But it's fucking so weird because when you're in there, you don't see rapists and people aren't going to fuck you in the ass. But you have this reality that comes into your soul. Like, this is life. 
This is the other side of life. You're not a human being. You're just a fucking number and a piece of meat. I said it before on the podcast. There's nothing worse, Felicia. I don't know what... It, I, I feel to take your womanhood, somebody would have to rape you, right? To really take your womanhood... Like, for me, it was somebody kicking my bed in the morning. I can't answer that because uh, I've never been raped. Right. And, I mean, and I mean that, like... But it's just imagine. Yeah. Like, for me, I think the worst feeling ever was when keep, people would kick the bed and wake me up, Felicia. That's horrible. Can you imagine me kicking your fucking bed in the morning going, bitch, get the fuck up. And you can't say nothing to me or do nothing to me. You know, those were the things that got to me the most. That it attacks your manhood. Like, you don't feel like a man no more. You're really a piece of fucking meat, you know. And no matter how hard you try to be a man, you're a fucking piece of meat. And that fucks with some people. That's why some people just stay in there. You know, and that's what I told them. I go, whatever you do, don't get caught up in that, in the, in the, in the rattle, the bullshit do your own time because you have people that only want to come out for a week and then go back in there. Um, how long does he have to do? Did he say? Or? I think three years. You know, oh, yeah. so I don't know how the English system works. I don't know how the English prison system works. I don't give a fuck if they put you in Lompoc in San Francisco where you play golf and you have your own room. It's still time. It's still time away from your loved ones. It's still time away from your life. You know, I don't know what that is, you know, I don't know, at, at that time, I didn't have a life, really, mm -hmm. I was just living for today, I was making money, I didn't even know what the fuck I was doing, I wasn't dealing with it, I was just, you know, but it's amazing when somebody takes your freedom away, it's a fucked up feeling, Felicia, and you, when you say it to somebody, you're like, oh, somebody takes your freedom, what's that, fuck, Felicia, when somebody reads your letters before you get them, when somebody feels up your kids when they come to see you or your loved one, can you imagine somebody feeling up your kids? You know how embarrassing that is? So those are the things that bother you more than the actual time. The time after a while, you become buddies with somebody, you have the same interests, whatever yeah, the fuck, you yeah, know? So yeah. all I can do is prepare you. Is that's it. It's just do your own time. Read some books, do some push-ups. Like I just read something on an airline that uh, there's an airline that's not letting kids on it. Oh, really? There's somebody who said, no, it's over. Yeah. You know, fuck you. Fuck you, you know. And yeah, listen, man, I, I got a red eye to fucking Pittsburgh a month ago. I'm not complaining. I didn't pay for the fucking ticket. I'm sitting there, and there's a kid in the fucking back all night. People take that red eye to fucking take a nap. Uh -huh. And you're going to come on there with your fucking kid and walk around with that smile on your face. And it's like, and what killed me the most was that I had a good seat, but I'm looking at this going down. And this is what kills me the most. The kid's crying, and she's got the fat fucking husband walking back and forth with the kid. Do me a favor. Get your fat ass up and get that fucking kid. You're the mom. It's two in the fucking morning. You don't know morning. what could have led up to that. Maybe he didn't do one fucking thing to get ready but for the, the fucking, trip, and she did understand. everything, and you then the understand. deal was you do everything, and then I'll take care of the no, baby no, no. on the No, no, the thing plane. is you have to be considerate of other fucking people. That's, true. That's the point of the fucking yeah. story. You know, you bring a moot kid to I understand it's your kid. Like I tell people, and please do not get offended if you don't want to listen when I say this. You fucked and suck. Why should I put up with your fucking kid? You're the one that fucked and sucked and you got your chiz on your fucking monkey. Why should I put up with your fucking kid in a plane or in a movie theater guy right. or even in a fucking restaurant? Well, you know, I wouldn't do it to people, You know what they Felicia. should do on planes is they should just say if you have a small child under the age of two or three, then it should be the first five rows. No. Don't let them on so at night. Not, let them on at six in the fucking morning yeah. and fly with the rest of the people. No, dog. You don't want to hear that. Don't bring the kid on the fucking plane. This won't happen. Anyway. Just think about it. Before you and your husband are planning this trip yeah. to Hawaii four fucking hours and you got a two-year-old and an eight-month-old, just think. Just fucking think for five minutes and go, what's easiest for everybody else? If you don't have to do for the first class ticket or whatever, I don't know what the fuck to tell you. But I just think about it. When I Listen, I was married. I know what it was. I remember when Pretty Woman came out. I remember when Pretty Woman came out. I wanted to go see Pretty Woman. I always liked Richard fucking Gia for the office and the gentleman. And here I got my wife, and she's like, I want to go see Pretty Woman. So I said, we're going to go. She's like, let's go at night. I go, no, that's fucking rude. We're going to go in the daytime. And we went in the daytime, and as soon as the kid went, ah, 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 I got up and went outside with the fucking kid. As bad as I didn't want to go with this fucking kid, even though it was my right. child. Yeah. I didn't feel in my heart that I wanted to go with a child because I know the experience. Even, and that was me and my junkie, don't give a fuck about nobody days, I thought yeah. that way. Yeah. You know, when I, I, I just don't, I understand you want to do what you want to do in your life. 
But you also have to realize what it is to the people around you. You're driving uh-huh. fucking Hollywood. You're going down the street and there's a guy and a chick making out. Just in the middle and there's four cars deep. And people wait for that shit. And then when you give the guy the fucking horn, he gives you the finger. Like you're fucking yeah. wrong. That's the shit I'm yeah. talking about. The same shit it, it applies with the fucking kid too. Right. No, it does because this person, it was Jesus a couple. Jesus fucking Christ. It was actually a, an Indian couple. And, uh, and it was like, really, dude, you can't see that, you know, that this isn't correct. It always... But but I, but I what what saves it is the fact that no one said anything. That kind of saved it. Like, at least most of us try to be smooth under the situation. Well, you can't say nothing because you cannot be politically incorrect. But it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Thank yeah. God for both speakers mm-hmm. on a plane. You know, thank God I fucking found those speakers and I put them on my ears. Yeah. I don't hear shit anyway sometimes, but Jesus fucking Christ, that's not the point. Mm. The point is we got cotton balls for everybody. You should think before you bring your fucking eight-month-old son on a goddamn red eye, man. I was at a Maria ST the other day, and some lady and her husband or boyfriend were telling us about a situation where they went on vacation, and they got fucking robbed, and you know, and they went to the beach, and they didn't know, so they left the door open, and I'm sitting there, in the back of my mind, I'm like, you deserve what the fuck you get. It's 2012 and you got your back door open on fucking vacation in Puerto Rico. Or, and then the other hand, I felt bad because I understand what their pain was, their own vacation, and how you took away their belief. It takes away your belief system mm-hmm. at some point. It really made me feel guilty for a while. And uh, in 85, with my first wife, whatever, I moved to the Virginian Hotel in San Francisco. And it was, Felicia was the cutest thing in the world. It was a boarding house in mm-hmm. San Francisco. It had like four floors. And what you basically had, if you had a VIP room, you had a bedroom with a bathroom. The bathroom was the size of your closet. It was a standing shower and a shitter. If you didn't want to pay the $90 a week, then you paid 75 You had a room, and then you had to go out and share a bathroom. Uh-huh. And they had a female bathroom and a male bathroom. But it was very neat. They had couches on every floor and TVs in the room and... Downstairs, they had like a meeting room. Trust me, it was very cute. Uh-huh. And everybody knew each other. And let's say there was 100 tenants. 50 of them were people who lived there, like older people who mm-hmm. cooked every night. Like there's nights you got there at 7 o'clock at night and people would make lasagna. And they were like, would you like to eat? And it touched you in your heart. But me being 21 and me being the piece of shit that I am, I never really caught on to that kindness. I took that kindness for weakness. That's what I did. I was in New York City. I was a fucking yeah, animal. yeah. And it's pretty crazy. They had this uh, cart. The maid had a cart. She was uh-huh. an old school maid, and she just walked around <clears> with this <throat> cart. But she left the keys, the master keys, on the cart. So I figured out a way how so to get... So you just happened to notice that one day? No, I just... You know me. I watch <laughs> everything. I'm a fucking criminal. I watch everything. You don't think I I'm know, watching, but I'm watching. <laughs> and I take the keys off, and I open up like two rooms, and I put the keys back mm-hmm. on, and I go in the rooms. And, you know, I took... But there was this one bookie in the building, and I kept cleaning him out. Every fucking Sunday. $200, but he used to do those receipts, those bookie sheets. Uh-huh. And then I would hear him downstairs. Somebody keeps taking it's that fucking maid. And I'm like, oh, they think it's the maid, you know? Right. And again, I would feel kind of guilty, but I didn't give a fuck. I'm out there in the jungle by myself. God took my mother. Fuck these motherfuckers, you know? And I kept doing it. I kept robbing like little people. Like I'd take her keys. Finally, I just figured out I'm just going to make a duplicate key. Mm-hmm. So I went downstairs one day, made two duplicates, went back up, put the key back on. She had no idea. And I would just go on the keys. I'd just watch people check in and check out. Plus, I got to do it across the street. There's a big Hilton. That hotel is still there, the Virginia, but it's now a hostel in San Francisco. It's right downtown by the Tenderloin area. And across the street, there was a Hilton. I started doing it at the Hilton also. And I followed one of the maids and stole the key. It, it, fucking craziness. I would dress up with a suit there. And I'd make believe I'd be reading the Wall Street Journal, waiting for my fucking limo. And all some people would check in. And I'd see them go to their rooms and they'd run right out. I'd go right up to their fucking room. I'd hear what they were saying. Fucking craziness, you know? But this one particular Saturday or something, we were, uh, I don't know what the fuck we were doing. And I seen this couple check in. And I went in their room. And I locked and I went in their suitcases. I went everything. They had nothing. And all of a sudden, Felicia, I hear the key hit the door. And it's them. So I locked the top lock. And I go out to the balcony. I'm looking around. It was the second floor. I could have jumped. Or I could have walked on the ledge. I had one uh-huh. of those ledges like Batman. Remember in the right. 60s, he'd walk with his hands on the ledge. And I'm like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Holy shit. 
and they're banging on the fucking door. Let us in. We're going to go call the police. Oh, they know you're in there. Yeah, the landlord comes up, and he's banging. He's like, now for two months, I'm ripping off apartments in this place left and right. They're downstairs scratching this their This is head. at the Virginian. This is at the Virginian. Oh, They're okay. like, what the fuck? Who's doing this so shit? So you live there, too. I live there, too. Oh, so this is why I you thought know, you were talking. You were saying it was a Hilton. No, this no, is the Virginian. No, this is the Virginian. And it's so funny because these are all the things I live on. You don't shit where you sleep. That's why I know all about this shit. Jesus, Joey. So finally they get the door and they come and they got two San Francisco cops, an Asian one and a white one. And they're like, what's going on here? And I'm like, I was looking for a towel and I... I didn't know. I went to get the maid, and they're like, how'd you get in here? I go, the door was open, and then these people fucking knocked, so I closed it. And they searched my pockets. They looked around the room. They said, nothing's missing. So, like, he's saying the truth. We can't press him. No charges on him. The Germans mm. are like, we want to press charges and all this shit. So they let me go. So I know what's going on. And I go, the rest of the building is going to know. So I pack my bags, and I fucking go to Reno for the night. And I remember we took those buses from San Francisco. You ever take uh-huh. one of those? Like five bucks to Reno and oh, they give no. you a $10 coupon. And we got on there, me and my girlfriend at the time, who was my wife. She wasn't my wife yet. And I'll never forget, we got on there. We met some Arab kid. And he's like, you guys want to get high? And we're like, yeah. And he had a uh, hash with weed and tobacco. You know, big old fucking spleef, like the size of Cheech and Chong thing. And we got fucked up. And then we took the bus back that night. This is crazy. And we get back to the hotel. And the people are like, listen, the cops are looking for you. Because they want to question you about all the other robberies. So they fucking knew. So the guy's like, listen, as soon as you come in, the cops hit the call. I got to call Joey. Whatever you want to do now is up to you. So I go upstairs and I start packing. And we beat the fucking, uh, we beat the cops before they get right. there. And I'll never forget this. We get in the fucking cab. We shoot out to the hotel. Uh, we shoot out to the airport. And we get to the fucking airport, Felicia. And she left the money hidden under the bed. <laughs> <laughs> all the money we had really so this is horrible like we had to call her brother how much money do you think you had in there 3,000 cash really and now we have two dollars on us so this is a fucked up story we fucking had to go into the airport call her brother to pay for our plane tickets back to Colorado the cab driver was like where's my money and we go listen dog here's the story I'll never forget this way here's the deal this and this and this and this. We have no money. If you give us the fucking address, we will send you the check in a week. And he's like, I've heard this before, but fuck it, do it. But the whole time when I was there, I was stealing jewelry and pawning it and taking mm-hmm. the cash. And some of the jewelry was my wife's at the time. Uh-huh. So she's like, we got to go back to San Francisco and get that jewelry and get the three. I mean, this is fucking craziness. So you went back? No, I just went to Colorado. And like three months later, we went back and got our TV and we got a bunch of shit that we had in hop. That's how we basically got out of town that time. And then that's what happened. We sold all the shit that I had stole with credit cards and accumulated like rings and stuff I had had. And half of it we pawned with because the guy's like, I can't buy all this stuff. I could pawn half of it. And we're like, yeah, 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 whatever. We were just going to sell it, but it was such a nice TV and such a nice, like we had engagement rings and we had jewelry and she ended up going back. But one of the things we always did was we paid that cab driver. We actually mailed him oh, a fucking really? check, and then when she went to San Fran, she called the guy, and the guy picked her up and drove her back. She made a one-day trip. But it was so weird how when they were saying that story about the vacation, I felt so bad about that story, Felicia, because it was such a nice hotel until I went in there with my bad fucking energy. And I realized that years later, like, I wish there was a way I could repay those people back because I was, it was so bad. And Felicia, it was right there for the opening. I was out of New York City. Shit like that was easy. That's what I did every day. You know what I'm saying? Like, that was just a quick way to get $200 or traveler's checks. I was the king of those fucking traveler's checks. But it's just I bet a, you were. Oh, my God. Because yeah. no, no ID. Mm-hmm. All you got to do is match the signature on the top. What, are you fucking kidding me? Now, uh, a person who's on the other end of that, they don't give a fuck. Yeah. They're going to get money on it or not, whether it's stolen or not. Traveler's checks, they pay right through the hole. So don't, don't ever believe that the retailer's going to sit there with a magnifying glass looking at your signature. Yeah. They don't give a fuck. They're going to cash anyway, too. So it's a two-way street. That's right. the other end of the coin. Uh, and in those days, I was doing nothing but snorting, blowing, driving all over this great country of ours. MCing, you know what I'm saying? 450. <laughs> That's all I was doing. Snorting, blow, and driving that, from Baltimore. That should be the opening of your book, Joey. What is it? What <laughs> is it? What is snorting, it? snorting, blow, and driving all over this great country of oh, ours. Oh, with a Datsun B210. You know what I'm saying? Show motherfuckers That's what it's all of, about. Of yeah. the Joey Diaz movie. And, uh... <laughs> And it's funny that one day in uh, one of the parts of Michigan, I pulled over for a massage, and 
you know, they, they did the switcheroo on me. The hot mm-hmm. Asian answered the door, and I was like, and then I go, my shoulder hurts. And she's like, yeah, right. And I, I start looking at her, I'm like, this is weird. And all of a sudden I go in the way it says, take your clothes off. And I'm like, for what? I just need my shoulder stiff. And she's like, no, take your clothes off, $40 for a hand job. And I'm like, are you fucking crazy? I mean, I had never been approached like that. There was no, like, in the middle of the massage, nothing. She didn't say nothing. She just goes, it's fucking, take off your clothes, and it's $40 a hand job before we start. And I remember asking her, like, you know what? What makes you think I want a fucking hand job? But she didn't understand English, so she kept trying to give me the fucking hand job while I'm standing up. You don't like, think getting a quick hand job would have helped the tension? No, in your no, no. That's really that's a different <laughs> level of disgust for a guy like me. So like I was telling you, my brother George is in town. One of the guys that I did a lot of my, he wasn't a criminal, but he sat in the forefront and watched me and helped out from time to time. And he comes out every year for Comic Con, and it's funny. Like I'm not good with, I'm not sightseeing type of guy. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I could honestly tell you I've never been to Venice Beach from a distance. Like, I, I don't like nothing. Leave me the right. fuck alone, all right? I don't want to see nothing. I don't want to see the rides. I don't want to see shit. Well, you know? this is the second time he's been sitting in my garage. Right, so. But it's funny that uh, we went to uh, an audition for commercials. Oh, you did? For commercials. I had a call back for the stupid FedEx, but it was a mobster commercial. Uh-huh. And I usually don't talk about this on here, but it's fun tonight because this is great to talk about. And it just goes to show you the fucking economy. Okay, first of all, the guy that played the cop on The Sopranos was there, which he's not a big star, but he works all the time. Second of all, Sonny Black was, Sonny Red was there from Donnie Brasco. He's had all those things. He was there with his hair fucked up. And George is watching all these people walk in. And then... Uh, Did George get the part? No, George okay. And then, the, then the, the Italian guy from Holly, Harlem Nights was there. The one that fell in love with the hooker. Uh, uh, Miss Black, uh, Ma- Madam Heroin. Mm-hmm. It was a joke, and he kept saying, "Miss Heroin, she's beautiful." But the guy that most rang my bell was the black DA from Law and Order was there. Oh my God! Like this is how bad things are. That he's reading for fucking commercials. This just goes to show you what has become with the actor. Like they tell you about the price of gas going up. They tell you about unemployment all across the country. You know what? I never thought that the acting community would be in bad shape. The guy from Law and Order who had to be on there what? Seven, Seven eight fucking years is reading for an eight or whatever uh, Federal Express commercial. Right. You know, it really lets you think about where, I mean, there was some fucking heavy people in that room at one. The dude from New Jack City and Godfather 2 were there. I mean, these are things from a past, right. Right. but it's still just to show you what has happened that people, the levels of 10 years ago, these guys wouldn't even be in that room for a commercial. They'd be doing big time movies or mm-hmm. big time, and it's not them. It's the economy it's the that economy. slowed down. Mm-hmm. But it's yeah. funny to bring uh, George people out with you, and they see what you see on a daily basis, and what you look at is minute. You know, he was like that skip from The Sopranos. You know what I'm saying? Like it was kind of neat. Oh, and cool. we sat with him, and we bullshitted for a little while, and we giggled. And the main thing is like auditions for me. A lot of comics don't like auditions. A lot of comics feel like it's it's getting in their way of sleep and stuff. For me, it's, <laughs> it really is. A lot of comics, you see a comic of an audition, he's looking at his watch because he's got a plane to catch. You know, mm-hmm. he, he wants to get the fuck out of there. But I, I've found over the years that at first they were a little intolerable, but now I have a lot of fun at him. And there's a boxer that became the welterweight champion of, of some division, WBC, at the age of 44. His name was Vinnie Curdo. His name is Vinnie Curdo. He's still alive and kicking. Vinnie Curdo is a hilarious guy. He was on Miami Vice. He played uh, the goofy guy on one of the episodes where he fights Don Johnson. Mm-hmm. And he was in a great, great, great American film named 29th Street. And I always liked him. And one night I go to the store to perform, and who's in the audience? Vinnie fucking Curdo. And I go up to him, and I'm like, oh, my God, he's half Cuban. So it makes our relationship even more special. But he was a professional boxer. So over the years, he's lost his patois, as they say. Like, his mind is gone. So he'll come up to me and say, hey, how you doing? And you'll be with me. And I'll go, hey, Vinny, this is Felicia. And he'll go, hey, Felicia, how you doing? Then he'll walk away and come back and go, hey, Mary, what's up? Like, he'll call you 18 names. Mm -hmm. And then he'll tell you again, what was your name again, Felicia? He'll turn around and come back and ask you again. It got to the point where he used to irritate the shit out of me. He knows my name. He knows I'm Cuban. He remembers. But with other things, he doesn't remember. So now when I see him, I just fuck with him. So I go up to him and say, Vinny, did you hear, you know, De Niro's doing a new movie. What's the name of the movie? Death on Wheels. And he'll write it down. Then two minutes later, he'll come back and he'll go, what's the name of that movie again? Fucking De Niro fucks North Hollywood. 
But the best one was about, because he's really good friends with Joe Rogan, too. Uh-huh. We've always gone out for dinners, and we've oh, me and Joe had left there howling because he's that funny. He really, like, if, you, if this guy walked in right now, I'll tell you what, he's wrote two of the best scripts I've ever written. Watch one which he sold, which he had De Niro cast as Angela Dundee and Mark Wahlberg as himself, but he made a racial slur about De Niro's girlfriend at a party. So they pulled the fucking movie. This is a real story, I'm telling you. Uh-huh. I read for the fucking movie. It's one of the first things I ever read for. He, he told me, you're going in for this movie as the boxing manager. I knew nothing, Felicia. I had 10 minutes at the store. You know right, how it is when right. people call you in for shit. But he's always believed in me. And I love him dearly. But at auditions, I have to have a good time. So two weeks ago, I see him in a commercial audition. And he comes up and I go, Vinny, you know they're doing the Joe Rogan story, right? And he's like, come on. And he goes, yeah, I think he wants you to play his manager, right? So he goes, let me go get a pen. I'll come right back. And he goes, he gets the pen. Uh-huh. He comes back. He goes, what's the name of the movie? I go, uh, fear has no factor. And he wrote it down. <laughs> he, he leaves. He comes back. He's like, what's the name of Joe Rogan's movie? I go, News Radio 3. He left. He came back. He's like, what's the name of that movie again? By the end of the conversation, he even forgot whose movie it was. Right. But it's sad, but to me it's hysterical because I got to fuck with somebody all day. Right. And he knows I fuck with him. Right. Trust me, he's already hit me with a fucking jab oh, to the he side. Has? Oh, and he hits hard. <laughs> That's his main you thing. you still fuck with him? Oh, because we shot, in, so far we've been in this, I've been here with him 13 years and we've probably shot three national commercials together. Oh, really? One for uh, 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 Verizon two years ago, the Italian, the Italian, uh, the Italian uh, family's thing. Oh, uh-huh. Uncle Sal. Well, my Uncle Vinny's here. So me and him shot that commercial. We get there, and I'm fucking starving. And you know me, at 6 in the morning, I am stoned to the gills. We're shooting at Griffin Park. And I get there, and it's an Italian commercial. So I go, yo, where's the fucking food? And they're like, listen, we have no food here, but we have your Italian co cuts. Right? So I go over, and I taste one. They were turkey Italian co-cuts, like turkey prosciutto. It tasted like fucking ass, like horrible, like horrible. Yeah. So I'm thinking, right? I'm thinking, I'm thinking there's a scene in this commercial where the uncle has to eat. And they're like, Joe, you're going to do it. I go, you know what, bro? I can't eat meat. But Vinny loves Italian food, right? They, <laughs> <laughs> they gave him the tray. <laughs> they gave him this whole tray of shit. Yeah. And every commercial take, he had to take it and put it in his mouth. And he would look at me after every take and go, Joey, this is the worst piece of fucking turkey I've ever eaten in all my... I mean, it was that bad. Wow. It was from the night before. Yeah. So it's like every time we work together, I kind of do a practical trick on him, and he kind of knows, and he doesn't know. You know right, what I'm saying? Like, I try right. to fuck... But I'll tell you how fucking sharp this motherfucker is. The, that same commercial, we were sitting there. I swear to my mother's grave. We're sitting there. We're talking, and he's on the phone talking. And so I'm like, at the time, all of a sudden, he goes, what the fuck do you know, Al? What the fuck do you know? You don't know nothing about the Cuban... I got a Cuban kid right here, Al. Hold on. It's Pacino. Tell him how to fucking make fried bread. I was like, come on. Tell him. He's like, hello? I told you about yeah, this. Yeah. I shot the thing. I'm like, are you fucking serious? Are you fucking serious? And he's like, yeah, I talk to him every morning. I've known him for 30 years. So he just calls me. He's one of the guys that they call each other uh-huh. men, men gossip. Right. You know how men gossip yeah. about stupid shit? That's one of his men gossip buddies. Yeah. So the guy's not there, but he's there. Right. You know right. what I'm saying? So it's always a pleasure to fucking see him. I don't ever want none of you kids to go out and shoot somebody in the head or do drugs or nothing like that. I want you to learn from it. But I could sit here till I'm fucking blue in the face and tell you guys of the avenues to look for, the, the things to look for as a kid to avoid or whatever. And guess what? Somebody told me those things, and I didn't look out for them. So who the fuck am I to judge some kid or not to tell some kid? I just want you to learn from it. And his message was beautiful. He got the message, this kid. Mm-hmm. He said it. He goes, it doesn't matter where you start. It's where you fucking end up in your life. And we're all going to be fucked up in the beginning because you're all trying to feel what you want out of life as a, you know, as an adult. That's what you're thinking about when you're 16. What's my next fucking move? Some of us do. I know I did. I had no fucking choice. But this kid's letter was a little touching. He lost some weight. Mm-hmm. He's running three miles a day. Uh-huh. Uh, in the letter, I think he said he can't wait till he's a taxpayer to smoke pot. Oh, yeah. But I can bet this little giggly fuck has already smoked pot. I can just feel out of him. And I ain't mad at you. I'm not here to criticize what you do in your house or anything like that. I just want you to know what you're getting yourself into, and I want you to enjoy your kid life. Being a kid is the most important fucking thing in the world. Enjoy it. There's no rush. You're going to have plenty of time to be a man and to be an adult and to do all that shit. Be a kid. 
play with your computer, sleep on your fucking mother's couch till you can. Scratch your nuts and enjoy it and love your mother and help her take out the garbage and do what the fuck you can. Just become Wow, a, my nipples just got hard, just be, Joey. Like, just be, what? Yes, just become a creative yes, member of yes. society. Go to school. Be good to your parents. And the most important thing as a young man is fucking your character. Work on your character. You see a little fucking thing on the floor. Pick it up. It's the things that you do when people aren't watching you because don't let your character ruin your destiny. That's all I can tell you fucking kids. Listen to the podcast. Giggle. He even giggled about the hooker. He giggled. Right. You know, no, I love I know. you. You I have know. heart, kid. And all you kids that listen, you have fun. And I shouldn't call you kids. You're young men and young women. You got the, you, you deserve that respect. Nobody else gives it to you. Mad Flavor is going to fucking give it to you. But stay at home. You're going to have plenty of time to be a fucking man and to go out there and burn hookers or whatever the fuck it is you're going to do. Stay home. Learn to love your parents and help them as much as you fucking can because once they go, motherfuckers, they don't come back. My dad's stash of Super 8 films. And in the old days, everybody had Super 8. That was a point. There was no computer, no VHS. You had to set up your own fucking thing. It took time. You know what I'm saying? If you went to porn, it took time in those days. Yeah. And you had to go to a porno thing and order the movies, and then you could order a projector. You had to have your own fucking projector. Does that, does that make the porn better if you have to, like, set go through this whole plan, order it, get How the fucking equipment. amazing is that? And yeah. now you can just turn it on. Did, did you think on. the porn was, was felt more illicit because you had to work so hard for it? Like, I now just, it just seems like it's just, it's like just porn. And I remember being, like, in the seventh grade and my parents being gone for the day and me getting, like, six people over and smoking dope and we'd go upstairs and set up this fucking fake you know this camera uh -huh. and we'd watch like and I, and I till this day I still remember we watched like maybe two points and we just shut the lights out and I told the story when I uh, when I did the CD last year the fucked up CD that you know she took a piece of bread I mean we're kids we're just learning about yourself and here you are watching this lady take a piece of bread put Miracle Whip, whip on it mm -hmm. and put it on a guy's dick and eat it and it wasn't even Wonder Bread it was this crusty fucking lunch school lunch bread uh -huh. and she said and I remember like half the guys were like oh that looks like fun and deep down inside my fucking little fat heart was breaking I'm like that's <laughs> disgusting you be giving that bread to pigeons yeah, you know what I'm saying yeah. you're wasting on a fucking disgusting dick and I just remember the whole porno thing. It never really grabbed me after that. Like, after that, people say, let's go up and watch your dad's pornos. And I'm like, dog, I don't want to do that shit. Like, yeah. I just, but that, that fucking hooker house was the nail in the coffin. So, I, I don't know. Because I remember growing up later on and seeing pictures of my mom after my dad died. And for, like, a bunch of pictures, it was just me and my mom. She would be at the bar bartending, and there'd be a little... Thing and I'd be sleeping in the corner, you know. There's a picture of me and my mom with Celia Cruz on stage and some other guy at my mother's bar, and my mom on stage with a Moroccan, and me with a bottle and a sock falling off. You know what I'm saying? Oh, you have that picture? No, if I had that picture, yeah. it'd be worth millions today. <laughs> it'd be worth fucking millions today. Celia Cruz and yeah. my mother on stage, it'd be worth fucking millions. And my mom, me with a Moroccan with the bottle and a sock falling off. Are yeah. you fucking? My mom took me everywhere. You know, there was nothing that. She didn't take me to see it. It was fucking crazy. Uh, I'm going to say the story on the air because it's been bothering me. So let's get it out of the open. And uh, when my mother died, they were the Cuban family. I hung out with a lot. And she said something to me. She goes, I remember you. She goes, when I seen the longest shot, oh, my God. She goes, I remember you being 110 pounds, if that. And you always had a basketball with you. She goes, you always had a basketball with you. And I used to go to the house, and then when my mother died, they came to the wake, and they said, you know, we're a Cuban family, and we think your mom would want us to stay with a Cuban family. And they were very nice. They were very, very nice. And we're going to get into this now, because we had gotten into this before. And as I got older, you know, I got fucked up, and one Friday I went over there to rob somebody else, and I ended up robbing them. I took $400 from their house, and it, it just destroyed me. You know, I was caught up in the coke, but they lived on top of Martin the Fag. The story I told you about six yes. months ago about the Santeria guy. And we would sit upstairs and they go, oh, my God, the guy downstairs is gay. And the girls would say he's gay and he deals with Santeria and we think he's up to drugs. And I'm like, really? That's fucking crazy. I make believe like I didn't know what it was. And one day as we're walking down the stairs, Martin's like, Coco, how are you? And I'm like, and they're like, how do you know Martin? And Martin and my mother were drug partners before my mother died, kind of, sort of. They knew mm -hmm. when to get the same coke together. And when, when my mom died and my Santeria stuff had to go somewhere, it couldn't come with me, Martin took it. Well, years later, I ended up robbing Martin for the coke. 
And to this day, I think he put a fucking Santeria spell on me because I couldn't stop snorting coke after that. But it's really weird that <laughs> these people came into my life on Facebook. That for a couple, like three weeks in a row, I came here and told you drug dealer stories from Facebook. So finally, Facebook is really starting to pay off. Then there was another. <laughs> and then there was another girl that was friends with them. And every Saturday, we used to go to their house and watch The Love Boat. Oh, yeah. And Fantasy Island. Yes, yes, And we'd yes. sneak some of their dad's booze, but the uh -huh. father was a god to me because he was one of those guys that was a fireman, but not really. He was an EMT. So they sent him into all these buildings to save people. There was a show on TV about that. And it was my favorite show. And this was her father. Not emergency. One of those rooms about oh, these really? guys. And I'm like, you do that. And then to top it off one day I'm in the city and I actually seen him. There was a fire. And I see Mr. Moran coming down the thing and I'm like, I fucking know him. That was my idol. That's what I wanted to be when I was a kid. Here, her father was one of these guys. So I would go to the house all the time and Kathy and I would run every night. She was a year older than me and she was into track. So we'd run every night. Every night we'd fucking run. Best friends. This is how long I've had women as friends. And she started dating a really good friend of mine that was 20 years ahead of his time. His name is Juan Rodriguez. He's the only family like the, the, my, like my wife's fucking family. They named their, both their kids the same name. You know, my wife's sister's name is Teresa, too. <laughs> Shut up. Really? Yeah. My sister, my really? wife and her sister have the same name. They just call Teresa Ann, Teresa Ann, and they call my wife Terry. But they both have the same name. These kids had the same name, Juan Carlos Rodriguez. Juan was the older one. Carlos was the younger one. Mm -hmm. And Juan and his brother were hysterical. I mean, half the shit I talk about now, it's because of Juan Rodriguez. This kid came into my life. He was a Cuban kid from Pensauk in New Jersey, close to Neptune, close to Philly, all that. And he was basically black. And he played ball, Felicia, like a black guy. Top fucking game, dribbled, amazing basketball player. But the shit that came out of his mouth. And in New York at those times, in the summers, I was a big basketball geek. And there used to be the Shore League, which was all nice kids that went there. Jim Spinarkle from Duke and all these nice colleges. Then there was the Rucker League. Did you see Man on Fire? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end, Denzel Washington has a jacket that said Rucker. Rucker is a league in New York that is amazing. It's in the heart of Harlem. And in the 70s, it was all black. But Dr. J would show up. All these black players would show up. And it was all these kids that couldn't get into colleges. They had shot somebody or they were hooked on heroin. But these were the best players in the fucking world at the time. And they would play in this neighborhood in Harlem. And people would come from all over. But the 6 to 8 game, the 6 o'clock to 8, was for nice... In those days, there weren't no fucking yuppies. It was a couple Irish kids going up, a couple girls that looked like you. But the 8 o'clock, the midnight games, if you were white, you didn't go to Rucker. That's just the way it was. Mm -hmm. But guess what? what? Me and my little white crazy motherfucking friends would go to Rucker in the 7th and 8th grade to watch basketball. And then we'd go home, lie to our mothers, and stay on the court to practice the moves we would see the guys do. Amazing stories. Yeah. But one night, me, and then the, finally the mothers got together and said, you motherfuckers can't keep going to Harlem. You're going to get killed. You're going to get killed with your little basketballs or your little dollar bills and your gold bracelets. So they decided to send a teacher over there with us. And we had this teacher. His name was Mr. Ketter. And looking back, I could have sworn the guy was a fucking pedophile. But you know what? He really was. And he really was into basketball. And he would wear colored socks mm -hmm. with shoes. And he had a crew cut haircut. But this guy took the time to take a handful of kids into Harlem. And one night, we all go into Harlem. One fucking hot summer night, we're in Harlem with our little basketballs, like little geeks. Remember when I got mad at my wife for touching your kids' oh, basketball? Oh, that's right. Th now oh, you get it. I was a basketball it. geek, dog. There was no confusion <laughs> then. I'm no, sitting there. You really oh, are. my God. I'm sitting there with my little fucking basketball, and we're watching the games. And also on the way out, is, and I hate to say it, it's nothing but black people. And it's me, Georgie Kenna, Chucky McBreen, and Juan Rodriguez. And we're walking out. And the whole thing, he's got a karate jacket on. He's got a karate jacket on. Who does one? Juan, Juan, the yeah. whole show. And this is what Kathy said to me yesterday. She goes, he was 20 years ahead of his time. This motherfucker had a karate jacket on in Harlem. It's 1975. <laughs> As we're walking out, we're all three feet ahead of him. And we look at him and we go, we can't fucking believe you wore a karate jacket. And he looks at us, he looks at the black people and he goes, you don't see nobody fucking with me, do you? And that was it. And that was it. And Juan was just a great... His father was a big thing for Goya. And we graduated high school. We all stayed in touch. And he went to Miami. It was the big Miami thing. And they went down there. And uh, Juan did blow one night. And he got an aneurysm and died in 1987. And it was really sad for me. But his brother Carlos and me were the same age. And they both had the Peaks Widow. 
mm-hmm. you know, that Peace Widow, right. and they both had their hair back. Right. So they both kind of had a resemblance to Eddie Munster, you know? <laughs> so the younger brother and me were playing in fucking East Orange, New Jersey for a Christmas basketball tournament. Again, East Orange is the home of Naughty by Nature, Queen motherfucking Latifah. This is real. You go in there and they're locked, the doors lock and the black chili to start stomping. Go, go. And all of a sudden you're a freshman. You're like, what the fuck did I get myself into? And we're on the bench and it's a Christmas tournament. We're playing Our Lady of Grace, Our Lady of Garages. It's Our Lady of Grace. It's, it's uh, East Orange. It's a bunch of high schools. And we're playing and Carlos takes the ball out and this black kid goes to cover him. You know when you take the inbounds ball out mm-hmm. and then the kid goes to cover him and we're on the bench right there and the black kid looks at the other friend of his and he goes, Look at this motherfucker. He looks just like Dracula. That was all we needed to hear. There was no basketball. Everybody fell off because for years we've been calling Eddie Munster. We all fell off the thing. And after that, his name was Dracula. The other night I sat outside the haha and listened to two young comics talk. And it was like they spoke for two hours about comedy in the way I like to talk about it. But it was going nowhere. Like they were both like stating their case but arguing at the same time mm-hmm. it's kind of weird and it's like whether it's politics or the tea party or shit like that it's like when you fucking die and go to wherever the fuck you gotta go you're gonna look down and see how much time you wasted worrying about shit that didn't fucking matter in your life you really are that's when it's gonna hit us like what the fuck was I thinking like the other day uh, I was at Eddie Bravo's house and I was saying to him Eddie can you take Twitter and take a picture and put it right on Twitter from your iPhone and he was telling me yes I'm not good with technology and my, and my wife is like you know what Joey could do it he's just fucking lazy he just doesn't want to do it and I've tried to do Twitter mm-hmm. from my phone but then again this is my other stand if I have to use my Twitter when I'm, I'm out I'm not living if I have to oh, check my yeah, Facebook yeah, when yeah. I'm out at Felicia's house then I'm not living do you know what I'm saying if I gotta twit you that I'm eating lunch at Marie St with Felicia, then I'm not really living. So when I'm doing business, I'm doing business. When I'm in front of the, you know what I'm saying? I don't want a lot of things to become that easy. And this is why I try to live life. I mean, a lot of people, when I go to do comedy, I'm thinking about my fucking set. I may not be thinking about it, but I'm thinking right. about my set. You know how it is before you do fucking comedy. That was why the other day when we were talking about the pictures, you said, I know you don't like taking pictures. Before I do comedy, I don't wanna do nothing. I want to talk a little bit. I want to get into like a, I want to get my blood going a little bit. Just a tiny bit. I want to get mad at something, aggravated, and then I want to walk away. (laughs) Are (laughs) you serious? Yes. When I do comedy, (laughs) the best comedy I could do is when I have a little fury. You achieved that Friday night. What's that? (laughs) You achieved that Friday night. No, I get, that's what I need. Because you did exactly that. That's what I need. When I need, when I do comedy, it's a different, it's like when I, I've been trying to tape yoga from the people in Mad Flavors world. I've really been trying to tape yoga. I've been really trying to take my camera over and get the downward dog and everything. But yesterday I said to myself, why am I coming to yoga if I'm taping this? I'm focusing on a camera instead of what I should be focusing on. So yoga has been scrapped from Mad Flavors world. Yeah. Because when I go to yoga, I go to fucking yoga. Uh-huh. I don't go to yoga to be cute or to giggle for a camera. I go to yoga to really get the fucking breathing. I gotta fo- so I'm trying to focus on the breathing and I gotta worry about the camera. Is it in the right angle? So yesterday... When I do something, I like to, and, and, and it just goes back to, you know, like today I went somewhere this morning and I wanted to get something to drink. I was at a gas station. I walked in and they're talking about what's this going to do to the country, the S&B and all this shit. And then I went somewhere <laughs> else and I had to drop off a file. And again, they were talking about Obama, blah, blah, blah. And it's so weird that the shit we worry about at the end of the day, if we focused it, and I, we talked about this before, that... But you didn't know about that? I have to get mad before I go on stage. That I do that so all, anno- yeah. I do no, it all the time. Yeah, yeah. I do it yeah, all the time. You know what? Because I noticed that because sometimes when I do you it go all the to time. Brea, you're very cranky. At very that. cranky. And you always try to slip a fart in there somewhere and then I'm, you get mad that it's, been, you know. Very yeah. cranky because I'm trying to get my, I don't have time, fucking time. You, you know, I, I noticed these comedians that get cute off stage. <laughs> and they get on stage and they bomb. Right. What was it? You wasted your cute. You just wasted your fucking cute on two comics in the green room. Do you understand me? You just wasted your fucking cuteness. Maybe that's the story of my life. No, you just wasted your cuteness. And it goes back to that story when I first came to town. I stood online all day at the Laugh Factory. 
and there was a guy there, and I didn't know nothing, so I didn't say nothing. I just sat there with Gavin and giggled. And there was a guy there all day that knew everything. Oh, don't go to the comedy store because uh, Messina Baker won't see you there. Don't go to the improv and do a tenor. I mean, he knew everything. He fucking knew everything. And when it came 7 o'clock and Jamie put him up, he fucking froze up. And I went oh, up to him really? after the show and I go, dog, if he didn't talk, so, I, it, it just, like, it hit me. So I had to let him know. I, let, I didn't know him. He was older than me. I thought we were going to throw down. But I went up to him like a man. I go, dog, not for nothing. If you would have talked all fucking day and worried about what was in front of you, you would have fucking killed tonight. And he looked at me. And a month later, I seen him selling lighters. <laughs> And he still sells lighters and oh, silver really? rings. Oh, really? He's like Hungarian. He lives in this car. He's always trying to open up a comedy club in Orange County. Orange County needs a comedy club. I'll call you. I know. Then he opened up something and people went down in. The windows were blacked out. And he had no liquor license. So you waste your time on what's fucking in front of you. I had this. When I first moved to Colorado, I didn't really have a lot of contact with people outside of New York. And there was a guy upstairs. His name was Ken. And he was from Kentucky. So he used to call him Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> Ken would always show up at dinner time. Uh -huh. Hey man, what are you guys doing? Eating? You mind? Every night, five nights a week. And I lived with a guy that was a chef. And at that time, I used to cook a little bit. You know, I was I knew what I wanted. I'd make like steaks, and I'd get Oscar Mayer salami and cut it up and throw it in a salad with Italian dressing. And we we'd make. Lo I used to shoplift a lot from Village Market then, so I used to buy a steak, but shoplift two steaks and a lobster tail. You know what I'm saying? I just would go to the counter, so they would never suspect me. So we would always have like little treats at night and shit. Whenever I did, at that time I wasn't really full first burglarizing yet. I was just getting the landscape of, of yeah, uh, Snowmass you were Village. Cock teasing yourself of so Snowmass this, Village, yeah. also known as uh, Farmville, so, the victims. <laughs> so this fucking guy would come down every night, eat our food, then get into an argument. Uh -huh. But he got into an argument because he was very right wing and very like you know Christian and proper. Oh really? So he would ar eat our food and then uh -huh. argue about like. Our ways, it was me and my buddy from North Bergen, and we were a little crazy. And how did you meet him? He was a neighbor, and we all, you know, in Colorado, uh -huh. people talk, hey, man, how you doing, whatever, and, and you know, me, whatever, bye. You know, lesson number one, lock your neighbors next door, right, whatever, see you soon. Because if not, they start knocking, but you don't know at the time, this right. is how you learn. So he would come over every night and every night, and every night he'd leave with a fucking argument. One night, I finally said to him, dog, you know what, if you don't like our fucking ways of thought here, don't eat our fucking food, get the fuck out. So we kind of like became like little enemies and he used to ride his bike. And, and so one Friday night, I'm sitting in my apartment, bored as shit. I just got like my $8 an hour check and I'm like, hmm, who can I rob? And I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna rob Kentucky. I'm so <laughs> pissed off, I don't know, I'm just gonna rob him. Fuck him, he eats plenty of lobster tails here. So Jimmy wasn't home, my roommate at the time, nobody was home. Kentucky was an Aspen drinking. And I said, fuck this motherfucker. So I go behind my building and there's a balcony and I can't reach it. And I have no strength in my shoulders. Really bad, Felicia. Really? I've never done a pull-up. Like really? when I used to take the presidents and exams and shit when I was a kid, I could never do I've never done a pull-up. And it's embarrassing, but fuck it, it's beauty and the beast, right? So uh, I couldn't pull myself up. Felicia, I devised this <laughs> concoction. <laughs> And this is, and like today, if you said, like, I put a bar chair on top of a stool, uh -huh. on top of three bricks, on top of a notebook with a ladder next to it, and I got on the ladder and then climbed up to this fucking make shift fucking pole, <laughs> and I grabbed onto the balcony and I put my leg over and I went to the kid's house and I looked, and I mean, I searched for hours. And he would always come down, you know, he was a cheap fuck, and he would always come down and say, Yeah, I just got a big check from my daddy. I'm going to go put it in the bank and all this shit because I don't trust people in the area. Like, he would always goof on us like that. Right. I'm saying, I'm going to show this motherfucker who not to trust. I go upstairs. I gut out this fucking house. I can't find it. I can't fucking find it. I'm pissed. I leave, but I leave the front door open as a message just to fuck with their heads. You always leave the front door open just because maybe they're confused. I left the front door open. They don't know. I got high. I was on the phone. And I went downstairs, and I'm like, no, nah, that motherfucker's got cash upstairs. So I went to the bathroom, and I looked around the bathroom, and sure enough, I opened up the Band-Aid thing, and there it was rolled up. And <laughs> oh Remember God. in the old days, it was a metal yeah. container? It right, wasn't like, now right. it's paper. Uh -huh. In the old days, it was a cool container. When you ended it, you, you would take it and put marbles in there and right, shit, you know? Right. He had it rolled up in here like 300 bucks, so I fucking clip it. I go down to the Stone Bridge. I got a steak, a la carte. You know what I'm saying? I'm buying drinks for people. I get myself a Jibo of Coke, and I go back and hide. I do the gram of coke, and sure enough, the first fuck I knocked the next morning is Kentucky. 
And I remember I didn't say nothing to Jimmy because Jimmy at this time was out. So uh-huh. by the time he got home, I was in my room paranoid from the coke. I wasn't coming out. <laughs> so we went to bed, whatever. Jimmy was in the other room. And I get up the next morning. I'm we'll making breakfast. And sure enough, we hear the knock. And it's Kentucky. And he's like, man, I got robbed last night. And <laughs> <laughs> That's a terrible story, but and, a funny one. <laughs> oh, no, J- Jimmy Burkle is fucking dying while he's eating because he knows it's me the whole time. <laughs> he's just laughing his fucking ass off. And this Kentucky's like, well, I already called the police. And when I was a kid, I took this detective course one time. I swear to God, he's you telling us really? this. We're fucking I, I dying. Really? And he's like, you take scotch tape and you put some powder on it and you can lift the fingerprint. So I'm going to... I'm going to lift the fingerprints and take them down to the station and show that to the policeman. But if you guys know who did it, let me know, and I won't do that. He knew it was us. Right. He knew it was me. You know he knew saying? it was you. But it was just so funny that after he <laughs> left, we died. And I don't know what happened to him. He, he was like a bike racer or something. But it was just so funny that he's a person that should be really paranoid. Like, I should feel bad for robbing him, but I don't. Because he was such a mooch and such a fucking scumbag in a way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. There's so much about him. I mean, it didn't justify what I did. It never justifies the action I did by robbing him for the $300. But I remember Felicia, he sat there and he kept saying, Man, I really, really need that $300. He sat there, Felicia, for at least an hour while we were oh, eating our man. eggs and shit. I'm already got the day planned out. I'm going up to fucking the town and buying some CDs and shit like that. And after that was when I started going on a tear in snow mass. And you know what? He always knew. Yeah. And he never said nothing to nobody. He always fucking knew that it was me. And then he moved away, and that was it. Life moved on. And in my situation, it was my stepdad. You know, after my mom died, we went at it with the money for the house. And I expected this, and I expected that. But I got pissed when he didn't give it to me. And then after I went to Colorado and went to prison, I guess the fucking the anger had gone out of my heart. And I started to accept him for what he was. And... We weren't tight my last 10 years while he was on this planet, but we talked, and he knew I loved him, and and with everything that had gone on between us, I knew he loved me, and he always wanted the best for me. But even my problem in life started way before my mother died, you know? It started way before, and it started with him. You know, when you live with your mother and a a man moves in and is a stepdad, it becomes a little challenge. It really does, between the men and this guy that's fucking moving in. Nobody wants... Anybody but my dad fucking your mom. You accept it. Kids don't think about it. You know, you're too young. But it's just the way it is. And there's this little subtle rivalry that develops between the boys. It's just a subtle rivalry developed between me and my dad. And after a while, after everything's that they try to expose you to your mother. You know, that's what they're, that's what a stepdad does. Exposes right. you, you know. Mm-hmm. And with me, he would tell my mom, listen, you better watch this motherfucker. This guy ain't the sweetheart you think he is. <laughs> this guy's got potential for fucking to make it happen, yeah. you know. So I always knew that he would tell my mother little things. Like he would drive by and slow down by the park and see me playing hoops. And he would get mad at me like, you didn't mow the lawn, but you have time to play hoops. and You know, shit like that. But he kind of exposed me. So my way to lash back at him was to steal money from him. Uh You know, from the time I was in the fucking fifth grade, I would just, you know, there was money all over my house, Felicia. He had money in his pockets. Did you get caught a lot? Did did, No. Yeah. No. He had an idea. Right. He would have an idea. But you never got caught. By my stepfather. Yeah. No. Did you get caught by your mother? She had an idea. I didn't clip from my mom. My whole war was with my stepdad. And so would he stomp around and say... Yeah. 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 So he would... He had money in the closet downstairs, about $50,000, and then he had cash in his pocket at all times. Then he had money under the fucking bar downstairs. He had money in the trunk of his car that he wouldn't drive in a garage. Uh He had money under the bureau in stacks with rubber bands, but he would pull his hair out and put the hair under the rubber band and all this shit. He was just a very keen guy. He knew how to hide things, and especially after he found out somebody was clipping him, which was me. And I wouldn't just clip him, Felicia. I was a kid. So he would put his money, like let's say in $1,000 stacks under one rubber band. He would have $10,000, but he would count a thousand, Uh fold it. I would go down and take a thousand at the age of 12. Like I'd just go clip a thousand. What did you do with the thousand dollars at the I'd age of twelve? I'd buy dinners for my friend. We'd go to fucking top restaurants. I'd go into the city and eat. I would gamble. I'd go to the track. I'd buy bicycles. When you were twelve? I'd buy bicycles, and they didn't know. I would hide shit at my friends' houses. 
So let's say I bought a bicycle, I come here and give it to your son and say, keep the bike here, go ride it when you want, just don't let nobody know it's my bike. Let's say, oh, let's sure. say I went and bought a, let's say I went and bought a, let's say I went and bought a, I was very generous when I was a kid because uh -huh. I knew this was a score. Right. Even at that age, I know it's a score, I gotta take care of my buddies. So I would steal money from my dad and like take them to restaurants or to get cheeseburger. I swear to God, I would take my friends to buy clothes, whatever. And I just, that's the way my mother raised me. When you have money, you fucking, you know, you spread it around. You like the Pied Piper. I learned that from my mother. So I would burn through this fucking money. I would burn through this money. People always said, this motherfucker got money. I would pay for movie theaters. I would lend money out to my friends. I didn't care. I didn't work for the money. I had no work ethic, you know? I did work for my mother. <clears throat> he had this jar that he dedicated his life to St. Lazaro. And he had this jar. I mean, a bottle of Chivas Regal, mm -hmm. the big, 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 right. big bottles yeah. that was filled with silver dollars and hundred dollar bills that he would just stick in there, hundred dollar bills as a donation to the church at the house. And then when they would fill up, he'd take it all and throw like a party or something in that saint's name. Uh -huh. Get a bunch of animals, kill them and cook it for the saint. I would take hundreds, three, four at a time when I was in the sixth grade, seventh grade. <laughs> It was terrible, and he knew, and he would complain, and he'd set me up, and if I knew he was watching that particular bundle, I wouldn't hit it. I'd hit the bundle in the closet. You follow me? So he knew how to work <laughs> me, you know? But today I was reading, uh, today was the 34th anniversary of Elvis's death, uh -huh. and uh, it was really weird because I remember Elvis's death, and not because of that, but because one of the days I robbed my stepfather for the biggest score I ever had. And at this time, me and him really didn't like each other. I was about 13 or 14 because I was always playing basketball. And him and my mother were pretty much over, except for the shouting. Like he was still sticking around for God knows what. My mom had the bar and he had his own thing and he was a millionaire. And him and my mom were at this little war that he, my mom felt he should put money into her book making bank and he was like, fuck you bitch. So it was almost over. So at this point I was just trying to rob him all the time. But for some reason we were getting along and I had gone to a basketball camp that summer five star and I had another basketball camp I wanted to go to it was called Superstar in Jersey City, New Jersey and it was run by the coaches of St. Anthony's that the school is a powerhouse for basketball his sons went on and played for Duke and they won the national championship this is way before that those little boys that won the national championship were four and three when I was at that fucking camp so what happened was I wanted to go to this camp it was $140 to go to the camp for the week or $90 or something to go to the camp and I needed 90 plus I needed a bus fare plus lunch money, I kinda asked my mother for it, but my mother was already, I had blown, I'm I tell you, I hit the number, uh -huh. so I had blown that money by this time, so I couldn't go to my mother for the camp money. If I would've gone for the camp money, she would've said, what'd you do with the $2,500, you fucking hit the number? What'd you do with that money? So I couldn't tell her, so I'm like, how am I gonna get the money for Superstar Camp? And I'm sitting in front of my fucking house, and who do I see coming up to my house with my stepdad? And he hits the garage door open, he pulls up with the car, and he goes, what are you doing? And I go, nothing, I'm just, and he goes, you want to wash the car? And I'm like, oh, this is my chance to rob him because he's going to go upstairs and hang up his pants, you know, and then I could rob him. <laughs> so he went up, hung his pants, came back down with the bucket and everything. He goes, let's wash the car. And he goes, aren't you going to change? And I go, yeah. And as I went upstairs to change, I hit him. I go, this is the one I have to hit him. But he would walk into the garage to see if he would hear me walking into the room. I mean, it was fucking, he had it down. So I had to do it just right. So I would walk up, walk into my room, and I knew that he would walk in. And when he hit me in my room, he'd walk him back out to the car. And then I'd run into his room. And that one time I went into the room, and this was one of the times I was, like one time he had his money tied up and so much with the rubber bands that as I was taking the money out, the rubber band broke and all the hundreds went up in the air. <laughs> and they're all floating. I'm trying to put the rubber bands together and shit. And I finally found the rubber band, and he came back down. He goes, this isn't my rubber band. He goes, I buy my rubber bands at one place. I mean, this is how slick this motherfucker. Yeah. Because not only was he watching me, he had a bank in New York, and he had to leave money there. So he always didn't watch his workers. So he would say, I buy these rubber bands at a certain place. They're two inches and they're tight. This is a four-inch rubber band. This is how cool and tight yeah. this motherfucker yeah. was. So I remember going upstairs. I went, boom, and I banged them, and I got 400 cash. And I had to hide it somewhere else because he would, if he found that it was missing, he would come looking for it, and he'd find it. So I had to run downstairs and go out to the yard and hide under the swimming pool until he went upstairs <laughs> and relaxed. And after we washed the car. Because you had a swimming pool and above ground swimming pool. Out in the yard. So yeah. I would hide it behind the swimming pool. Uh -huh. And I went out, hi, right, Dad, you want me to help you wash the car? And I'm like, whew, it looks like I'm going to camp. So I helped him wash the car. He went upstairs. <laughs> he made a milkshake. And he never said anything about the 400. 
But that next Monday, I took a bus to Jersey City and went to the Superstar Basketball Camp, and that was the day Elvis died. Uh, so I'll never forget. You're like, yeah. where's the story going, Joey, with Elvis? No, like, I was totally waiting. And when I went to uh, that camp, you know, Elvis had died, and, and that's what made me think about it. But in the long, t like, that's what I first thought of today. But at the other side of it, I also thought about how bad I felt that I had done that. How bad I felt that all those years, I always accused him of exposing me when... I had exposed myself, and I just put the blame on him. You know, I wish that I could go back to that time period. I would be the best son that I could be to him because even as a stepfather, all he wanted from me was the best. Even though he was fucking nuts and, you know, he smacked people and all that shit, I got to be honest with you, he always wanted the best from me. He was a solid, solid guy. But, you know, I blamed him for something that happened with me. When he realized he couldn't raise me how he wanted to, he lost interest. And who the fuck am I to do, be mad at him for that? That's the same thing I did with my daughter. When I realized I couldn't raise her like I wanted to because I had plans for my daughter. My daughter wasn't going to be like any other girl. My daughter wasn't going to fall for that shit. My daughter wasn't going to fuck till she was 20. You know what I'm saying? I was going to train her to be a fucking killer. I was going to train my daughter to slice people up. She's going to be beautiful, but she was going to go on the service and shoot people. I was going to train my daughter to be a fucking killer and a lady. You know what I'm saying? At the same time, I had plans. <laughs> right. But when I realized I couldn't raise my daughter, to the way I want, I lost interest. And it's probably like a natural thing. I just lost interest. You know, I only had my daughter 10 hours a week, and I couldn't really give her what I was about in those 10 yeah. hours. She was five or six. With me, he was trying to make me into a man and dog. Half the shit, half the principles I live by today yeah. are his principles. I wish he was still alive so I could tell him that most of the things I do today are based on the things he taught me. He was a no-nonsense type of guy. Yeah. That compliment you paid me a couple months ago about me taking things, and that was his gift that he gave to me as a man. He was a man, Felicia, and uh, he wanted things done like men. And I was too young, and I thought he was an idiot, and I wish I had the opportunity over to tell him I was sorry. And, uh, you know, my problem started way before my mother died. It started by stealing from him and lying to him. And I wish I had the chance to apologize to him today. That's it. Fuck Elvis. No, fuck <laughs> fuck Elvis. Elvis. But I was feeling kind of weird today, and I got this Facebook from this kid, and uh, it asked me when I worked with the guys from basketball, what did I think? And and I said it was okay. And, but then he hit me with, he wanted a better answer, so I hit him on his message board, and I told him what I thought. And I didn't think much about it. And he hit me up today, and he goes, thank you for returning the message to me. It was very nice. Nobody ever hits me back. I'm 14. I listen to the podcast, and I just lost my mother in March. Oh, and I got to tell you something, Felicia. It's like that somebody had just stabbed me in the fucking back. I looked at his picture, and I could tell he wasn't prepared for what was going to happen to yeah. him. And I just went back and forth with him, and he was telling me about his family situation, what had happened. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about, you know, five months after his mother died, he's on fucking Facebook, and he seems okay, you know. And I was like... Uh, you know, everything's going to be all right because at least, you, you know, he, he asked me, he goes, did you ever feel like you didn't give a fuck? And I told him, that's part of the symptom of, you know, they took your mother, guy. Somebody took your mother. God took your mother. Society took, you don't know who it is, but you can't really put in. One of the symptoms is you want to fight back. You don't care. You want to die. And I told him that. I go, hey, man, I was ready to kill somebody because, in fact, I, I was hoping he'd kill me. You know, he would do me a fucking favor. After I shot him, he'd have a gun in his BB gun, in his sock or something. But it was just weird. Uh, we went back and forth for a little while. I don't really have much to say about the kid. You know, we just went back and forth. I looked at his profile. But it just struck a chord, like a chord that I don't even like going to. Like, I really broke down for like 10 minutes because I can't imagine. He's 14. You know, he's looking at life, and all of a sudden, yeah. whatever, whoever, your mom goes away. You know, and uh, it's just, and I told him that just don't let it get to you and just focus on the things your mom wanted for you. You know, that's all you can fucking do, Felicia, really. I'm in a bar one day at, at, at a Lobo Loco. Josh Wolf from Chelsea lately ran this bar. <laughs> this was his daytime job. And <clears throat> we would sit there and have lunch. They had a Romero was the cook, and he'd make the best fucking Mexican food in the world. And one day we're sitting there talking about gambling, and some kid comes in there, some fucking pigeon. And I know the statistics for gambling. You're going to lose. I know that even if you get me the first week, you're going to fucking lose. I just got to cut you off before you start winning. Yeah. That's the beauty of gambling. You have to fucking figure out, especially when you don't have a bank. So I lied to this guy and told him I had connections in bookmaking. And the guy's like, I want to put bets in with you. The first week, the guy loses 800 This guy's like a grape for me. 
So he gives me 800. Second week, he loses like nine. Third week, he loses like a thousand. The third week, he loses like three grand. And he's got to pay me, but he's like, listen, I'm sick and tired of paying you. Something's up here. I want to meet your guy and all this shit. And I said, listen, either you give me my fucking money or this is over with. I'm going to get in the car and go to those days. The big room on Wednesdays was in Moscow, Idaho for John Fox. I go, I'm going to Idaho. When I come back, you'll be dead. So either give me my fucking money. He goes, all right, I'll give you a thousand bucks. And he worked for a phone company. He goes, I'll set you up with a phone line. And uh, oh, I swear to God, I had free unlimited 1-800 number for people to call me in. Uh-huh. And I had a free 1-800 number for me people to call out. Right. It was the weirdest fucking thing. And I would do sports betting from there. This is so fucking crazy. I even remember this shit now. And I remember I was going to kill this kid on the street one day. Like I had a hammer in my hand. I'm like, I want my money. I'm like, if I hit this kid, I'm going to go to jail for life. You know, I'm going to go to jail for fucking life. You really had a hammer on the street? hammer on my hand. Really? Yeah, because what are you going to do? You got to get your fucking paper. You got to get your money, you know? So I had a hammer in the car. Did he pay you? He gave me like 1,100 bucks. And he's like, dog, uh, because I said to him right now, I go, either you have my money or I'm going to make a call. I'm going to go to Moscow, Idaho. I'm done with this. I don't even want the money no more. Yeah. But they're going to go to your house. They're going to come to where you work. You don't need that shit. Who's going to come to my, I don't know, three fucking guys with no necks. You don't need that aggravation. <laughs> and as I'm getting in the car, he's like, all right, all right, all right, all right. I'll make you a deal. He's like a oh, thousand bucks wow. and I'll set you up with this phone system. So I was a fucking bookmaker, like a fake bookmaker, combination sports information salesman. I did comedy at night. I became my mother. My mother's life, my mother's mission in this life was to make women stronger. My mother hated, like, uh, the reason why I can't take women talking in my house is because my mother didn't do that. Oh, my mother didn't like women at the house talking. My mother didn't like that. You know, my mother's famous words to me like, Ma, I don't like milk. Ma, I don't like making my bed. And she'd say, I don't like sucking dick, but somebody's got to do it. My mom always had a line mm-hmm. to make you feel like at first would throw you off, but then you're like, she's right. right. She's right. <laughs> and that was what my mom's gift was to the world. She always took you off your guard, and it took her two fucking words. So today this lady writes, and she goes, Felicia, my name is whatever. I love the podcast. Karen, Karen. My name is Karen. I love the podcast. I'm so <laughs> sorry about you and the activity partner. It must be so sad. And I wrote back, listen, bitch, Felicia Michaels don't need no sorrows. Her pussy is a survivor. <laughs> a survivor. You understand me? When at the end of the fucking world, there's gonna be a couple of rats, a guy walking around with a missing leg, and they'll show you a pussy walking with one leg shot, dragging like a fucking uterus and shit. You know what I'm saying? Down fucking sunset looking for a cock. What the fuck is going on here? The world will be like, I am legend. There'll be Will Smith, the dog, and your pussy, and a bunch of fucking vampires. <laughs> your pussy's a survivor. You always figure out a way how to squeeze juice out of some fucking helmet. I love it. And I called the high school teacher of mine. This is a fucking crazy story. And I called him up and he came and he put me in his house. In fact, I just seen the baby that was four when I lived with him. I just seen him at Burbank Airport. He works for fucking Warner Brothers. He's a man now. We talked and we had a beer and I got on my flight. And it's so weird that he was an AA. And he took me to a meeting. He goes, you don't want to stay at home with my wife? You come to a meeting with me. And I go, you know what? I got to get some weed anyway. You going to Newark? I go to Newark. And while you're at the meeting, I go get weed, you know? And... I went to the meeting with him, and he brought me to this meeting out of his heart, and he sat me down, at, and I hadn't done coke in about a week at that time, and I was really trying to get off the coke and trying to get my life together, and somebody said something that was fucking so stupid that I almost died. They're like, you know, when you're trying to get your life together, it's better that you don't date. And at that time, I wasn't really dating. I would get a gram of coke and go out and bump into a victim, and next thing you know, you're eating pussy and you're doing rocks, and you get up the next morning and you move on with your fucking life, yeah, and you still not feel a bad as, plan. No, and you still feel as shitty as you did when you went in. Because at the time, I was, I had, I was also in your position. I just stopped dating somebody that we were friends in high school, and we knew that we shouldn't have fucked around, and we fucked around and it ended up something bad. Thank God, today, thirty years later, we're best friends. I talk to her once a week on the phone. But it's so weird that at this AA meeting, somebody said something, and I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? And he goes, you know, when you try, I was 21 or 22, he goes, when you're trying to get your life together, what we recommend people is to stay celibate for a fucking year. And at that time, I wasn't Mel Gibson. It wasn't like I was getting pussy, but I was getting strange pussy, you know, four in the morning, tying them up, choking them, that type of cocaine, <laughs> crazy pussy. And I, and I thought about it. And you know what? I said, you know what? I'm not... And I still didn't, I didn't do any coke. I didn't do any coke. I, st- I worked as a bartender in New York and, and I didn't hit on nobody. I didn't really talk to nobody. And I, and I stayed celibate for like nine months. And I got to tell you, it made a big difference. 
You stayed celibate for nine, for nine months. months. Didn't even think about. It. I just focused on staying clean and trying to. And in that time, I tell you what I did. I, I got my life together. I got a job. I got back into the Sheridan Center. These are little things, and I put money together to move to Colorado. Uh, for good like I had gone there and ducked fucked around and went back to New York and got myself into drug trouble and shit and I said I'm gonna go to Colorado and I got my head good enough to be able to come to Colorado and you know start a bank account don't you know don't get me wrong I was still fucking around with stolen credit cards then but (laughs) I was in a different head and it was because it gave me nine months you know sometimes we start dating when we're 14 and we just keep going you just keep going, keep going, and you have the little ones, the two month ones, the messes in the middle, and the guy's sister that you fucked. There's always something. Right. And I said, let me just back out of this, and uh, it, it was amazing. I, I don't, you know, and at the time, I, like I said, I wasn't no Charlie Sheen. Like for a long time, my mom was getting massages for her arm, and I was sitting in the fucking room. I didn't like this guy. Yeah. I was eight. I didn't like yeah, this motherfucker. Yeah. You know. So I always want you to realize what the other flip side is. There might be peace. Right now, just get these fucking kids growing up and get yeah. them through the adolescence. Yeah. That's your main thing. If you go out and have a drink and you want to suck somebody's dick in a car, so be it. <laughs> suck but, somebody's <laughs> dick in a car? You know, I don't I mean, want to suck someone's dick in a car. I, know, but, I listen, want to suck someone's com- dick at Shutters in Santa Monica yeah, on a 300-count you know, sheets spread, with a fucking feather bed underneath it. Then it, I want to suck cock. Yeah, but if it covers the spread, if it scratches that itch... Just do what it takes. You're a fucking filthy animal freak. You and I both know that. You like to lick a ball from time to time. You like to get fucked heavy, people to tie you up and all. You know, you just got to pick your fucking battles. You know what's crazy, Felicia? I got to tell you something. You always break, break my balls about this. When I first met Terry, like, yeah, when you meet somebody and then you have sex, you get in, 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 you get a, yeah. you get caught up in the sex the first three months. And at one point, I got caught up in the sex with Terry, and I said, you know what? I don't want this. This is the weirdest thing that happened with Terry. And it all goes back to this. Today, something happened, or yesterday, something happened. And I go, this is pretty fucking strong, what I did. And I kept Terry at bay because I wanted to be her friend. I didn't want to confuse the sex with the... I swear to God, because all my other relationships, they were about fucking and sucking, and how quick can I fuck you? And, you know, when you're home, you got to fuck every day. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to slow this down and I'm going to get to meet her and fall in love with her for who she is and not fall in love with the pussy because a lot of times guys do that. And then once the pussy gets old, they realize they got nothing. They didn't know who the woman was. I got to be honest with you. This happens to fucking me. When I was really young, Felicia, I had this thing where I can name names off the bat of girls that I dated till I slept with. And I just lost interest. And I felt so shitty about that. Because it was like, that was it. I just wanted to get to conquer. And then as I got older, it was, let's fuck, let's fuck, let's fuck. Yeah, let's go to a movie, but we're going to fuck. We're going to go eat a cheeseburger, but we're going to fuck. Everything was accompanied to that fucking thing we did, that event. You know, there was an event. Even when I was 20, when I was dating my friend, I would go to the movies with her, and all I'd be thinking about when I was watching Ghostbusters was eating a fucking pussy from behind. I couldn't wait to get home. When this girl used to talk <laughs> to me about a family and shit, I didn't give a fuck. I would look in her eyes and just dream of me stabbing her and sucking her ass and, and, and it was wrong because I never got to see what these chicks were about no way you know and when I started dating Terry I was like I'm a cunt this sex shit. and she was frustrated for a while what are you cheating on me and shit but I just wanted to try if I could just get to love her for who she was instead of get the pussy confused with everything else that was just my little experiment yeah. and I'm with her 12 years and like I said I'm going to that age where I snap and I'll see a 20 year old fall in love and tell Felicia to shove the podcast up her ass I'm getting a vet whatever you know those fucking guys and I pray every day that that's not me because I love her for who she is you know I love you for who you are you know what I'm saying I've as I got older I said you know what I'm gonna like people for what the fuck they are you know and it's and if I don't like them after I stop doing blow I go that's a big problem with me my relationship with people especially being in Hollywood sometimes you have to talk to people you're really not crazy about but they have a job for you or they might have a job in the future. When I stopped doing blow, I said, I'm throwing that character flaw away with me. Either I like you or I don't. I don't give a fuck if you're Steve Soderbergh. If I don't fucking like you, I hear that this guy from The Hangover, everybody hates him, Todd Phillips. You know, I mean, I'm not kissing nobody's ass. I've never really been a big ass kisser, but I just don't want people to get confused. That was my thing. I wanted to really get to know people for what they were about. You know, that was just my experiment. A month ago, I was in the Rogan podcast, and Felicia, I just mentioned it. I mentioned about getting divorced and what it's like to pick up your child and have another man's cologne on, and you, you know, 
what the pain was. And all of a sudden, I started getting like an email every three days. This is a month ago. And every fucking three days, I got an email from a guy that this situation's happened to. That he was married and, you know, sometimes guys aren't well off and you need an attorney and all that shit gets involved and they lost their kid. They haven't seen their kid. There's a kid who sent me a YouTube thing that says he can't post his picture up on the YouTube because his wife and him, I mean... It, this this is very common, and the truth of the matter is, when I first got into comedy, I had so much pain from that situation that my goal was to get successful enough to spread this, to talk to people about this. To, there's a lot of people out there that get considered deadbeat dads or whatever because there's a lot of twists in the story. Yeah, there's a lot of bad fucking people out there, but there's a lot of guys that, you know, things happen. And this last weekend when I was writing this with this girl, we, we had all the topical stuff. The point of the story was that I walked away from my daughter because I was protecting her from me, you know, all this shit. And then I started thinking about it. I'm like, that's like kind of fucking cliche-ish. So we went out to lunch, and I started laying down what happened throughout the divorce. And looking at my wife, you know, my wife is sweet, probably purebred. I always judge things by my wife because she's as nice and sweet as can be, you know. And I was, I was telling the story to these people, but I was watching her, and I could see her mouth. And I'm like, I knew that there was something else here. And... and it's against my personality because basically, I don't want to say this because I'm not a whiner, but they kind of bullied me out. They bullied me out with the law, but I couldn't adjust to the law, so I went after him how I knew. And I never told you the story. In the middle of my separation from my wife, Felicia, did I ever tell you I got attacked, that they sent people to beat me up? Oh, no. You know, and it's so weird because I had a condo. All right, let, let, to, to tell you this, I'm just going to tell you this. I, I, I was at the halfway house. And one day, I knew that one of the counselors from the halfway house lived down the corner from me. His name was Adam. He was a Jewish kid from Long Island. Very nice to me. He was a counselor. He would throw you back in prison. But he was very fair with me. And one day, I'm walking my dog, and I see one of the other counselors coming out of his place abroad. And I knew from the rules that two counselors cannot have contact with each right. other. And here, they're fucking... And I walk up to them. I'm like, good morning. And they're like, uh, Joey, how are you? Oh, we just came over to get papers. And I'm like, okay. And that afternoon, I get to the halfway house. And sure enough, there's a note come up and see Adam. And I go see Adam. He's like, dog, what you seeing this morning? I go, Adam, how fucking you think I'm a crime stopper? I'm not a crime stopper. I go, but you know, you got to take care of me. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I ain't a crime stopper. But, you know, you got to give me a little slack. I understand. You got to put me but back. But I am for... at a halfway house. Yeah, but I am at a halfway house. So about a month later, we had become friends. He, he became a fan. Like, I didn't do comedy then, but he became a fan. I could tell he was proud of what I was trying. And he came to me. He goes, you like that place, those buildings over there? And I go, yeah. He goes, dog, my father bought me that. And I want to move him with this broad. The pussy's really fucking good. I mean, he didn't tell me like that, but I knew. Yeah. He's like, I want to yeah. move him with this broad. She was like 10 years younger than him. He goes, I want to sell it. But I don't want to go through the bullshit. I know you just came out of prison. How's your credit? I mean, that's how cool he was. Right. And I go, my credit's okay. I just got a school loan. And I got all these credit cards. He goes, let's do the paperwork. He goes, I'll give it to you for like, I don't know what it was, 8000 down and like 1800 a month. I'm like, done. It was gorgeous. In the heart of Boulder, you pull up. I had a, a, a beautiful bedroom, a, a living room that went down into a thing. In the back room was a sunroom that you use as an office and it has this thing to cool it off. So in the summer, you could put plants in there and in the winter time, you could just sit there and get sun and smoke dope. It was my little office. Then I had the upstairs. I had a loft, a baby's room and my bathroom with a bathroom, whatever. And one day she comes up to me after we get separated. She goes, listen, we're going to get divorced. So while we were together, we acquired this debt. Let's sell this condo. I'm like, let's what? This got nothing to do with you. I got this condo when I was fucking single. You know what I'm saying? Don't even start that shit. I've been living on people's fucking floors for the last 10 years. And now you want to show up with this condo shit. But at the time, the real estate market was still going. I go, fuck it. I just take my profits and go buy something else. So she goes, my father wants to for you to sell the condo. He has a realtor friend. And we'll pay off the credit cards. And then we'll split the rest. I go, no problem. Well, the profit was like 60000 this condo. You know what I got? 6000 And I'm like, how the fuck? And then I found out that she took thirty. And took all the credit card bills out of my side. So all I got after taxes was six fucking thousand dollars. And I called her up and I tried to get my money. She's like, listen, Joe, whatever. I'm going to move and the baby. I said, fuck it. Take it for the baby then. I figured I was doing the right thing. Right. Okay. Then she, I, I asked her about the child support. She goes, don't worry about it. Just pay for the daycare and take the, buy the kid clothes. and da, da, da. She was still living at a, a father's house. Well, a year later when we go to court... You know, I'm in trouble now. I owe fucking uh, 11 months at 355, and I'm in the thing. But that wasn't the point of it. This this continued to go, and I was very docile. Like, I was like, you know what? I just want to see my daughter. 
That's all I want to do. So one day I took her to see Jurassic Park and the boyfriend came at me. When he came out, he goes, hey, listen, me and Kathy spoke and you shouldn't be taking her to go see those movies. And at this point, I said, you know what, bro, not for nothing. Who the fuck are you? What's this we? What's this we? You got a mouse in your pocket, bitch? I go, if my wife has to say something about the baby, let her say it. You got nothing to say to me. And he goes, well, what are you, tough guy? So I spit in his fucking face, right? I just spit in his fucking face. Like, listen, don't even go there. You don't want to go into this. By this time, they were fucking with me a little bit too much. I mean, there's more to the story. I'm just trying to condense it to you. So one night, about a month after this happens, I go home. I was working for a sports betting service, and I had a balcony at the time. I sold the condo, and I was living with a friend of mine. I had a balcony, and I let my dog out. And you know Colorado. You let your dogs out. You leave your doors open. Yeah, you can yeah. put your wallet on the fucking porch. Leave it there overnight. And somebody will knock on your door and go, hi. You know how bold yeah, it is. Yeah. So I hear the dog squelch. Ew. It's like Fonzie stepped on something. You know, and you're like, hold on. I heard something. I go outside. And I don't see Hercules. So I figured that a possum got him or a porcupine. This boulder. Yeah. This is the bottom of the foothill. So I go, fuck it, let me run down. So my garage is open. I run down. Felicia, as I'm running down, he runs from the side of the house. So I go to get him. The dog. The dog. Yeah. And all of a sudden I hear, whoosh, like, whoosh, like, and I turn around. And by this time, I, I don't see anything except a white. It's dark. And I see a stick in the guy's hand. And I hear another guy going, get him, get him. And all of a sudden he goes, whoosh, and I block up, but he hits me in the rib, and they fucking just, I heard the, tsk, and I just, my wind went out of me and shit, but when he hit my rib, I'm a big guy, he dropped the handle on his stick, and it fell. So I went to get him a little bit, and he tripped or whatever, and he falls, and then he gets up and runs, but I turn around, and they had a weight, uh, uh, they had a uh, driver, uh -huh. like a, a, getaway weight, driver. a getaway driver waiting. Now he sees that it ain't going well. What happened was, I turn around, and the guy doesn't know where to jump on me, and I just had jumped straight. And I'm, at this time, I'm not 300 pounds. I'm 225. I had a punching bag. I'm lifting. So they picked the wrong fucking guy. Plus, it was the tail end of the craziness. Yeah. It was the tail end of the craziness. So when I got out of the halfway house, I got a job at this car wash. And this car wash in Boulder is central headquarters to Boulder. The cops go there. Undercover cops go there. Everybody goes there. The mayor goes there. They get his car wash. So I start meeting people. And I befriend this cop. This big cowboy country motherfucker that his name was Durfee you know six foot four 320 the belt didn't even fit uh, yeah, the yeah. police belt but he didn't give a fuck he's a cowboy he fell in love with me Felicia and I told him about my journey and what had happened and he's like dog you ever have a problem with people you call me I got plenty of ammunition at the house yeah. I only got two more years on the force so I, I'm not even thinking about this stuff. Now this guy's in front of me, and I chase him, and I tackle him down like Chael Son and grabs Anderson Silva. I mean, it was perfect. I just took him, and he lands on his back. So I got this motherfucker. Now, I'm angry at this time. They're fucking with my daughter. I'm broke. Uh, yeah. I'm getting into comedy. I'm going to take I've seen that anger. I'm gonna, no, 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 no. This was a different angle. I'm going to take everything out that bad that's happened to my life on this motherfucker. Oh, no. So I start kicking his kidneys. Bam! Bam, oh. bam, bam, over and over, bam. And I'm like, who sent you, you motherfucker? And by this time, the getaway driver doesn't know whether he's going to get out of the car. This is why I don't show up with getaway drivers. They sent the fucking B team. <laughs> they sent the fucking B team, bitch. I won't blow a getaway driver. No, they like, sent the fucking fuck those guys. B team, right? <laughs> so I'm kicking this guy. And I'm like, who the fuck sent you? Why are you? Because oh, I thought it was the kidnapping dudes. Uh -huh. The dude I kidnapped. Oh, okay. I thought it was one of his friends. I'm like, who the fuck sent you, motherfucker? So I know this guy's still looming. So so I leave this guy on the floor and start chasing the other guy, like running to see if I see him. But it's, it's uh, I forget the name of the streets, what, it was 20 years ago, and he's gone. So I go back and this guy's still on the floor. Oh, and I go, dog, it's your fucking worst night, man. I took his wallet out. First of all, once he showed up with a wallet to do a hit, uh, it's amateur. Is that hour. the first rule? That, yeah, you I don't show up with wallet. nothing. If I have a piece, I got a string around that piece, around my hand, so the gun don't fall out. I got everything prepared so you don't know what's... Do you put a string around the Fuck gun? yeah, I put a string. If I show up to your house with a fucking bat, I'll put a string around that bat around my hand so that bat don't fall and I leave fingerprints. I won't leave no wall on. I have my head tied up. I have a baseball hat over that motherfucker. I'll have tape on my hands. Plus, I'll have the fucking thing. And all this clothes has to go. If I'm going to go hunt somebody down, that clothing has to go because I'm going to be going through weeds, bushes, the whole fucking deal. I mean, I, when I was a kid, I was a savage. I knew all the, I became friends with a guy in Colorado that would hunt people for a living. 
Okay. Now, are these rules that you just came up with yourself, or is these were these general? Would rules? you show up to beat somebody up? And if that, what, if if I knew my wife was over at a guy's house, would I show up to beat him up with a wallet in my pocket? No, I'm just no. But I'm, what I'm saying is, that are, are are these rules that you kind of made up yourself, or uh, when you no, were hanging out? No, these are things you other... pick up. This yeah, is okay. things you pick right. up. Don't you gotta be, you know, you gotta yeah. show up with your wallet and a pair of sunglasses. If I go hit you in the sunglasses floor, my fingerprints are on it. Okay. So you gotta show up with the least amount of shit on your body. But now they got the hair. They got everything. Yeah. This is if I'm going to go ice you. The good old days. <laughs> I, yeah, I wasn't going to go ice nobody. This this motherfucker, I rip out his wallet and it says, Idaho. And I look at him and I go, so John sent you. <laughs> John sent you, didn't you? My baby's fucking stepdad, the guy. That's what's going on here. So I go, you know what? It's all over for you. And I start, now I go to the front of him and start kicking his stomach and his fucking mouth. I start to put my foot in his fucking mouth with my sneaker. Ta -ta -ta -ta! And I'm hearing the... Ta -ta -ta -ta! You did what? You put the foot... Oh, fuck yeah. You know I'm out of my fucking mind. I just... This was... I, dog, they were fucking with my little kid. Yeah. You know, listen. They were fucking with me in a court sense. But once they did that, they came into my world. Yeah. And this is what they had no I'm idea. I'm surprised they did that because that just what, opens it, a can of worms. It like, was I mean, the worst is, thing. And, and it's is, my wife. It was my ex-wife. who. That's when I used to hang out with the Miami Vice strap. When I used to have the holster and I had the gun yeah. here with the 16 bullets in here. That's how crazy I was. I'm like, my ex-wife. So I didn't know if my ex-wife had done it or John done it. I'm like, who sent you? If you don't say John, I'm going to fucking kill you. And he's like, I don't know. I don't know. I go, you know what? We're going to figure this out. So I went upstairs and said, I'm on probation. Let me go call the cops. So before, You're on probation you have someone's foot. Oh, <laughs> fuck yeah. I'm on probation for the kidnapping. I was on yeah. three-year probation. I go upstairs and I call Durfee. This motherfucker shows up with a truck, with a cowboy hat and a shotgun. He's like, what happened? I go, listen, bro, I don't know what to do. I called you. These three guys tried to jump me. He goes, he looks at me. He goes, what the fuck you want me to do? Keep doing what you were doing, baby. <laughs> Keep doing it. I started kicking, 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 kicking. We took Durfee's car, we put a fucking, like a wrapper in the back and drove this motherfucker to the hospital and threw him out in front of the fucking hospital. I never heard nothing after that. Nothing. I must have kicked this guy a thousand times. Now my plan was how I was gonna execute it on my, the people who fucking did it to me. So now they were gonna show up at 10 o'clock to drop my daughter off and then, oh, look at Felicia, she's huffing and puffing. You know me, Felicia. Yeah, yeah, this is yeah. the shit I, this is, no, this is I, the good old yeah, day. I, that's at 10 a scary thought, Joey. At nine in the morning, I get dressed, I got cologne on, I'm on my Sunday best. They pull up and I can see they're very apprehensive because John never heard back from the guy. Remember that call on Scarface? Uh -huh. We fucked up, he got away. They never called John back, so when they pulled up, they didn't know what they were walking into. You know me. Hey. <laughs> hey. How you doing? What's happening? Come here, my little princess. I kiss her. I wave like I'm a Republican. I throw kisses at the truck. I could see them backing out. And they're like, oh, my <laughs> God. Oh. And at 7 o'clock, they come back. The sun's still out. I got my little princess. I bought her a little toy. I pull up with them up to the car. And I go, hum, give me a kiss. I go, oh, by the way. The B team showed up last night. I know what you guys did. And I ripped up my shirt. By this time, it was purple and black. I had like an ace bandage uh -huh. around. Because when you have a broken rib, you don't go to the doctor. They're just going to try to you nine other house and tell you, rest and don't fart. You know? <laughs> <laughs> rest and don't fart. Because you have a broken rib, don't giggle. Really? I figured that out myself when I took the first shit. You don't even want to shit when you have a broken rib. You got to push. Oh, really? I've never had oh, a broken rib. Oh, really. fuck. A floating rib they break under the... Oh, my fucking God. For two weeks, you got to... And twice, I got my ribs broken. And I just fucking told them. And the look on their face, Felicia, was priceless, you know? And it's weird that after that, I went into a different realm in my life. I was like, you know what? And, and like I was telling you the other day, Felicia, I remember this vividly. You have to. If you're a comic or you have a dream, you know... Whether you want to be a lawyer, you see yourself defending somebody. You know, when I, when I was an open mic, I used to bring home just for laughs and circle the clubs, you know. And, and Felicia, I would close my eyes and I kind of cry. I would cry because I wanted this so fucking bad. I, this was going to save me. I didn't want to be a star, but this was going to help me from stop doing being criminal. And I would see myself, and I remember I would see myself in Seattle, and I would see myself at the last stop, and it was amazing. I got into such a deep war with these people. That at one time I wanted to kill him, and I would see my, I would, I wouldn't even see myself stabbing him. I just kept seeing memories of them on the floor, holding onto their throats, asking for their lives, and I kept seeing this vision, and I kept seeing it, and it was just like, it was like being in Deer Hunter. It was like a fucking nightmare. And one day I just said, "Fuck it, I'm gonna leave." You know, I, I'm gonna kill these people. And, I, and then I, 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 I reasoned with myself. I said, ah, "I won't kill them both. I'll kill him." And I mean, Felicia, I had the tunnel. 
Because in Colorado, that's the best place if you're going to kill somebody. You don't even have to kill them. Just stab them a little bit, rub some peanut butter on them, a little honey on their hand, tie them to a tree up in the woods. Let the fucking bears and the lions do the rest. <laughs> At least when they come get you. I didn't kill them. I just right. stabbed them. <laughs> <laughs> I just stabbed them and left them there. You know, look at the DNA. You found a tooth and an elbow. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because you leave somebody in Colorado, they don't find nothing. Yeah, yeah. And Felicia, I can't. I'm sitting here across from you telling you this is like my dream. The ISOM. I was going to go to prison. And I was going to get my friends chip in and get me a fax machine. I was going to write jokes with Jay Leno. Yeah. Can you fucking think of how disgusting my mind must have been? This is what these people were doing to me, you know, in a way. Like, they were just getting inside my craw because, you know, I'm an immigrant, Felicia, no matter how you cut it. And I, and I hate to differentiate this. When I came to this country, you always have a, a, a slight insecurity because Americans are the best. They're the fucking best. I don't care what anybody says. Americans are supposed to be the best. The rest of the country looks at America for, for fucking everything. So I always, you know, when I got married to her and stuff, I was really proud. Her parents, like, were in the service. He was a lieutenant colonel. And it was so weird that these people had everything going for them. But at the meantime, they were doing so many little dumb things that it let me down in society in a way because... The shit that they were doing is what spics and, and minorities and all these people that are bad people are supposed to do. And I wasn't doing that, you know what I'm saying? They were doing all that shit. And I was looking at these people like they were supposed to be the leaders, like I'm learning from them. The whole time I was married to her, I always felt insecure to her and her family. They were very intelligent, they were college educated, but what they didn't have was fucking character. I went over to the Ha Ha Cafe and uh, this is young comedian there named Vinny O'Shana. Let me tell you what the Ha Ha Cafe is becoming. Because I went home last night and I'm like, huh. The Ha Ha Cafe is a comedy club in North Hollywood that's been there for 25 years. Are you serious? It's been there. That place was a restaurant before. Across the street from there is the famous costume place where Elvis would buy his costumes. So he would go in there, get fitted, and then cross the street to what the ha-ha was, uh -huh. and he, they would put him in the back room, and he would have a waffle room in the back. Can you say costume? Costume. And that's where he would, <laughs> that's where he would put his waffle, you know, he would eat his waffles, and he got fat over those years. Uh -huh. But I think after they sold that, Jack bought it. And Jack is Armenian, and his wife is Mexican, and they have this comedy club, and now they're divorced. But they both run the club together, and they don't talk. So their schedules are adjacent to each other. So one works Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and the other one works Sunday through Wednesday. Wow. And they have wow. the kids working there, and you yeah. can see that the one kid looks Mexican, the other one looks Armenian. And I'm going to tell you... You know what? I always wondered when I went down there. It's like, a well, fucking I trip. I couldn't... You know how when you go into a business, you can't... You try you to can't figure, figure out, out, like, who's... You can't so, figure and out the I dynamics. can never figure it out. Okay, the bartender, the black chick, stabbed somebody a couple fucking years ago, the boyfriend. The, the other one like is a rave dancer. You know, and then you get the characters that hang out there. It's not a top-notch, ten-star comedy club. But for me, it's three minutes from my house, and I don't have to go over the hill. And comedy is comedy. You know, at first you want to come here and perform at the store, and then after the glamour goes away, all you want is five people to try your new fucking joke. Right. And you want the easiest path to resistance. So I've been going there for the last 18 months. And at first for me, i got to be honest with you, it was kind of a shame place for me. It was like I'm at the bottom of the fucking comedy really? spectrum. Yeah, I really felt like that. And I tried to get out of there. And then I came to my senses. I go, I'm a fucking comedian. A comedian, I learned to do comedy in a room like that. Who the fuck am I to judge a room like that? And I really committed to it. And that's why I worked out for the Gabriel thing. Nobody knew my material. I would just go in there every night. She put me up last. And I didn't care. But I became friends with the owner and his son. and Well, the sons. And there's a, a guy who works there, Rico. And, and there's this one comedian. His name is Vinny O'Shaughnessy. And I tell you what, he's uh, 24, maybe 25, maybe 26. You know, he's a young guy. And I could tell when he's there by the time when I pull up. Because he was always yelling and screaming. There's always black people. There's always like really weird, different kinds of characters. And this is what this guy brings. Mm -hmm. And his character and his comedy is very different. And he likes to party and he's crazy. He fucks bitches, you know, the whole fucking thing. Right, right. You know, the whole thing. He'll drive to Vegas and he's just, you know, and you look at that and you admire it in a way. <laughs> but I'm, I look at that place last night. Last night I go up there and let's say there's, there's 20 comics. Now it was me, Greg Wilson, and somebody. But let's say there was 10 comics hanging around. Three of them were doing powder. Now, I know this yet. Yeah, like I can see their jaws, and they're smoking one cigarette after the other. And I'm looking at this place, and I'm like, you know what? I went to the improv last week twice in one week, and that's a fucking dud. 
And, you know, if you go to the comedy store, it's this new generation. And if you go to the Laugh Factory, and again, I don't condone nothing bad, but I want a place with character. When you walked into the store, when you first walked in there, when you were 19, oh, shit. it yeah. just had so much character. Oh, yeah. And you could never even come, you could sit oh, here for yeah. hours. Oh, yeah. and, and I walk in, when I walked to the, when I first got to the comedy store, it was the tail end of that. And there were the, the door guy still sold blow, they sold weed, oh, yeah. this guy had pills. When, when I, I came first, in, yeah, it was fucking crazy. When I first got to the store, yeah. there was a kid who OD'd in the back on heroin. He yeah. moved away. I, I, I still remember what his name was. Yeah, that's how they're telling. So I'm looking at these kids drawing last night. So I'm sitting with Vinny Ochan, and I'm like, wow, I remember those days when I used to draw like that. And he asked me, he goes, when was the first time you did blow? And I go, you know, it was a month before my mother died that I did it, and then I tried it again after she died, and then I tried it again, and, you know, it, it, whatever. But the funny thing was that when they buried my mother, it's a Cuban funeral. So a Cuban funeral is they watch you for seven days. Open casket, 24 hours. Seven days? Yeah, like that's the old school. Seven fucking really? days. They put you out on a thing, and people come and go 24 hours. They bring booze. They can bring food. But I was sitting at my mother's funeral, and my mother partied. You know, she smoked pot. She drank. So a lot of people brought her bottles of pinch. She used to drink pinch. and uh, what is Pinch that? was an old scotch. Old school. They don't even make it no more. The bottle alone would cost a hundred dollars. Yeah. It was old octagon, whatever. I don't even know the, 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 what to call it. Pinch was this old whiskey, and uh, my mom used to drink Pinch and Johnny Walker. So people were bringing uh, do not doers and uh, what's the other one she would drink? Uh, Shivas. Uh -huh. So people were bringing a Shivas Regal and and you know stuff. And then the coke dealers came and they started putting little packages in there. And people would put joints in there. And I'd see them kneel down and they'd kiss her. And then they'd slip something on the side of her dress or something. And I would go and check every fucking couple of hours and the shit was packing up. Like there was, I could see it. People were putting money in the casket. I mean, Cubans are crazy. Latins are crazy when it comes to that. Especially the lifestyle she had and the people she hung around with. They were very superstitious. And money, here's 500 so you can bet a horse when you get to heaven. It was kind of touching. But that turn, you know, they buried her and stuff like that. And this is fucking crazy. That New Year's, it, you know, when a person dies, like Terry, my, my wife's grandpa died on Monday. But she was in the shower Thursday crying. And I told her, I said, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't really hit you. And it hits you in levels. It hit, death hits you uh -huh. people in levels. Yeah. She could be dead in the fucking ground seven years. And all of a sudden, one day, you just get an attack. Something just triggers tears, you know. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I was a little boy. You know, I was 15, whatever. And, and that New Year's, I got really fucked up. And I, that's the last time I drank Jack Daniels. I got fucking lit. I drank a bottle of Jack Daniels, and I jumped the cemetery fence which I would never do. And I jumped up with this kid, Dominic Speciano, and Carlos Perez, and we were in there pouring the fucking thing. And I remember that we ran out of coke, and at one point in the back of my head, I'm like, what if I dug this motherfucker up? Like, what if, I, how crazy is that? That's what cocaine does to yeah. you. Like, at that young age, like I, wow. like, I was like, what if I dug her up? And, like, the next morning I woke up, and I was like, I'll never tell that to nobody. Right. Like, last night I was watching an episode of Louie, and Louie says in the beginning, he goes, you ever do something? That you're like, whoa, I'll never tell nobody about <laughs> yeah. that. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, and I forgot all about that. So yeah. I get in the car last night and I'm driving. And I'm like, what have I done that I don't want anything to nobody to know? I mean, right. pretty much at the podcast. I've said everything. You know? Oh, I know. I've said you know, totally everything. everything. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But, you know, you think I'm on the blogs and I talk and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, my God. I know what I never tell nobody. That that night at four in the morning. In my veil of tears, while I was crying there over the pain over my mother, in the back of my mind, I'm like, if I dug this bitch up with the coke, still be good. And I kept thinking, you know, we got a casket. I think they said they waterproofed it, like they had the inside lining. Uh -huh. Like this is what was going through my head that night. Like, how much coke would she have? And I didn't have a shovel or nothing. You right. know what I'm saying? I mean, I wasn't that crazy, yeah. but just to let you know how fucking crazy drugs and situations make you. Wow. Yeah, I can't believe Louis C.K. said that. Did you ever do something that you never wanted? This I'll never tell nobody about this. I'm quite serious. I got in the car, and that's the first thought that came to my mind. And as I was telling Vinny O'Shaughnell last night, I'm like, Vinny, I never told you. I didn't even say that. It just started coming out. I go, so here I am partying, me and my buddies, and I'm thinking to myself, maybe we should dig the bitch yeah, up. She's yeah. got to have an ounce in there, yeah. at least an ounce of blow. She died in November. It's New Year's. That was six weeks ago, even if half of it got oh, wet. Oh, my God, Oh, Jerry. my God. Yeah. You know? And I remember fucking going, this is it. This is yeah. This is the end, the beginning of the end. This is where this shit is taken. And I used to have a hard time 
with science. I didn't like fucking science. I didn't like it at all. Math I was always good at. And here's the problem why I was really good at math, and I never tell people about this. Like, yeah, when I was a kid, my mother did the numbers. So on Saturdays, no matter, and I talked about this before, no matter what I was doing on Saturdays, like my mom said, you had two options. You could sit at home by yourself and play with your fucking toys. You come up to the Bronx and make 50 or 60 bucks. And to me, at the age of six or five, that was a lot of fun. That was G.I. Joe's. That was money that was unanswered for. That I could do whatever the fuck I wanted to in my mind. And I would usually put that money away because I was such a cheap fuck and hit my mother up for 20s during the week. And she'd go, what'd you do with the 60 from my game? You fucking Saturday. But I would have to go up to the Bronx and work in bookie rooms. And I learned how to add. Like, they would give me the individual sheets. Uh -huh. So bookmakers have a big sheet, like the one that goes to control. But when a bookie would come in, they'd have individual sheets. And I would have to add up all the numbers. That was my wow. real way into yeah. And, you know, wow. I was six, seven, eight. And they would give me $20. And I'd have to go to the store and figure out the change. And there was no mistakes. You couldn't. There was no fucking mistakes. I was working with adults. You follow me? So I would get the receipt. So I would save everything so I wouldn't have any problems. But when I was about five or six... When my stepdad, Juan, got out of fucking prison, he wasn't allowed into Jersey. And one thing about Juan that I've never... <laughs> his, his parole would not allow him in Jersey. Oh, no. We lived in 205 West 88th Street. This guy was... I've talked about him on the podcast before. And, you know, and it's always weird. Whenever I talk about him, I talk about him beating up somebody or tear gassing somebody in the face. But this was the other side of Juan. The side of Juan that grabbed me as a young man was he was very good with painting. This guy could look at a fucking picture and draw it, like draw a sketch oh, of it. Oh, really? Like he was very articulate. He played the guitar, you know, so even though he taught me how to sharpen his knife and he taught me how to, when you shoot somebody, how to get the residue off your arm with, with alcohol and a right. candle. The other things that he showed me was when I would get in trouble and I would be punished, he would either do two things. He would either make me write in Spanish, I will not torture my mom, you know, 50,000 fucking times in really? Spanish. Oh, really? In Spanish. And I would go, why would I have to write it in Spanish? This is the United States. And he would go, because I want you to learn. He goes, no, 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 no. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you're writing in Spanish. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you're going to write in English. Don't worry about that. <laughs> like, you know, and, but he taught me how to write Spanish. So that taught me there. So here's this guy that was a fucking killer and all this shit. Uh -huh. He taught me how to write Spanish. Well, the thing that he fucking drilled in my head, and that they call him La Tabla in Spanish, his time tables. Okay. From the time he got yeah. out of fucking jail till I was 10, he would ask me every day, six times seven. Like, he would just ask me. So at, for two, three years, every time I got in trouble, I would have to sit down and write one times two is two, one times three is three, go all the way up to 12, backwards. And then he'd quiz me, and i have to do it backwards because it's easy uh -huh. when you know him, you know. Yeah. One times, two times, three times, but four times. But out of time. context, yeah. But out, out of, of context, order. you're fucked. But it's so weird that sometimes people, like, I do math in my head all the time, but I don't let people know. Like, people will say shit to me, and I can figure out the math, but I don't want to, I'm really good with numbers. But when I really think back to it, it was, math was taught to me by a guy that the state of New Jersey wouldn't allow in the state for, like, six <laughs> months, and he was yeah. stuck with me, and this was one of his hobbies, Felicia. But till this day, I sit there, and I'm like, wow, thank God that I had him. Yeah. To, 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 to go over these tables with me because today I would have been a fucking Momo. I really would have been lost. Halloween's coming, <laughs> bitches. Halloween. Are you, so you're going to dress up, I hear. I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. I like to dress up and scare the kids when they come to get candy. Mm -hmm. You know, fuck with the kids because that's always... But kids aren't the same like they used to. Yeah. Kids don't yeah. fucking come around the bundles. Yeah. You know, two weeks before Halloween, I was getting my little fucking entourage ready. I had my friends ready. I'd get a couple eggs. You take some needles and you put the hole in the egg. Uh -huh. And you put the eggs under your bed for like 10 days before Halloween. Those are man-made stink bombs. <laughs> and you pray that your mom don't find them. Just a little needle. And just pluck that egg on top and you just hide that motherfucker. And really? Don't let that egg break. Wow. Whatever you do, don't let that egg break because you will not get the smell out of your nose. That's like a dead fucking body. And is there a particular target you guys always have Anybody who doesn't fucking tip you. Oh, really? Yeah. Chinese people spit on your food in Chinatown when you don't tip them. We would throw eggs at your fucking house, and those things stink to all hell. And we would get, like, I had a friend that was a hunter, so he would get, like, deer piss and... Really? Yeah, you get like piss from different animals uh -huh. to put it out because it scares a certain animal. We would do that shit. We would get skunk scent. 
uh-huh. and put it on your fucking thing. Yeah, you had to pay up. We would. It was it was Halloween extortion when I was right, a fucking kid. Right. You knew what we get the. So you put I'm sorry skunk urine on your on you what? Get, you get you uh, get you go to the sporting goods uh-huh. and you buy skunk scent. Okay. And you just pour it on some of these stale, stairs when mm. they don't give you candy. Just it's fucking like a little bit really? will go a long way. Yeah. Like the whole neighborhood will stink. Wow. And we would each buy a jar of that. So and we were prepared. So by oh, the time, a jar. Like a, not a jar, like a big. Uh, <laughs> you bought it in like two like ounce little, little serving. Yeah, 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 like yeah. little vials. Yeah. So we'd all chip in, and, and in those days there was no internet. You had to have like your dad drive you to the sporting goods. And, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like wait in the car, cause, <laughs> and then you. What'd you get? I got a giant hat, but you really got the fucking vile of skunk fucking scent. Yeah. You know, Halloween was big when I was a fucking kid. Listen, I'm no fucking costume guru. You know me. <laughs> I just get a cape and a fucking mask, and I'm ready to fucking rock. We'll, we'll make it up as we go down the fucking block, all right? Well, what's the, what, what was your favorite Halloween costume when you were a kid? The one that I've been for the last 48 years, Captain Chaos. Really? <laughs> <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Captain and Chaos. Chaos. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm telling you, the best is when you, I'm, till this day, I know I've said it before, is do it this year. Just take a shit in a bag. See, in the old days, you could scoop shit on the streets, but now everybody cleans their fucking shit, which I never believed in. You gotta scoop. <laughs> fuck, the, you know. You gotta Throwing look, away an opportunity, they are. Yeah, that's it. And now I got to go hunt down my own shit and light it on fire, you know. And you put it in a bag and you put some right. little fly this fluid. You look at me like, why are you doing? This is the shit you do as a little fucking boy. Before that became the China Club, that was like a little coffee shop that was a dive. Like I had eggs in there one day, and they were like the eggs in my cousin Vinny that had the lard underneath floating oh, yeah, on yeah. the fat. Oh, I, I yeah. couldn't even eat it. I was hungover. Yeah. And I, and, but they did karaoke then. It was transvestite karaoke. So they would be like up there crying. Like the night I went, they got into a fight. Like a transvestite couple got into a fight. You can't write this really? shit. You can't write this. So it was like, and it, it wasn't the first time I had seen it. It was a transvestite guy, a little girl, whatever uh-huh. she was. I don't fucking know. I don't know. Yeah. With a yeah. guy on a date. And while she sang, he got jealous because her boyfriend was there. I mean, this is something that can only happen on Hollywood Boulevard. Right. And the, the fight started. Bah, 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 bah. No wigs came off, thank God. Right. They had like duct tape they prepared. Right. You know, they had gone through it before. They had, they, this wasn't their first roller derby. Right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> When I was I 17, I rubbed heat on my knee or something. And I didn't know, and later on, I was scratching my nuts, you know? Mm-hmm. And oh my fucking God. Oh my God. Really? Well, I had to go in the shower, and I didn't know. At first, you don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. And then you put two and two together. You're like, what the fuck? You know, thank God. Thank, you know. Thank yeah. God, just didn't pile it on. <laughs> but when I was a kid, I'd fuck around with my ears and my pee hole. And I'd put shit in there, like fucking cigarette butts, whatever. I don't, don't know, even, don't even fucking ask for these. <laughs> when I was a kid, I was an only child, so yeah. you had to find a version. So Ears, you know I understand, right. but you one don't... time I put a bean in my fucking. There was a game called "Please Don't Spill the Beans." Mm-hmm. I remember where I that. I put it in, yep. and it swings both ways, and it would swing. And I had it, and I'm by myself, and I would play "Please Don't Swing the Beans" by myself, and I put a bean in my, and I'm playing with it like a, a six year old does. I wow. put it in, pop it out, put it in, pop it out. And then I put it in one time, it didn't want to come out. So fuck it, I just left it then, didn't say nothing. <laughs> I figured it just dissolved. Three months later, you Are know. you serious? It's Three plastic. Three months later? Three Those beans were plastic. Three months over the holidays. I drove my mother, like, uh, you, you think of you, what you did to your mom with stupid colds, like a time you were close, like you thought you were close to dying, you had like 103 temperature. Right. All that shit is negated by the, what I put my mom through. And I didn't say nothing till the hospital. She beat me outside that hospital. It was on 156 in Broadway. It's a big, big university uh-huh. up there. It's like in a weird, that's where they rushed me. Uh-huh. They didn't know what it was. And she kept putting hot oil in there and you know, all the remedies, you know. And finally, like, we just gotta take it to the hospital. And they put uh, a fucking vacuum tube in my ear and zzzz, and then and all of a sudden they took like this, uh, uh, like a roach clip. Remember the old days, yeah. the roach clips? And they put that in there and they took it out the fucking, it wasn't even a bean no more. Oh. It was just like a shred that was like steaming. And the doctor's like, how'd this get? And I'm like, how'd that get in there? And my mom's like, listen, give me the bill. And in Spanish, she's like, I'm going to knock the fuck out of you right on the elevator. You do know that, right? <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. 
whatever. It's really talking about, you know, when you come from another country or whatever, when you're a kid and you aspire. I always want to aspire to be Charles Bronson. I talked about Charles Bronson and one of the listeners, a fucking great artist by the name of Mike's, Mike Maxwell from San Diego, drew this picture, contacted me. I told him my address. Two days later, it was in my fucking house and I had a tear in my eye. Because not only was the gesture a beautiful gesture, but the picture he drew was mind boggling. And every morning I put it in front of me to think about Charles Bronson to remind me who the fuck I really am. You follow what I'm saying to you? <laughs> <clears throat> and I've always loved Mac Mike Maxwell because of this. Whenever I go to San Diego, he shows up at the show and he don't come empty handed. He comes with an edible, a fucking joint, a bag, a bazooka, and a picture that he drew for you of the week. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. You can't, when somebody awesome. draws something for you, it means so much to you. I got his shirt at my house that I won't wear because it's such a cool shirt, like a design with an ape and stuff. Mike is just a neat guy. He uh, got invited to do the uh, uh, Miami Basel Art Festival 2011. He went on Facebook yesterday. And I think the plane ticket was like five something and he got like 400 and ones and tens, the same way I did for the documentary. Uh -huh. And I'll tell you what, we're, uh, that's what Facebook is about and Twitter in a way to me. It connects a lot of same minded people. Uh -huh. You know, when I look at Twitter and I lose three people, I know that they got pissed off because I said a, a joke about some stupid shit that I talk about in my fucking perverted mind. And I understand if you don't like my sense of humor, but it cuts down because it lets the people that want to be in your realm be in your realm. And in that realm, I have fighters, I have drug dealers, I have, you know. You um, do have an interesting yeah, realm. Yeah, and I love them all. <laughs> Guess what jam I listen to this morning, Eddie, because of you. And I got to tell you something, not one of the heaviest jams ever. But it's such a smooth fucking jam with such a badass guitarist that you sit there and you go, wow. Let me guess. Give me a clue. I'm, I'll guess. We just talked about him the other day at the table. We talked about a lot of bands. But we talked about he replaced Randy Rhodes. Oh, wait a minute. You listen to Night Ranger? Yeah. What song? You can still, Sister Christian? No. You can still rock in America? Even better than that. Uh, down now, then when you close your eyes. Oh, I do, do, oh do, my do God! About me. Oh my God! I was walking and it was on the iPod and I didn't feel like switching it, and it came on and we were talking about Night Ranger, and I said, "Let me hear out the song." Uh, and by the middle of the song, I said, "How brilliant is this song?" Because here's a guy that could blow the fucking speakers out of a fucking guitar, and he had to just chill. And it's that a is really crazy. It's a crazy we're, fucking jam. Are we on the air? Yeah, we're, we're oh. just talking right now. We just we warm up like yeah, this. Yeah, too. yeah, it was very interesting. Uh, you remember Night Ranger? Uh, yes, I I know Night Ranger. We're talking about Night Ranger people. But as a as a girl, like girls don't have these usually kind of conversations. So it's always very interesting when you see guys go off on music. It's cool. It's well, cool. we we guys are into the band members and their personalities and and their style. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. Like a, a certain bands' bass player. Girls generally aren't into it unless they're lesbian. Like the the drummer for. You know, Metallica or something, you know. Yeah, yeah. Everyone is a character. And Brad Gillis, uh, well, first of all, Ozzy Osbourne, everybody knows Ozzy's the fucking the biggest rock star of all time. Reality show and legend at the same time. Reality show legend and and real life legend, <laughs> Ozzy. He was the, the singer of Black Sabbath. He went and did a solo. He went solo and became bigger than Black Sabbath. He's like, you know, all these rumors about him biting off bats' heads. He's a legend. All those legendary stories. He does a reunion tour, a farewell tour, actually, like every year. It doesn't stop. He has Ozfest. He has like the most successful rock. This guy's huge. And then he does a reality show. I mean, everybody knows who Ozzy Osbourne is. Everybody, you know, children, everybody. He's the biggest rock star ever. Well, anyways, when he left Black Sabbath, he when he formed his uh, the first band, he got a, he found a guitar player named Randy Rhodes, and that guy was just it's just everywhere he went, everybody knew he was just this you know this golden child guitar player, and he just like walked onto Ozzy. Ozzy was like, man, he was used to playing with Tony Iommi in Black Sabbath, and the guitar player for Black Sabbath was actually out of all the famous guitar players. Ever and ever, he's probably known as the least technical. He writes amazing riffs, the heaviest, darkest riffs. Black Sabbath, his riffs, Tony Iommi's riffs, just started a whole new genre of darkness. And it came from Black Sabbath. That was the darkest band. They were in the 60s 
and dark as hell and and all these satanic references they were heavy as hell he, he had amazing classic riffs no one will ever touch tony iomi as far as coming up with those heavy riffs and those evil riffs like heaven and hell when you hear that when you hear those guitar chords it's so simple but it's so godly but technically as a lead player he was actually known as a dude who just wasn't he didn't really care about leads he just cared about coming up with awesome riffs and all of a sudden ozzy goes so long and gets this shredder this guy that's the pro at that point in time he was him, a baby yeah he was 21 he walked into this randy rose yeah he walked randy into rose. this audition he was he was playing with uh quiet uh, riot quiet riot yeah and he you know he walked into this audition and he was, it was like 78 and he's a gorgeous man he's Sexy. a beautiful blonde you know hair the whole thing and sharon the fucking genius that she is said we gotta have him and it was this just when you know, listen you know when uh the guitar yeah, sharon, player like sharon osborne now this goes back like everybody knows sharon osborne the right, right. this is like the genius this, this is genius ozzy was the lead singer of black sabbath the godfathers of heavy, heavy genius metal. the godfather genius yeah. shit before fucking there was like led zeppelin wasn't really dark and heavy they were like boogie rock and roll black sabbath was slayer in the 60s reality music you know yeah. acid and ozzy had had there's some i mean classic classic all -time classics. i mean like iron man everybody knows iron man you could use that as a a super bowl commercial and everybody would know what iron man is people do or, you know Paranoid, somebody's using it now paranoid somebody's is probably the most covered song at backyard parties ever every band covered paranoid if was, i went to somebody's house and they didn't have the album paranoid <laughs> exactly. i didn't even hang with them most <laughs> that yesterday nbc picked up the monsters which if you under even see as a kid you watch the monsters and it kind of scared you but you giggled no. but as an adult when you look at the monsters kind of makes you realize especially you know i'm a comic you're yeah. a comic we're all three comics we acted the commitment to be herman or grandpa like people aren't gonna know who i am what am i on a sitcom for you know my face and makeup these guys didn't give a fuck except for marilyn yeah marilyn was the, the white chick. replace her remember yeah they replaced <laughs> her because she finally cracked and she didn't look like the rest of them people no. would torture i don't know butch patrick never recovered no eddie munster still snorting blow with a fucking hands <laughs> and uh <laughs> yeah he never recovered from that yeah. but you look at fred gwynn who later on was in uh oh he did a lot of shit. a lot of shit. You know he did, he did like this organized pet crime. cemetery oh he was pet great. cemetery yeah. tremendous cemetery, yeah. he was just a great actor these guys what people don't understand like when i first seen it yesterday that they picked up the monsters i was like what the fuck and the first thing that came to my mind is the level of commitment yeah we don't have it like unless a big time actor would get on there like a theater actor these guys, nobody's gonna go in there and play grandpa. No. Al Lewis was fucking classic when he only used to light his fingers on fire. He definitely smoked weed. Yeah. <laughs> like if you think about it, you're like, that motherfucker smoked weed, because no all the writers did. Yeah. Somebody yeah. in that realm of the monsters was smoking heavy duty weed, listening to Lennon back in sixty yeah. six. It was sixty six. Yeah, it's about sixty six, sixty five. Sixty six, you know? sixty five. Uh -huh. That I mean you're talking about almost you're talking about a little over forty years ago. What actor has the commitment and the ability to laugh at themselves the way Al Lewis and Fred Gwynn did? That's bullshit. There's, bullshit, there's nobody bro. gonna be able to do it. Man. No. You know? It's like Fred Gwynn was he was he was unbelievable. I remember an interview Tom Waits did where Tom Waits worked with Fred Gwynn on the Cotton Club. He said this guy had the biggest fucking head that he had ever seen on a human being. He was like a horse. It was like they put no plaster on that head of his. He was just brilliant. Just... And Fred Gwynn, remember when he would love? Oh, 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 yeah, and right. he would stomp and stomp and, and like, stuff. Yeah. And, oh, who who would play such an? Idiot? And even if Nobody you look at the them. shoes, you could see the eight inch platforms. Yeah. Yeah. Whenever the bat flew, if you yeah. look closer, you could see the so, string. You know, it was just a show that was. You couldn't do it. You couldn't they do it. They fuck it up. Leave the string. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? When you used to, like last night, Motra was on. Yeah. They were having like a Motra festival on like uh, Action Channel, mm -hmm. on the pay per view channels or What's whatever. Motra? Motra is that fucking animal that fought Godzilla, Mothra. Mothra. Oh, Mothra. Mothra. Whatever his Mothra. fucking name is. And they had one like they made in 83 and it mm -hmm. just sucked. But early, like at 11, I was going to the channels and they had one that they made like in 62. Yeah. When the strings. And the, when you the, can see the wire yeah, dragging the wires and, and the Godzilla jumps yeah. on it. And, 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 and they'll leave like a Japanese guy flapping mm -hmm. the wings by mistake. <laughs> it, it's just fucking brilliant. It's so much better. When and it's, it's so really much better. Done, it's so much better. That's yeah. why you get to laugh because yeah. it's so much fucking better. Like, I'll what? tell you right now, they're going to fuck up the monsters right from the get go. You know how they're going to fuck it up? They're going to do it in color.
They're going to do it in color. Now, if they did it in black and white, I might be willing to buy into it a little bit. Because you remember when you can you you remember when the Monsters movie came out? Can, yeah, Gold? it wasn't the same. It just wasn't. It was the like same. Gilligan's Island in yeah, color. You know, the black and white Gilligan's Island. Everything once they changed it, yeah, it, it fucked changed, up a little it bit. It fucked it up just a little bit. Just black a little and white bit. is so much better, especially because these are drawing from the whole universe, the old Universal horror movies. I mean, you got you got you got a uh, uh, Dracula. Frankenstein, the Wolfman, the Mummy, and those were all in black and white. I mean, shit, and they were they were incredible because they had these sets. Even when young, even when uh, uh, Mel Brooks went off and did Young Frankenstein, he was like fucking black and white. We got to do it in black yeah, and white. Can you brilliant. imagine Young Frankenstein in color? Yeah, this shit suck. would not it work. Was, you know? These idiots are eventually gonna we color it up. Well, we color, yeah. By the way, do you remember that what the store? What was some trivia for you, mm -hmm. motherfuckers? What was Eddie Munster's? Uh, well, teddy bear? Was, yeah, teddy bear's name. <laughs> Wolfie. Wolfie. Remember one night we were at the store? I mean, and I said, because Wolfie looked like Chewy. And I was on stage and I go, uh, you know, her pussy looked like Eddie Munster's. <laughs> Eddie Munster's Teddy Wolf. Bear Wolfie. <laughs> the fucking place went nuts. Like, where did you come with that reference from? I go, look, at, yeah, who's fuck? I don't know whose pussy I was talking about. It was like Eddie Munster's fucking uh, teddy bear, Wolfie. Wolfie, that was. What about when the so-called Beatles came over? Yeah, that was a great. My favorite fucking episode that I have on DVR. Mm -hmm. That's how favorite it is. Is the Zombo episode that you only got on Halloween? Mm -hmm. When and in fact the actor was on Curb Your Enthusiasm as the father-in-law, and I bumped into him at an audition, and I said, "Can I tell you something? I know Charles Bronson. I know John Wayne." Well, I, I go at the age of six. I knew Charles Bronson. I knew John Wayne. I knew Jim Jones, and I knew you because of Zombo. He played the episode of Zombo, mm -hmm. which is one of the greatest episodes of the Monsters of all time. He comes home and the kids are watching Zombo, yeah. and and he wins the fucking trip to go to the studio and how to be like Zombo for mm -hmm. a day. And so Herman gets jealous and he builds a suit like Grandpa makes a potion for him to to look like Zombo. And he's down in the basement. And he looks like Zombo when he comes up. And he asks, it's Eddie with his two little white buddies. And he, <laughs> he goes, so Benny, what do you think of Zombo? And the kid goes, the kid's like, sir, my dad said never to say harmful things against other people. Like he insulted him right out to his face. And he looks at him, he goes on to the next kid. But then he goes to the episode, yeah. he goes to the show, and he figures out that the guy is just a regular civilian. Yeah. And they put makeup on him. And all of a sudden, Eddie's sitting on his lap. He goes, so little Eddie, what do you think of Zombo? And he goes, what, they can't have your tongue? And he goes, you want me to tell you what? It? Zombo's a fake. Remember, and he pulls his yeah, beard so. off and shit, and he wrecks the fucking studio. That was my all-time favorite fucking Monsters episode yeah. right there. You know, it's the weirdest thing because there's nothing like going in. Like, I had a, I, they called me on the Friday before the sentencing on Monday at 4 o'clock, and they go, Joey, you, the Department of Corrections, turned you down the, the uh, local halfway house uh -huh. they turned you down they're not going to accept you with the machine gun charge you're going to go away it's up to the judge the judge has the last thing but they called me Friday at fucking four you know I got no light to stand I got a half hour to make calls so yeah. you know so I just did what you would do I went and got a fucking eight ball you know if I'm going <laughs> away Monday I'm going to get this party started till the end they're going to yeah. reel me into that fucking court and I remember going in, and all of a sudden, like Saturday, my buddies called. They're like, "Bro, when are, we heard you going sentencing. We're flying in." So my gorilla buddies flew in. They're like, "Bro, what's the story? We're gonna go in there with you. We're gonna tell the judge you're a good guy. And we're gonna take you home. We got an ounce of coke in our pocket." I put on my Armani suit that morning at eight thirty. I went down there. I'm like, "I'm gonna beat this. You know, I'm gonna walk in there and be me and razzle the judge." And there's no feeling when the guy just looks at you and he goes, "I'm gonna impose my sentence on you." And he lowers his. And you don't even hear right. Yeah. Because I heard six years, Department of Corrections. And I couldn't hear. I kept thinking, like, what the fuck did he just say? Yeah. Come on. And I'm, I turned to the judge. I go, they got an ounce of blow. And he asked <laughs> the attorney if he could keep me out for an hour. Just all I need is an hour. You yeah. know what I'm saying? They get talked in to move to Bolivia. But I knew I couldn't <laughs> run because America's Most Wanted was on. So I knew I couldn't run. I knew that they're always going to get you 40 years from now. So I was stuck. When that motherfucker said that to me, I... I was like, ask the judge if I could stay out for it till tomorrow to take care of stuff. And when that motherfucker picked up that stick and he went, bam, like all your energy goes out of you. Like I went in a cell and just went to bed. In fact, I had a little Coke rock in my suit jacket. <laughs> I crushed it up right under the cell, right under the camera. I blasted that motherfucker and I fell asleep. It's like drinking six Red Bulls and going to sleep. Yeah. Because my body was done. Like the suspense was over. That's it. it. Yeah. I'm going to fucking jail. Funny because... 
When I was about five, we lived, before I moved to 205 West 80th Street, we had a stint on 89th Street. And that was when I came to the realization something wasn't right. My mom had money, you know, jewelry, the bar, you know, we ate good, everything was okay. And then one day we had this uh, lady who lived underneath us, you know, and uh, Oela, we used to call her grandma, how are you? And one morning, you know, I wake up to a bang on the door and I open it, it's the super of the building. He goes, your mom around? He goes, tell them they're downstairs. And the next thing you know, I see my mom running into the bedroom and she comes out with this Macy's bag, you know, and she's doing something. We had a little balcony outside and all of a sudden she had the balcony and she took like this fucking thing and threw it to the balcony underneath and she came in and right there, boom, 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 boom. And, we, and I had a drum kit. I'll never forget, I had a drum kit in this living room. I was a kid, five maybe, tops. And they came and my mother said to me in Spanish, don't say a word, just sit on the couch. And they broke us up and they tried to ask me questions and I had my little fucking imagination. I was an only kid. You couldn't fucking talk to me when I was five. <laughs> And I remember them leaving, and I asked her what that was, and that she threw over the balcony, and she goes, it was cash, you know, and I knew there was cash in the house. But then later on, we went to get it, and I peeked in the bag, and it was blow. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, going on a school trip uh, to the police station, and I'm talking about narcotics, and me asking this guy what narcotics were, and me being shocked. Mm -hmm. Like, I was in shock, Felicia, that I understood the numbers. I could live with the numbers and I could live with the loan sharks and all that shit and the sports betting. But even at five, I knew drugs wasn't fucking cool. I didn't want to be, and I'm confronting that. Like, what the fuck? And shut your mouth. It's none of your business. I was holding it for a friend. Here's $20. And like anything else in life, for 20, I just turned my head, you know? And uh, But it's weird. Like, that was the most shocking thing about finding out what my family did. I was raised with my, my real dad was a hustler. My stepdad was a fucking uh, street guy. My mom was no fucking saint. So it's really weird how I grew up, how my rules always bent for certain, certain situations. My, my, my life is not, I don't judge people on a white and black situation. There's a gray area. Yeah. Before I judge somebody, I always think about their psyche. Where, where the fuck are they coming from and where they're at? You know what I'm saying? Me, you know, it's amazing that last night I was in a room full of tremendous comedians with Felicia and I'm going to tell you right now, the most comfortable I ever felt was in a room full of thieves because I knew where I stood. <laughs> and I knew That's so, so true. those guys could all suck my dick last night. I mean this in a great way because I don't know where I stand with those guys. If six fucking mm -hmm. Puerto Ricans with mm -hmm. knives come in, mm -hmm. I don't know what Russell Peters or what Joe Rogan and all these fucking morons are going to do. <laughs> but there's an honor amongst thieves that I've always, even if somebody's kind of crooked, I've always leaned towards them in a way. I'll give them a chance more than somebody else. And then when they let me down, it's fucking it because they are pieces of shit, but there's this honor among thieves. It's so weird how you go through different phases of your life yeah, with comedy. And when, and when you're at one point of comedy, when you're, MC, when you're at that open mic MC, you still have your eight hour job, mm -hmm. you know, part time. Like it was so weird that for me, like I remember like if I go back to that time, it was Boulder 94. And I was still like a part-time criminal. To, I was selling cars, but the hours were too long. So I'd quit. And then for a month, I'd sell coke. And then for I'd get another little job in Boulder. And then for a month, I'd sell weed. Or, and it was always like an option that was there. Like, fuck, I could either go work in an office at night selling yeah. insurance on the phones. So, you had to do comedy just to go straight. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah. but it was funny how... You know, every time like I had doubts with my comedy or I, I was having a bad month, you have to do something. You know, and sometimes it was catering. Like when I moved to L.A., it was catering and, and whatever. But then I moved to L.A. Uh, after a few years of being in L.A., I met people. And I knew where to get an eight ball and I knew where to get a quarter ounce. And sometimes once a month somebody would come to me and say, hey, man, where can we get a quarter ounce? Can you hook us up? And if I knew them from the comedy store or something, I'd get it from them and I'd make 60 bucks. I always knew. And I knew from looking at it if I could cut it or not, you know. And, and I was telling these guys the story. They created a big buzz. This week I got home and I got like 10 emails from people in Dallas that it was all over the thing. It was the Whitney Houston story. And I just uh -huh. wanted to tell you the story here. You know, and I didn't want people to think the wrong impression because when you're in those Joe Rogan podcasts, you have to tell your story quick. It's like combat oh, stories, so you really yeah, can't yeah, yeah, yeah. you really okay. can't give the people a backdrop. So I want to give the people yeah. a backdrop, and it's pretty nice that we don't have a guest right now till later on. So this is what's great about this, so we could tell the story. And and it was because Felicia was looking at me weird. Like I've known Felicia for a long time, and, I, and three months ago I came in here, and Felicia, and I'm like Felicia, I'm out of stories. You know, I'm really out of stories, and then. 
uh, I was going to meet Stanhope, and I was thinking about when the last time I seen Stanhope was. And I was thinking about that he had, he lived on the top floor of this building, and he had two chicks that lived in one apartment and another chick that lived next to him. And they were, all three of them were pretty cute. And the one girl was German, mm-hmm. tall, like she even had a little bit of an accent very lightly. She had grown up in Vermont or something. And one night I bumped into her at the <laughs> okay. 7-Eleven. She grew up in Vermont, so she was like Americanized. I'm sorry. And uh, <laughs> like, I don't fucking know, right? So I seen her at the 7-Eleven on Curson. Yeah. And I ended up going home with her and doing like a gram. And I didn't think she was going to give it up. And she finally gave me the monkey at like 6 and I went home, my head over almost explained. I'd never seen her again. Mm-hmm. But then there was a redhead chick that lived next door to him. Her car got hit. And I was nice to her one night, and she was really beautiful and voluptuous, big tits, the whole fucking deal. But she weighed like 160. She had a big ass, but she was thick, but she was like 23. She was really hot. She would come to the comedy store with dates. And one night she came to the comedy store with another date, and I ended up going home with her. We messed around. And then we had like this thing on Sundays that we'd mess around. And we'd do heroin, and we'd do... Uh, MDMH, the shit you put in water, and she'd come to the store on Sundays. I was the house MC, mm-hmm. and I'd host from MDMH. Is that that shit that you put in water and you drink it and you fucking get like a quaalude and you could die from it? You pass out. She would mix it in a water thing and go up to the store and give me oh, sips shit. in between my sets, and I would be fucked up. This is way before Terry. So I was thinking about Jesus, I was Jerry. thinking about how her and I had this weird relationship. Like I would hook up with her for two months in a row on Sundays. Then I wouldn't see her for six months. Like I go on the road and then I lose contact with her, and then I would, and you know I would see her for two more months. And every time I see her, it got worse and worse. I go over and she put lingerie on and we eat Valiums and snort heroin and blow and watch porn, which I fucking you know like this all came to me like on the drive up to one thirty four, mm-hmm. and I was thinking about oh my god, what about when I was selling coke to Whitney Houston? And I'm like, oh, my God, that was the most fucked up time. Because, again, at the time I was living with Terry, I had just met Terry. Okay. This is what's amazing about Joey Diaz. Because, in your opinion, the time you sold that to Whitney Houston is story number 2,556. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's, it was nothing. that would be, like, in the top ten. No, it was nothing to me. It was yeah. nothing to me. Because I've been around people. Everybody you meet has partied with a celebrity. And when they say it in a circle, it always seems uncomfortable. Like, so I never really remembered it. It wasn't like I party with Whitney Houston. So it was like we just had a drug relationship. And it wasn't really Whitney Houston. It was her road manager. So it was the weirdest thing because at that time I was getting $15 a spot at the store. You know, if you got a main room spot, woo, you know, it was like 80 bucks or 90 And I was basically living off road gigs that paid nothing as a feature act. In San Diego or Bakersfield or all those hundred dollar gigs, and I always had a bummer ride or it was a fucking nightmare. I don't have to tell you, you know, when you're first yeah, starting yeah, out. No, yeah, it's and not, instead, yeah. of, a lot of comics hustle. My part time gig was selling drugs to people from time to time. So one day I would buy weed on Curson Street, uh-huh. and I was good friends with him. He was a comic, but he worked at CAA for a while in the main room, and he quit and became a comedian. But one of the guys he worked with was this guy that became a road manager to music acts. Mm-hmm. And this has to be 2000 because I met, or 2001, because I met, I started hooking up with Terry in 2000. And like in that New Year's or something, she found a dollar bill rolled up. And she asked me, what is this? And I told her, and she goes, listen, I can't date you if you do this shit in the house. Or don't, don't. So I said, fine. So I was good for about a month, but then old habits die hard. And I just made a deal with myself. I can't do coke in the house. I could do it in the car and then go up and hopefully she'll be asleep and I won't let none of her friends see me do it. And I was pretty good with that shit, you know. I would never do it at the store. I would always do it on, in the car on the way home. That's my freak. I would do it at a fucking light. i just put a dollar bill and, and do a blast at the light and just keep driving. But this thing came up. He kept asking me, you know, can you help out my friend? And I'm like, when people ask you to help their friend out, they got to be a cop. And that's why they want to meet the guy. But finally, I said, you know, all right, what does he want to buy? He goes, I don't know cocaine. He just wants to buy big numbers. So I needed money, so I started helping the guy. And after like two or three times, the guy told me what he did. You know, we became, he was from Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And we became friends and what he did. And he told me that he was Whitney's and Bobby's, well, Whitney's road manager. And he traveled with them. And he was uh, getting packages for them. And he would call me every fucking day. And at the time, I was getting coke at Martel. And it was called the Martel Cartel. And they had, like, street coke. And I cut a deal with them. I'm like, guys, you can't sell me this shit. I want this shit. You guys get uncut. 
I'll pay you a little extra for it and I'll cut it. So I would get inositol and it was like, I would go to the health food store and buy a fucking barrel of inositol and leave it at my house. And I would get like an eight ball by eye, put it in my baggie, the guy would pick me up in front of my house, take me to the Martel cartel. In the guy's house, I would throw the cut in and take my eight ball out and give the guy the coke and he'd drive me home. That's it, Felicia Michaels. And I would get like 200 bucks and an eight ball for the day. So you were a drug dealer. So I was a drug dealer, yeah. pretty much, just for them. And I was taking some coke and snorting it. But they were coming to me every day. I couldn't snort that much fucking blow. I had too many people around me. So I, I didn't want to have it at the house. I hid it in the garage for a few weeks. And finally I go, Marilyn, can you hold this for me in the house? And I went to my friend's house and I weighed up like an ounce and I gave it to him. And I gave it to her. And then I weighed up another half ounce and gave it to her again. And I think I gave her like a half and a quarter and an, an ounce. And I gave it to her because I kept, it kept coming in. So I would just leave some in the garage and snort that. And finally one day I said, you know what, Marilyn, bring the bunch down because I think I'm going to sell it. What a fucking mistake that was. I had all this coke, but I didn't have it in the house. I had it in the trunk of the car. And every time I, and I went to the store that night, I had a good set. So as I was walking off stage, some guy gave me a little baggie with something on the bottom of it, Felicia Michaels. And I went to the house and I did it and it wasn't coke, it was speed. So it fucked me up. So I kept going in and out of my apartment to the trunk of the car on, in front of that house where we lived on Schrader and doing cocaine in the car. It was fucking crazy. And at five o'clock, that redheaded chick paged me one night and she's like, hey, what are you doing? And I'm like, nothing. And I went over to a house and we fucking stayed there till five in the afternoon. And that's what made me, it was just horrible. We did heroin, <coughs> we did the fucking wow. ounce and a half of blow in that whole fucking time. I felt terrible about myself. And that, and that was when I really, I started signing up and going to like these little rehab classes I wouldn't tell nobody. But that's when all that stuff with Whitney Houston was going. And it's so weird that I told the story. People know the story because they've heard it. And it's so weird that people are trying to blow it up, that people never take, like, uh, the good things about that you've done. Like, they took that story out of all of them. That's the one that really made a difference. All the podcasts we do, mm -hmm. all the shit that I take from it. It's really weird. One of the other reasons why I never told that story, and it's, and it's weird, like I told you the story, like if you said to me, what are the embarrassing things in your life, Joey? And I'm like, when I stole that fucking kid's jar from that Carvel, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's so weird how that, dealing with her on that level, like I didn't see her until like the 10th time that he brought her in the car. And she didn't really talk to me, you know? She said, hello, I said, hello. But I remember looking at her and how she was looking outside the window and how bad she felt that she was in the car with me and how fat I felt that I was in the car with her because this wow. is the way I wanted to really meet yeah. her and it was weird because I remember going to people's houses to get coke when I was already fucked up and they'd like I call you up or whoever I call somebody up and go hey I want to get a pack and they go well I'm at my sister-in-law's house and I would go there and these people would go you're the guy from the longest yard and I'm in a fucking way Felicia that I can't talk to people and here I am to buy coke, and they're looking at me as a guy in the movies, and I'm really going there at my lowest point. So I always thought about, it, like, the last time I seen those people was the story I told on the podcast with, with uh, Whitney Houston that they were here for the Grammys or the American Music Awards or something, and the kid had called me all week. He's like, bro, this week they're partying hard, so you got to be on fucking call. When they call, they want a package, you know? But I remember that they didn't call the night of the awards, and I was really in shock. I'm like... I was getting ready to snort blow. I didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. I was living off them, you know? And they didn't call, but the next morning they called. Like at seven in the morning, and they goes, your guy ready? I'm like, yeah, he's fucking ready, let's go. And they picked me up. And I remember that they were all still up from the night before, you know? And they were looking out their perspective windows as we drove to get it, and I gave it to them. And I remember when I got back in the, in the house that day, it was like eight in the morning, and I hid the eight ball in the garage. I remember going upstairs and thinking about how bad they felt. Like that they had a, this is like the murky waters in the end of the world. These people got invited to the fucking Grammys. These people are Grammy type fucking people, you know. So it's just really sad that that's what I learned from that experience. And that's why I never, I think I never talked about it. Because that's more embarrassing to me than stealing that fucking change jar. Like even for me going to, like I said, to, 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 to the ghetto, the cop. And somebody would say, you're the guy from the longest yard. And I, yeah. You know how fucking embarrassing that was, you know? Like, yeah. So I'd never, it, like, to so some people, it's like, you're right. It's like story one for some people. For me, it's like story 2000 and whatever because 
you know, I don't even know. I, that's the way I was raised. Just watch, shut your mouth, and listen, you know. Mm -hmm. And I remember, like, seeing Lawrence Taylor years ago, 30 years ago, and trying to offer him a bump of coke and him wanting to beat me up at a bar in Jersey one night. Like, he's like, get the fuck out of here before I kill you, you white motherfucker, and all this shit. So, mm -hmm. but it's just weird. Like, I've been thinking a lot about that story lately, and it's like, first off, I shouldn't have said it because it created too much drama in a way. Why? Well, I, I didn't think that people would react to it that way. I thought it was just a story I was telling that. To me, like I said, everybody I've met has always said, oh, well, I party with this guy or I party with that guy or <clears throat> this guy did coke with me or whatever. So, I don't know. It just well, felt you know, like Jeremy, a minute story. Here's the thing, like, uh, we're pretty honest about everything on this podcast. I think so. And uh, uh, everybody knows, if, if this is just the first time you've listened to this podcast, you know, I don't know what you're going to take away from it, but if you've li listened to the podcast and listened to all your stories and listened to the things in between the stories about what you're saying about how it shaped you as a person, you know that when you, I think when you tell stories like that, you know, they're funny because you're a funny person, but that, that was, that was part of your story too. And you're allowed to tell that part of the story. And I don't think you should be penalized or think badly of because it made you a better person that story made you a better person don't you think that was one of the steps in i gotta get my shit together because that's fine it was a monday morning and yeah. i remember going upstairs and going these people are getting high on a monday morning and that's the day that was the day that i really noticed that she was looking out the window and it was like she was embarrassed to be there yeah, and that's saying it in that way. Also, look, everybody knows that something's going on or did go on or whatever happened with her and, and drugs or whatever. And I think that pa paints her in a very gentle light because it's an addiction. It's an illness. It's when you're at that fucking point, you are ill. You know, you know, it's an addiction. And it's that's uh, now that you're talking about it in that light. Here's you know, the real addiction. Here's where it gets weird. Before a person goes to rehab or they hit their bottom or whatever the fuck they want to call it, there's one morning that you have to wake up and you open up your eyes and you look at the ceiling and you like, where the fuck am I? And you think about the night before and you know that you can't keep doing this. It's so weird, Felicia, because you know you can't keep fucking doing this, but you can't stop. You can't fucking stop. And that's where it gets really scary. And that's the position I was. And I mean, I'll be honest with you, I was done with cocaine in 95. I did it till 2007 because I couldn't stop. And that's the scary thing. That's the sad part to me that even knowing you're a fucking award winning Grammy artist or an athlete or a fucking president or whatever the people, whatever the fame you might have, that you're lurking in that bottom floor of life. You're on the basement of life, and in reality, you're in the penthouse of life. But you're forcing yourself to go down. I felt it all the fucking time, and I'm nobody. I was on the second floor, and I would just go on the basement. I would fucking feel terrible about myself, even thinking about it. Like, all week I've been thinking about it. Like, how sad is that fucking story? Dick Van Dyke. Oh, really? I did a movie for the Lifetime channel when he was on, and my first scene with him, as soon as he walked in the room, I had to go down on one knee. Like, I couldn't even look at him. And people were looking at me like, what's the matter with this kid? And I kept lying to people, telling people I have allergies. And after like 10 minutes, it was just me and Dick Van Dyke. And I was like, I gotta tell you, man, I can't stop crying because you're the first person I learned English from. Yeah. Like, I got up to watch you, to see you jump over that chair to do all that zany shit. I think for three years, I thought I was Dick Van Dyke. You know what I'm saying? Like, to see <laughs> Dick Van Dyke to me, yeah. you know, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, fucking, you know, all those movies as a kid. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, come yeah, on, yeah, to yeah. see, and then to, you know, and then Tom Van Dyke or his brother, and then he had a brother. But just to see that. Jerry man, Van Dyke or something. Yeah, Jerry Van yeah, Dyke. Yeah. You know, uh, I've seen Pacino, and I just walked by him, you know, and. Yeah. But when I seen the guy in Scarface that cut his arm off, the, his brother's arm off, like uh -huh. he, he's in a couple movies, I seen him in a commercial audition once. I fell all over myself. I couldn't even focus on the audition. I had to talk to the guy. His name is Al Israel. He's Jewish. And every role he's ever played in Hollywood is a Spanish role. He's never played a Jewish role. 
Every role he had was a badass drug dealer who shot somebody. And it was just amazing talking to him. And like I'm like, you ever go back to New York? And he's like, nah, everybody's dead or in jail or fucking strung out on drugs. I mean, it was like talking to a mirror. Yeah. He had had the same life. And it's amazing how, you know, I, I, in my wallet I have a union card. Felicia, I, I was never even a fucking Boy Scout. Like, I've never belonged to nothing. I'm in a Screen Actors Guild. How fucking crazy is that? How fucking crazy is that that if I live, I'm going to have a pension? Yeah. Like, it's not going to be much. I'm not going to be a millionaire. But just the fact that... Dude, you're a working actor. I had nothing. I had nothing. I didn't know anything about... I didn't even want a pension. I knew nothing about insurance. I I knew nothing. Like, I'm like... And I look at this card. It says, member since 98. Like, I'm like, wait a second. I've been a member of SAG now, yeah, 15 fucking years, 14 years, you know? So it's like, you know, people are stuck in their lives, and sometimes things just happen, and you don't know how you get there. You know, that song by the Talking Heads is a beautiful song, same as it ever was. Yeah. You know, how did I get here? I got a beautiful wife, a beautiful car. What the fuck, you know? You know what I'm saying? (laughs) I love it. When I found out, you know, I love Blue Bloods. I love the show Blue Bloods, and I watch it because of Moynihan. She's fucking beautiful. Something about that little Irish bitch drives me yeah, crazy. An Irish sassy. chick with brown hair yeah, has always yeah, driven me crazy. Yeah. Then I found out he dumped her when she was six. I Wikipedia the bitch. He dumped her when she was six months pregnant. <laughs> God damn, that's a cold blooded move. That's a pimp that super a, fly hand. That is a fucked he, up move. But he dumped her for the Brazilian chick. Which, yeah, but she's prettier than the Brazilian chick. I like the Brazilian chick, but she's just like some. Sometimes you look at her and you're like, "What the fuck?" You, you know could, what I mean? Like, you could tell you. she smacks the fuck out of him. She beats <laughs> the fuck out of him. She's a tough bitch. Yeah. You know they have a bunch of back hidden things in LAX and stuff that they just drop you. Yeah. You know the people that come out in the front, the TMZ catches, they're amateurs. Yeah. They're amateurs. Oh, the real people. Yeah, the real, up they in have the back. like this thing that you go through the back and the limo pulls right up and they whisk you right away. A lot of people don't know that about LAX. All these guys that think they're bad when they come out and TMZ's waiting for them. You're a punk. <laughs> You're a punk. You think Clooney comes out through the fucking front? The Angelina and Jolie? Fuck no. They land and there's a hatch under the plane. They just drop them. <laughs> the pilot just pushes the fucking thing. They come down like James Bond right into the fucking limo. There's a chick sucking dick and they whisk him right into the Hollywood Hills to Charlie Sheen's There's probably fucking a chick mansion. sucking dick as he's dropped. As he's dropping. That's what I would she's do. She's holding on for dear life. You know, people in this country don't realize how, how fucked up flying is. Like, not the flying, but I used to fly when I was a kid. And the planes have gotten low class. Like, you have to fly to London to get that big flight that's twenty, you know, $25,000 right. where they give you a manicure. But in the old days, all the flights used to be two floors. So the regular folks sat on the, fl- on the bottom floor, uh-huh. the peasants, and the pimps sat upstairs. And upstairs, they'd have a piano, a guy playing the piano. People don't remember this shit. They have a, on People's Express, and then they have a pig with a pineapple in his mouth. And you come up and mingle with people and smoke cigarettes. That's how it used to be. I'm one of the first crimes I ever pulled, I was in first class on Eastern Airlines. I remember, remember this. I was a little yeah. fucking kid, and I went with my mother and stepdad to Puerto Rico. And I went to the bathroom, yeah. and there were perfumes. They used to put perfumes in first class that you could open, you know, before yeah. the fucking guy came into the bathroom and give you the towel. Right. Way before that position was invented, when trust was still left in this country. They just put everything in the bathroom. You go and comb your hair, brush your teeth, you throw the toothbrush away. They had all these perfumes. So in the bathroom, I'm like in the first grade, I'm like, you know what? There's about 13, 14 perfumes in the black market, maybe. I got about $30. So I took the puke bag, the bag that you puke yeah, up, yeah. I filled it up, and I sat next to my mother with the thing hidden until we got to Puerto Rico. <laughs> and in Puerto Rico, you know how you run through the fucking airport? I, I put cologne on, and I forgot to close one of them. So the bag leaked. So here I am in Puerto Rico running, and they're like, stop, stop, Jose Antonio. And all of a sudden, the bag fell out. And all the perfume was broke. Uh, and I'm there looking at him. My mother my mother just kept walking. I don't even know this kid. That's where I learned that move from. My mother was like, I ain't responsible for this motherfucker. You learned that move all right. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll leave your ass there. Uh, <laughs> this shit go down. You got to worry no, about yourself. Pe- people have Joe no idea. Fucking out of there. You know, they, all that shit, the sky. What's that thing when people fuck in the air? What's that called? The Mile High Club? Uh, That was invented 30 years ago when you could fuck in a bathroom. Now a guy like me can't even whack off in a bathroom. You don't fit. (laughs) Who the fuck fits in a fucking bathroom that you can fuck? The Cuban egg roll doesn't fit in a bathroom? (laughs) No, I fit, but I got to keep my foot open, my leg out, so you can't whack off with the door open. They'll throw you you off the flight. You you can't lounge back. No, you can't bang a fucking good one. the toilet seat. In the old days, you could bang (laughs) one in there and fuck it in the seat and come on that metal fucking tent and leave it there and some nun will come in and get pregnant. You can have a good fucking time. You can't do that no more on a fucking flight. 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying? When we lived in oh. Gardner and I drank all your orange juice. <laughs> you, you came over all jawed up, okay? And and I was on a budget and telling me a story. Coco drank all my orange juice. I just made it, right? And we were going to have breakfast like respectable people, right? It didn't have much, but, you know, just have respect. I like, have people over, you know, have a little juice, all right? He drank my whole fucking thing of juice. And I'm like, that's my whole juice for the week, dude. All right? And, and he just drank my juice. And I realized at the bottom, I go, I just made that fucking juice. And he goes, it was a good story, cocksucker. I got to go. All right? And I fucking left. And I'm just sitting there all juice raped. You know, like, what the fuck just happened on my juice? Oh, it was awesome. We were one time, one time uh, they were working out front of our house, and they put the uh, our apartment complex, Sunset and Gardner, and they put these big metal, uh, this big you know, piece of metal to cover uh-huh. the hole they were working on, uh-huh. right? And I parked my car there, double parked to the red zone in front of the fire, uh, you know, station, which is like illegal, like five ways, right? And uh, I was coming around, and I didn't see that metal, that that inch and a half metal. And I busted my ass. And Coco's like, Ralphie, where, where'd, you, where'd you go? Where'd you go, cocksucker? You know what it is when you talk You're talking to, and then just pew. When you talk to somebody in the car and you get out. Like we parked right. and you're like, yeah. You know, you're in the middle of a story. Right. So then I fucking told the bitch, hey, fuck you. So you fell in the hole? Right. No, so no, we, no, no, I fell down. I you fell, fell down. down. So I get out of the car and I'm telling my story. And all of a sudden I turn around and there's no Ralphie. Yeah. So I'm like, Ralphie, Ralphie. He's like, I'm over here. And he can't get up. And yeah. all I see is little legs <laughs> I and am, shit. I am my fucking turtle upside down. <laughs> in my shell All right, and he's like he's like yelling at me and I'm laughing so it's making getting up even harder because he's fucking making me laugh he's like Robbie, you cocksucker you gotta get up get up because they think, I'm, think, mugging think I'm mugging you they think I'm mugging you they're gonna fucking pull over and the cops are gonna pull over you know you gotta let people know I've already been in, I've already been in these situations where you're helping something up and ten cops around you you, know, you gotta get up this is sunset and fucking like, garden you're gonna get the, you're gonna bring the heat let's go get it together <laughs> That happened to me once. Do you remember a comic? You guys probably don't even know this guy named Ollie Joe Prater. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ollie Joe was a big guy. And the first time I ever worked at the La Jolla Comedy Store, and we had to leave the condo, and we're walking down to get the car and the parking structure underneath. And, uh, and I'm doing the same thing, like, blah, 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 blah. And I turn around, and Ollie is, like, laying on his back, like, smoking a cigarette. I'm like, what the fuck? He's like, go get the car. <laughs> I was like, yay, comedy, yay. <laughs> Welcome to comedy, fucker. Now, go get the car was the time when mm. I got ah. caught eating the chicks. Ah. 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 Right, okay, Ooh. let me tell my side of it, okay? Right, right. We, this, is, this is Bubbling at Dublin's. Jay Davis is over <coughs> up on uh, Sunset Boulevard, okay? All right, Coco is the only guy in the history of comedy that bombs for seven minutes, got nothing. And, and and he had that fucking hand working and sweating. Everybody told me about the set, bombed, picked up a bra while the next guy's on stage, then talked her into going downstairs into the fucking refrigerator, all right? All right? <laughs> Get her blow, all right? Is eating her pussy on a set he bombed. Okay, she's totally <laughs> fucking hot. All right, and then continue the story from there on out. So okay, I'm eating a pussy, sad. and I put the coke rock on a pussy. I said, "Have you ever had coke on your pussy?" She goes, "No." Let's try it. So I put the fucking coke, and as I'm going to lick it, fucking they bust in a Hindu with two other bodyguards, and they're like, "We have you on camera," and I put the coke in my sock. So it, like, it was you know, her blow. It was her blow. They're like, <laughs> and it was her blow. Yeah, please, you know. Oh, and fuck. it was her blow. And it was her pussy. So. We go upstairs. I'm not call impressed the by cops. the pussy thing, but her blow. They're going to fucking call <laughs> fucking the fucking cops dirt. on me. Now, 10 years earlier, I would have got rid of the blow. I held that motherfucker for dear life in my sock because I knew the cops weren't going to take it. There's no charge. You were snorting yeah. coke. The coke is gone. I wasn't snorting no fucking coke. We seen you putting a pussy. It's your word against mine. We'll go. You got to search. You go get a warrant, bitch. By the time you go get a warrant, listen, we don't need this aggravation. We all go home. So I'm sitting outside. Willie Barsana comes out with Joe Rogan. They're like, what's going on? I'm like, listen, they're going to arrest me. The guy's going to call. They're like, fuck this. Willie starts talking to the security guard, and Joe Rogan gives me 100 bucks. He goes, when you go down to the station, here's 100 bucks. Call me, and we'll bail you out. So I look up, and I'm like, I'm going to go to jail. I look up, and I see Ralphie coming from the, oh, you could eat Miyagi, And right? the Miyagi's two for one. <laughs> two for okay. one in those days. And they had parking. karaoke. It was the best deal in the fucking place, man. <laughs> I got parking, two for one. I spent $30. I ate like a king. I'm going to go do a spot. Jay Davis is going to give me 40 bucks for it. I'm walking across 
fucking sunset waddling, fucking just just high as fuck and sushi out to the gills. All right, I see Coco and he's like, Ralphie, get the car. Get the car. Get the car. Get the car. Don't ask. And, and he's like, like, why? I got a spot ABC. See, I don't get a fuck. Get the fucking car. And, 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 throw and, me a fucking jet. Emergency. Like, like, first I thought he was busting my balls. It was Coco, right? Get the car. Right? And then, then, then I saw the emergency in his voice and I'm like, Right back, okay, quickly. My car hadn't been gone through the valet yet. It was still at the front. I handed the guy ten dollars. I fucking whipped it around there, got in, and and the cops were coming. Get it, Coco jumped and was like, "Hit it, cops like a hit, hit it, hit it." Hit and, then it. We, and then we went, we went out on sunset. Then the first, uh, the first fucking right, we were down, and then up fountain, and then okay, and then up, and then over by the Russian Park, okay, by, uh, Gorky Garner. Park, huh? yeah, yeah, Gorky Park, okay, 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 and then straight to the house. Get in. We've been here for an hour. Okay, that's a story. I got neighbors. Hey, we've been here for an hour. All right, that's the, everybody was in on. All right, and then Coco, Coco, fucking, he's got a huge package. He's got a hundred dollars from Rogan. All right, I gave him money because I didn't know what was going on. I got the good. He smells like pussy. <laughs> he smells like pussy. He ain't, he ain't fucking pussy. He had a great fucking night, man. I mean, and it was all by 8.30. Yeah, I was home by 8.30. And the cops were looking for me. Who's better than me? I went out with zero. I came up with an eight ball, 100, and the fucking cops were looking for me. Who's be- and I bombed. And I bombed. And I had pussy on my fingers and everything. And I bombed. You know, I always thought I was crazy when I was a kid and I had gone through my little thing that when I would go home at night, I would put on Black Sabbath and some nights I would cry. Like I would think that I could relate to these guys. Yeah. But in no way ever did I ever consider me going and chasing down Ozzy Osbourne to tell him that we right. were tight or he was talking to me. I, yeah. I, explain, I understand Led Zeppelin. I understood, you know, Patty Smythe. I understood a lot of people where they were coming from. Yeah. But I didn't feel at no time that it made me feel good. It soothed my pain for the moment. Sure. At no time did. And I did a lot of drugs back then. And if anybody had a hole in their soul, to be attracted to something like that. It was me. It's so yeah. weird how I, I see this now and I'm like, holy shit, this is a weird thing for a kid. Yeah. You know, this is just, uh, but I like it. I, I like I like that Felicia and I have been doing this for 18 months and you've been doing a podcast. I like all this shit. You know, we do Joe's podcast. We do all this stuff and people get to know who the fuck we are. I got sick and tired of doing a show and 50 people running out. Yeah. I really got sick right. and tired of people coming up to me every every three weeks and going you know what i watched you in some movie and you were funny and now i come here and it was vile and disgusting and yeah. vulgar i'm like fuck you bitch you know what i'm saying i mean <laughs> right. i mean you know i mean i got sick of that a part of me really got sick of that yep i i, I you know i've worked with joe for years you've known joe for years and there was yeah. a time when you know people watch him on fear factor and they think he's a sweetheart they yep. come down you know i remember when he was on news radio uh we were in miami with chris uh Chris, uh, the kid, the real know. cool kid that writes in town, and uh, some lady girl up to him and said, "You're very funny to Chris," and she goes, "I like you, but you're a, a homophobic." I started calling him a bunch of names, and then Joe's like, "What did you expect?" And she's like, "I wanted Joe Girardi." Yeah. You know, when you like, are you fucking crazy? That's a character on yeah. a television show. Yeah, you know, but with the podcast, we eliminate the middleman. This is what we were talking about in yep. the hotel lobby the other day. That I got sick and tired of that, so I don't mind. Talking about, you know, hey, listen, I'd rather put it out than somebody come to me and say, hey, I bumped into a high school friend of yours and he said you robbed something when you were in high school. Fucking put it out there. It was 30 years ago. If the cops are going to come get me, this ain't coke case, bitch. That's only on CBS on Sunday (laughs) nights. They ain't digging up 30 witnesses and doing paperwork. That's on CBS to scare Joe Mo. You can't fucking scare my flavor, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Unless you got the tape, bitch. <laughs> or the body and the footage. You don't come to me when I got a neighbor who seen you crawl in a window because I'll knock that fucking case right out of the loop. You follow me? But it's like, clearly, we're not a death squad. Like, we're not going into villages in third world countries and shooting babies in the back of the head. There's no association at all, but your mind's too small to stretch out a little bit and understand that it's just a word. When I get those type of e- I I email everybody back. But when I get something like that, not only do I delete it, I block that motherfucker yeah. and all his friends. Yeah. Like, if we got a connection, because I don't want that. You got too much fucking time on your hands. That's what you're telling me. You sat yeah. there and go, I like Duncan, I like Joey, I kind of like Brian, but that squad... 
Oh my God, let me Wikipedia that. Oh my God, how can they associate themselves yeah. with this? Have you heard our fucking material guy? Yeah. Do you think I'm worried about a fucking nickname, Death Squad? I mean, that's what killed me. You worked at the store, and there was a time when I would go in there once a month, a manager would giggle and hand me a fucking envelope. Yeah. With a hate mail. <laughs> those are the best. Yeah. So, at the comedy yeah, store. Yeah. I got some of those. People who came time, from Indiana, yeah. went there, went all the way back to Indiana, and I love Indiana, don't get me wrong, I'm just using Indiana as an example, and wrote me a letter once they got back to Indiana. So you carried that anger with you. Three hours on a plane. This is when I used to look at it, and at first, the first three or four, I read them and went home and changed my material a little bit and looked at it from his point of view. And, and then one day I said, fuck this yeah, shit. This can't. is bullshit. This guy, the worst one I ever got was from a guy in Akron, Ohio which just destroyed me. I don't know what joke or what reference I made. He wrote back a month later. And it wasn't just a page. It was one of those nine pages where yeah. he sat down and fucking outlined the letter before. It was a term paper. And I felt <laughs> bad for him. Like I even went and lit a fucking candle for him. Because you took that anger all the way back, three hours back to your hometown yeah. to write the letter. Right. Over a word I had used on stage or a joke. I think it was, you know what the joke was about? He was black, and I made a joke about Ike Turner. Beaten up when he uh, did the press conference. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. After he, he got very angry at Ike Turner, which is a true story. He got very angry at Tina Turner publishing What's Love Got to Do With It in 84, in 84, 85. So he wrote a memoir, and he finally got it done in 94. And the, a girl was a, a publicity, and she told me, she goes, we're doing uh I turn a, he's having a press conference well a week later I seen the girl and she was like he was late four hours the car had to pick him up in Harlem crack was oh, in the I'm car sure, I'm sure. you know he got, yeah. but the, the faux pas was somebody asked him was the book real and he goes I never beat the bitch I just punched in the face a couple times that is hilarious <laughs> and I made a joke on stage and he went home yeah. he even contacted like a black governor or a committee man wow. over that oh, joke wow, wow. like it was that deep yeah. and I, I didn't say a bad word or nothing I never got it well you're dealing with you know what you're like a really great comedian I remember going to see uh, you know George Carlin and what happens is uh, when you go to see a really good comedian, y y y all of a sudden you realize, oh, this is more than just you know laughter. Holy shit, this is a lot more than just laughter. And then all of a sudden, a, a good comedian starts fucking with your subjective reality and starts deconstructing things that up until that point you'd never even considered. You'd always thought they were real. And so that, for some people, is an identity threat. And so they, I guess they get really, they get afraid because their world starts crumbling. Like when I saw Carlin and... You know, he starts off with some kind of like hacky jokes, kind of like I remember thinking, like, "Oh man, where's the evil, you know, black necromancer that I thought George Carlin was?" <laughs> you know, this is like these shit jokes. I mean, this is terrible. Then all of a sudden, he's talking about his dying wife's cancer screams, and then he's like, talk, you know, he's breaking down religion, and you can look through the audience and you see some people and they are suddenly have just been dragged into the deepest water their worlds are, are crumbling inside their heads and it's beautiful I love it. it's, it's beautiful, beautiful to it see and it cuz you know that's the best gift you can give somebody it's the greatest thing you can give them is to you know destroy the parts of their identity that are based on falsehood and bullshit and a good comedian will do that while making you laugh because that's the thing. It's like it's like poison that tastes really good, you know. Poison to the ego, not poison, not bad poison, you know. But so that's what a great, a really good comedian does. So when you're, you know, talking about Ike Turner or whatever, all of a sudden someone. I mean, imagine these squares. Imagine their lives and their little fucking living rooms with their fucking mantle and their fan. Maybe there's a trophy room that their kid has or whatever. They come out to Hollywood and all of a sudden they're getting molested. You're fucking their brain. You're just grabbing their brain. Your mouth fucking their brain like in the porn with a slobber when the girl starts slobbering and she's weeping you're doing that to their, their brains and they can't get out <laughs> so they drive home after a psychic <coughs> mouth fucking and they're, they, all they can do is go back and write a letter that's the only that's the only recourse they have <laughs> okay, mouth speaking fucking. of mouth fucking yes do you remember one of the times I took my dick out at the comedy store how yes. much chaos it would cause yeah and it would cause chaos against the most fucked up people yeah. ever. 
And one night I went to the store and it was like a rambunctious Friday night in the original room. You guys know exactly what I'm talking about. Where it's 9.45 and they're already off their rockers. Yeah. There's 60 more people than usual. Yeah. And the lights are flickering. You know, zzz, zzz, you walk up there, the energy's burning. And all of a sudden there's two fallouts and they make you go up there. The comic before me was Bobby Lee. And oh, some wow. hot fucking girl went up there and threatened Bobby Lee's dick or he's Japanese, he doesn't have a big dick, something just obscene that I had never witnessed before in my life. I was in the back, you know, even as a, as a comic, I had never seen that. And all of a sudden, Rogan had to follow the thing and she kept yelling at Rogan. And one thing led to another and they're going back and forth and the chick is hot, but she's a lesbian with another girl. So he gets off and I gotta follow him. And I go up there and I got nowhere to go. And she's like, hey, chubby, or whatever the fuck, fat baby, whatever the fuck, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know so I said, listen, why don't you just shut the fuck up? You interrupted me. If you're going to come up here and take off your pants, take off your pants. This bitch yells, I'll take off my pants, but you got to take out your dick. I'm dead. I got nowhere to go. She's hot. I go, get up here. The girl comes up, Felicia, <laughs> opens her pants, drops her fucking pants. The pussy is a 12. <laughs> okay, it's neat. It's like yours right now. It's very neat with the with the line. She probably had a SWAT sticker on it. She had a piercing. The noodle was radiant and full of light. The light was hitting it perfectly. She put cream on it before she left the house. And I'm sitting there mummified. But this is where it gets better. I look to the side, and there's Bobby Lee and Rogan and a bunch of other comedians. And the people are running in. There's no doormat. So people know that there's trouble going on. So yeah. now I'm sitting there and I got nowhere to go and I just pop out my helmet. And the place goes bananas, you know, and they're throwing money up at the stage and she's looking for it, but I'm knocking the 20s off because I was like 18 away from 20, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> on those Friday nights when you get up there, I got $3, I'm 17 away from 20. <laughs> and I remember how much chaos it caused, like amongst the weirdest people. And it wasn't women. It would be guys that would complain like a yeah. week later. Oh, really? Guy comedians would say something to me. Yeah. And I learned a lot from that. Like, I, I don't know how. It was just really, that was one of my lessons about L.A. and what's politically correct and then politically and how people react towards you. And, yep. You know, it's wow. oh, yeah. I freak out on little planes. The really? smaller oh, yeah, the, plane, the plane, the tougher it is. For yeah. Wait, I've seen you on videos singing in the... That's a 747 with 20,000 <laughs> people on the fucking plane. I'm talking about, you know, when, when you're a kid and you fly into Puerto Rico and you have to go to a small airport. Those little fucking tractor yeah. planes, they take you to... Yeah. I'm not... Even the one that you... There's a... Uh, where do you go? Like, let's say you have to go to Iowa. Fuck, you know, I, Iowa, Iowa City yeah. You gotta yeah, fly into yeah. Chicago and then take a fucking propeller flight. And bombardiers. But yeah, you know, people have parachutes. They come on. We have no drinks. We have a parachute. Yeah. And you're like, what the fuck? I should have just rented a car. That uh, You got to experience somebody. I've heard all the stories about Tracy Morgan that you tell. Fuck. And it's really hard to describe that individual if, if uh, he's really up there craziness-wise. And you got to experience it. How fucking crazy is he? You know what's so funny? Tony Woods. You know who Tony Woods? Yeah, is? I know Tony Woods. Tony Woods was there that night with me. Tony, at the club. At the, that, when, that, I, when that, Tracy that, and I that's how you smoked take care PCP, of, yeah. That's how you take care of a bartender. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, he was there that night. <laughs> so, that is fucking hilarious. So you know how you remember a story in your head? Like, you remember, you know how you tell a story to someone, and the, the way you tell it, if your husband or wife are, is there, they go, that's not what happened. And you're like, bullshit, don't fucking... Especially as comics, because we enhance the story enhance and we really story, and we make it, we tell it where it's good and where it's you know we juice it and we pull in, like pull some information uh -huh. to heighten the the, the delivery. Oh, right, and right, so right. and so, Tony calls me this weekend in D.C. Calls me. I'm on stage. I answer the phone. I go, Tony, what are you doing? He goes, I'm at some comic club. I go, come on, get up on stage with me. Come over to the to the, the improv. He's like, I'll be, I shorty, I'll be there in five minutes. Click. Tony Woods gets on the stage and he goes, let's tell the Tracy Morgan story. He goes, uh, you tell it the way you remember it and I'll tell it the way I remember it. Mother of God. I tell it like such an innocent bystander. But when Tony tells it, he's like, you were the one that got Tracy to take his shirt off. 
He was like, you were standing on the couch. I was like, I wasn't, I was very innocently just hanging out. And he was like, no, you were, t- you were the reason they kept looking at us because Tracy was just <laughs> drinking and being loud, but you were the white guy with his, sh- and I, but it was fucking, so yeah, Tony was there that night and then we told the story and the only thing we have correct is that there was a fight that we both were outside when Tracy got thrown out and then the other night he snapped his shirt and he goes, now that's how you get out of paying a check. That's the only way. <laughs> That is, and it's just, you know, I had never experienced him. Oh. I had watched Saturday Night Live maybe once or twice. I had never even known anything like that. Yeah. And the first day I met him, I, like people always go on Twitter, oh, it would be nice to hang out with you and Rogan or whatever. And I'm like, you have no idea. You go home bored. You want to go out <laughs> yeah. with somebody, you go out with Tracy Morgan. Because that'll make you think about your, your life, your future, where you stand, how you talk to women, how you don't talk to women. You and and then on top of all that, your inner fucking ghost or whatever's inside of you is howling. Yeah, he's howling the whole time because oh. it's just a, You know, I remember like being with him for six weeks in Santa Fe, and every time I would see him, it was a different laugh. And what he would say to people, he would say shit to Adam Sandler that was way beyond comprehensible. And Adam would just shrug it off and laugh. What well, really? was Tracy? Yeah. It's fucking Tracy. What, what, what are you going to argue with him? You're gonna, what are you going to yeah. say? And he means it all, but it is no written. There's nothing written. There's nothing thought about. It just comes out of him. He was so... I remember he came up a lot around that time, would come up and get on stage. And I, I remember thinking he had such a weird eye for comedy. What he found funny, what, what the audience found funny, I often felt, I bet he didn't even know that was funny. And then what he found funny was so obscure. <laughs> like, like he, I remember he had an observational joke about, uh, um, oh, man, I got a pretty dick. You can suck my dick with the lights on. And I was like, <laughs> and I remember going like, that's, that's a pretty dick. Yeah, I was like, I, and then I was thinking, I was like, I don't think I've ever gotten a blowjob with the lights on. I don't think I've ever gotten, I don't, yeah, I go, I don't think I've ever presented my penis to anyone with, with like halogen bulbs and like take a look <laughs> ever except for the doctor. And I'm, and I'm like, oh, that, like, but I go, if he had worded it different, <laughs> if he had just approached, like, what, what he's ultimately talking about is, is, um, is being insecure. <laughs> Like it's such a fucking weird. Uh, who remembers finger fucking by the handball courts? And I'm like, no one did that. You're the only one that did that. <laughs> who the fuck? But he's yeah. from Yonkers, New York. So yeah, well, he grew he's up. From, it's, he grew it's, up it's, up it's neat there. when you meet people that grew up differently. Where did you grow up? Um, I'm an army brat, so I grew up a little bit everywhere. But I wanted to say that uh, I've met Tracy a couple of times. My uh, ex-husband is his manager and when we met it was always in a familial sense like that he would bring his family over for dinner and he is like the coolest guy around kids <laughs> like, oh he's yeah he's a lot of fun he had he's i'll sweet. never forget this oh and like and now once again this is uh tracy morgan morgan lore um one of my friends was working at icm and they were courting him to to um to be a client this is when he started getting big and he was and Tracy apparently was like yeah yeah we can go we can go to we can go to to lunch dinner we can meet but I'm I, I'm bringing my family and they were like all right so he brought his family and then a bunch of other people for his son's birthday and had him do it like Davis Busters and <laughs> and, and had ICM pay for his son's birthday that's genius by the way it's that's genius so- that's genius like it just- that's what you should do. Yeah, he yeah. was like, yeah, yeah, you want to take me to lunch? Sure. Hey, when's your birthday? <laughs> this dude on the 10th. I was like, fuck. But he's I, he's always been, I never, I've never had bad words with the guy. I never, I, I only hung out with him one night, really. And and I had a good time with him. But yeah, he's an interesting guy. I hung out with him for four weeks. And since I had the same patois as he, he navigated, you know, and I was kind of uh, intimidated by him. You know, yeah. like I was uh, insecure around him because who he was. But after a few weeks, I got into his patois with him. And it was great because yeah. when I came from Cuba, those were the type of black kids I hung out with. Yeah. They were the ones that courted me. So hanging out with him really brought me back. Like when I came from Cuba, I still remember my first friend. His name was Jasper Williams. Jasper Williams. He was a black kid. And he lived on 127th and Autobahn in those beat up fucking buildings off 125th Street. And I'll never forget that he would walk me into his building. And at the time, it was still racial, was still yeah. weird. And the, the brothers with the afros, with the hair picks, would say, Jap, why are you bringing that white boy into the building? And he would turn around and say, he's Cuban, motherfucker, shut the fuck up. <laughs> and I would be blown away. Like, you talk like that? Like, it yeah. was just, 
And when I met Tracy for the first time, he brought me back to that, like those kids from New York that were black and solid. But he's from Yonkers, which when the lights go down up there, or it used to be, that's a different fucking planet. They yeah. never mention Yonkers. They talk about the five boroughs, don't they? Yeah. Yonkers is never mentioned. That's a fucking reason. That's a fucking reason. They got a racetrack out there. I can't imagine that. growing up like that. It's, it's Mary J. Blige and him. Those are people from Yonkers. Fuck. It's just a, and his patois, his voice, his voice isn't really New York. Yeah. The way he talks like that, that's not, that's something different. That's old school like that. Yeah. Those are, so it's pretty weird. Like the funniest thing he did with me is he had a, a white girl on his lap and he kept asking if she wanted to have a black baby. <laughs> you want to have a black baby and shit because I'm in the mood to get a black baby. <laughs> and I'm sitting there dying of fucking laughter. Yeah. And people, like at first when we were coming up to him, oh my God, you're from Saturday Night Live. And he would say something to him so outlandish that they were like, okay, yeah. nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> he would just push him into deep waters. Like, you want to suck a black dick? Let's do this shit. Yeah. There ain't going to be no telling stories or Adam Sandler and shit. You want to suck my black dick? <laughs> And they told me, like, some, you know, some women, like, you know, cute. Like, I went to uh, Chicago, and my screen broke on my phone. And they said, can you come back in an hour? So I went to Sprint, and I seen a white chick pitching a black guy. And it was hysterical. She's like, oh, my God. I work for a non, uh, non-profit uh, organization. And I'm sitting yeah. there going, you know what? You could say, he'll let you suck his dick. He's a black dude. <laughs> yeah. He'll let a fat yeah. blonde chick with dyed hair suck his dick. You're yeah. in no danger. You're a skinny brunette. They, Go for it, bitch, you know? <laughs> I mean, black yeah. guys don't give a fuck. And Tracy's one of those guys that really doesn't give a fuck. I mean, you Sincerely. look at his success. He must torture the people at NBC. He must torture all those people. But they just go, we got to deal with it. Yeah, he's he's just a, he's a, I, I like, I don't think he's acting at all on 30 Rock. <laughs> like, I, he's just, I, he's such an interesting kind of guy. There's a clip online of him talking about, playing high school football it's like some guy is shooting a documentary and Tracy goes from like t- talking about being a young comic to talking about how it's like football and yeah you're Donnell Williams you better not pull that Doug Flutie shit just starts going into this character of a coach talking to his quarterback you ain't Doug Flutie Donnell you ain't like just out of nowhere and you're just like oh my god he's fucking genius like he's like a he's just like a, a savant like like, like a comedy savant. Like he just is. He was. Uh, he did fucking five minutes at the Boston Comedy Club about shopping for porn. He didn't say any words for five minutes. He was just getting objects down and looking at them and te- and it was like, oh my god. But yeah, I can't. I'm shocked to hear that you would be intimidated around anybody because you're the most intimidating person I think in comedy. He is. You think? You think Joey is? He, he's one of those guys. Well, Joey's like a. <laughs> like a, like you're the, one of the nicest guys and the sweetest guys. No one will ever say a, like, oh, he's a mean guy. But but you're just there. There are very few comics like you. There actually are, is no one like you. And especially in the back of a comedy club, when you see the list of people and you look at the list and you're like, you know, uh, Dimitri Martin, you know, Bert Kreischer, uh, Ari Shafir, Duncan Trussells, Joey Diaz, and then you see you, you stand alone. You are you are literally. There's like probably. 10 guys like me, 20 guys like Dimitri, 30 guys like Ari. There's, I mean, I'm, 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 those numbers are skewed. I'm, I'm making it, uh, but I mean, there's a lot of guys that do, like Dane, like, that are similar to me. There's, there's a, no copies, in other there's words. There's no one like you. There's no one. That's true. There's That's no true. one like him. And so in a weird way, in a business where everyone's trying to be independent, you then become one of the most intimidating f- f- people around. You know? It's you're, really weird because... Like I said, I base everything off of fear. Like, after I do something, I walk out of something, I go, whew, if they only knew. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's <laughs> yeah. If they only knew. Like, a couple of weeks ago, I was doing General Hospital, and that was the first time, because as you're driving to this gig, you're thinking about all the things that you, you don't add up. Yeah. Like, how the fuck are these guys going to let me in those studios? If they knew that 10 years ago, I robbed the fucking <laughs> blind guy, you know? Yeah. Or whatever. Whatever's on your mind. Yeah. Then you go in... And you're like, well, now I'm a bunch of round actors. I'm a stand-up. So all your insecurities come in. But then when you're in that energy, it pops up. And that's what happened with Tracy and Chris Rock in that movie. Yeah. I got to this movie. I was a stand-up comedy from the store doing blow at night. And all of a sudden, I'm in this fucking greatness. Yeah. And it's like anything else. Like you said about the jump. You're right there, man. Fear is... Sometimes you don't even... I do everything because of fear. Yeah. You know, when I used to walk into a, a room... When I was 15, I'd walk into a room in Harlem to get a bag of weed, 
I knew that if I gave a little bit of fear out, they're like dogs. Oh, they're gonna chew you. Yeah. Yo, dog, you gonna give me that five dollars you were talking about? Next thing you know, I'm here to buy a bag of weed. What five dollars? Next thing you know, he's got four guys coming over. They smelt it in your walk. Yeah. So that that walk to get the weed, I was fearful as shit. But I just composed myself. I just acted it out. <clears throat> and that's what everything. You know, you just have to act it out in your mind. I'm scared of the weirdest things, but you don't know that till you get older. Yeah, I always thought that, oh, I was motivated. I was, uh, you know, what's all those words people use, inspired? Yeah. No, I was scared to pieces. Yeah, I was scared to fucking death half the time. What we do is fucking scary. But you close your eyes and you get a fucking chair and you walk into the lion's mouth. It's weird when you tell somebody a situation in your life, but then you explain to them what you took from it. And that's what the whole story is about. I don't even focus on the stories no more. It's, I'm in the shower thinking of stupid shit. Like, yeah. how did I learn to fucking sweep? The other day I was thinking about how I learned okay. to sweep. Okay, oh, that's so fucking genius. You know, how did I learn to sweep? Who taught me how to sweep? And I'll never forget going for a job one day at Rendell Lumber and Marine. This is a true story. And he goes, before I hire you, do me a favor. I'm going to uh, come in and work for a few hours. And I went to work for a few hours. And he goes, uh, go sweep my office. And in his office was a little green box in the center of the thing. And I was fucking a big time thief. So I'm sweeping the office and I <laughs> look in the box and it's filled with cash. And all I needed, I had 40, so all I needed was a 20. 10 for the half a gram and $10 for, for beer. Yeah. I'm good, you know what I'm saying? I took a 20, and he goes, take the job. And then later on, he called me up, and he goes, you know, I counted the money, and there was a 20 missing. You took a 20 out of here, you know? And, and he goes, I'm still going to give you the job. You know, it's just amazing. You yeah. think of all these fucking things. And uh, the story is about me stealing a 20, but not really. Because he's like, you're a good sweeper because you move the desks and shit. Yeah. He goes, that's why I'm hiring you because a lot of people come in and sweep, but they don't move shit when they sweep. You came and swept, so because of that, don't worry about the. So it's almost like a twofold challenge. <laughs> yeah, it was like, like a, a Zen master. <laughs> like I'm gonna put money in the center of the room yeah. and I'm gonna keep dirt under the desk. I want to see which one's better. Yeah, and I was a good sweeper, so he let me fucking that's take so the job, even though I stole the twenty, and I went on to destroy him. Like by the time I quit that place, his bank account. Did you it think was, how this was gonna end beautiful? It was, it was, it was no, it was like a karate was, kid sweeping I, moment. It was, it was a New Jersey job, destroyed it. and the kid who gave me the job, <laughs> Bert Christ, this is how crazy oh this was. The kid who gave me the job pulled me aside. He goes, "Do me a favor, steal." Yeah. He goes, "Everybody here steals, and if you don't steal, they're gonna know." Oh, he was so everybody up. at this place was stealing from they had such a, it was a, a, a boat marine yeah. plywood fifty dollars a sheet you know four by eight marine uh, AC plywood fifty four dollars four yeah. by eight one inch people would pull in the back and go I need fifty five sheets of <sighs> they're fifty six dollars but if you give me thirty cash done you know I didn't leave there with two thousand dollars I was sixteen the Shut register was up. an old school register. So if somebody spent two hundred dollars and two thousand, two thousand. Let's say somebody spent twenty six hundred dollars in hammers. I bring in two hundred dollars. How are you paying for this cash? Two hundred dollars, and I put it in the register. At the end of the day, I had the math in my head, and I go to Jack Flint, Finn was his name, the other yeah. cash register guy. And I go, what did you steal? I got about eight hundred. I got about three thousand. Let's cut it down the middle. And we cut it. He go get a gram of coke, and by six o'clock, everybody at the place would be jammed. <laughs> customers would come. You couldn't get customer service at this fucking place. And it was funny because the guy that had raised me, pseudo Carmine Balzano, was also robbing the place in a different capacity. He was a cop that was building a house for himself, but billing it to the town. So all these people would come in and go, let me get 25 sheets of plywood, bill it to the town, but deliver it to my house. So all these people were raping the town of North Bergen, Shut but up. billing it, building and billing it. So when this place went down, finally Carmine took it over yeah. with a crew of other guys, and he turned it into a combination strip club flea market. So it was a flea market in the daytime, and at night it was a strip club. This is around the corner from the Meadowlands Inn. Are you serious? So finally, after everybody put heat on them, so in the daytime you'd go in and they'd be building trinkets and yeah. Indians with feathers and shit. And at, night, yeah, and at night it'd be 20 hookers from the city grinding that pussy on your face. And you're like, well, I came for a trinket. There ain't no yeah. trinket. This black pussy cocksucker. And finally, after the place went out of business, there was the whole thing, he tried to light it on fire. Yeah. So he went out there. That was his middle name, Carmine the Torch Balzano, because he he was a driver for the mayor, but he also built he also lit the buildings on fire for all the people in the neighborhood, and he lit the, the thing on fire. And three kids were outside riding their bike, and they're like, "Mister, 
the building's on fire. He's like, no, it ain't. It's just a little smoke. He's yeah. like, here's twenty dollars. We'll get ice cream. Yeah. So the kids went and called the police, and then they wanted to interview him, and he faked the heart attack. I mean, I come from a great town. Because when you do a crime, you fake a heart attack. That gives you and your attorney a couple of days. They yeah. can't interview you to put the story together. These are all the things that happen out of this Rendell Lumber and Marine. This all started. The title of this story is How I Learned How to Sleep. <laughs> <laughs> That's the fucking... We're having coffee. He goes, he, was, he goes, yeah. He's like, dog, I heard all these stories about you. And then he's like, I got to see this guy. I got to see this one night I go in and your name's on the lineup. And I go up and I watch you do stand-up. And I'm like... No, I don't see it. He's, I, it's not that good. It's not that guy. I'm not. I'm not a big fan. I don't. I can't believe this guy robbed the train with the Russian mafia. I can't believe he partied with Tracy Morgan and smoked PCP. I can't believe and bullshit, bullshit. And <laughs> turns out he saw Mike Birbiglia do stand up. Oh, so really? the whole time, I see Mike Birbiglia up there talking about Bibles and lollipop funny. and writing a blog, and I'm hearing about fucking. <laughs> This guy, you know, hooking and fucking mugging people really and on a train. So when Rogan and all those guys are telling me, Bert Kreisch, oh I'm like, God. what? Stop. Oh, that <laughs> that guy will get, you know, he'll faint That's if he sees funny. a needle. Michael Bigler is very funny, He's but very I can't funny, see yeah. him fucking on a train, yeah. robbing fucking Russian, yeah. drinking vodka. So I always thought he was Mike Birbiglia for years. You lived in the, I saw Joe Diaz get beat up by a transgender guy with, with an umbrella. Oh Dude, remember when that guy you were trying to escort him out of the club because he was working at the club, the my club, and we had a it was called fetish night. So there were these two transgender dudes, and they were both dressed as women, and they had umbrellas. Well, they started to fight with each other. So I was like, Joey, because he was like, I need some work, and I was like, All right. so I, he was working the door. I go, Joe, you got to go break that up, and. So he's breaking. He's like, come on, come on, guys. Come on, we got to go. And they're like, stop it. And they're hitting him with his umbrellas. These little, like, little twirly Asian umbrellas. He's like, he was umbrellas. laughing his ass off. As he's why he's like, don't stop hitting me with the umbrella. Stop, stop, stop it. <laughs> that uh, is funny. And then the, the DJ for that night used to pull up in a hearse and pull all of his equipment out of the hearse. That, that was dude. the old Lobo Loco. Lobo Loco, yeah. If those walls could talk. And I've told Felicia that I lived on the office above it. I paid the guy a buck and a quarter and had no bathroom, so I had to shit off the balcony. Yeah. And piss off the balcony. <laughs> and, those, and the guy was like, that guy was like, are you living here? And you're like, no. Nah, I just do my business. But here's the funniest thing. When I was thinking <laughs> on of, the balcony. When I was thinking of you coming on the show, I was thinking about that day that we were going to Moscow, Idaho, and you would bartend lunch in the daytime. Uh-huh. And I had to go from the bar, like I had to meet you because we were getting a rental car or something. Right. And we had met this guy at lunch at Lobo Loco that used to come in every day, and we talked sports. And one day he said to me, can you take my action? I don't think you remember this story. And I said, sure, I'll take your action. I had no money. And every week I would beat him. Like the first week I got him for like 800 yeah. Then the second week I got him for like 900 And this was like a lot of money back then. Like I was an open micer, broke, living on a floor in an office, and I got this sucker. And I'm sweating it out every week, taking the guy's bets. And finally, after the third week, we're going to Moscow. Idaho. He's got to pay us. That's how we were going. He was going to pay me. And he gets and he's like, listen, I want to meet the bookmaker right now. I remember, you remember that. that. He's like, I know there's no bookie. You're sitting on my fucking action. And then it was, I think, Frank the Lip. <laughs> yeah. Frank Frankie the Lip. the Lip. Frankie the Lip talked him into giving me the money. Because you know I'll give you that? half. Fuck it. I'll take half because I'm not going to sit here and argue with you. Do you remember how he got that nickname, the Lip? No. Because he used to get that big, one big herpy right on his upper lip. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember the very first time I ever saw Joey on stage? Now, Joey and I met in Seattle. 95. The, June of 95. <laughs> the first time I saw him on stage, like he was doing, he put together a show at the Comedy Underground. Now, at that time, he was maybe going 215, 220. Max. Max. I mean, he was thin. Thin. Yeah. He, and he, he liked to think he could beat me in basketball, too. He, yeah. was, he was thin. But suit, three-piece suit, tie the whole thing. Oh, really? Yeah. I was still confused. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you don't fucking know. You think the, and then he, he used to tell this joke. What was the joke about the curtains? I have no yes, fucking idea. You, uh, Wipe for, your dick on yeah, the yeah. curtain. That's the worst joke ever. That was your closer. That's the worst <laughs> joke yeah, ever. Yeah, he used to do a white... And he used to close with that, and I used to close with an Elvis, Elvis. impersonation. Oh, God. If anybody has the oh. tapes, it's terrible. Oh, oh it's really? So bad. really? It wasn't that so bad. Like, you look at that stuff now, I just throw it the fuck away. 
But before I put it in the garbage, like I break it, I burn the tape, I pull it out. Like I don't want anybody tone or whatever. I wouldn't know where the fuck to even start with this stuff, especially this phone. I know nothing. I finally figured out how to take a picture and put it on Twitter. You know, little things. Every week I make out. Yeah, you're right. You do learn new things every fucking week. You're absolutely yeah. right. You know, you don't know what it's going to be about. But it's pretty fucking sharp. I don't like these things. They're too confusing. You but love it. You just in denial. I like the fact on the phone that I get my emails now. And I like that shit. And I can check my Twitter. But I don't want it to be. I like it when I'm in a hotel. When I'm in a hotel instead of having to go downstairs. Because I can only fly with either a sleep apnea machine or a computer. I got to pick my weapon of choice. So I pick the sleep apnea <laughs> machine. And I go downstairs and I'm on a fucking computer. And this, I can at least check the, the obvious stuff. I can care less about Twitter or Facebook. But the emails, I want to know what's going on, you know? Yeah, I think a sleep apnea machine should just have Wi-Fi. Yeah. That's the next fucking move. That's the next move. <laughs> They're making them. I just, this morning, I had to mail two things, and one of the things I had to mail was my, and it's amazing. This is this is it, guys. I had to mail my computer chip from the sleep apnea machine. And they'll, they just sent me the new one. And then in three days on my email, I'll get a fucking printed out sleep study from the oh, last cool. month. And I could pick out the nights I smoked too much reefer. And I could oh, pick out the wow. nights when I drank alcohol. Because it shows you how dry you're running. And you see how it's fucking amazing. Just by putting on a mask, oh, it wow. electrodes everything. Blood pressure. And they show you where you're at. I mean, I, I've gone to the doctor and he's gone, you drank alcohol on February 18th. What are you talking about? I did. I did the improv and I drank a Bloody Mary. Bam! It's all in that fucking chart. So one drink will throw your sleep off Might sleep off because it much? makes you drier and it makes you snore. Oh. So that's all part of the fucking patois. You know, everything, you know, when you do blow, your, your throat, like he would, like in the beginning, he'd go, what happened? This whole week you slept weird. <laughs> 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 there was no sleep at all. That was my disguise because he could tell your heart rate on it. Uh -huh. You know, your dryness. I think when you do coke, your throat closes. So you reach for more air. So I have a flex machine. So the air is on from, let's say, range 10 to range 19. Even if I don't need it, it's there. On the nights I did blow, it would go all the way to 29 because your throat closes up. So it's really amazing what you can tell. Like I've learned a lot about, like I tell people now all the fucking time, there is nobody, Brian and I were just talking about it at coffee, there was nobody who was as scared as I am of doctors and all that shit. Just the thought, Felicia. All it is the thought. Like when you were going through your thing, it was bothering me. Mm -hmm. All it is the thought. Like what's she going through today? Like when people say to me, I gotta go for tests tomorrow. Like I know what you're fucking going through. You know what test means? They're gonna stick shit in you. That's what test means. It's not like you go in there and they look at your eyes and look at your ears. They're gonna poke you and prod you and look at shit, you know? And I always think about it. We were having a conversation about my knee before. But after the knee surgery, three days later, Felicia, I woke up one day and Terry's like, oh my God, what happened? I'm like, what? My whole leg was covered with blood. But not on the outside, on the inside. The, oh, this happened after you came home from the hospital? Yeah, the oh, blood really? drips from the knee into the skin. So it looks like somebody fucking kicked you in the leg. Like, and I didn't, you know, I didn't expect nice. it. But all in all, Felicia, I had no scares with this thing. Like, I'm walking around today going... I don't believe I made such a fuss in my head over this. It was nothing. Yeah. It was like going to the dentist. That's how he's, that's modern technology. They could tell you fucking everything now, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. We gotta imagine for that's years, true. I mean, the guy that shot whatever heard the dog bark, you know, like he heard a dog bark. Remember who shot Lennon or one of those guys? Heard a dog bark. Oh, the 24 caliber killer, I'm sorry. In the early 80s, 70s in New <laughs> York, the guy would hear the dog bark and tell him to shoot people. Oh, and, you know, uh, yeah, 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 son of Sam. Yeah, son of Sam. I'm yeah. sorry, 44 caliber killer. And uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, for, in the 70s and 80s, people would fall in love with you from a poster, a right. song. You know, now we're devouring our insides. What stops some guy from saying, "Fucking Felicia's my soulmate"? Right. You know, we both grew up in the mountains. You know, what fucking stops somebody? You know, like I told Joe the other day, we were having a conversation. When we were kids, we were fans. You know what a fan is? When I look at a picture of Julia Serving, I don't know Julia Serving. When you look at Farrah Fawcett, guess what, Felicia? We're not fans no more. We have friends. They're not our fans no more. They're in contact with us. Yeah. 
That's a and friend. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay I'm with that. Totally fine. I, love I, I love it. I love it. I love it. I wish I had it when I was I a kid. I do that with other people. Like sure. Like following other people. Like I follow weird people. Sure. I'm like, wow, oh my God. Is, yeah. You know, I mean, I'm totally you ever see stalking the fucking a girl pe- in Chicago right now. You are? Yeah. That, and her name is I am Enid Colesaw. She's like, writes the funniest uh, Twitter things of all time. I feel like I'm stalking her. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's weird. I get, I, I get, I love Twitter. I love reading some people's fucking tweets. Yeah. I yeah. love seeing some. So I, I follow the weirdest that. fucking yeah. things too. Do you guys follow? a lot of people I had noticed recently that I fall way too many people like uh, somebody told me something like oh did you go to this person's show and I'm like what I, I didn't know, even know about it but, but I followed that person but they've been tweeting about it nonstop for the last two weeks but somehow I missed every single one of their tweets and they're like how many people are you following I'm like uh, 1400 people and so they're like, dude, I fall 200. You need to cut that down. No, I had to cut mine down. And and then I was going to do like a new Facebook. But I'm like, you know what? The Facebook, I didn't want it to be the 5,000 people that I actually know. You know what I mean? And I just did that. I just yeah. restarted. I just deleted my Facebook and started or, over. Or people that are pretty active on my page where it's been going on for a long time. Then I, you know, but because uh, it gets too crazy. Then you can't read what other people are doing, your friends and family, you know. By the 80s, if you want to be part of a social media, you had to snort coke. <laughs> That was the social media. There was no Facebook. There was cocaine. You know, that's the only way you really talk to people. Now there's Facebook and there's fucking Twitter. We got to figure out a way how to sell coke on fucking Twitter. <laughs> that's the thing. I can't wait to read that fucking article. I'm going to go, I fucking knew it. I knew somebody was fucking doing that shit. Oh, for sure. Someone's got to be Somebody's doing it. selling sure. something on Twitter like that we don't fucking know about. Yeah, I remember yeah. I put a thing on Twitter just to check the waters. Like, hey, man, I'm going to see Pink Floyd. I'm looking for acid. That's oh, ballsy. my God. Oh my God. People were like, hold oh, dog, follow me. So I got DM you. And I started reading the direct messages. People had explosives for sale, fucking <laughs> acid from 1960 for sale. There's wow. people out there that are holding on to shit. And I finally got it in Sherman Oaks. Right in Sherman Oaks, I bought a sheet. You know, what the fuck? You did? Yeah, for the Pink Floyd concert last you year with Ari. Did? Yeah, a, sheet? a whole sheet, ten you sheets, do? fifteen dollars oh a You're thing. You're brave, Joey. No, I'm not great, but it's amazing how fucking far it's really gone. Yeah. Like somebody's gonna figure out what to really do with Twitter. Like in a month, we're gonna read about something that went huge because somebody figured out how to fuck Twitter through the timelines or how to sell a fucking how to stash a body. Oh. I like auditioning. You do? You do? I fucking love it. Why? I love I like auditioning more than getting the job. When they call me for wardrobe and I gotta go work and I gotta drive to Calabasas, that's when it's all you audition over. for Long Shine? Yes. Yes and no. Yes and no. It was it was funny because I sent a they didn't want to see me, so I sent a tape. I went to Houston, Texas, and before I left here my feelings were very hurt. They said we want to see a star name. And in Houston one night I was doing fucking coke and I was up and I was <laughs> thinking and I came to the conclusion that I followed Paul Mooney for all that time. I go, who can they go with? They're either going to go with Sarah Goosa, who's a great character, Sharippa, who's a great character, or Big Pussy, who's a great character. But as far as Adam Sam and funniness, I mm. knocked them all out of the box. It's sure. just, this is the truth. I, I'm experienced. This is yeah. not a, a right. sham. Or so do. I've done the halftime at a Buffalo Sabres game. So I got up that day and I went to a fucking play it again sports and I got a helmet that was too small that they had a pound into my head and I was 400 pounds and I got a shirt that was a 1X and I put it on to show every fucking roll and I went and bought a football and I had Chuck Savage throw the ball to me while his wife taped uh-huh. on the field. And then I took a scene from the movie and I just did it by myself. at the thing and I sent it in and they didn't want to see me. And by the time I got back to LA that Monday, they had called my... My uh, agent said, Adam wants to meet with you and Chris Rock. Uh, that's because amazing. I went, and bo- but they didn't want to see me. Oh, they so Initially, they told you. No, they wanted to go with a star name. They wanted a big name? Yeah, and I just went out of the initiative and made a fucking tape and sent yeah. it. And even at the lunch when I met them, they were like, wow, we're only going to really hire you for four weeks. They didn't decide to the first week that they were going to fucking keep me. With oh, three really? outs and all that shit. That's when they oh, decided. Oh, they, they weren't sure? They weren't sure. And then they put, because the, the training camp. I guess they only wrote me in for a couple of weeks and then I wasn't going to come back. So they said I was only going to be in New Mexico for like three weeks. Oh, yeah? So then after the first week of triads and my fat stomach, when my ball came out Adam of the shirt, said, that's Adam, it. they said, there's a contract in your thing. And I'm like, what contract? And I go, you're going to put you on an F-Series. 
Yeah, for the remember the day they the wrapped us and then they unwrapped us, but you didn't go back. I didn't go back. I went back. I told you to go back. <laughs> they used to get fucking it. guys. I said they, you know, they wrapped us, and 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 I go, Joe, I'm on my way to the spa with some place where you get all these, you know, waterfalls or whatever. It's a thousand. I, I don't know what it was called. Anyway, I said <laughs> they wrapped us. They wrapped us, and then Joe, Joe's like, ah, fuck it, I'm not going back. I said, Joe, we gotta go back politically. We gotta do the right thing. We gotta go back. Cause I'm not going back. So I'm going back. All right, fuck it. I turn the car around. I go back. I go back, and they wrap me again. But they thank me for going. I'm like, see, Joe, you should have fucking came back because, you know, Joey was just that's how Joey was. He didn't mean anything by it. But you know, he was like, I'm not fucking going back. No way. They wrapped me. I'm not gonna be on it. I got wrapped, and I got wrapped again. <laughs> oh, they wrap you. Oh, yeah, but I wanted to friend. do the right thing because there was a lot of you know. We're back, bitches. <laughs> I live yeah. next door to the girl that, that played the, the dancer sure. in Casino. And she told me that scene took 16 hours because they would shoot it and he would come back and talk to Scorsese. Yeah. And then an assistant would come and tell you stand two inches. To That's what it. my brother told me. He said, it's, nothing it's, is too boring for this guy. This that, is just amazing. You know, that, he goes, I realize why the guy, is, he's not the most naturally talented, but he could probably outwork in, in his heyday. I mean, now he's more commercial. But in his heyday... Like, you know, if he if he had to put, like, a glass down, you know, he could, like, a, wait a minute, let me do it. You know, I do it like that. Now, let, let me do another one. He could do it, like, a hundred times. The obsession. The, and if you could see it in his work, it's in his work, like, when he goes, do you hear me? Did you hear me? You hear what I said? You heard what I said? You heard? That's him. That's who you are always comes out. There's parts of you that come out in every character. You're not that character, but you use yourself in the in acting. That's the biggest thing. You always you put yourself in it. It's not that it's you, but that obsessive quality. My, because my brother has that. My brother's a, uh, you know, he like folds clothes, and I do something like with my wallet. Like when he holds, he does a funny thing. He they're very obsessed people in my family, very obsessed. And De Niro has that. Like he'll who he doesn't even know. Like you're having a conversation with him, he'll go, okay, yeah. <laughs> Open and close his wallet over. Yeah, and but over. you know, he he did he's like you're like not even there. He's like <laughs> yeah, yeah, Stop yeah, molesting yeah, yeah. that wallet. <laughs> then he turns around and goes, yeah. You know you know what I'm talking about, Nick? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Like oblivious to what he did. I've seen him wash lettuce, rewash it, and then yeah, fucking crazy things, obsessive things. We have a brother who's not that well, but he's really obsessive. But my brother is too. You know, he'll say to me, you say the same thing over and over. You are, I'm like, I say the same? We do repeat ourselves. But I'm like, you are, you know. And when he met De Niro, his wife told me, well, when he, she direct, he directed him, he goes, that guy is fucking crazier than me. You know, at the end of the movie, <laughs> he directed him in this movie after my mother died. Uh, it was a spy, it was an FBI movie. Uh, I forget the name, The Good Shepherd. So I guess John told him that he had to be done at a certain day. And, 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 and Bob said, you know, Everybody was kind of like deathly afraid of him. My brother respects him. He loves De Niro. I love him. But he's like not afraid of him. Because John's like, you know, because John said, yeah, I'm done today. This is my last day. And De Niro was like, I guess he wanted him to stay some more. So he went to see him. He said, so you're done? He goes, yeah, I'm done. So you're done. Like a, like a little kid that I you know, like couldn't get his yeah, candy. Yeah. So you're actually done. He goes, I'm done. But if you need me, Bob, I'll come back. So you're done. Yes, I'm done. I'm finished. But if you need me, if you need me, <laughs> I'll come back. He goes, okay, okay, guys. Yeah, but if I need him. But he had to tell him about me, like, I can imagine that scene. I'm probably not even doing it justice. Well, I think it's you fucking, are, because I can imagine it's it. It's fucking yeah. brilliant. So you're done. Yes, I'm done. So you're leaving. Yes, I'm going to leave. So you're done. Yeah, I'm done. So you're going to leave. Yes, I'm leaving. But if you need me, if you need me, I'll come back for you, Bob. You know what I mean? I'll be back. Okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> fuck has happened to our lives. <laughs> what the fuck? When you're 20, remember when you were 20 and they called you to go do comedy? You go do anything. You could pack, be ready in 10 minutes. No sleep, no nothing. You didn't give a fuck. Now you have to prepare for a trip. That's the age I'm to. I've been sleeping. T I'm going to Miami tomorrow and I'm in fucking anxietyville. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I'm not about the shows or whatever, just about leaving. I've been home for eight fucking weeks. Oh, uh, yeah, So yeah, just yeah. leaving and driving to LAX tomorrow The first two. week is hard. Oh, my God. I remember when I used to do this every week. This was like 
This was like nothing. This was like a machine. So what? Going to the airport and getting on a plane is like shitting when you're a comedian. It gets to that simple. You break it down. Oh, I just got to take a flight. Most people got to pack a fucking sandwich and water and oxygen. They got to take insurance out. We just rock and roll, bitch, on any airline, you know. Somebody calls you the night before. How many times did you get a call the night before? I remember when I first got here and I was broke. I used to get, there was a club in El Paso. They still there. <laughs> These motherfuckers would call me on Monday night at 8 to be there at Tuesday night. You didn't have $108 to fly in those days as a feature act. All they paid was five fifty. I remember taking the Greyhound bus, the 1140 Greyhound bus, which gets you into El Paso at 1. You don't know what life is till you get on that bus on LAX, whatever the fuck it is, downtown LA, and you got to take the all-nighter to El Paso. And like, you know, there's some buses that you get on there at 11 and you wake up and you're there. This is after you wake up, you got to sit there with bad breath and rotten ass oh, yeah, yeah, for yeah. five or six <laughs> fucking hours until destination will pass and they got to come get you. And it is horrid. It is such a great jump the day you go from riding a bus to taking a plane when you're a comedian. Like, it's such a relief. Like, at first, you're like, I love to drive. What are you talking about? I could drive. Fuck, that shit gets old. Oh, no, Fuck yeah, that shit. Yeah. I won't drive to San Jose no more. I'm, I'm like on a three-hour zone now. Uh -huh. You got my attention for three hours. After three hours, I can't, I can't fucking drive no more. Would you? I uh, I want to let my kids fly uh, by themselves, but uh, the ex isn't into that. But I'm like, fuck, when I was a kid, I yeah, used to I take flew. the bus all the time by myself. Took the bus from Colorado to L.A. in the middle of the night, dodging the molester by the bathroom, gambling in <laughs> Vegas. I was like 11 years old, you know? I mean, it was a fucking adventure. My now mother my used kids. to put me on the plane from no bueno. Newark to LAX by myself. And in those days, you had to give like the stewardess a 20, and she'd sit you on the first seat, whether it was first class or not. You'd sit right there, and they'd give you like a wing. They'd give you like a pilot's fucking hat, crayon. They gave you a ton of shit. You were excited about fucking flying. One of those trips back from El Paso was the scariest fucking bus ride I ever had back because there's two systems from LAX to El Paso. There's either the regular bus system mm -hmm. or there's the Mexican La Jara Hamba bus, <laughs> which is $35 and they got Telemundo on the whole fucking time. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you got your own little private television. You get back to LA and learn Spanish. And learn Spanish. Pretty cool. <laughs> <clears throat> so one time I'm coming back from El Paso and some guy on, uh, on, at the club the night before said to me, bro, you're pretty funny. And he gives me like an envelope, but I thought it was weed. You know, when you have weed, you're like, fuck it, perfect for the bus ride. <laughs> so I, I wrap it up, I go in my pocket, the next day I get up, I go to the bus ride, and I, I get to the El Paso bus thing, and I, and I open up the thing in the back, and it's a fucking Coke rock that is as shiny as a fucking <laughs> diamond, right? So I fucking get, I'm excited, I'm going to do Coke the whole night on the bus, this is fucking great, we'll pull over, <laughs> I'll smoke a few cigarettes, drink a beer, this is fucking jamming. I break the Coke rock up, and I do fucking like two lines, and I'm on the back, and it's kind of cold. You know, everybody has like hooded uh -huh. sweatshirts on and jackets. And I'm sitting there, you know, with like whatever, you know, the hooded sweatshirt, the jacket. And I do like two more lines. And all of a sudden, as you come out of El Paso, there's a fucking security thing where they come on the bus with dogs and oh, shit really? like that. And I'm like, oh my God. So now I got the paranoia in me, my heart's beating. <laughs> I'm like, what am I going to do now? I'm an old school motherfucker. There ain't no way I'm flushing coke. <laughs> like I've done enough of that in the 80s <laughs> it's 95 I ain't flushing it out I'm a soldier I'll hold on to that shit to the end I'll put it in my asshole if I have to I don't give a fuck that I have flushed ounces one time and it killed me the next day it was like what'd I do that for but so I, I said fuck it I'll just do the whole pile oh. and I did the whole pile the dog was just getting on I just did the whole pile I was in the back of the bus <laughs> and I'll never forget that they opened the doors you know and it was windy and it was cold and by the time they got back to me, I was down to like a, a wife beater. <laughs> I was sweating, and they're like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, nothing, you know what I'm saying? That coke kept me up the whole eight hours. Like, people were freezing on the bus the whole night. I'm sitting there with a wife beater. Steam's coming out of me on this fucking bus. And that's the last time I took the El Paso bus. We're back, bitches! Knoxville had one of the best record stores I've ever been in. Oh, really? Knoxville. Who would have fucking thought? Right down the block from the hotel. Just like that. Every album, everything, you know? So it's pretty neat when you go to those places and you think you're going to bump into fucking Hee Haw. Right. It's a great time. You know, Robert Plant lives in Nashville. 
like all the big recording guys live in Nashville. They got APAs there, CAAs there, like all the big agencies right. there. I would have never fucking known that. I would have never known that. You know, so it's pretty interesting when you travel around the country. Well, uh, when you have a bunch of hee-haws in the audience, it can be fun. No, you know? they're the yeah, best. Be Listen, fun, yeah. they're the best, bro. Yeah. It's like when you go to Texas, Houston, and all those places. Remember the old Oklahoma club? Oh, yeah. There was yeah. one Oklahoma yeah. club that was, you know, they didn't give a fuck who you were. The MC got a standing ovation. Well, they throw beer been? bottles at you. It was like Roadhouse. But they liked everybody. They just partied. That's just the way it is. I don't even think that club's there no more. No, it isn't. Is like, that the club where the condo, where everyone who went in the condo, uh, when you stayed there on the weekend, bought a piece of art? <clears throat> and the whole place was like the cheesiest art you could ever imagine <clears throat> all over the condo? I, I don't yeah. remember that one. Yeah. I remember the one in Cleveland, Hilarities, in the old days before they redid it. <clears throat> you slept in the back of the club so the, the beer guy would wake you up in the morning. There was no windows. There was nothing. Like, I slept one night, and I was like, God, you're fucking killing me. I can't do this. You know, when you're doing blow in the dark, <laughs> it don't fucking work, though. You know what I'm saying? You need some light to get paranoid. You, you need something, you know what I'm saying? Wow, I wouldn't think people would do blow in the Fuck, dark. Well, it's tough. Yeah. Not a lot of people do it. You got to get the straw and cut it up and not spill it. And you don't know whether you're snorting fucking <laughs> weed. You don't know what you're snorting. You're just having a good old time with a fucking flashlight. Yeah. You think you're back at summer camp. You know what I'm saying? In a fucking tent. In the, in the 80s, I remember that. When you, I remember the weekend John Lennon died. I went into uh What the fuck? Oh, I went into I, uh, I went into uh, uh, That was Bleaker like God's Box. theme music right there. It used to be this thing in the village called Bleaker Box. Uh -huh. And it used to have all the music you want. Like I found... Like, I went in there one day looking for the cars, and I ended up finding Ozzy Osbourne's first album with the Blizzard of Oz, which a lot of people know it's only four songs. Later on, when they got picked up, they put out eight songs. But in those days, in the early 80s, uh -huh. like 1980, if you went into, there was a head shop in New York City that it looked like a wallet. It was a wallet. You'd think it was a wallet, but when you opened it up, it was a little tube uh -huh. for your cocaine, uh -huh. a spoon, a gold straw, and on the bottom there was a rock and there was edges in the rock. So when you poured the coke, it would go right into the rock and you didn't have to make lines. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Fucking for like, you know, twenty four ninety five. I think I used it for a month and I lost a rock. You know, I lost a slate or something like that. And then wow. what do you have to walk around with a little kit with a tube and wow. it's amazing. They used to have a lot of neat things for Coke. They used to have a double barrel shotgun with a spoon made out of glass. So you can just <laughs> You could just put your little spoon in and put the two tubes to your nose. But the problem with I told you, I always sit on it and break it. I had like 80 of them. I would break them. Man, where's the tube? I don't know. I sat on it. What the fuck? So it's weird how they've changed paraphernalia now. I've only used a bullet before. A bullet? Remember the yeah. bullet? And they make plastic ones now. Remember if you left the yeah. thing, the Coke would spill out. You'd yeah. get pissed off. Oh, man. Awesome. I remember what they used to have. They used to have a gas mask for weed. Yeah. Do you remember the that? Gas like, like, so it was, uh, like a jet pilot guy. Like a jet pilot. So you... Yeah. You took the, it was a container, like a, like a Slurpee container, uh -huh. and you uh, put the joint in it, lit it, and then put it in the jar, turned it around, and then you blew it, like a, like a mustard thing, uh -huh. and, it go, whoo, whoo, and it blows smoke in your face. <laughs> if you wanted to take it to the extra level, you got the mask with the goggles and everything, and it would just go right into your fucking mouth. So people would just squeeze it. That, that, that was the part. <laughs> Do you remember when you went to a concert in the 80s, and you couldn't sneak beer in? So you had to buy those leather things. Remember those leather things you filled up with wine and put that was for that flask. Yeah, uh, yeah. Remember <laughs> that you you hit them under your jacket. You thought you were Clint Eastwood and shit. Sure, yeah. And you walked in there. You're drinking with everybody. The next day you got fucking tonsillitis because you're drinking <laughs> fucking wine with a bunch of filthy animals that haven't brushed their teeth in a year. <laughs> you know, I everybody, always everybody had a bandolin. Yeah, everybody. Those are the fucking. They had yeah. things. They made things for to enhance your party, you know, atmosphere, oh you know God, what I'm saying? I funny. remember seeing a condom for your tongue one time, mm -hmm. and I did not know what it was. The people were showing it to me on 42nd Street. It was probably a gum. What is it? It was probably a piece of gum. No, it was a... Right before you make What it bubble. was, it was a, a, a condom that you put on your tongue, and over the condom was like a, a devil. So it was like a toy devil that went on your tongue, so when you it, it gave your tongue extension... So uh -huh. you put the t the condom on your tongue, okay, and then the condom was connected to like a little devil that went on the tip of your tongue. So when he was eating your pussy, the tongue had like a devil on it, 
and the tongue, the devil had a tongue plus your fucking tongue. So you got two tongues in your fucking monkey. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> plus the devil. Who in this day and age can say they've been eaten out by the devil? Not too many fucking women. So that's, well, I've seen that What did they call that? Time. What did they call that? You know, one? man, this had to be 1983 or something. Uh-huh. Tongue twister. And, 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 tongue twister. And, and, <laughs> and the weirdest thing was that when they were showing it to me, I didn't know what it was, but I was making believe like I'd used it before. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. And the guy's like, yeah, I know. Yeah, oh, wow. Of course. Wow, yesterday. Yeah. I seen the one with Jesus' face on it. No idea. Yeah. That was yeah, the first time. I, I got the one with Gene Simmons on it. Yeah, yeah. the one with Gene Simmons. I'm so <laughs> fucking embarrassed because I didn't know what it was. And I never seen that. Have you ever seen that? So it was so it was the one with a Gene Simmons and then no, Gene no, no, Simmons. No, it was a devil. Time. It was just a oh, devil. Okay. They only had a devil. Okay. So basically what it was was a condom for your tongue that was connected. Yeah, you grab the like devil a, by the horns. Yeah, so you grab that little fucking devil and rub it in your fucking mouth. We're back, bitches! <laughs> To this day, like I go back to San Francisco and I still love it, but I'm always uneasy because of that time I spent up there. That's interesting. It was such a a fucked up time. It was so, I learned a lot. You know, I learned what the other side lived like. Yeah. I never knew. I never knew. I met Cuban refugees that had come in 79. And here I thought I had it rough. I lost my mom and I had met these guys that were like engineers in Cuba living great. And now they were on the street hustling fucking uh, food stamps. Oh, yeah. And I was hustling food stamps with them. It was a complete different... Uh, wow. It was fucking crazy. I didn't know you were a food stamp hustler. At that time, there was a Chinaville or Japan City or something up up in, uh, up there. Mm-hmm. And I would take uh, food stamps, traveler's checks, stolen credit cards. I was like the defense because they didn't know how to speak English. Uh-huh. So I would get tons of fucking uh, traveler's checks every day. And I would pay like 30 cents on a dollar. And I would take them to... Japanville and buy a sweater, and then the change was my cash. There were, uh, you know, I was. How did you meet under, those people? I was under the fit. I was called an under the scale. I was an under the fifty dollar limit. What a lot of people in this great country don't remember is the reason why we have econ- the bad economy isn't because there's no jobs. It's because the street hustle was removed. See, and Gary and mine's there. A guy could be broke, but you could front a hundred quaaludes for two hundred dollars and sell them, and make four hundred, and you got two hundred a day. You do that three times a week. That's fucking three grand a month, my friend. And you didn't do dick but go to a bar and eat the quaaludes and drink the drinks you were going to eat and drink anyway. You just provided a fucking service. And you would collect unemployment and you would do a thousand things that things weren't bad. You could always make a move. And one of the moves we used to make in the old times where they used to have credit cards. They still have credit cards. But it was under the 50 limit. In those days, there was no fucking computers. So when you spent money, they put them in a little thing and went ch and gave you the card back. Mm-hmm. If it was over fifty dollars, they made the call. Right. But it was under fifty dollars, it was just taken. So, so we would buy stuff for forty four dollars, sell it for twenty, and get at least fifty percent of your dollar. This was just a street thing that you did every fucking. But how did day. you actually meet them? Like Asian people that wanted to sell food for weed. stamps. Really? I went down really? there looking for weed and started talking and went back the next day. <laughs> and the next thing you know, they're like, hey man, you speak English, can you help us out? Ba ba da ba 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 ba. I met this guy who met this guy. And the next thing you know, I'm living at the a Virginian hotel who's where it's a, it's a thing now where people come from all over the country and stay there. Hostel. Yeah, it's yeah, a hostel yeah, yeah. now. There was coffee runs. <laughs> there was a coffee runs hostel. in the middle of the street where it was a, 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 a coffee shop where they served you topless. That's why Starbucks just sucked my dick. It was open 24 <laughs> hours. And the deal was that you could go there and drink coffee coked up in the morning and a topless fucking chick would come up to you. They weren't tens. They were fives. Yeah, when yeah. you're coked up and drinking coffee at that point, who gives a Frenchman's fuck? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you need some titties to get you going. That is hilarious. There was a fucking porn shop fucking 50 hilarious. feet away called Coffee Ron's and he bought everything. This was like a reality show. He had no teeth. He was six foot five. He, went, uh, he played for the Niners and this is what he did. You know, he was hustling people. So you could go in there with a microphone, a guitar, a boot, a sneaker. He give you two bucks to get. You could even go in there and go, uh, Ron, do me a favor, give me a fifty to get the day started. And you had to go back at the end of the day and give him seventy five dollars. Uh-huh. So you had to make fucking seventy five dollars by the end of the day. So if I knew I was meeting you, and we were doing something, tra- travelers checks at ten, I I would go to him, give me a fifty to get the fucking day started. This guy was the main street guy of everybody in that area. That's he wild. He was the the fence. And I remember leaving San Francisco with the cops looking for me. And having to go back a month later to pay him vig on jewelry that he had had that I had given him 
from uh, all the different street things. And, and I would dress up in a suit in the mornings and go to hotels and I had the bus boys wired the bellman and they would tell me who checked in, who didn't check in, how long they were gone for, if they put stuff in the safe. It was a different fucking world. Wow. I'll never forget San Francisco because of that. And whenever I do play Cobbs or one of those clubs now, at one point I take a cab and I walk those streets as a reminder. That's good. Just to fucking remind me of yeah. what I went through and what I learned. I used to go to I know what the you're talking best about. fucking place ever. Because you could go in there with 15 and eat the whole day. Original Joe's. Hey. When it was in the yeah, fucking tenderloin. The fucking waiters were all union. You know, it, it, right, they moved it because they burnt it. Jewish lightning strikes again. But boom the owner got sick. The property values went up. They burnt that motherfucker to a crisp. <laughs> yeah. Jewish lightning, look out. Jewish lightning alert. <laughs> I'm sorry. The Jews are back. The Jews oh, are back. Joey. It's the truth. They're the oh, best at Arson. Joey. They tried to burn that place oh, three times Joey. in 20 years. The Italians tried to just, do it first. Just be a little smooth. They couldn't do it, and now the fuck they had to call the Jews. They had to call the henchmen of the match. So <laughs> and a match. Yeah, when it comes to lighting the no. match, a Jew lights it like nobody else. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Yeah, Doug, we're throwing fucking heat here. It's a week before Memorial Day. What do you want to talk about? <laughs> fucking camping gear. I ain't got that type of time. I got twenty years. Now. My wife got problems. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I used to drive from Denver to Baltimore. When I was an open mic, there was a club there on the water. On the water, this is 95, way before you thought of getting into comedy. Sure. And uh, I forget the owners. I mean, it's horrible. My friend Rick Kearns got me into the club. And the guy really liked me. We talked. I mean, I, we were like kindred souls. The club closed down. But one thing I remember about Baltimore is you don't fuck around there. Like, most places where you go cop a nickel bag, there's always like a, when they know you're a newbie, there's like a fucking disturbance. In Baltimore, it was like, what do you want? Just want some weed, though. No, go see that guy in the corner. No, get put the money on the floor. I never fucked with the drug dealers really in Baltimore. Luckily, I always had like white people I used to get mine from. Oh, I had the, the best wine. coke dealer in the world in Baltimore, though, man. She was the best. She, she was the best. She was always home. That's that's how you know you have a good drug dealer. She's always home all day and night, and and she was the best. My age, always hooked it up. She actually, uh, on my birthday, gave me uh, an eight ball for free. And then she said to me, this is true. This is actually a funny story. She's like, you know, it's my birthday. She's like, everybody gets to feel special on the birthday. She's like, here, take this. If you run out, come back. So I go out with my buddies. We get fucked up at like four in the morning. I go back to her house to pick up more. And she gives me another eight ball for free. And I'm sitting on the couch, totally drunk, high off my ass. And then some girl's looking out the window and goes, what car is that? And the next thing you know, like 18 cops break in through the window and it's they're like it's a raid and like we're gonna search everybody and I'm just sitting there on the couch with coke in my pocket and the first person comes up the, the main guy he's like alright everybody we're gonna search everybody first person we're gonna search is that guy right there and he points at me <laughs> and he pulls me outside and, and I got this coke in my pocket and he's like I, I'm trying to talk to him but I sound like an 18th century gold prospector because I'm just so fucked up I'm like well I don't know and just, just going off he's like you have anything on you I'm like no and I grab a hold of the coke in my pocket and I'm thinking what I'm going to do is just kind of like pull it out as I go listen man I don't have anything in there and then just like let go of it and hope the wind will just take it away to some magical place where they won't find it but of course I let go and it just drops like a bag of tomatoes it just hits the ground makes the loudest noise and then I start uh, crying so I'm like nah man please you can't arrest me and he's like ah blah blah and I'm like listen it's my birthday man and he stops he's like it's really your birthday and I'm like yeah man it's my birthday and uh, he's like, all right, let me talk to these other cops over here and we'll see what we do. And he goes over to talk to the other cops and then he comes back and he's like, you're not lying to me. It's really your birthday, right? And I'm like, yeah, it's my birthday. And he's like, all right, we got something for you. And he goes, two, three. And then six cops start singing happy birthday to me as I'm in handcuffs crying on the side of the street. <laughs> oh, no. And that's, that was 26. That's what <laughs> That was 26. Those are good fucking cops. Yeah, but they but let they me go. Left. And oh, they I let me go. go. That was the oh, other thing, too. I forgot go? to add oh, okay. that. Well, I, you know, I think, I don't know if they were real cops or they were just dirty cops because they went upstairs, they took all our coke, and then they left, and they just let us all go. I just expected to get up and have a protein shake and have an hour or two to unwind. Sure. Now I gotta fucking get dressed and take a shower and take it to work. I gotta feed the fucking cats and clean the litter box. I gotta do this in the fucking 45 minutes. When you're not awake and you smell a litter box, uh, yeah. that will throw you the fuck off for a loop, okay? <laughs> you need to be awake before you smell some cat's ass. You need to get some fresh so, step, dude. Get some fucking yeah, fresh no, step. No, the, the litter box is great. It's just, when you do it, it's like when you go to Starbucks now. Sure. You go to Starbucks lately, I just want a cup of coffee. And they ask you, 
Do you want milk in it? Do you want something to eat? Do you have a Starbucks card? I just want fucking <laughs> coffee. Ask me this shit in 15 minutes. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You need you're the like, coffee what? before you ask the question. Yeah, you're like, what? You don't even want to fucking talk. They're like, oh, ask me. You're like, what? That's what it was like this morning. So, we're. <laughs> you need to get a goddamn coffee now machine. Now I'm fucking awake. House, now I'm fucking awake. That, that was great. You need to get a coffee machine in your house. And no, I got brewing. the coffee machine at the house. Good, all right. Fine. But you don't understand. You got to hit it first, sit down. I take two bong hits. I go on fucking YouTube. <laughs> I go on Facebook. This morning, I had to change the little boxes. I was drinking the fucking coffee. Oh, yeah, that's bad. That's, that's bad. bad. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. Usually you wake up, you have an hour to fan your balls, scratch your head, <laughs> yeah. look out the window at that fucking bird that landed on the tree and ask yourself what continent did he come with? You know what I'm saying? Because you got that type of fucking time. <laughs> what continent did that yellow belly sack come with? Let me Google him. It's got nothing to do with your world, but you got that type of time. You know what yeah. I'm saying? I got time. Wow, I, that was an insight to your soul, Joey, right yeah. there. That's true. When you wake up in the morning, it's great to look at something and go, why did God give me two balls instead of one? That's Those true. are the questions you answer at 6 in the morning when you, you got time. You got two hours to Google, why yeah. did God give me two nuts? But if I get up and I ain't got that time and now you're throwing this shit at me, I got to digest all this shit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm going through something right now where I have a mutual friend with some friends of ours. And she's got a kid, you know, she got two kids and a husband, and one day she woke up and she decided she didn't want to be with the husband no more, and, and, and you know, she wants the kids, but there's more to the story. She's been in like three rehabs in the last year, and she was driving drunk in the daytime and picking the fucking kids up, and the husband called a friend of mine, and so, you know, uh, I'm the type of person, if you were ever there for me in any situation, I'd like to be there for you at any fucking yeah. level that I can, and I'll tell you yes or no, you know, so... It starts with a phone call. I keep in touch with her once a week, check in with her, always drunk. You know, mm. when I call in the afternoon, I can hear it on the voice, you know. And her best friend called me the other day and she goes, you know what, man, I had to stop talking to her. Because, uh, and, but I feel really guilty. What do you think? You know, that's a situation that arises a lot. I mean, they're like you and Jewel. They've been yeah. together since fucking grammar school. Right. How can you turn your back yeah. on somebody? But she goes, we're not getting anywhere. Yeah. You're not getting anywhere. That's the one I said she yeah. picked her up at the airport drunk when the medic was outside with her and she goes, I'm allergic to peanuts. She goes, you're allergic to fucking vodka. Look at you. Uh, she was swollen yeah. and shit. And after a while, like, I mean, and, uh, and you feel guilty because you want to be there for your friend. But you know, when you were at that point and somebody would come up to you, it wasn't going to do nothing for you either. Yeah. Their friendship wasn't even friendship. It was about paper. The only reason you were nice to them is because every once in a while you can go, hey, Duncan. Let me 50 bucks till Thursday or something right. like that. You, you're going through your own dilemmas. So I understood. You know, that that's a part that a lot of people have a lot of... Listen, there's people that you meet on the fucking set. that if you tell them to go fuck themselves, it doesn't change your life a bit. You just met them. Yeah. But you know the different levels in your friendship with people. And even if you meet somebody for the first time and you hit it off, you know the different levels you got. And you know what people you have an argument with or misunderstanding? That's just a misunderstanding. That's all it is. Yeah. That's all it fucking is. You still love that person. There's some people that you do have to cut loose. Sure. From time. That's not a friendly distance. I think Marcus Aurelius called it fucking stabbing you. He was a fucking Roman emperor. He was a Roman so emperor. He crucified so, yeah. people from time to yeah, time. Yeah, he was fucking. <laughs> he would cut your fucking nuts off. All right, off. let's yeah. all get the perspective Yeah, this is, this is crazy, you know. Those guys laid the law on you. They mentioned it to you one time. Yeah. They mentioned it to you. And yeah. then after that, they took action. Yeah. Gotta go on there. Your uncle was the dude who created the Twilight Zone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you right now. It's funny because there's a Twilight Zone episode. Next time you're at home and you see a, when they do a bunch of them, click on and see. Just look for Sebastian Cabot. He played the butler on Family Affair. He's a fat little French dude. Chubby little dude losing his hair. Uh -huh. There's an episode of Twilight Zone where a bank robber is running and he goes to jump a fence and the police go stop and they shoot him and he wakes up and it's... Sebastian Cabin, he goes, come with me, I'm gonna help you, and he takes him to this fucking palace, and there's bitches, and he gets his own bedroom, and they gamble at night, but the cops are looking for him, so he can't leave the house, so he has all these parties, and then fucking people come over and shuffle, and every night he wins, and after 30 days, he goes to Sebastian Cabin, he goes, what type of fucking place is this? I got, I got booze, I got broads, I can't lose, what the fuck, did I die and go to heaven? He goes, no, you're in hell. You're in hell. And he just fucking snaps his fingers and that's the end of the fucking guy. Jesus. It's a great episode. No, those motherfuckers will take you deep late night if you yeah. let them.
I mean, I sat across from the table today from this guy that's heavy fucking duty. Holy got shit. thrown out of the army. I mean, he's heavy. And uh, the funny thing was, I'm sitting across from this guy. He can't go back. And the waiter went to bring him the food. Like, I told my wife, I go, you know what? I'm going to go meet him for breakfast. I go, how crazy could he be? He right. Had, he has his kid with him. Oh, how old is his kid? Seventh grade. I go, how crazy can he be, Felicia? You know when people put a dish in front of you? Uh-huh. He went nuts. He went nuts. He goes, your fingers were close to my face, motherfucker. My heart, st- I just kept eating my oatmeal because I know what time it is, this guy. Right. Those dish, and then he won't punch you. That dish will be flying in your skull. He's one of those crazy motherfuckers. When I picked him up, he had, he had crutches. His leg was wide open on a cow. He's a cowboy now in Texas. He's like one of those. He was, I'll tell you what he was. He was uh, jackass. Before the jackasses, Johnny Knoxville. Yeah, twenty years ago, that would hit you with bottles. He, he was the guy. real stitches, blood, the whole thing. Really, you know? but it's just when I went to see him, I knew there was a problem because I went, I picked him up at the Scientology Center, <laughs> 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 and he's telling me how he wished he had twelve hundred dollars to take the pure when they bathe you for twenty one days and they detox you, and he's telling me about all the movie stars that go in there and they pull the toxins and the weed out and. When you drink water out of a plastic container that goes into your fat cells and it develops Shut cancer. Up. This is what I sat through for fucking breakfast yeah. this morning with this guy that was pretty much a killer. I mean, pretty much a fucking killer. But, you know, guys, when he, when I dropped him off, his son got out of the car. I got out, I hugged him, and as he fucking hugged me, he goes, I'm really proud of you. And he goes, remember that time when I went to your fucking uh, sentencing? And I looked at him, and, and that put everything into perspective. Because this is a guy that on his own dime came out to see me get sentenced. And not really? just came out with a suit. Came out with a suit, an ounce of blow, and two hookers. He's like, if you're going to go to prison, we're going to have a bon voyage party for you. You know, when he showed up in court, everybody was like, what the fuck? He's bigger than life. Yeah. Steroids, big stomach, two bitches, gold chain the size of your dog. But guys, he flew 2,000 miles. That's a fucking TV show right no, there. No, he yeah. flew... We take, we, Joey Diaz sends people to prison, right? So he flies out and you throw the best going to prison party. You can, and Joey, you, to all the point where you're in a limo and you drive them up to the fucking prison gates. <laughs> See you, sucker. I'll be back, motherfucker. We're going to visit you. And he's like, I had the best night of my life. That's a good fucking reaction. That's a great That's fucking a great show. Reality. But you guys got to, you can't have people like, like going to prison for like, like I guess it's got to be fun. But it's got to be fun. Like yeah, somebody, it's got like, <laughs> to be like, you know, somebody. It's got to be fun. Somebody crimes. who burned the he house killed, down. Yeah, he, burned, he burned his grandmother's house down. Like it's got to be fun. Like God, that would be a fucking great show. True TV would do it in a heartbeat. It's uh, it's just amazing to see people from your past and how they react to you. Yeah. Like he when he said that to me, everything at the restaurant went away, everything about his life went away because that's all I know him as. When I looked up at that court at my darkest fucking minute, yeah. and I thought I was going home, and all of a sudden it was like, boom, the doors open. It was like my cousin Vinny. And he walked in, you know, and he's like, what, what, what's going on? And he was serious. Like, he was coked up from the night before. They just flew in from Vegas. They were up all night. Oh. And he made it to my sentencing hearing. And when the judge hit the thing and said, guilty, as they were pulling me away, he, you should have heard him. He's like, I'm going to kill this fucking judge. I mean, he's just till the death. God. They had to throw him out of the courtroom. Then he waited for four days in Colorado to see if I could come out of jail, and I didn't, and he went home. So how can I judge a friend? I cannot That's, judge him. Yeah. Whatever. Well, if he does get into this program at Scientology, you should bring some hookers, bring some coke, <laughs> like right and walk him up to it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell yeah. Tom Cruise I said hi, he motherfucker. Doesn't, uh, he doesn't do that shit no more. You know? He does a party? No. He even asked me, he goes, you didn't bring marijuana with you, did you? And I go, no, nah, I never carry it with me anyway in the car, but... It's just funny to see people from that era and how they react to me now and how cool. But I had forgot. I, I never forgot that he came to the sentencing. It, just the way he put it was yeah. really sweet. It was really sweet, Felicia. You know, it's like somebody just, he just broke it down. And he wasn't saying it in a braggioso way. He was saying it as, hey, remember that fucking day? Look yeah. where you're at now and look where you're at then. It was a dark fucking day. We thought it was dark. He goes, I thought you were dead after that. He goes, I thought you were going to come out and just kill people. Like, yeah, but she was just there for 30 fucking days. I couldn't do 30 fucking if she, days. If she would have, let's say, got drunk and vehicular manslaughtered somebody, yeah. she's going to jail whether she has anxiety or not. 
They'll put her ass in oh, yeah. jail. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And there's no attorney to get you out because you're a celebrity. They got to throw the book at you, you know? But it's really weird because what you perceive prison as, like Oz or all the people that you see in TV shows, CSI. Just ass raping. It's, no, it's That's really weird because they categorize you where you go. So you're a white collar type guy. What, what are you going to do? Uh, rob an accountant? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You're a nice guy. You're going to rob him with a fucking notebook or something. You're going to have a nervous breakdown. They take all that into consideration. They're not going to send you to a fucking gladiator school where there's people <laughs> there. You know, that's oh, they what don't, it is. So they that's what it is. Yeah, they don't. It's yeah. people coming up to you, putting their finger in their food, in your food. That That's craziness. They know. They know. When they do the fucking mental shit on you, uh -huh. they know whether or not you got a chance or it's bye-bye time. For you. So they don't just send you know, I was cherries locked. into the fucking... Hey, listen, I was put in the system with uh, crazy people. I'm not going to tell you. There were some crazy people, and I heard their stories, and I laughed. Yeah. But uh, I wasn't in there with molesters and nothing. Those people weed themselves out, and they put them in protective custody and all that shit because the word gets out that they're child molesters or rapists. So those people always get away. They put them in their own fucking cells with other rapists so they could, you know, exchange notes or whatever the fuck it is that they do. Yeah. You know, they put me in, you know, whatever the fuck, you know, this is the best way to do it. You know, hit them in the head, whatever. But <laughs> fucking, uh, they put you, like I was in there with a couple people that did vehicular manslaughter, which really broke my heart because these people were going through the transformation of their lives. They're just regular guys. That they were just, just drinking and driving. Regular guys. Yeah. That went out and you hear the stories and you're like, I see it. It's not a story that they got blasted or killed somebody. It's the story where they got pulled over a block from their house after they had two beers at a fucking barbecue or something. Fuck. The second That's time. why I don't drink and it's drive. It's fucking at crazy. All. At they all. will throw your ass in fucking jail. And you know what? It's 30 years later. Now they will, you know, now they'll fucking kill you for a DUI. Yeah. You got to go to alcohol school and learn the history of alcohol and watch Boardwalk Empire. And you got to do a fucking thousand things. <laughs> you, yeah, yeah. The history of prohibition. I mean, it's a fucking nightmare. Like, they make you absorb <laughs> all this make shit. wine. Yeah, like, you know. Greek stepping on wine and shit. It's fucking crazy. You got to do, you know, if you got, it's funny how they say click or tick. What's that expression? Click it or tick. Click it or tick. Yeah. What's the tick? What, what, how much is the ticket they have? Uh, 225. 225. When you get to court, that 225 is 800. That's yeah. the opening price. That's like the, the wiggle price. And when the, the cop gives uh -huh. you the ticket, yeah. you're like, it ain't dick. It's 225. You know, I'll do this and handle it. Then you get to court and they start hitting you with the victim's fees, victim compensations fund. The fucking the Occupy LA fund. Yeah. By the time you get out of there, you're paying for fucking people you didn't even touch. Yeah. You know, you're paying for the assault victims unit. I mean, when you get out of there, it's a trip going to fucking LA court. I, I my dad my dad had a buddy who his son was celebrating uh having his bachelor party. So they started the bachelor party at the Bucks game and they had a box and they all started drinking. And he was the soberest of the of the bunch, and he drove. He was driving them home. They were gonna go to get in a limo and then go out to the strip clubs that night. And he was driving home and cut across like Hines and Hillsboro or whatever, and and uh, and killed uh, two of the dudes in his car and and the two people in the other car. And he's in prison for a long time. <coughs> he was going to get married the next weekend. Aww, I mean, his life was yeah. set. The idea of spending the, his life in a box was. If you had said to him, do you think that'll happen today? He'd be like, get out of here. That'll never happen. I'm having my bachelor party. And then that turned, and he's still in prison. And I think of that, like, just laying in bed. I'll go, I'm laying in bed just hanging out in a hotel room. And he's in prison still. Like, that is, and it's so avoidable. I, I, you, I, you know, I mean, you know this is that I, I'm obsessed with not drinking and driving. Like, I will take a cab to the Ice House if we do the Ice House Chronicles and try to, I got a hitch to ride with you one time. And I was like, I just, I can't. If I'm going to drink, I just got to know that if a car is around, my car is around, I very well might go, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. But if I, my car is not there, I can't do it, so I won't do it. I'm obsessed with that shit because that will change your life. Especially like little white boys. Like, um, I'm, I'm going to say his name to you guys, but not on mic. So they, because he's a comic and we all know him and he drinks and drives all the fucking time. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's okay. <laughs> he's clean, though, now. Oh, he's not drinking? He cleaned up, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he used to drink oh. to the point where he would be like, <laughs> like, and I'm like, how the fuck can you function? 
How how can you roll the dice? You have a beautiful life going on. Like how do you roll the dice with the opportunity that you may end up going to prison or killing people and having to sleep with that? Like that yeah. fucking blows my mind. <coughs> I also got locked up with a very weird crime of people, and this crime always alerted me. It was the crime of a simple party and throwing a simple punch. Holy shit. That is the worst story ever. Like there was a guy in there that was a family reunion, Spanish kid, and he fucking punched his uncle and the uncle died. That's involuntary manslaughter. That's fucking crazy. I was in there with a biker that got into it in a bar with two guys and one of them died. Both of them went to jail for six years. Involuntary manslaughter is not that bad. It's like six, eight years. You've got a good attorney. Yeah. You argue it, you know. But that's fucked up. That's fucked up. You could be arguing with somebody, throw a fucking punch, and they die. But now, are these, like, here's my question. As a woman, are these guy problems? Like, are these, <laughs> are these things that we think, because I think about going to prison a lot. I always think, I just randomly go, oh, I couldn't do what that. Would it like, like? What would it be like? Yeah, what would it I, be like? I always think about being homeless. What would it be like? Yes. What would it be like sleeping on a fucking corner with rats climbing on you, having no air conditioning, you know, having a half a Subway sandwich for 24 hours? What would it be like? Yeah. You know, you always have to pee. Well, I think uh, it's it's like concerns that uh, like men have versus women. Like for me, I don't ever worry, oh, I'm going to end up in prison or I'm a little concerned about the drunk driving thing because my biggest concern about that is what about if you get in an accident and you just happen to have two drinks? And it had nothing to do with you, but you oh, test over the limit. You're it's fucked. Your, it's your you're fault. Fucked. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's your automatically fault. your fault. Prison's but, not that bad for you. You just got to learn how to braid hair. <laughs> <laughs> like, like give, a, give a prison enema. That's it. You know, I I, the, I'm, I'm more afraid of ending up as the old woman at the at the side of the town with cats. You know. By the way, I was telling someone the other day, like this is how you know, as a woman, you get older. Like when I used to see the old woman with a million cats on the edge of town, you'd be like, oh, that's weird. Now I see that woman, I'm like, wow, she really planned for her retirement. You know what I mean? <laughs> Fuck yeah. It's crazy because Felicia and I have had this conversation. And what I'm going to tell you, you're going to say, Joey, you're weird. A guy like me was built for prison because I'm an only child. And I have a party in my fucking head at all times. I don't give a fuck if I'm alone. You're doing me a favor when you don't hang with me. You're doing a guy like me a favor. Because I'll do push-ups, sit-ups. I know how to maintain my time. Now, I'll whack off around it. The thing <laughs> I didn't like. I couldn't do that. I definitely couldn't do that. You know, you have an eight-hour day. You get up at six. I couldn't sure. do that. I, got, I, got a, I got a... Night? I, I got still a, hide in my bed with my cover. Oh, and he, and like, what cover? Much. You got a sheet <laughs> on a metal thing with a little inch mattress, and you're in a cell by yourself oh. with a little toilet. And all night long, you're trying to sleep with black guys. If you think they yell in a the movie theater, go to jail one fucking night. Let's say there's three fucking floors. Felicia, don't look at me like that, cocksucker. Let's say there's three floors. Oh, that's why I never made a joke about that. That's why when people say that, that's really hacky. Because you motherfuckers never been to prison. If you get pissed at the movie theater, you better never go to prison, Joe. Because they communicate all night long loud. That is my favorite quote I think I've ever Oh my God, loud. Felicia, don't look at me like that. I hate when you look at me with that racist stare. It's not racist. Oh, I'm prison. telling the truth. You have no idea. Oh. Like, if they bother you at the movie theater, uh -huh. don't oh ever get locked up. <laughs> because you will not sleep. It's like, yo, Leroy, what up? Oh. Nothing, Holmes. Just trying to do some time in this motherfucker. <laughs> yo, what up, JJ? And this is all night uh -huh. long. Yo, 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 what up with that bitch? Yo, and they're just talking, but they're yelling like you're... Yeah. So you're in the middle. You're the fucking string. You're the fucking string in between yeah. these two cans. So you're waking up all night listening to, yo, so when you on the street, what's the first thing you're going to do? I'm going to mug somebody. I'm going to get a 40. They're having conversations from one side of the room to the fucking other. And here you are in this cell going, when does it end? That's, that's when you're locked up by yourself oh. and you're only out one hour a day. Why don't you find that as funny? As I, I do, do find it funny, but I want to know. I know. She's a Christian. No, I uh, I have to be the voice of Sandy. No, she's the voice oh, of Sandy. I'm the voice of Sandy. No, it's hilarious. All but, that shit. But where was you. your favorite place to to whack off when you were in prison? That's First of all, you it's a listen when you're home. And you, you whack off completely <laughs> different. It's like you when you're home. You get the yeah. dildo, you get your pants off, you fucking flag that monkey off, you take the <laughs> dust off it, you smell your fingers, you drink some water. It's a set. You light a candle. You know, women, when you jerk off in jail, first of all, you got to make believe you're asleep. Yeah. Like I if you're in it. your bunk, because the cell guys walk uh -huh. past and the mates, and then you got to whack off cappuccino style. You got to put your hands over your cock 
and just go like this very lightly. Cappuccino's style. Like cappuccino. <laughs> some people like the flamer. You know, you know like some the, people like, like your cappuccino, cappuccino style cappuccino. like this. <laughs> so this is good. <laughs> This is oh insurance right here because if you come, oh. you come in your palm and you just wipe it on a towel. But with me, I got the turtleneck. So if I come, I just hold the end and all the cum stays in the helmet for a little while and I just relax. When I'm ready to piss, then I get up and pee and come all at the same time. Oh Why well, burn calories, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's true. But Bert, not to be a fucking uh, jack off, the thing that killed me, you hit, and you hit the nail on the head when you said this. You don't know what life is till you lose your freedom. Yeah. You don't know what life is, and I'll never forget this. And I tell Felicia all the time, you don't know what life is till somebody kicks your bunk and tells you to get up and turns the lights on. And you can't just say no. Anything. Hey, listen, I get up at five thirty by myself. Okay, yeah, I don't need nobody, but they'll come in, kick your bed. You're a fucking grown man. You kick my fucking bed, we're going to have a fucking problem. Yeah. Okay? About eight years ago, I almost killed Terry one day because she came into the room yelling, don't yell at me. When I'm in bed horizontal, don't even go there. Yeah. Wake up gentle with birds and flowers, but to kick your bed and to say, get up. You know, there's nothing worse than somebody else controlling your life. You're a fucking slave for them. You know, I got 20 That's minutes insane. at the store. I got to eat when they tell you. You got to shit when they tell you. You got to be at a certain place eight times a day for count. You know, if you're not there, you get your meals taken away, whatever the fuck they do. Yeah. I didn't see nobody get bucked in the ass or nothing like that. Yeah. What I did see is that pain. I felt that pain of your manhood getting taken away. That's what gets taken away, bro. Yeah. I get up when I fucking want to. Yeah. All right? If I want to take a nap after this and scratch my nuts, I, I can take a nap. Not in there. In there, you can't. Oh, you, you can't just take naps? You can't just go to your cell and take naps? <laughs> no. You, <laughs> you, you, you can never go to prison, I mean, listen, right? there's, people, <laughs> there's people that killed... Ten people, they're in their cell for the rest of their fucking life. They leave that cell once a week for yard. Yeah. Oh, really? And three showers a week. Yeah, they don't mm. put you in general population. They don't put you in general population. That's, that's a little fucking tough. When they feed you through a fucking door, think about that. I just come over here, open that door, and throw the food on the floor, and it's whatever the fuck it is. You know, like, I don't like gravy on my mashed potatoes. They don't give a fuck. Yeah. They don't give a fuck about your problems. Have some dietary requirements. Excuse me. <laughs> you have any carrot juice? Listen, how about helmet juice and water? That's what you're fucking drinking in Kool-Aid. So you learn about yourself, what you could live without. Like yeah. for me, it was perfect because it taught me what you could live without. Like you could live. Like how many yeah. times have you said, oh my God, I'm going to do this. This is going to happen. All of a sudden you get there and nothing fucking happens. Yeah. You know, I thought all these things were going to happen when I went to prison. Nothing fucking. It's like when you go to church. You ever go to church and you're like, when I leave here, the Holy Spirit, that motherfucker never comes. Yeah. You want him to fucking show up. That cocksucker never comes. You know, but you go to church, it makes you feel better, whatever. Yeah. It's the same thing in there. That's what I didn't like. Them <sighs> taking your manhood. That's the thing that would fuck with me is the, is we were just in Scotland and they were talking about this. We went to this cemetery at night and they, and they were saying that, on the other side of this wall, it's supposed to be haunted because they said on the other side of this wall, this guy, they took like 150 Scottish soldiers and they marched them naked like 100 miles and then uh, laid them in Edinburgh, which is cold as shit. They laid them in the mud face down for, and I'm fucking up the time period, but for like 60 days. They couldn't move. All they were given was bread and water. And for 60 days, they laid face down in the mud. Half of them died. The other half got sent to another prison and killed and like 16 got out and they were sending them on a ship out and the ship sunk but I just like do you know that like um, you know that feeling like when someone goes oh and then I uh, and then they burned off his eyelids and you go Ugh! like that yeah. that just like Ugh! that that chill that runs through you or your asshole tightens up and you're like ah when they said they laid face down in the mud for 60 days I was like I couldn't do that I, like I, I can't that isn't it I couldn't I would have to get up and be like guys I'm done like, I, I, that concept of having your freedom taken away is so foreign to especially, like, American kids. Because yeah. that's all we have is fucking freedom. All I have is freedom. And, like, that's, I have so much of it, I waste it. Yeah, sometimes you got, you know, Twitter, Facebook won't let me put the ball picture up, which is a fucking shame. I'm convinced that Zuckerberg is a fucking communist. They really are. I think they are communists. It's not, I told you, it's socialist fucking network. They're commie <laughs> motherfuckers, bro. They're just trying to put you all fucking together, grouped up. <laughs> Pretty soon we're going to have numbers on our fucking foreheads. Watch, man. I don't like that fucking Facebook no more. But Twitter's all right. You can light yourself. Listen, you can put a picture <laughs> of lighting somebody on fire. The other day I clicked on somebody's link 
and it was her showing her fucking pussy on all fours. Taylor Vixen. I couldn't fucking believe it. Oh, yeah? A pussy shot. And I'm not talking about like a pussy shot from far away. Right. I'm talking about on all fours with the camera focused on that asshole. Wow, because a pussy is uh, pretty hard to light correctly. You know, it's not the most attractive thing. I mean, generally to me, a pussy just looks like, you know. That's what's funny about Don the Knotts other day. Don face. When know? I went to the doctor, when he stuck a finger up my ass, two nights later, I was walking in the bathroom naked. And my wife goes, you know you have a pimple on your ass. Let me get that for you. And I go, leave it there. <laughs> oh, no, and stop I, it. <laughs> and as I went in the shower, I was taking a shower. I think I was meeting you that night to go down uh -huh. to George Perez's. And I was thinking about how the doctor f stuck a finger in my ass and saw that pimple in my <laughs> ass cheek. And for the first time, I felt like a stripper with that pimple on her ass and nobody wants to tell her. You know, that was the most disturbing thing to me about strip clubs was going into a strip club and seeing like a chick with a tight, tight white head. Because there's a big difference on white heads. There's white heads that just look oh like blah. God, but there's white heads that are just tight. You know there's a fountain of pus in there. Like they have that little black head in the middle and the pus is surrounded on their ass cheek and they're giving you a private dance and you want to give her an extra 10 just to pop it. You guys, do me a favor. Stop dancing. I just want you to pop that fucking... Let me just pop that zit for you one time. You know what I'm saying? So I, you, you know how embarrassing that is? Pop it. After somebody That's finger awesome. bangs you and you have a fucking pimple on your ass, you know how bad that is? Seriously, I was. Then I let her pop the pimple because I don't want to walk around with her. So your wife did pop the pimple? Sure, she yeah. felt bad for me. She's like, you can't leave the house with that pimple <laughs> on your fucking. It was right on my ass cheek. Wow. She goes, it was huge. And I felt something. Sometimes you, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you sit on a pimple and you don't know what the fuck it is. Right. For like three days, you're like, what's that pain? You know? Then you're fucking soaping up down there and there's like a lump on your leg. You're like, what the fuck is this shit? <laughs> you know, and you pop it, you know, the rest is history. No more. <laughs> oh, my God. What's the problem here? I'm talking to you. I'm, I'm talk I think I'm about to faint. <laughs> I'm talking to you from the heart here. What, you never had a pimple on your ass? As a kid, you know, my mother didn't want me to do nothing. When you're Spanish and you have a child, he's like a Latin prince. You know, God forbid he has to wash his own underwear or his bathroom or and when I went up there, I seen, you know, I had my own bedroom, Felicia, with an air conditioner, my own color TV. And I went up to 148th Street, and here's kids with, you know, eight kids in the family. And I'm talking about the Sedenos. I was thinking about this family, the Sedenos. Mm -hmm. I hung out with Ricky, and he had a brother. He had nine brothers and sisters. They lived in a two-bedroom, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother, whenever my, my mother would get mad at me, she'd go, you don't know how fucking lucky you are. And I'd go, fuck you. In the back of my mind, you know, we all think you know better. Right. And yeah. I'd go up there to spend three, four weeks with those kids. You know, I would just wake up in the morning, go to my mother's drawer and take $2 out. Those kids had to fucking wake up, go to storefronts and ask them, can I sweep in front of your storefront or pull the garbage cans in or wash your windows? That's what these kids did in the morning. You know, so seeing that really taught me the other side of the fucking coin. Wow, this is amazing. <laughs> you know, it's funny that... Uh, you talk about music and people sometimes go, ew, what the fuck is that? You know, I, I'm one of those guys. But even if I don't like a band's music, sometimes I'll go and watch them. Just to see. Mm -hmm. Just to see. Maybe I'm missing something, you know. And I've learned that every time I've gone to a concert, I've picked something up from a band that I didn't, uh, you know, I'm not big on cover bands. I never have been. Mm -hmm. Just because I didn't grow up in that society. I grew up in a disco. When I went out to Colorado and I'd go to fucking a bar to get a gram of blow and I'd see people dancing to rock you all night long at the bar to some fucking guy on stage with no shirt on, I'd want to fucking shoot myself. I, I just, I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> it I is hope a crime no, that happens quite a lot in I Colorado. I hope nobody gets bands. offended. Yeah. But it's just I came from a different sort of training. I went uh -huh. to see real bands in the city at that age and I went to... Uh, uh, discos. Uh -huh. So to, for me to go see a band, like, who, who are these guys? You know, like I remember going to see Twisted Sister and fucking hating them in Jersey, hating them in the beginning. This is Twisted fucking Sister, man, at the Hole in the Wall. I went to see Bon Jovi at the Hole in the Wall. We used to call it a hole in my pants because it was such <laughs> a dive, but it was a hole in the wall. It was in, uh, like an hour from where I grew up, middle New Jersey. Uh -huh. You know, I went to see Aerosmith in those small bars, but I really wasn't used to just a band at a bar. Right. So I've never been big on just, I, I fucking want to talk to you. When I take you to a bar, it's to get in your fucking pants. I don't want music talking and ruining my fucking rapture here. I only got one <laughs> shot at this pussy, you know what I'm saying? So uh, I, I was never, but I always like going like, I'm really upset that next Friday, I'm this Friday, I'm out of town, Chaka Khan's at the Hollywood Bowl. Fucking Chaka Khan. Yeah. Fuck it. And I don't want to hear Chaka Khan. Chaka Khan, Chaka Khan. I don't want to hear that. I'll stab that bitch. 
I want to hear the shit she used to do with Rufus. The badass black dude she was with in the beginning. The one that did all those uh, ain't nobody, all those little yeah. guitar things. Uh-huh. That dude's a savage. Tell me something good and all that. Watch those videos. Look at that bad black motherfucker with an orange shirt on with a fucking big old tie and a big old hat. You're like, what the fuck? You know, and, and you learn from those people. As a comedian, you have to be entertained sometimes. Mm-hmm. Whether it's a movie but ever since I became a comedian, I started looking at more live performances. Because even if it's music, you're going to take something from it. You're going to take something small from it. Like, I watch videos on YouTube. There's a video by the B-52s that's to me. It's the most amazing video on YouTube. It's Dance This Mess Around. The little chubby blonde girl sings it. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. It's amazing. She leaves her fucking pussy on that stage. She's singing about somebody. You Uh know what I'm saying? Yeah. But if you see it, you feel it. Right. You know, a lot of people sing the same song and they're like singing. It's like us doing a joke for a year. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when somebody sings, they get down. This bitch, you know, and I I learned. Right there, I'm like, that's what I got to do with my stand-up. I want to give people that illusion that I'm leaving my fucking soul Yeah. So I watched a music fucking video that helped my stand-up. Because at the end of the week, we're all fucking artists. And we have something to show. You know, when I look at Mike Maxwell, I look at Mike Maxwell, uh, his fucking Charles Bronson every day. And I mm-hmm. get, like, amused. Like, I just go, like, what the fuck? No, absolutely. Seeing people your lunch live. Boxes, yeah, that's seeing... real fucking art. Yeah. Like, these lunchboxes, sometimes you look at them and you're like, look at evil motherfucking Knievel. Yeah. You know, I mean, so you learn, even in a year from now, you're going to come to me and go, Joey, I want to do something for a web page. And I'm going to say, where'd you see that? On one of my lunchboxes. Because you don't know. Right, you don't yeah, know where you're yeah. going to fucking get an idea. Be- you need a lunchbox. You need the Joey Diaz lunchbox. Oh my <laughs> God. With a thermos that says, suck my dick on it. <laughs> <laughs> the low Joey That's Diaz the, lunchbox. The Joey Diaz lunchbox. That guy was difficult to be around, and his family was very nice, but he had one brother that was a little, and I mean seriously, he's a little fucking weird. Mm-hmm. And that's the brother one day, I was like in a bad mood, and he started breaking my balls, and I said, listen, do me a favor, go fuck yourself. Then he came over, and he, was, he told my brother, go fuck himself, dog. Somebody's gotta tell him to go fuck himself. You know, he's just a silly guy, like, what happened to your Jets? I don't even like the fucking Jets. <laughs> You know those people yeah, that are yeah, like, yeah. what happened to your Jets? What are you talking about? I'm an adult. <laughs> I'm a fucking adult. You know what I'm saying? My fucking Jets. Like, I never understood that. Right. So one day, actually, I was in a bad fucking mood. I was out of blow or stop something. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> no, and I told him. I said, listen, bitch. I'm not a Jet fan, so get the fuck out of here with that Jet thing. And then they, uh, I had this deal. I was supposed to go to Arizona. And they, and they kept saying, you can't leave, you can't leave. Like, the, the F-Series contract is one of the f- most fucked up contracts ever in SAG. Because it's it's built for an ensemble group. Uh-huh. So what happens is if Josh Wolf works, I have to work. Whether Josh Wolf shoots or not, whether I'm shooting or not, that's how they get their money out of you. God. They pay you a good amount, but you got to be on the fucking set. So even though I'm not shooting, they'll go, come on down. Up to fucking 10 hours there for three days without And you shooting. weren't doing anything? No, you're just in your room smoking dope, you know, watching a movie, whatever. You don't mind, but you start to go down there. So they fucked with me. They made me go to the, they said, all right, if you can't, you can't, you don't need to come in, but you have to go to a doctor for a checkup. And they fucking, uh, I went to the doctor, I went to like this special doctor and they were, they were fishing. What they were doing was fishing. For what? So I went in, <laughs> right? They weighed me, they checked my blood pressure. And the doctor's like, I have to look in your ears. And he looked in my ears, and then he looked in my nose, and I heard him go, whoo! <laughs> right? And I swear to God, he goes, what have you been doing? I, go, I got allergies. He goes, that don't look like fucking allergies. So the following week, I had to shoot that scene when I, when I put the jock strap on. Yeah. And I went in and I interrupted Adam. Like, I, at that point, I didn't give a fuck no more. Like, I didn't even give a fuck. You were there 10 fucking weeks already. This is enough. Right. So I would just walk up to him. He was talking to a bunch of Sony guys. And I walked up to him, I go, listen, dog, I'm doing that scene with no fucking clothes on, just a job. And they were like, don't let him do it. And he was like, fuck that, let him do it. But that day, Barry Bernardi yeah. came over to me. He's solid. And he's like, listen, dog, we got the report from the doctor. You got to stop doing that shit. And I, and I was like, I know. And he goes, your fucking back of your throat is raw. Your ears are raw from the blow. And he goes, if you ever took any advice from me, just 
stop doing that shit. And ever since that time, Jack was always even weirder to me. And then when they were doing that god awful fucking movie, which one? With the guy from Napoleon Dynamite with the softball team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had uh, just, bench warmers. We had just finished the longest yard. Bench warmers. It was bench it warmers. Was, yeah. And I was supposed to go into uh, one day just to visit the set, and they called me an hour before I got there. Jack doesn't want you on the set. So when they put me in the movies, Jack's not allowed to be on the set. So when I do the movies, like I see Barry, I see all the boys, but right. Jack won't be around or his fucking retarded brother. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't give a fuck at this point in the game. They can't do nothing to me that Castro hasn't already done. What's up with you, you sexy? Oh, well, blonde? I didn't know it affected your ears. Well, <clears throat> when you snort coke at that rate, you know. By the way, it was a, it was a pretty intense rate. It was a rape. It was a rape. And it was a, no doubt, I'm sure. <laughs> it was a, it was nonstop for a couple yeah. of years, and it burnt. You know, when, when you when you do a bump of coke, it changes your voice. Something swells or something mm -hmm. locks up in your throat membranes. Right. That's all part of it. You know, all that shit. So it really does affect your throat. It affects your throat. It affects your fucking teeth because all that drip goes into your teeth and it zaps them. Uh -huh. It zaps the nerve endings. So you gotta. So that's. The prolonged use. I just had the fucking throat and the ears popping. So thank God. I was in uh, Idaho Hill, Idaho Springs, Idaho. Was that when, where you sold me for a bag of weed? No, no. This oh. was on a triple <laughs> one. that had two of the same rooms across the street from one another. And on Thursday nights, the Indian reservation chicks would come. And I was dancing with this Indian chick that was hot. And I was feeling her ass. And she had short shorts on. And I said, I'm going for broke. And I stuck my hand up that snatch. And it was like yogurt. And I took it out and I was dancing with it, but I could smell my hand eight fucking feet away. Like I was doing like the low mower. I'm like, what? I'm like, what yeah. is this fucking smell? That was it though. I've never had really a I, girl. I turned around at a at a belly button once. Really? Yeah. You could smell it that deep. Yeah, and she tried to do the scooch. You know where she, she scooched up, and I kept going up with her, and she tried to do the hand on the back of the head, and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, no, it was bad, bad. Really? Like, I, I, was, uh, I was doing oh, that. Oh, really? Oh, it was so really? bad. One time I robbed the chick. Wow. I, I robbed the... I, I know, you robbed, you robbed I that robbed, Asian chick. I, no, I robbed the white chick from the Laugh Factory. She was heckling Paul Rodriguez, and he threw her out, <laughs> so she was all fucked up. I had, like, no money, Felicia. And I go outside, and I had a little bit of coke from Dante and the boys, and it was the cut shit. Uh -huh. It wasn't the shit that they would give me, like, the shit in a the rush. They would cut it and give it to me. I'm like, man, I need every bit of this, but I also need to get my dick sucked. I like to fucking rail this chick. And it's a Monday night at the Laugh Factory. And I'm like, how am I going to rob this chick? I, I wasn't even thinking of robbing her first. We went to get, <laughs> we went to, I was thinking of getting my dick sucked, and I told her I had Coke. And she goes, let's buy some Coke. So I took her by that liquor store by the Viper Room mm -hmm. on the corner there, and we went in there. And I had like maybe eight bucks. And this was it. Like, you know when you have eight bucks for the night? No, no, no. I had eight bucks for life. And I got this chick, and I'm like, what am I going to do? And we go inside the liquor store, and at first she's drunk, but she's playing the don't buy me nothing routine. So when she gets the big bottle of wine, she goes in the pocket, though. she got a stack of hundreds right there. I decided this bitch is going down. This bitch is going down. So we fucked around. We drove around. We drank. I had to go to the brothers and front another fucking package. But the package was so bad. Like, that I got it, I'm like, Dog, I got to get a good fix. Right. This was like a shitty fix. So she was a, a, a computer programmer that was getting trained, and she was staying at a Japanese. I never told you about this, Joshua. This crazy bitch was staying at a Japanese hotel downtown. That's, yeah, I didn't know that. That had, like, it's Japanese. You walk in, and it's high level, but it's Japanese, people bowing, and we pull up, and I got the fucking Ann Mania mobile <laughs> <laughs> with a thousand tickets, and I go upstairs, and we're upstairs swapping spit, and we do coke, and I'm like, I got to save this coke, because if I don't get the robber, I gotta fucking make this work. But Dante would close at one. He would close at one every right. night. He would get pissed if I showed up like a five after one, especially with no fucking money. He'd really get pissed. You know how those brothers get me show up with no dough. So I'm like, I gotta rob this bitch. So we're swapping spit. I'm giving her little bumps of my coke. She's getting fucked up. I got her pants off. I'm trying to eat her monkey. I would eat half of it, a finger, and then she would start crying. I have a boyfriend in Seattle. Don't worry about it. We'd start all over again. The pussy, the fucking monkey. I find, but I got her pants down to her ankles, and I'm eating her pussy, and the onion smelt like that sauce they put on a gyro. I'll never forget that. But I kept eating like a soldier because I was robbing this bitch. So I'm eating her pussy, and I'm going through her pant pockets while I'm eating her pussy, right? 
<laughs> but she had all hundreds on the top. But then she turned it into a Jewish bank. A Jewish bank when, when I wasn't looking, she put the middle on the outside. So here I am taking the outside and they're fucking singles. So finally I go into the middle and I pull like a hundred dollar bill and I had been in that pussy for about six minutes. I was dying. I pop my head up and I go, oh my God, what time is it? I gotta go put a quarter in the meter. And I just flew downstairs <laughs> and shot the Dante's and made it there by one o'clock and bought my Coke and how, she's probably still waiting for me. How many times did you wash your face? I did <laughs> once when I got in after I snorted the blow. <laughs> Fucking crazy, this Felicia Michael said. Tell you, you know, there's people who are cut out to do barbecues and parties, and there's people who can't. You, my friend, know how to throw a fucking party. You're so we had sweet. a friend, fucking Stacy, and, and one time invited us down there at five. We got there, there was no fucking food. I had to go to the deli and get a sandwich, like a fucking, like a Polak on the eighth. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> what the fuck? I had to eat the sandwich. I'm not lying to you. I come here, there's tables out, there's food out. And more than abundance of food. I mean, you always know fruit. You don't give a fuck. You got vegetarian. Well, if you're going to have a party, have a party, yeah, right? You, you don't fuck around. I'm not a good hostess. I've never had a... I don't know how to throw a party. The parties I had, the last party I had was a month before my mother died at that house. My mother went to Florida to sell the property. Uh-huh. And I wanted to be cool, so I had a party at my fucking house. And it was just crazy. I, didn't, I couldn't handle it. I didn't like beer on tables. I don't like that shit people drinking. People spilling beers that smell of beer. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, well, I'm that's because like, you grew up in a bar, right? Yeah, but yeah. That, 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 I'm like Felix Unger. You ever watch the Odd Couple Felix Unger when you don't use a coaster? Uh-huh. I lose my fucking mind when you don't lose a coaster. I don't know why, because of that bar. Oh, Because yeah. I would have to wax the bar, and I would see the stains, and I would go, Ma, tell these motherfuckers to use a coaster. So now I'm in my house, and I have this party, <laughs> and it was a crazy night because uh, there was this guy. I swear to God, we had a six-foot five St. Lazarus in our living room. St. Lazarus is a saint in the Catholic religion that is licked by dogs. One dog looks like oh, your right, dog, right, Fonzie, right, right, right. and the other one's a brown uh-huh. dog, and he had uh, he has crutches. Well, my fucking pet, my stepdad was so enamored with this saint that he gave the guy, he bought him special crutches, uh-huh. and his, the thing around his head, the, the sainthood thing uh-huh. around his head was the fucking calf. 14 karat gold. Uh-huh. And my father went all out for this saint. This was his statue. <laughs> when he sold the flower, somebody brought this into the flower shop. He bought it for like 300 And it was the statue that when you walked in the front door, you even if you lived there, you mm-hmm. would go, oh, because you thought it was somebody standing there. <laughs> now, this was my father's favorite statue. He left. Left my mother. And my, it was just me and my mother living in this house. And he was coming to get this statue eventually. And the 14 karat gold thing was there. Uh-huh. And there was an argument about a girl. Her name was Darcy Bizani. They called her Darcy Head. I'll never forget that. And she was going to sleep with a kid. She was like a senior. And she was messing around with one of my buddies. And they went to the attic. And in the middle of she's in the attic, the boyfriend comes. And he's like, where's Darcy? I'm here to pick her up. And we're like, we don't know. And he's like, I better find out what the fuck's going on. And he had like three gorillas. With him. This is in my house. And I'm looking at this go down. And they're like, if we don't know where Darcy is, we're going to start smacking fucking people. And all of a sudden, this kid, I'll never forget him, Chris Donovan. They called him the Red Devil, the original. He was the only <laughs> kid in the neighborhood that had red hair. Uh-huh. They called him the Red Devil. He's on Facebook. He fucking got up and took one of the crutches out of the saint's arms. Mm-hmm. Right there, my heart stopped. Because if they break this thing, my father's going to shoot me and everybody involved in this fucking thing. He took the crutch on. He goes, ain't nobody lifting a hand. Ain't nobody lifting a hand in this kid's house. It's disrespectful. You want to fight, take it outside. But if it, you move one more fucking inch, I will hit you with this fucking crutch. And there was a pin drop, and they turned around, walked out of my house, and that's the last time I had a fucking party. You understand? <laughs> Just, I don't like fucking parties. <laughs> I'm around those yeah. You get passports there and shit, yeah. fake IDs. That's, <laughs> like for us, we had yeah. to go to New York City. And they had a bunch of little places, but then they had like three places that were real deal. Then there was a guy in the Bronx, Tony the Baker. He had a bakery, and he would give you a, an ID, a Social Security card, Social and, a, Security. And, a, and a registration for your car for five hundred dollars. Oh, that's wow. a fucking that's gift a in those days. But oh shit! When you're a kid, you can't. He would give you an insurance card for your car that the cops could check out, and it was clean. This was for years. Wow. Wow. It's amazing. Like, well, my stepdad changed my birth certificate yeah. so that I could work a year earlier. I was only 15. Wait, I was 14. <laughs> he was like, them are some big titties. You got to get out, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to work in a telemarketing place when I was 14. You have to work at 15. It's legal in California. So he fucking changed my birth certificate. To this day, I'm a year older. But you can't, I feel like you can't do that shit now. 
because everything's all electronic. Oh, and you like, can't because even if you have a baby, you got to go down at a certain time and get them their, their social security number. Like oh. I have a really old social security number compared to all my friends my age <coughs> because I got one because I grew up on welfare. And when you went on a, the system, you had to get uh, a social security number. And uh, and now when you have a kid, it's like you have to jump through some hoops. to go. Get, you have to go down there and wait before you didn't have to. You, see some lady, you were away. Some lady tried to rob a baby from the hospital. Oh, I saw that. And then they put a bracelet on the babies now, yeah. which I, oh fucking genius. God. I never thought of that. Like, you know, anybody could just walk in in a nurse's suit, but they have like little probation uh-huh. braces. Let me tell you something. I used probation to Probation braces? Yeah, it's like a home. Uh, Welcome the to t- the world. You're I'm on gonna probation. I'm going to tell you something. I was the king. Yeah. When I was young, I was the king of forgeries. and not. Yeah. I wasn't good at forging, but I knew where to take shit, too. Yeah. And I, I tell you, 20 years ago, I'd get you whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> Now it's it's fucking gotta be bad. I mean, I never even tested for my driver's license in Jersey. My friend's father mm-hmm. had a friend who had a driving school. And he's like, dog, you need a driving? Yeah, I'll call the guy. Just have a hundred bucks for him. Just gave him a hundred bucks. Here's your license. There was no test. And that's why I was telling Felicia for Best. years, they couldn't pass a driving test. I hate taking driving <laughs> tests. The worst, it took I me know. like three times to pass this LA one. This uh, so I, I know serious? I did it in Sherman Oaks. Wait, no, Van Nuys at the Van Nuys DMV when I was 16. And it's all, there's so much traffic on Sherman Way and everything, it's almost impossible. One time, though, the, how I got my license in Colorado was really weird because I kept failing the test. <laughs> I, I lived in Aspen at the time, and you had to go down to Glenwood Springs, and I kept failing the fucking test. So they kept telling me, go to this little house, but the guy's a scumbag. And even that time I walked in there, I'm like, I'm not going to get my fucking license. Mm-hmm. This guy's going to fail me. There was no computer then. Now you have a computer, they put the piece of paper in, and you just hit it. Then you had to do like the fucking X's. Yeah, yeah. And I remember failing him. The guy was talking to me in the middle of me talking to the guy. The guy's telling me how, in other words, how stupid I was. Like he was telling <laughs> yeah. me, some guy just budges in and goes, hey, I want to take my driving test. The guy goes, you have to wait a second. I'm with him. And the guy goes, hey, everybody told me not to come see you because you were an asshole. And these two guys got up and they were ready to fight. This guy was like, and I got in between them and I told the guy, get the fuck out of here before I fuck you up, motherfucker. Because I just wanted my license and the guy bought it. The guy was like, thank you for helping me out, man. You're not really as stupid as I thought and all this shit. He took me for a ride and he gave me my fucking license. Wow. But I never took a driving test. I didn't know how to fucking take a driving test. I, don't, I failed here. That's, I even failed yeah. the fucking... The driving test, I even fucking failed, Felicia. I forgot Are you about. serious? My wife was wow. wouldn't talk to me for like three days. I did something. <laughs> I did something wrong. You driving for years, they want you to do it fucking legitimately. <laughs> so stupid. I've been doing 90 on the yeah, 101 for 10 years. You can't look your, your wife in the eye after that, right? No, nah, it's tough. <laughs> How do you fucking tell somebody you failed your driving test? I... Listen, in 19, when I first turned 16, I got my license, even though you have to be 17. Really? I couldn't wait to get a fucking car. I couldn't wait, Felicia. So the guys that were taking care of me after my mother died, he's like, Coco, if you see a car, you're like, let me know. I'll buy you a nice car. So I come home one day. I go, Mr. B, I seen the car I want. I want a 1973, no, it was a 1963 uh, GT Mustang. All I wanted it for is because the stereo was rocking. I didn't know about engines. I didn't know about nothing. So the guy, Mr. Bender, goes, this is what you want? You know? And I'm like, yeah. I think the kid wanted $2,300 or something at the time. It was a Type LT Camaro. Uh-huh. That's what it was. Yeah. So he goes, you know what? Let me take it to my mechanic, take it home for three days, and we'll let you know, and I'll buy it. it was, I don't know what it was. I remember after the first day, we turned that motherfucker around. Because you hear shit falling. You know, after, once you start doing 65, <laughs> da, 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 da. then another time I bought a car financed out of a fucking bank. And it's a used car, and I know it. Like, in the back of my mind, I'm like, I fucking hate this, but okay, I'll put up with it. And I bought this car, and I had it for like two months. It was a, a, like a Lincoln Continental, those two door, the long nose, uh-huh. with, oh, the, with yeah. the fucking uh, pimp thing on the stand. I'm surprised the you don't have roof, one now. I had a sunroof and I had power windows, but only the front. What year was this? This is '82, but this wow. car was this car was probably from '75, and it had power windows and it had the back windows with weren't the big windows, those little ones uh-huh. that go up. So one day I went to Harlem to cop a fucking bag. It had just no 12 fucking inches. And another 12 was coming. We better go over there now. Pick up the fucking Coke. And we could party all night. Who gives a fuck how much it's going to snow? I had the car maybe three months at this time. It was February of 83. It's freezing out in New York. I don't have to tell you. Rear wheel drive. I hit the fucking Henry Hudson. The car is spinning. The back is oh, fucking no. spinning. So my buddy smoked cigarettes. So he kept pressing that lighter in. You know, just, and, uh, 
And all of a sudden, he's like, zzz, zzz. I kept hearing, zzz, 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 right? And I'm like, what the fuck? We get to 143rd in Amsterdam. We park the fucking car. I go in. I get like two eight balls. I get like $20 worth of reefer. And I get back in the car. As I'm getting in, it's those New York snowflakes, those big ones that come uh-huh. off the Hudson. Got You have no uh-huh. fucking idea. Sideways. It's coming down. It's coming down. I get in the car, I'm like, let's get over. We got, all of a sudden I hear, zzz, zzz, zzz. guys, the power windows started going up like this, <laughs> and the back started going back and forth. I mean, it was fucking crazy. And all of a sudden you just heard like, zzz, 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 and you just heard, a, you smelled a bunch of smoke. Oh, no. It was coming, the electrical oh. system sizzled. Guys, it was like, a, maybe like a Friday afternoon. We walked up the Broadway, we took the A train down, and we went back over the city. We said, fuck, we'll go back in a couple of days and get it. When I got back there a couple of days later, you know that chicken, the turkey on Thanksgiving when you invite people over, too many people, and they uh-huh. destroy that bone? Uh-huh. It wasn't even on the bricks. They had taken the rear suspension off. There was nothing left, just the front suspension. Uh-huh. I didn't call the cops. I didn't report it stolen, nothing. I had like, I owed like $2,000 on it. I was making like $100, $120 payments. I never heard it. It's not on my fucking credit report. Nothing. Wow. And that's my lesson with old fucking cars, okay? That's why I can't stand them. I don't want them around me. <laughs> <laughs> they're just yeah, they tell me, like, why don't you just buy a new car? And I'm like, because then I own that motherfucker. And when you own a car, that's depreciation. Abe Lincoln said, you buy what appreciates, you, you fucking lease what depreciates. Yeah, you know right, where good. you're over yeah. the, you know, right, you're ready you're to go throwing yeah. it around. Yeah. Light a candle and I want to fucking go to sleep. <laughs> Nah, it's great. Hey, listen, man, it's uh, it's different for me. You know, I'm set in my ways, but every day I appreciate it more. Like, I look at her and I appreciate her more, and I understand what she's going through and where she's coming from, and I'm happy. You know, I just can't digest it all at one shot. Do you know yeah. what I'm saying? No, Some she's... people go out there and they're giving out cigars the third month. To me, this is all fucking like, wow. I don't see it till I, it's like Martians. Till I see a motherfucking Martian, then we'll talk about it. Until that time, don't talk to me about Martians, all right? <laughs> I've never seen a fucking Martian out at night <laughs> dancing or nothing. It's the same thing with this baby. You feel it and the stomach, but it's not till you fucking are in the hospital that it all comes to you, you know? Yeah, yeah. Is she going to go to Catholic school? Is she going to be a little fucking witch, you know? Yeah. But everything else is great about it. I'm I know we're starting uh, to talk about her little party that we're going to have, baby shower. Yeah, and I've been getting advice from all my friends. Apparently, it's a big game if you melt a candy bar in a diaper in the microwave and then you pass it around and you have to smell it and guess what? <laughs> A kind of candy bar that is. That's what women do to entertain ourselves. You know, we melt candy into a shit receptacle. It's so weird <laughs> when, you're, when you're like 15 or 16 or 17, 18. You're always wondering what women are doing. You know, like you're like, what the fuck do they do when they go out? Have you ever seen women when they go out? It isn't the most pathetic fucking celebration of nothing. I thought guys were <laughs> fucking boring. At least we got farts that we smell from each other. <laughs> Fucking girls sit there with fancy drinks and they can't, they don't know how to act because they finally got to pay for a fucking drink when they're out by themselves, you know, in a little girl, girl group. Because any fucking moron sees six chicks, he knows he's not getting no pussy. And they're jumping around, dancing with one another like they're having the end of the fucking world. I, I, I never got it. Even guys, I've never been a big guy hangout guy. You'll never really? see. Yeah, I fucking hate that shit. Yeah. Football games with 15 guys drinking. No, 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 no. If bitches ain't naked, I don't want to be there. I've never been a guy to hang out with six guys and play cards and all that shit. No, 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 no. Leave me ever, the fucking. Ever, ever? No. Really? No. Don't like it. I don't yeah. like that big uh, rah rah type thing. I don't yeah. like. It. I don't know why. And you think like I'm that type of guy now. Yeah. Since I was a kid, people invite me over. Come over for a football game. You gonna have food? I get high. I go and I eat the food and fuck you. I'm out of there. <laughs> I don't want to watch no fucking football. I ain't a fan of no. I'm a fan of whoever covers the spread. Yeah. That's it. If I'm, just to sit there and watch a football game, I can't. So I never understood the whole girly concept. When you see yeah. girls all do it up, then they go home like, we had such a great time. What'd you do? We talked to the bassist from a band. Who gives a fuck? You know what I'm saying? Like, girls do just, other things than that, Joey. Like Davis. what? Um, well, now we send each other nasty things on the email. We do that. Oh, Jesus. Like nasty little articles. Like, articles. like I saw this thing in it. I can't shake it, Joey. It's a museum. I read this uh, in somewhere on the internet that is about the penis. It's a penis museum. Just nothing but penises. And it's in Iceland. Just cracks me up. And they have all these pictures. They have like the penis of every animal in a pickle jar. It's just not right. <laughs> well, on Discovery, a couple of weeks ago, they had the restaurant that has that. They have a restaurant in like Hong Kong. Oh, and really? That's what they specialize in is penises. Uh, I think <laughs> that the most expensive dish is dog penis. is two hundred dollars. 
but they fucking marinate it with garlic and shit. Tremendous. I mean, I wouldn't eat no animal's penis. It's like a moose, a dog, a sheep. They had a couple of fucking penises, uh-huh. you know, cat penis. It's a fuck- cat penis. Yeah, because <laughs> eating a penis makes you stronger, like sexually. It's like a sexual dish. You know, it's like sucking somebody else's dick is going to make me fuck better. Stop it, all right? <laughs> Don't tell guys that because they'll go start sucking another guy's dick. You know, it's like people start saying if you drink your own piss, it's good for you in the morning. Good for what? For your breath? You ever smell fucking your piss in the morning? It's fucking disgusting. Oh you know, if that's what it takes to be a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? What's the word? You know, people say it makes you not virile, but uh, uh, it's an aphrodisiac. Right. Oh, okay, yeah. If that's what an aphrodisiac is, fuck Nature's it. I'll just jerk off and go to bed. Okay. Yeah, fuck that shit. And mm-hmm. that's it, Felicia, man. That's all I got for you. It's yeah. the end of the fucking summer. We're yeah. three months away from either the Mayans are going to show or these cocksuckers ain't going to show. Either they're going to show yeah. or they ain't going to show. Yeah. Either they're going to be the fucking Mexicans on Sons of Anarchy or they're going to fucking come here December. So we're three months away from what they're saying is the end of the world. And I knew something was going to happen this year. And you know what happened? I got my wife pregnant. I was just going to say, that's maybe the, that's what I kept what saying, it is, December really. 21st. Well, she's due January 10th. 10 before or 10 after. Yeah. It's going to be before. If you looked at my wife, she's fucking huge. So... It's going to be December 21st. That baby's going to be fucking born. Yeah. The Antichrist. Yeah. It's when you walk into a place, you could tell the difference between somebody who loves their job. Oh, yeah. And somebody who is there for the paycheck. Yeah. You go to some places where you have to tell people to stop. Fucking stop, guy. I don't want this. It's fucking water, all right? Every time I turn around, I, I can't take a sip without you filling my fucking glass. You know, and that impresses the fuck out. Bro, Hell yeah. listen, it's 2012. I hear these motherfuckers crying about business. Where's the customer satisfaction? That's what wins it with me every fucking time. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, th- uh, a month ago, I was in Buffalo. They missed the wake-up call. I called, yelling and screaming, bro. Like, I'm like, are you guys fucking retarded? What? They go, come on down. I went downstairs. The manager came up, Mr. Diaz. How are you? I already called JetBlue. We've changed your reservation. Pay for it. Pay for your ride to the airport. And we gave you the night for free at the hotel. That's wow. what you gotta do. That's customer yeah. satisfaction. Yeah. I didn't want do. the knife for free. You know, I didn't know about I can lie to you and tell you about Cuba. I don't fucking remember Cuba, you know. But yeah. I remember coming over when I was a nerd, you know, I like building models, you know, and, and I used to go to the store to buy glue. I was telling Felicia this and I and I, I didn't know. I didn't know. This guy every day would say, Hey, can you go inside and buy me glue? They don't let me in there. Bro, I had to be six or seven. And I would go in and buy the kid the glue, you know, and give it to him. He was an older guy. He was like 30, and I was maybe six, you know. And one day they're like, dog, don't talk to that guy. That guy snorts glue. And I'm like, what's not glue? And they're like, yeah, he snorts glue, and he gets high, and that's why he buys the fucking glue. And I'm like, really? And I started thinking about it, that he would have to buy glue there. So one day I went in the morning, and instead of buying one tube of glue, I bought two of them. And he gave me like, <laughs> he gave me like the 60 cents. He's like, you got the glue? And I go, bro, it's not 60 cents no more. He goes, what are you talking about? I go, dog, I've been going in there every day buying you glue. I got to make something. He's like, what the fuck are you talking about, kid? I can just beat you up. But I had like six other little Puerto Rican kids. This was a tough neighbor. We're like, no, nah, dog, from now on, you want glue. You got to pay an extra quarter. You know, we Hilarious. were fucking, for a quarter, a quarter in those days got you a juice drink. Oh, yeah. From the fucking hot dog, man, that were delicious. And again, I didn't need the money. My mother gave me whatever I wanted. But I was like, I got to make money off this guy. I started buying glue by the case. Hilarious. And selling it to the guy. And some days he's like, I'm not paying it. Well, fuck you, bitch. But all the hardware <laughs> stores, <laughs> all the hardware stores had like a picture of him. So they wouldn't sell him glue. Hilarious. So he had to walk to like Harlem and buy paint. So he'd be <laughs> pissed off. I'd see him that night. He's like, fuck you. Because of you, I got to buy paint and shit. He'd be huffing paint. And I remember just going, bitch, this is the way it goes. And we'd make, you know, a dollar fifty off him a week. Yeah. But. I think back to then, I'm like, wow, what made me possess me to do that? That's the first time I really took over somebody's weaknesses, you know? Yeah. Like I took advantage of <laughs> yeah. weaknesses, but that, it just teaches you how to, I read a newspaper route. And you're entrepreneurial. But hold on one second. Do you see a kid delivering newspapers today? No. There's no more newspaper yeah. routes. Yeah. There's a newspaper, there's the North Hollywood Reporter, and the kid comes by, that's once a week, and he collects, and you give him a dollar or something yeah. like that. But there's no hustle, yeah. because that, that was the main hustle. Everybody had to have a paper route oh, when yeah. you were a kid. I'm on whatever, Facebook or whatever. I'm looking at this ad that always pops up about singles. Do you guys get those singles? No. And, like know, Christian have, singles? Yeah, and I yeah. have all these friends that are always talking about, like, Lee and Felicia. And they're all talking about online dating and shit. So I clicked on to that, and they're like, you want a free profile? I just want to see what it's about. That's it. I'm just curious. I'm, I'm high, and I got time to kill. I got 15 minutes to kill before I got to pick my wife on the train. I pop it up. They want you to fill out 
20 pages of information yeah. just to see a fucking chick oh, one of these yeah, people yeah. the other day. I just wanted to see a profile. That's it. Yeah. I just want to see how it looks, you know. I, you know, Christian Mingle. Get one of your friend's logins. I got okay. a friend who's in it. You got, hardcore. You, 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 oh, I'll give you a see. login, yeah. Because me and my girlfriend. You do it. You do it. No, I want to sit with we you. We have logins, and then we go, stay on the phone, and we both go on together, and we look at other people. They don't know we're looking at them. And ChristianMingle.com, how do they even test if you're a Christian? You could just go on there and fuck with people. They need to test if you're Christian. Yeah, but what? But what's the purpose of hooking up with a Christian only to take her out and talk about racquetball? Like, yeah. like <laughs> you better be a Christian if you're on there because you're not fucking. I wish yeah. you could. <laughs> <laughs> well, unless you put it out there early on. Listen, I'm a Christian. I love God, but I also like to eat pussy <laughs> and fucking suck the whole fucking Roman way. You know what I'm saying? So don't apply back. If you don't like that. Yeah. I mean, hey, Christian I sucking fuck. The other, that they do, and that's what pisses me off. Like, what differentiates a Christian and a, and a regular person? That they're not going like, to curse on a date? Yeah. What, what are my values? Yeah. My values. What fucking values? You're on a fucking website trying to get pussy. It all goes out the fucking window. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Jesus didn't go to a website that went pussy. He went to a bar the old-fashioned way. He, he had to, some balls. He went to a mansion. Yeah. Yeah. A mound of dirt. Yeah. What the fuck? That was his microphone with a mound of dirt. But, hey, listen, man. I understand. I mean, it's got to be a weird way to fucking go on a date with somebody. Just go online. It has to. I just wanted to see so we could talk about something, you know. Yeah. November of 2007. Brody, it was a two long years. I was doing two grams of blow a fucking night. Mm -hmm. Plus antidepressants, plus reefer, plus Vicodins, whatever I get my hands on. And I ended with heroin for a summer, which nobody knew about because I was snorting it. Nobody knew. Nobody fucking knew. And uh, it wasn't the addiction. It was, I was in a dark place. And it ended with me going after Jeff Valdez at the comedy store. I had to go home that day and go, what the fuck? This is not, this is out of my realm here. I'm going after somebody in public. That's not my realm. Right. And I knew that something was the matter. I've never discussed this. I knew something was the matter. You know, I usually finish it. I'm not going to go after somebody, you know, in public in front of 200 people. I said some pretty heavy things, and I went after him pretty heavy in front of his wife and his attorney. I didn't give a fuck because that's my state of mind. Once we get down like that, but I think back at that time in my life, I didn't go to a hospital because I think people were scared to put me in that car. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, people were scared. I don't have friends that, like in Jersey, they would have fucking tied a neck around. They would have tied a bag like the Colombians do and tie a thing <laughs> and handcuff you. But I think here, people were scared, including my wife. Yeah. And I saw it, and uh, thank God I got off that blow. Thank God I got off the antidepressants first. See, I got off the antidepressants like in September. Once I was doing the antidepressants with the heroin, that was not going anywhere. That just got worse and worse and worse. And the thoughts I were getting were not uh, suicidal. They were taking motherfuckers out. I was ready to go to Paramount and start taking people out because our expectations. It was my expectations. And, you know, I never knew I was going through what I was going through until this year I bumped into Freddie Lockhart. And he told me what he went through after Frank. The show Frank. The yeah, Sports Frank. I did, I did audience work yeah, up there, too. And I thought that, and he thought the same thing I thought. He believed what the people told you on the set. He believed when, because we know we're funny. Let's cut the shit. But when we shoot a TV show and we get there, they really blow smoke up our ass. After the third take, they're still giggling. Really? I'm not that fucking funny. And when you, that goes into your psyche. I've seen, you know, we, can, we can't handle it. And we're fucking comedians. We can't handle it. Could you imagine somebody who's a comedic actor who went to the Groundlings for a year? And that's it. <laughs> Went to the Groundlings and Improv Olympic yeah. and, con and considered the advanced improv technique the long way, whatever the fuck they call it, and then <laughs> did that for six years. Because you know what? i seen it happen. i seen kids come up here and they'll eat you alive because this eats you alive. If you let this eat you alive, I'm that. Hey, dog, we all have it. We're comics. We, born, we were born to torture ourselves. How many people wake up one day and go, you know what? I'm not going to dance no more. I'm sorry I'm saying your business. I'm not going to sell coke no more or steal mm -hmm. a great life to have because at least every two years you get put in a prison. You don't have to pay rent for two years. You know, you were playing baseball. You, mm -hmm. you were doing the shows with us in Seattle. What makes you want to dive into this fucking hellhole, live in your car, and, you know, have to be accustomed to say, get used to people saying no to us? What other job is that? Tell me. Telemarketing, maybe, but you still got a base salary. 
You still got eight bucks an hour. Well, do you get anything from doing comedy sitting around all day? No. This is stressful, my friend. And remember one thing. At the, on, on the first of every month, there's no Louis C.K. And there's no Anzi Azari. We're all in the same book because we all got to start from scratch. That's the way I look. At the first of every month, every comedian is equal because we all got to start from scratch. I know every morning when I wake up, two things are going to happen. Either I'm going to have a fucking great day or I'm going to hit the lottery. Today's the day. That's why when I wake up at 5, I'm in a great mood because today's the day. Or today could be the best, worst day of my life. I'm going to make that call. I'm 50 in February. I got maybe 20 years left without the cigarettes and the old residue of the blow and eating rotten pussy. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, let's be honest with ourselves. That's the choices we have to make. But as comedians, let's listen to the career we've chosen. We chose a career of 10 years of people saying no to us. Right or wrong? It's about 10 years. No, yeah, you need a web page, you need yeah. a headshot. No, yeah. no, no, no. Can't feature, yeah. can't go headline. Not ready yet. Don't have enough credits. And then, you know, a Chinese girl moves to town, does three minutes at the comedy store, and she's on fucking uh, The Tonight Show. That's okay, though. You know, no, yeah. I understand it's okay. But the first time you fucking see it, it's oh, not no. okay. Yeah, yeah. It's not okay. The first time me and you were at the store, we started together in Seattle, and the first time I see fucking Brody at, at the six years of doing comedy at, on The Tonight Show, inside, it's going to fuck with you a little bit. People like you and I were a little stronger. We go, you know what? God bless that motherfucker. You know what? For me, if Felicia could do it, that means I got a shot no, at this it No, it does eat away at you a little bit. Even if you're a positive person and you want everything to go well, it does eat away at your self-esteem. There's no way it can't, you know? Like for me, it was like, why did Sarah Silverman do great things and I didn't? Well, because I made poor choices and chose to go on the road and whore my comedy out and ruin it uh, to pay uh, for my lifestyle. Did yeah. I just say that out loud? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I feel that um, I can't I can't compare myself to others. It's hard. You never can. No, you can't. We have yeah. our own path. Yeah. I used to do this. Hey, listen, we moved here with Josh Wolf. Mm -hmm. Kid couldn't get a spot at the store. Kid went into the store and Mitzi Shaw said, you want to be a doorman? Yeah, he does have the stench of doorman. Do you know what he felt like? You know how bad he felt when he went and tried out as a regular? And she told him, you're pretty funny, but you're going to be a doorman? And here I am, a regular. You're a regular. God knows who else is a regular. He couldn't get a manager. He couldn't do nothing. One day, his wife leaves him. Leaves him with the kid. He writes about it. Does a one-man show on a Monday night. And by Tuesday, he was a new man. He got a deal on the table three days later for half a million dollars or something. Mm -hmm. I tell you what, it sucked the fucking hair out of me. We were together in Seattle, were we not? Were we yeah. hanging out together in Seattle? Sucks the air out of you. Sucked the air out of me for 90 days at least. I'm big enough to say it. But you got two options. You get caught up in that. Yeah, yeah. Or you could say, they're going to do what they're going to do. Brody's going to do what he's going to do. Felicia's going to do what they're going to do. Terry's going to do what she's going to do. And guess what, motherfuckers? I got to do what I got to do. Yeah. I ain't worried about what Brody's doing with Felicia. You know what? I got to get on stage. Don Herrera made a great fucking thing when I did his podcast. He goes, I come from the old basketball school. If you ain't practicing, somebody else will. I had a situation when I was a kid. A kid pulled a gun out and wanted to play Roman fucking roulette. And he's today he's still alive. He's on Facebook. He's doing great. <laughs> he's you know, he's doing great. What's Roman roulette? Is that like Russian roulette? Yeah, same like fuck, a toga? Yeah, <laughs> Russian, <laughs> Russian roulette. But you he put a bandage on around your head. Grapes. <laughs> You're landing grapes and shit. It was just uh, he scared the shit out of us. He yeah. came down. His he came down. His father was a cop. Right. This motherfucker came down with. The, <laughs> Let's play. And all of a sudden, he snapped the first what? one. What? And we just froze to Pete. We just fucking froze. You know, it's funny because myself and Rogan were talking about deer hunting the other night. Right. When uh, when uh, De Niro had to go to Vietnam and get... Right. And we were talking about what type of... Oh, I of, heard that one. Yeah, I heard you guys talking about it. You're talking what, about yeah, getting into character. What type of job yeah. is that? Because there were people, they just didn't make that occupation up. Right. In Vietnam, there were 20 zombies walking around that played Russian roulette for a living. Wow. Soldiers that stayed to shoot heroin, wow. and they just played Russian roulette to make. Can you imagine that's night? your job every night to go in, bet on a click? I'm done. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I got another day. You know what I'm saying? Fuck it. Wow. How do you live? I mean, remember you remember that movie? I remember the movie. Sure. He sure. had to come get him, and he was so deep. Christopher Walken was so deep they didn't recognize him. Nikki, it's me. Nikki, Nikki. Right. It's me. He didn't fucking recognize him. You know. You know who else was on the Today Show today? Yeah. 
Linda Blair. She trumps Laurie Kilmartin. <laughs> yeah, wow. stuck across in the yeah, pussy. She trumps she was everyone. <laughs> she's still fucking great. She still looks great. God bless her. Somebody tweeted me yesterday and go, Joey, you're not going to believe this. Fucking Linda Blair's on the Today Show. I stopped what I was doing. I went to the fucking thing. <laughs> I scrolled it and I fucking taped it because I want to see what she looks like yeah. today. To me, they should give her an Oscar every year for that movie. <laughs> Somebody should give her a check. That's traumatizing. Yeah, she did it. At 12 years old, Changes you watch The Exorcist. Yeah, and you're like, if you watch an Exorcist with a parent today, that parent's thinking to themselves, would I let my kid do that role at fucking 12? That's a traumatizing yeah. role, grabbing your mother, making her eat your pussy, and they fucking VO'd in. <laughs> watch the fucking movie. It's on IFC all the time. Oh, I can't talk enough about the fucking movie, all right? <laughs> Years ago, they were taking your kidneys in Vegas. Yeah. You, oh, really? You'd be fucking, Urban legends. Yeah. yeah. You'd be, no, well, they even did it. Listen, when they do a Law and Order about it, it's real. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that makes Law it real. Law and Order had an episode where yeah, some, some dude woke up in a fucking tub with ice and a note that said, Dial 911, we took your kidney. Wow. So you would, you would get drugged, they'd suck your dick, or you thought so, uh-huh. and then once you pass out, Fucking Russians will come in and wow. slice your kidney out and sell it in the black Man, market. Man, how do you suck nice someone's time. cock knowing that you're about to steal their kidney? You know, that is that. fucking commitment to crime. Yeah, yeah. That's like, fuck it, I'm going to go swallow this load because That's I'm going chick for crime. You guys better fucking watch out. That's chick That's crime. That's evil chick Well, at least they left yeah. a courtesy note. Like in the Philippines, they don't even leave a courtesy note. They don't even leave a courtesy note. They, they, they just and do it. The, yeah. And they'll put a glass of water a mile away. It's not even a doctor's nurse doing it, too. It's not even... They put a glass of water a mile away, so you got to hop over there with no fucking kidney. Yeah. With the tube wow. draining like a motherfucker in there. So it's it's tough, man. I think if you travel, you should probably get one of those GPS devices in your organs. Low jack. Low jack, yeah. <laughs> That's probably going to be the next fucking thing. You know, it's crazy because uh, you ever watch anybody remember there used to be a show, and I just talked about it on HBO, and it was called Dr. Biden, where he used to break down crimes. Like if you hmm. fuck Oh, it, I think I saw this. It's not yeah. homicide. It's something uh-huh. else. If you... If they call Dr. Biden in, you're done. Like if, they, if you're in a case and they go, they contacted Dr. Biden, you're fucking done. And the most best thing he ever did was they found a girl, her torso off the coast of Jersey. Wow. And they took the torso with no head, no arms. And by the fucking tits, the fake tits she had, they had a number on it. Oh, yeah. And what she numbers. had in her stomach, they, they found these clams that you could only get at like three different restaurants. So they went to the restaurant, got the security cameras, yeah. fucking brilliant, yeah. wow. you know. But the point being that they found it because of her fake tits. You know, she had like a... a you know, right. Have, yeah, dial, serial number. yeah. Numbers yeah. On yeah. Each yeah. yeah, serial numbers. Wow. Serial numbers. So it's amazing that maybe 10 years from now, if they're taking kidneys when you're born, they'll just take your kidney out, put a number on it, and yeah. put it back in. Everybody will be walking around with scars and shit, like cesarean scars on their back. You never fucking know. You never know. But the first thing up front was about the medical marijuana in Colorado. Oh, what are they saying? And their stance oh, on it. Yeah. Like, they, they went to Boulder, they went to Denver. Denver's Who got did? 280 oh. something stores. And my numbers may be wrong. Oh, I don't want to get 20 fucking Gmails. Joey, it was 266. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know how these motherfuckers are. <laughs> my point being, it's four to one against Starbucks. Four, four to one in really? Starbucks in that city. There's a medical marijuana wow. destination every eight doors. It's, again, eight, six, five. Does it fucking matter? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, uh. So, and they went to this one company who's the, the mafia. Yeah, they're pretty much the mafia. Now the guy uh, wrote the law. Wrote he's had been studying it for the last whatever, mm-hmm. and he wrote it to a science. And then his partner opened up. Bro, they got everything. And they have everything to milligrams, like how much the edibles are fucking amazing. But how they have it, Colorado can't buy weed from other people. Like here, like before I went to the store, yeah. and I got a phone call, and I was watching the weed store, and I was watching the guy getting out of his car, the trunk. I'm like sitting there going, 10 years ago, I would have been hitting this guy in the head right now. Right. Like, I watched the whole thing go down. Yeah, they're right. They just do it casually, right? They just do it casually. In Colorado, you have to grow your own weed on the premises. Or have like a warehouse adds a different patois to it adds a lot more money a to z uh-huh. the profit and just that they want to know where the weed came from people have to come in on a weekly basis and test your marijuana yeah they say you can't grow it and have it in the same spot yeah very interesting oh really felicia you have to grow it and sell it yeah you can't colorado's it it 20 years ahead like they said no and then they asked the dude like so what do you think you you're not working with a federal law 
you know, you're working against the law. And he's like, listen, we know where every seed is. In Colorado, they have to they have to account for the weed from the seed mm-hmm. to the motherfucking bone. Oh, wow. Very, I mean, real interesting. This is like oh, wow. genius yeah, they should. said, fuck it. This is how right. we're going to do it. Because if you buy it from other from, from growers, then you have no idea what's no in it, really. No idea what you're getting. You know, we're going to have another fucking uh, ther- terrorist threat. We're going to have another terrorist situation. I feel like they almost years. invent these terrorist threats to say, okay, now we're doing something else to you. Like, they never quite... 9-11 happened, but, like, the other stuff never happened. It just almost happened. And they averted it, so now we have to test your water because they caught somebody with acid. And luckily, he didn't get it done. They always fuck up. These great terrorists get all the way through and then fuck up somehow. Now, now this conversation we're having, just a conversation. Can't let up a shoe bomb, but he got it on. Come on. Uh, we're going to start getting watched and our phones are going to get tapped. <laughs> I'm sure. It makes me not but believe it. we're walking on ice, we might as well dance. <clears throat> what a lot of people in America don't know, last week, the Treasury almost got bombed in New York City. I know you almost read that. Again. Yeah, and yeah. I know you read that. Did you yeah. read the whole thing? No. Okay. Wasn't he kind of baited into right. doing it? You're right. Now, so what you basically have is they got a guy that looks like Ari. Yeah. Ari gets busted for reef and they go, come on down, we're going to give you 10 fucking years Oh, your father's from Israel. We're going to deport him, your sister with the kids, your mother. But, you know how to speak Arabic? I can fucking try. All right, we're going to put you in a sheet. We're going to get you a suntan. We're going to take those fucking glasses off. And you're going to go out and cause problems. What's cause problems? You're going to go to mosque, kneel down, and ask people, fuck America. Fuck America. Uh-huh. And eventually, somebody's going to go, yes, fuck America back. What do we do? Because he's got a cousin who was Al-Qaeda. The same way you have a cousin growing up that's in a gang and your kids hear about him. And they're interested. And so then they just come that way. Do you way. understand me? And now yeah. one thing leads to another. I want to blow up America. It's like me coming to you and, and saying, so let's Paul, so sure. You plan weak-minded. it together. I'm weak-minded. <clears throat> but the guy is really a federal agent. But then if someone's... <clears throat> it, it, you can't... Talk so they sold the guy bombs. Bombing, you know. Right, but then they sold him bombs. Yeah. yeah. They sold him bombs. He yeah. bought bombs from them and, yeah. and they put phony yeah, bombs in. Could. So I'm very he interested. He bought bombs. He know? bought bombs. So what I'm very interested in, in is what's that word? What's that word? I'm yeah, but so they knew it the whole time. Baiting. So there was baiting. never really. There's another word for baiting. Oh, uh, enticing. Uh, uh, oh, entrapment. Entrapment. Yeah. yeah. So I think in a way it's entrapment. But they, they're stopping it at the fucking core, guys. Yeah, and it's like, oh, we just, they always get lucky. He, they fucked up somehow. It's like, what do you mean? It's always lucky it doesn't happen? So so you're saying the current th- stuff doesn't work, so we need more stuff, and thank God nothing happened again. First off, it just makes me you, have to assume, trust them. you have to assume. The same yeah, guys that steal you have everything. To assume, as of 19, whatever, 9 11, you had to assume that there was keywords in your conversation on the phone that clicked things off. Yeah. In the old days, it was bomb, eight ball. There yeah. were certain words that clicked the computer off somewhere that just made them start listening. After 9 11, you have to assume they're listening to everything, everything. every time. Yeah. You have to assume. When you go to Vegas and you're jerking off in the shower, they got you on tape. <laughs> Sorry to be looking in your eye. I'm just. <laughs> I know you wash your pussy and you like to scrub that little fucking monster to the Get top. in there. Bubbles and the whole thing. Oh, wow. You polish that asshole. Yes, you have the toothbrush yes, yes. on. So you have to assume when you're in Vegas and you eat a fat stripper's asshole, yeah. they got you on tape. Right. When you're walking down the hallway and you grab your boyfriend's uh-huh. cop, they got you on fucking tape. Everything's you on know? tape now, for well, sure. Yeah. Well, what was the guest we had that talked about New York? Uh, and he said oh. that in New York, if you have a blue shirt on, on the 18th cop? Street, somebody talked about if you have a shirt on on 18th Street yeah. and they're looking for somebody in Manhattan, they'll find you if you had a blue shirt on. They'll get you to the exact fucking street within fucking six minutes. Is that Nick Betancourt? Somebody was Someone telling like us that, was yeah. here that, that crime that's stuff. The, that's what, after what happened in New York, yeah. New Yorkers don't even mind. Oh yeah, they they said they were ba- they they, the, they were baiting. That's what they said. New Yorkers they were baiting. The New York cops were baiting Muslims. Yeah, trying to get them so that they could then follow them. Guys, but after what happened in New York, see, we were out here. You were out here. Number two, I hate to say this, and Felicia knows. Felicia lived in New York for 10 years. Yeah. I grew up there. When I seen those towers go down in my stomach, I felt raped. Yeah, we all did. I can't did. imagine the people that were walking around. I can't imagine. I heard people that were coming over the bridge, and when you came over into Hoboken on the ferry, they would spray you down with these chemicals. And they said the looks on people's faces 
were like, you got fucking raped. So I know if you live there right now, yeah, oh. it's an invasion of my privacy. But they got a fucking camera on everybody's ass on the streets. Yeah. I don't know into those old apartments mm -hmm. that they got cameras. That's something completely different. I don't want to get into that. I know they got the wires tapped to a degree. Cell phones, you're done. What do you think? The cell phone was invented because they wanted to invent it. The cell phone was invented again, like the computer. They need tabs on everybody. The easiest way to tap somebody now is on a fucking cell phone. You switch that motherfucker to one range. or one, Again, I'm not no technology, technological guy. <laughs> not I watched Mission Impossible for eight years. I know how these motherfuckers crack a lot. You know what I'm saying? All right. So, you know, you have to assume every word you yeah, say on the yeah, cell phone yeah. is under surveillance. Yeah. Uh, there's a certain time limit on it. Maybe you have 10 seconds to talk or something. But everything is under a watchful eye. These podcasts, we have a great time. We talk about eating ass and pussy. But I guarantee the first mention of us talking about getting together and playing bundles at, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. we go to fucking jail. Somebody's got to be listening. This is freedom of speech to the fucking max what we're doing right yeah, here. We're yeah. putting it out ourselves. You yeah. know, this is heavy duty. So you got to understand the time, Zari. Don't get upset about this. Dog. And I'm worse than you are. get upset. Listen so do you, do you really think if someone put like bomb, the word bomb in their email, that that email would get flagged eventually? Probably they start looking at your other stuff, see if there's anything else worth eventually. looking really? for. Really? You think so? Yeah. Anything like that, you got to assume. You have to Well, they have the assume. power to do that. Yeah. So why wouldn't they? Yeah. You know, I'd want to just be sure. I don't work for CNN, and I'm not going to tell you the Kennedy Act of 84. If you gave me a week and you made uh -huh. me look it up, I would call an attorney and see exactly what the statutes were. And yeah, but then every shit. open mic comic would have would be flagged. You know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know. True that. Yeah, I mean, that's all they talk about is how bombing went last but, night. But it has to, it, you, you have to eventually know that everything you do, pretty soon they're going to, and they're trying to narrow us down even more to the eyeball. You know, oh, eventually yeah. it's going to be beyond the fingerprint. It's going to be the fucking eyeball where, you know, click Ari Shafir, click Joey Diaz, you know. And when you fly, you're not even going to need ID anymore. You get pulled over by the cops. You just look into a fucking thing. Right. You know, and that's 20 it's, years from now. That's yeah. your children are going to get. And I appreciate it. I, I just got hit up by somebody on email yesterday, two days ago. He's like, hey, man, I've been away for six months. And they had no access to iTunes or something. And he goes, so now I downloaded like 60 fucking beautiful oh, nice, beasts. Nice, yeah, yeah. And we talked a little bit. He goes, I don't know if you remember me. And it's really nice, man. We, you know, listen, like I said, you know, you booked these shows this year. And you were like really excited. And when I got off the phone, I'm like, fucking oh, Felicia, what's she excited about? I thought she knew that this is what happens when you get up and do something you're not supposed to do. Like if I blew you off very weak and said, we're not going to do this, then nothing to do. But we fucking stay on top of it. And it's so rare, too, because how many fucking people, and not just in this business, but any business, always say, yeah, we should do that, we should do this, and it never comes to fruition. For us, I know we have hundreds of friends and acquaintances that do that all the time. Let's do this project, and nothing ever happens. But for the fact that once a week, for two years, that we've been, more than two years, two and a half years, meeting and doing this every week, and we have learned so much. I've learned so much from the listeners, like the things they write, or, or people that you feel like you've made friends with over Facebook and Twitter because of just the certain things they pick out and respond to is what I find so super interesting. And, uh, and you see people's personalities come through uh, uh, the internet. Like, you see that Twitter picture, thing. and then you see them at a comedy show, you're like, oh my God, and they come yeah. over and they're cool. And it's, uh, it's been a real learning experience. Like, I don't... Every day for me, this is like going to college the last two years. Like, I'm learning something, but it's different because I'm doing it as I'm learning. And this is a different, and we've learned. I mean, we've had different guests in here, but we learned about each other. It's so weird. Last night I, I said something to Terry, uh, my wife, in a bad way. I have a cat that when he eats, he doesn't like to eat with everybody else. Mm -hmm. He likes to eat in a fucking corner yeah. by himself. Yeah. That's just the way he some is. People, it, some people are that That's way. That's just the yeah. way he is. But if you don't feed him in that fucking corner, he won't eat. Yeah. And guess whose balls he busts? He busts my balls. And he's Fidel. I love him with all my heart, but he's the biggest cat I got. But his meow is very, wow, like a little fucking girl. And I got to tell you something. It fucking goes right through me. Uh -huh. So the other morning I woke up on Monday, early in the morning at 5. And he's the first cat I see. My wife's on the couch at 5. With coffee and a hot dog. She's pregnant. With a smile. A yeah, from a smile oh. from ear to ear. 
And Fidel comes out, and I see the other cats eating. Fidel comes up, and he's like, wow. And I look at Terry, and I go, why is this cat meowing at me? She's like, well, I fed him. I go, no, you didn't feed him. The fucking thing's not in the corner. And she's like, well, I brought it to him. I go, for the last eight fucking years, he doesn't like eating with people. Yeah. It's eight fucking years we have him, okay? Okay, I put the thing in the dish last night. This is Monday. I just had this conversation on Wednesday. This is last night. It's Halloween. I stay in. I come out at 9 o'clock. First fucking cat that runs up to me is Fidel. She looks at me and I go, did you eat Fidel? She goes, no, I just fed them. I go in the kitchen and sure enough, the cats follow me in there and Fidel's fucking meowing on the floor. I look in the corner and where's his bowl? I said to her, I go, you don't seem to understand. I go, this kind of shit irritates the fuck out of me. This is like wiping your ass. Do you? Is there a day that goes by that you don't wipe your fucking ass? No. So from here on in, that dish has to be in the corner every day. <laughs> she picked it up to give it to Finny. I don't give a fuck about picking up. That's the way it is. And people in this country do not understand that. They refuse to understand. When you go on a diet, you go on a diet. When you become a comedian, you become a comedian. Yeah. And you stick to what makes you a comedian. You don't deviate from that. And then because when you deviate from that, then people, I don't know what happened. Well, you stop doing what you were doing. When you do something every Monday, I do it every Monday. The reason why I don't like working Sundays is because Sunday nights from 6 to 7 where the Dexter's on, I'm answering these motherfuckers' emails. Nothing can stand in my way for that. Not a dinner party, not somebody's fucking birthday. That has nothing to do with me. This is what's important. You know, when people go on diets in this country, they fail because they don't stick to it. Or they don't stick to a form of eating. And they go, I don't know what happened. I can tell you what fucking happened. You didn't stick to your plan. You have a plan. And this shit that you have to do every day. Regardless. I don't give a fuck. It's like when Josh Wolf was on here. Josh Wolf called me the other day. We had this talk. Oh, yeah. And he was talking to a friend of his. And he's like, I don't understand that concept. That you guys are talking on the open mic. Well, that's why you're not a comedian. Well, what is it that you do to keep so... Like focus. That's I'm always There's no focus. There's no focus. Who can do that. You have to do the same shit every week, regardless of what time, who's having a party, who doesn't feel good, who wants to do this. That doesn't matter to my world. That that has never mattered to my world. And and I see people that have the same work ethic. And and I, and I talked to Terry yesterday about it. I just don't. She goes, I can't understand why you get so mad about it. I go because. I don't understand that lifestyle. You do the same shit every fucking day. I'm not saying, and by you listening to this, you're going, well, Joey, you're a pretty boring guy. No. I'm not saying that I eat sushi every day, and I'm not saying I eat tuna every day. I'm not even saying I eat lunch at the same time every day. That's not what I'm talking about. It's the things you have to do to keep the machine going. Yeah. They have to keep the machine going. It's like what we talked about here. He was going on vacation. That's why he brought it mm -hmm. up. He goes, I'm going away with my wife this week for Friday and Saturday. And he goes, before you say anything. <laughs> and we were talking about it. I go, no. It's like, you don't understand. That's your wife. You have to do that. You've been on the road. Like he said, he goes, I did. It's October and I've already been on the road 28 weeks this year. Oh, and I understand yeah. that. That's it's the guys yeah. that say, you know, um, you know, I'm going to Disneyland. Re really? Okay, you got kids, Felicia. I'm going to have a daughter. I understand. When an adult says to me they're going to Disneyland, don't you have a show? Isn't it Saturday night? Should you be on a fucking stage? Yeah. But you're the first motherfucker that'll call me on a Tuesday with some sob story about, Joey, I don't know what to do. This is what you got to do. That's what needs to be done. It's the same shit every day. You know, and nothing could affect your dream. Nothing could affect your goal. You know, if something has to be done that day, it has to be done. I know that shit pops up. And that's what I don't understand about people. And they hit you back. I don't know. The number, you know, nobody needs a life coach. Nobody needs nothing. If you do what you need to do, we all know what needs to be done. I, I can't see, you know, I'm going to be 50. And I told you when we were having coffee that at this age, I couldn't see myself going on stage anymore. And part of the reason is because in the back of my mind, I feel like, I feel like Sandusky. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm gonna really? fucking lie to you. Yeah. You know, when I go to a weed store and I see an old guy with a ponytail with a 1969 shirt, I wanna smack him in the fucking face. That's just me. If you're 50, be 50. Act like you're 50. Rodney was a rarity because I still remember buying beers, which I don't even fucking drink. You know, I drank after I did blow. I, you know, I remember buying a six pack of Budweiser to take to see Easy Money. 
Easy Money was 1984. Rodney mm -hmm. was 50 something years old, and I was 21. And I couldn't get enough of fucking Rodney. Nobody right. could, no matter what age. Right. But still, when I get up on stage now, in the back of my mind, I'm like, what the fuck? These poor kids, you know what I'm saying? I feel right. like a child molester up there. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it's, but, you know, whatever. I understand takes, that. That's but then again, you know, yeah. listen, man. You know, let, let, let's get this shit out of the way. I, I grew up in a house with my mother where you had two seconds to get her attention. So whatever came out of your mouth better be more important than what's on her fucking mind. That's the way I am with people. You know what was on her mind? Money, cock, and drinking. You know, she had a bar and she loved the fucking Mets. So whatever you had to say better be more fucking important than what's going on in her mind. And I'm an only child. So I got a party in my fucking mind all the time. So whatever the fuck you got to say, you got about 10 seconds. It better be about money, pussy, you know, whatever, smoking weed, whatever is into my thing. I haven't really held your attention much. No, 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 no. But when I go out there on stage, you know, I remember watching uh, Carol on the, on the Rodney Dangerfield special. To me, when I got into comedy in 1991, that was my Bible. And I watched, I got to watch 10 great comics, from Herrera to, to, to Lenny Clark. And I remember Lenny Clark got my fucking attention. He went up there and he fucking grabbed you the first three lines out of his fucking mouth. He grabbed you, whether you liked him or not or whatever. And that was the style I liked. I like people who fucking grab you. We got no time to fuck around. I got 40 fucking minutes and I got 49 years in my head of, you know? So it's that style of grabbing them that I see people fucking just, you got to grab them. You know, you got to fucking grab them. I book a room in Brea and an older comic from the comedy store. Uh, came to me like a man and said, I'm not getting that much work. It would really be nice to do your room. Uh, I offered him money, and he said, I'm not, at first he said, this is not the money I'm used to getting. <laughs> I said, so, <laughs> you don't work, so now I got to give you double the VIG. I gave him double the VIG. <laughs> double the VIG. And he, got up, <laughs> and he got up there, and he opened up with a fucking, uh, what's the movie with uh, the Scientologist and Val Kilmer when they fly planes? Oh, uh, what, uh, Danger Zone. Whatever the fuck the movie is, Tin Cup, whatever the fuck it was. Right? Tin cup. <laughs> whatever the fuck it was. The point being that it's 2010, yeah. and you're up there talking about yeah. 1984. 1984 in a crowd. Right. So, they don't I'm have, talking about you know, So, here you are not working, but you're up there, you know, giving Michael Jackson references, yeah. and, so you know, talking, talking about that. fucking, uh, uh, you yeah. know, a John, what was the good quarterback from Baltimore when we were a kid, Johnny, Johnny United. Raiders. Are you fucking kidding me? You know, are you fucking kidding me? You know, these fucking mobile kids today, they don't know Dick. You know, they don't know who Charles Bronson is. They got to yeah. sit there and Google it. Yeah, yeah. they got to hold on one second. That's why I said fucking... No, uh, it's scary. It's, it's scary. fucking scary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a 24-year-old kid I hang out with, does a podcast with me. He's never seen Once Upon a Time in America. He's never seen Outlaw and Josie Wales. You want to grab these motherfuckers and go, how do you survive? But they think Avatar is a fucking great movie. That's why. Because they've never seen the good, bad, and the fucking ugly. It would kill them. Their minds would, you know, you were talking about, you were talking about, uh, what's the guy that owned TV? What's the guy we're talking about? The guy when we were kids that had a, you know, he'd come out tonight, the Beatles. Ed Sullivan. Ed Sullivan. Yeah. I read this fucking thing. I'm reading this book about New York, uh -huh. set New York on fire, about music in New York in the 70s, and how it went from music to disco. It's fucking has blown my mind. And there's an, a chapter when there were these disco owners would spike the punch with, with quaaludes in the 70s and acid and shit just to fuck up because Mick Jagger would go in there to Stones. But one night Ed Sullivan walked in. And he's like, I want some punch. And they're like, no, don't give him the fucking punch, right? <laughs> so they gave him the punch, and they put him in the back room, like the VIP area, and they sent hookers back. To, like the clubs had hookers in those days that would suck your dick. You know, the VIP lounge, whatever. And they went back, and the chick started squeezing his nipples. And fucking Ed Sullivan freaked out, went into a corner and started crying. Oh, you got to read this shit. And they took him to the hospital, and then the club owners worried about him. I'm reading this, and I'm going, you know, what if a kid reads this today? He, does, he can't laugh because they were saying in the book, Ed Sullivan was the straightest man in America at the yeah, time. Yeah, he was he didn't even want the Beatles in there. Like It was just overwhelming. He didn't like long hair or reefer. They gave this guy acid. He was in a corner. Kids wouldn't understand it you know, because they don't know who fucking Ed Sullivan is. They don't know who Sonny and Cher is.